This is a sphere several billion light years from Earth, home to countless intelligent spirits. In a certain country, the people here are suffering from an aging population. Before graduating from college to find a job, you must register to get married. If you don't have a partner, it's very simple. The country will choose someone suitable for you. But if you want to refuse, you have to pay a single tax of up to 10 billion RMB. This young girl is named Dai Tin Kuang, 22 years old, just graduated from college. Unfortunately she has just become single. The only way is to go to the marriage office to choose a marriage partner. Next to it, the village loudspeaker is still shouting slogans to stimulate marriage. We are who? Save the single. Why are we still single because we are ugly? Dai Tin Kuang was furious after hearing this, because she is a beauty queen, but she falls into a pathetic situation, needing the government to match her partner to get married. It's all because of the ex-boyfriend who suddenly broke up right before graduation day. Dai Tin Kuang secretly cursed it was all because of that bastard, then tried to enter the marriage office. This marriage game is also very lucky. After submitting the paperwork, the government will take people aside to draw lots. The computer will randomly generate 10 numbers, each number corresponding to a partner. We have to choose one of them. This makes Dai Tin Kuang very confused, because there is only the number, no information at all, telling her how to choose. The system has now counted down 30 seconds, because if she doesn't take the initiative to choose a number within 30 seconds, the system will automatically choose. Then it will be too late to regret. After hearing this, Dai Tin Kuang became more anxious, fumbling to press randomly on a random number on the screen. Very quickly there was an announcement congratulating her. The state has matched her with partner number 1,314,521. The system informs Dai Tin Kuang to now go to the service desk to receive the personal information of that person, while wishing both a happy marriage. Two children per year. The girl could only clench her fists on hearing this, hating that she couldn't say she wasn't a breeding machine. But eventually Dai Tin Kuang had to sigh and accept her fate. She thought she had to get the marriage certificate first, take it back to school to get her graduation certificate. She had to find a good job and wait until she earned money. By then she wouldn't have to worry about paying the divorce tax and finding a new husband. The administrative staff then gave Dai Tin Kuang the documents related to her partner. After that, they said they would quickly bring her partner here with her to complete the procedure, and reminded Dai Tin Kuang that according to the regulations of the country, within one year she had to move in and live at her partner's house. The marriage office staff could visit the two at any time. Looking at the folder with the name Dai Quan Kin on top, Tin Kuang felt the name looked a bit familiar. When she remembered, she panicked. Because wasn't this the guy who made the Forbes list of the world's richest people? It looked like Dai Tin Kuang had won the jackpot. But in fact she was extremely afraid because Dai Quan Kin had declared that anyone who touched his brother, he would have that person dig their own grave first. Dai Tin Kuang gloomily asked the staff if she could redraw. The cold administrative staff told Tin Kuang not to even think about doing that. With a scrutinizing look, the staff member said she had seen so many beauties like Dai Tin Kuang who were still single. Why were they still single? Wasn't their standard too high? She was certainly still single because Dai Tin Kuang kept choosing back and forth. Even coming to the marriage office she still hadn't dropped this bad habit. Dai Tin Kuang of course strongly objected. The reason she gave was that the person she had drawn lots for, the same surname as her, what if they were related within three generations to Dai Tin Kuang's family? That way, having children later would not be good for the fetus. The administrative staff smiled confidently, saying that this was match compatibility data that had been strictly checked, telling her to trust the state. There was no way there could be a mistake. Dai Tin Kuang still tried to change partners, and said she could pay the fine too. But the administrative staff said it was not just simply paying 10 million yuan. It also affected credit investigations. She could even go to jail. This would be a stain following her for life. She asked Tin Kuang if she thought she could withstand the consequences. Of course, this was the end of hope. Dai Tin Kuang could only cry to the heavens. In another development, Dai Quan Kin was also on his way to the marriage office. Dai Quan Kin's assistant was crying and begging him to punish himself instead. Because if he hadn't forgotten to pay the single tax, his name would not have been entered into the marriage lottery system. But he said the lawyer had been informed to come to the marriage office to resolve this. He would definitely make Dai Quan Kin Kin's partner find it difficult to back out. Dai Quan Kin didn't reply. He was hesitating because he thought of his brother who was at a critical moment in the presidential election. If he refused this marriage now, he was afraid of how many enemies would make a fuss. The assistant held up the phone, encouraging Dai Quan Kin that no one knew about this yet. But who would have guessed a second later the latest news popped up, saying that Dai Quan Kin, who topped the list of 10 people embracing bachelorhood, 
had been moved by someone from the Northern Marriage Office. Just as the assistant was screaming about how the information was leaked so quickly, their car had also stopped in front of the marriage office. Dai Quan Kin was also curious about what kind of girl she was, then told his subordinate that he wanted all the documents about her. The assistant then showed him a photo of Dai Tin Kuang, saying it was her. Unexpectedly, Dai Quan Kin's expression after seeing the photo was extremely surprised. His eyes seemed to pop out, feeling unbelievable that it was her. Inside the marriage office, Dai Quan Kin's lawyer was working with Dai Vin Kuang. Lawyer Tick said although Mr. Dai is currently single, Miss Gi Gi will soon become his fiance. He was confident that Dai Tin Kuang knew who Miss Gi Gi was without needing an introduction. She is the one and only mermaid in the world. Not only a national treasure of this country, but also the number one on the list of famous beauties that men in the country want to marry. Lawyer Tick said if Dai Tin Kuang took the initiative to refuse this marriage, then all the fines would be paid by Dai Quan Kin. In addition, she would be compensated 100,000. He asked how she felt about this. Dai Tin Kuang felt dissatisfied. She said this was not about money. At this point, Lawyer Tick began to look down on others, saying that Tin Kuang should not think that just because she grew up with some beauty she could compare with Miss Gi Gi. He ridiculed Tin Kuang as the daughter of a fisherman on a remote island. Compared to the young miss over there, they were worlds apart. Tin Kuang was now resentful. Her hands clutched her skirt tightly. A storm brewing in her heart, she thought to herself how could Miss Gi Gi be the only mermaid in the world. She still remembered that year, in order to cure her chronic leukemia, Dai Tin Kuang was born. But the Ha family had hidden her existence until she was six years old. When she was severely ill they dumped her into the open sea, leaving her to live or die on her own. They even laughed saying fortunately Dai Tin Kuang had provided bone marrow for Gi Gi before getting sick, calling her an ugly mermaid, cursing her to die quickly, Dai Tin Kua then retorted, saying what was wrong with being a fisherman's daughter, she got matched through the lottery, not stealing from anyone. Tin Kuang laughed and told lawyer Tick that the government thought they were a perfect match, giving Mr. Dai to her, telling him if he wasn't satisfied to go find the government himself. The lawyer smiled a vicious, mocking smile, he said he knew her father had a urinary tract infection, and claimed his young miss had connections with all the hospitals nationwide. If she spoke up, he feared Tin Kuang's father wouldn't be able to get dialysis if he needed it. Hearing this bastard dare threaten her father's life, Tin Kuang was furious and stood up. Just as she was about to retort more, she noticed someone had arrived. It was Dai Quan Kin. Seeing him, Dai Tin Kuang was stunned and asked who he was. Dai Quan Kin just strode forward. Even lifting her chin, he coldly stated his name. That wasn't enough, he emphasized it once more strongly, as if wanting her to remember clearly, or also to remind her. Dai Tin Kuang just felt his hand clutching her face painfully. She grimaced, then immediately backed away, yelling at him to let her go. But Dai Quan Kin forcefully pulled her back. He said Dai Tin Kuang had great abilities to be able to affect him like this. Dai Tin Kuang painfully denied it saying this was just a misunderstanding. It was all because of the state's allocation, she wouldn't dream of touching him. Hearing this statement full of contempt, Dai Quan Kin seemed a bit surprised. Dai Tin Kuang then asked what he wanted. If he wanted her to voluntarily withdraw, there's no chance. Telling him if he wanted to sign then go sign himself. But Dai Quan Kin looked at her with a terrifying challenging gaze, asking if she dared to try signing. Then he turned his head to order his subordinate to call the Civil Affairs Bureau staff over, and looked straight into Dai Tin Kuang's eyes saying he accepted the allocation. This sentence directly panicked both the lawyer and the assistant. The voluntary agreement to accept the marriage had been brought over. Dai Tin Kuang carefully asked if he was sure. Dai Quan Kin reached out to loosen his tie, smiling and asking Tin Kuang if she didn't dare sign. Of course someone easily provoked like Tin Kuang was very resentful. Why wouldn't she dare sign? Tin Kuang took the pen. After signing, she held up the form and told Quan Kin to look closely. She had signed, now it was his turn. The red-haired assistant kept worryingly reminding Quan Kin to think carefully. Because the old master of their family wanted to become in-laws with the Ha family, that lawyer also chimed in, saying moreover Miss Gi Gi was the one and only mermaid in the world, a national treasure. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin glared at him, saying he had no intention of opening a zoo. This comment made Dai Tin Kuang have to stifle a laugh. She also didn't expect 
suspect he had really signed it. The female administrative staff was also very pleased to congratulate them on officially becoming a state-sponsored married couple. Then she gave them a certificate of marriage, telling them they now had a year to live together. The necessary things about the marriage certificate were, could be freely changed into a marriage certificate at any time. After the bride became pregnant both sides enjoyed equal benefits. The development of other extramarital relationships were convicted. Both the husband and wife continue to cohabit, accepting the marriage office to visit at any time. At this time, Dai Tin Kuang raised her hand saying she had a question. If they really didn't get along, what should they do? The female staff member explained after a year they could apply for annulment of the marriage. When annulling there would still be a fine of 100 million, but there would be no other punishment. Hearing the huge amount, Dai Tin Kuang still couldn't accept it. Then the marriage office staff told Quan Kin he could take the young miss home now. The sky now looked like a storm was brewing. Tin Kuang got out of the car thanking Quan Kin for taking her back to school before it rained. Then politely told him to wait a moment. She had just left when the rain started pouring down. Quan Kin sitting in the car was taking a call from his brother, who asked if his younger brother had accepted the marriage for his sake. Dai Thoi Din said he heard that the old master's intention was for the marriage of Dai Quan Kin and Ha Gi Gi to be immediately announced in the daily news program, and asked his younger brother if he didn't really like Ha Gi Gi, and had built a mermaid pool for her in the house. Dai Quan Kin calmly replied that in-law relations between clans were just flowers embroidered on silk. Whether there was or not didn't matter. He said Dai Thoi Din's election was more important. Just as he was about to hang up, Dai Thoi Din asked his younger brother one more thing. So, did you fall in love at first sight with that Dai Tin Kuang? Remembering Dai Tin Kuang's words earlier that she wouldn't dream of touching him, Quan Kin said how could he be interested in that kind of woman. The conversation ended, Dai Quan Kin sadly looked out the window watching the rain. His assistant now spoke up saying he felt this wasn't that simple. Because logically speaking, the marriage office's matchmaking was a perfect match. But he felt no matter how he looked at it, Dai Tin Kuang didn't match Dai Quan Kin. Strangely, after hearing this comment, there was a hint of anger in Quan Kin's eyes. How was she not a match? The other assistant replied except for versatility and beauty, she had nothing else. And most importantly, she had been in love but dumped by her boyfriend. An ordinary college girl, nothing noteworthy, yet was matched with Dai Quan Kin. He was still chattering when the assistant stopped talking because he heard the car door open. He panicked and asked Dai Quan Kin why he was getting out of the car. He just coldly straightened his clothes, answering with three short words, going to receive her. Outside it was pouring rain now. Dai Tin Kuang had just stepped out of her college dorm. She looked worriedly up at the sky. The rainwater was now pouring heavily onto the road, splashing everywhere, frightening Dai Tin Kuang and making her retreat. Earlier because she was worried Dai Quan Kin would have to wait too long she had only changed her clothes and forgot to change shoes. She couldn't touch the water or her legs would turn back into a fishtail. At this moment Tin Kuang suddenly heard someone calling her name. She looked up, in front of her was a young man holding an umbrella coming toward her. It was T. Don then, Dai Tin Kuang wondered why he was here. T. Don then was Dai Tin Kuang's ex-boyfriend. He had just arrived and was yelling. Asking Dai Tin Kuang if she was the one who went on the school forum to call a girl named An An a mistress, right? Hearing these words, Dai Tin Kuang was completely confused, not understanding what he was barking about. He still remembered that after breaking up with her boyfriend, that woman named An An had come to say she wanted to marry him. That's why he dumped Dai Tin Kuang. Now he told her that breaking up with her right before graduation was his mistake. She could scold him however she wanted but that girl was innocent. That jerk even said that the girl named An An was so pitiful that he couldn't just stand by and watch her die. Dai Tin Kuang wondered if she wasn't pitiful too, while denying that she had done anything like that. T. Don then didn't believe her, he pointed at Dai Tin Kuang's face interrogating her, asking why she dared do it but didn't dare admit it, and said he really regretted, that back then he was blind so pursued her. Tin Kuang sadly asked if when they were dating, she had ever wronged him in any way. This T. Don then said the reason for the breakup was because Dai Tin Kuang was too weak, not suitable to be his wife. For example, Every time it rained like this, she couldn't go outside by herself. If he didn't give her a piggyback ride she would just stay holed up in her room. Tin Kuang was extremely angry and resentful. She said she wasn't that kind of person. At this T. Don then became even more provoked, 
challenging her to now try stepping off the porch and come closer. He told her to walk around campus with him, convince him that she was more afraid of losing him than getting her shoes wet. Tin Kuang lowered her head awkwardly, she couldn't do this at all. Seeing this, T Doan then just laughed contemptuously saying turns out in her heart he was only worth this much. Then he turned and walked away, telling Dai Tin Kuang not to bully An An just because he deceived her. The rain poured down violently again. Dai Tin Kuang felt helpless and hurt, her tears falling down, wetting her cheeks. Just then Dai Quan Kin arrived. As he passed T Doan Nan, he didn't forget to give him an icy cold glare. At this T Doan then stopped. He secretly glanced at Dai Quan Kin, not understanding why his friend felt like he was being stared at. He could tell with one look this guy was no good. It was still better to leave quickly in that heavy rain and cold. Dai Quan Kin appeared like a ray of sunshine breaking through pulling Dai Tin Kuang out of the darkness. He stood before her saying don't cry anymore. Dai Tin Kuang looked up, extremely surprised, to the point she couldn't get any words out, until he grabbed her hand. Tin Kuang panicked asking what he was doing, while she struggled demanding he let her go. Dai Quan Kin said in a loud voice, didn't your ex-boyfriend say you were weak, that when it rained someone had to give you a piggyback ride to go outside, just like that, Dai Quan Kin bent down to give her a piggyback ride. He coldly told her to sit still on his back and wipe away her tears. Because each tear of hers now was evidence proving she had deceived in this marriage. Be careful or he would sue her and put her in jail. Hearing this, Tin Kuang struggled violently demanding he put her down. She said she didn't need him to carry her, when he asked if she was sure. Tin Kuang stubbornly replied of course. In her mind she also expected that Dai Quan Kin would definitely let her go. But unexpectedly on the contrary he held her even tighter. He said the state wanted him to give her a piggyback ride. She couldn't refuse even if she wanted to. Dai Quan Kin also didn't forget to remind the girl on his back not to fidget. Or she would get wet from the rain. His actions from earlier had made her extremely confused. She wondered to herself could it be he was caring about her? Secretly glancing at him. Dai Tin Kuang felt from this angle he was quite handsome. Just his personality was a bit annoying. After that she hesitantly said to Dai Quan Kin that she wanted to ask a question. She asked didn't he previously want her to voluntarily withdraw from the marriage. By the change of heart, Dai Quan Kin replied it was because his older brother was running in the presidential election. He couldn't let the opponent catch him in a scandal. After hearing the reason, Dai Tin Kuang blurted out. Oh I see. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin smirked and asked her. Did she think he fell in love with her at first sight? At this point, Dai Tin Kuang really wanted to take back her earlier compliment. She vaguely asked him about their future. Dai Quan Kin didn't let her finish her sentence, hurriedly telling her to rest assured. He said after a year he would apply for annulment. She wouldn't face any punishment, not forgetting to coldly add, saying then he would pay the fine while she could get lost. These words left Dai Tin Kuang shocked into silence. In fact deep down she was very excited, because after a year Dai Quan Kin would voluntarily annul the marriage. After a year she wouldn't have to pay a fine either. At the same time she also felt she shouldn't appear too excited in case he went back on his word. After that she said firmly, assuring Dai Quan Kin that when the deadline came she would immediately leave, absolutely not bothering him at all. Dai Quan Kin didn't reply. He clearly saw her happiness after hearing she could leave him after a year. He felt she really hadn't changed. No matter how it was redone she still only wanted to escape from him quickly. At this time Dai Tin Kuang was still excitedly saying if he needed her to do anything just speak up. Dai Quan Kin replied coldly, telling her to stay far away from him. The further the better, don't affect his life again. The private helicopter took off. A new headline appeared in the news. The top bachelor has lost his spot. The mysterious central island welcomes another stranger. This was the central island of country A. As Dai Tin Kuang and Dai Quan Kin entered, countless servants and subordinates bowed solemnly in greeting. Dai Tin Kuang was astonished. She didn't expect the mystery of the central island was actually the Dai family manor. But this was the center of power of country A. And this scene was also too ostentatious. As soon as Dai Quan Kin arrived home, he coldly told Dai Tin Kuang that she would live here from now on. Then briskly strode away saying he had things to do. Dai Tin Kuang panicked telling Quan Kin to stay and introduce a little more but he had already left. At this time the housekeeper of the Dai family manor proactively said to allow him to introduce to her. The housekeeper said now Dai Tin Kuang was the spouse of the Kin family. In theory she could also freely move around the manor. Except for the mermaid pool. He said that was personally designed by Quan Kin for Miss Gi Gi, telling her it was best not to casually interfere with it. Tin Kuang also had to reluctantly agree. 
Besides, the Dai family manor had strict security, with people on duty 24-7. The housekeeper said if she needed anything she could call for people anytime, then he took his leave. Looking at the scene, both unfamiliar and dazzling, Dai Tin Kuang wondered if this was what they meant by marrying into high society was like sailing into deep waters. Very quickly, half a month had passed. That night Tin Kuang came home dejected. She was in a bad mood. It was another day she couldn't find a job. Exhausted, she threw herself onto the huge bed. She didn't understand why when she had clearly scored high on the written interview test for Coco TV. The result was still having it snatched away by someone else. But the hiring list had that Luke Ann An's name on it. Today after knowing the results, Dai Tin Kuang had also angrily questioned that company why Luke An An's scores were all lower than hers. Based on what did they choose her instead of Tin Kuang. But the people at the station just told her not to bother explaining further. They didn't want to explain anything more. Now lying in bed, Dai Tin Kuang could only curse that wretched Luke An An in her heart. Knowing only how to rely on damned connections, she wondered if she should also find some connections to get in. But she also didn't know where to go to find connections. Looking at the phone next to her, Dai Tin Kuang remembered someone. She picked up the phone, extremely excited. She also didn't expect she finally had her own solution. She wanted to ask Han Tan back for help. He was the big brother of the media village. She had sold him the regret potion. He had said his fate had changed a lot since then. In the future if she needed help, even if it meant jumping into boiling water or flames, he would be willing to help her wholeheartedly. So Dai Tin Kuang texted him, asking Han Tan back to write a letter to Coco TV station, recommending her for a job. After sending the text, Dai Tin Kuang put down her phone. She had done all she could. Next she could only wait for news. She didn't want to think anymore. Exhausted after a whole day, she only wanted to take a bath. Then rushed outside. Half an hour later, after bathing, Dai Tin Kuang indeed felt much more comfortable. It's just that she felt very itchy. Looking down, her legs had broken out in measles. She knew that since coming here and suppressing her mermaid tail these two weeks, so she had to quickly find a place with lots of water to swim comfortably. Otherwise the measles would get worse. She suddenly remembered the mermaid pool, but remembering the housekeeper's words, remembering the words of her parents in the Ha family cursing her as an ugly mermaid who should die quickly, and Gi Gi who took her bone marrow. Dai Tin Kuang felt very hesitant. She felt she shouldn't touch Miss Gi Gi's things. She lay in bed forcing herself to be patient, but finally her legs were too itchy. She couldn't stand it anymore. She didn't care anymore and got up. In the middle of the night Dai Tin Kuang went to the mermaid pool. Her first feeling was still extremely amazed by its magnificence. She furtively looked around to see if anyone was there then turned on the lights. The entire space was bathed in a gentle blue light and was perfectly still now. Dai Tin Tin Kwa now noticed there seemed to be an extremely beautiful mermaid statue made of glass on the roof. She saw that Dai Quan Kin had really spent this much care for Ha Gi Gi Sake. It seemed he really liked her a lot. After feeling safe, Tin Kuang immediately jumped into the water. Her beautiful mermaid tail also appeared, immersing herself in the crystal clear water. Only now did Dai Tin Kuang truly feel like her real self again, no longer having to endure the discomfort of suppressing her mermaid tail. She comfortably lay on the water's surface, and looked up admiring the beautiful mermaid statue at the top of the pool. She was still convinced that Dai Quan Kin must really like Ha Gi Gi a lot to have spent so much effort. At this moment, there was suddenly the sound of the door unlocking outside, and and someone talking on the phone. Discovering someone was there, Dai Tin Kuang immediately dove under the water to hide. But it was too late because that person had seen her mermaid tail. A look of clear astonishment on their face. This was Duong Chao, the adopted daughter of the Dai family, who always considered herself a boy. Seeing the mermaid she exclaimed in surprise. Then she immediately said on the phone to KY2 that she had just seen a mermaid more beautiful than Ha Gi Gi. She had fallen in love. KY2 wearily said Duong Chao should wake up, reminding her she was a girl. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin also appeared now, asking Duong Chao what she was doing here. As soon as Duong Chao turned around and saw it was Dai Quan Kin she panicked tremendously. She could only stammer that she had just drank some alcohol. She had come over here to walk a bit. Seeing this, Quan Kin coldly told her to hurry back to bed. But at this moment Duong Chao pointed toward the pool in front saying in surprise that just now she had seen the pool had a mermaid even more beautiful than Ha Gi Gi. Dai Quan Kin said she had drank a little too much but Duong Chao insisted she was still very sober and handsome. She enthusiastically invited Dai Quan Kin to go with her to look, guaranteeing they would see it. Quan Kin walked closer to the pool, asking what if they didn't see anything. Duong Chao still stubbornly insisted she had seen it clearly with her own eyes. Dai Quan Kin sat by the pool, looking at the water so clear you could see the bottom. 
He slightly smiled then told Duong Chao to take a look herself. Where was this mermaid? Duong Chao was confused, wondering if it had been an illusion earlier. Seeing Duong Chao still stubbornly wanting to stay here and find the mermaid, Huan Kin urged her to sober up then hurry home. Behind that wall, the mermaid had gotten out of the water, hiding there in the appearance of an ordinary Dai Tin Kuang. Dai Quan Kin now had no choice but to be stern, telling Duong Chao not to cause more trouble. Finally Duong Chao also had to reluctantly leave. At this time only Dai Quan Kin saw. At the back door there was a figure hastily leaving silently, restoring stillness to the pool. Stepping out from there, Dai Tin Kuang let out a sigh of relief feeling it had been really dangerous. Luckily her legs were no longer itchy anymore. She had to hurry back to sleep. The next morning, Tin Kuang was still sleeping soundly when outside there was the sound of loud banging on the door. She had no choice but to tiredly get up, opening the door while wondering who was banging the door so early. Standing before her was none other than Dai Quan Kin, wearing only a thin bathrobe. Dai Tin Kuang's eyes widened, not expecting to get this kind of shock so early in the morning. Dai Quan Kin breezed past her coldly making Dai Tin Kuang flustered, asking why he had come into her room so early. Dai Quan Kin stood in front of the closet, asking Tin Kuang back if this was her room, then just changed his clothes in front of her, shocking Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang covered her face asking if he was crazy, barging into a girl's room and stripping, but looking up at the ceiling. Tin Kuang was stunned because this was exactly like the mermaid pool. This wasn't her room. After getting dressed, Dai Quan Kin told her this was his room, and asked if she had seen enough. Only now did Tin Kuang panic, only wishing a hole would open up in the ground for her to crawl into. She knew she had mistakenly slept in the wrong room. Hurrying back to her room, she buried her face in the pillow feeling extremely embarrassed and humiliated, but it seemed she could smell a special fragrance on the pillow. Tin Kuang now pictured in her mind Dai Quan Kin sleeping here last night. Dai Tin Kuang panicked, scolding herself for remembering him again, until 10 a. M. After getting dressed she decided to step out of the room, certain that by now Quan Kin had gone to work. She was starving and wanted to hurry to the dining room. Unexpectedly as soon as she stepped into the dining room, the first thing she heard was still Duong Chao's loud voice insisting to Dai Quan Kin that she had seen a mermaid last night. Duong Chao even said she had purposely circled the mermaid pool this morning to search and had discovered a mermaid scale. Dai Tin Kuang now felt extremely worried. No wonder her legs had suddenly turned a little red last night. Her mermaid scale had really fallen off. She felt she had to hide this very carefully, not letting anyone discover this was hers. Summoning all her courage, Tin Kuang pushed open the door and entered. Smiling very innocently as if nothing had happened, she greeted everyone. Unexpectedly the only response was prolonged silence. Tin Kuang was at a loss but still had to sit down across from Dai Quan Kin and ask if he wasn't going to work today. At this Duong Chao said to the boy next to her that so this was his brother Kin's wife. She looked decent but Duong Wang Chao still felt Tin Kuang wasn't a match for her brother Kin. Hearing this, Tin Kuang was annoyed, not expecting them to discuss it so loudly. KY2 was the adopted son of the Dai family, an extremely enthusiastic person, now pulled over the chair next to Dai Quan Kin inviting Tin Kuang to come sit there quickly because people from the marriage office would visit the house right now. Tin Kuang obediently went to sit, not forgetting to express surprise at the information she had just heard. KY2 told her that online there was heated discussion about their relationship, saying she couldn't obstruct brother Kin. Dai Tin Kuang also knew the results of this home visit would likely affect the percentage of support for Dai Thoi Din. She had to perform very well, but remembering Dai Quan Kin's words from yesterday telling her to stay away from him, Tin Kuang didn't know what to do. She only dared to think it but not say it aloud. In the end, just who was obstructing who? Half an hour later, people from the marriage office really arrived. They sat across from Dai Quan Kin and Dai Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang could only awkwardly smile. Next to her was Quan Kin with a face cold as ice. The people from the marriage office now said they didn't need to be nervous, just saying they had only come to investigate a little about the couple's daily life after living together. Tin Kuang felt she couldn't rely on the cold-faced guy sitting next to her. She had to take initiative and come up with a plan herself. Finally she had an idea. After that Tin Kuang exerted all her acting skills to feed Quan Kin a piece of cake, telling her dear to open his mouth. Seeing Quan Kin look at her with an expressionless face, Tin Kuang still had to force a smile gently urging him, dear, open your mouth, ah, 
as for Quan Kin, seeing her pitiful pleading expression, he also gently grabbed her wrist and opened his mouth to eat. The marriage office employee now judged that it seemed their married life was also very good. After that the female employee said next she would ask some questions about their daily life. Just answer truthfully. Dai Tin Kuang immediately replied yes. The first question was asking if she had gotten used to living here these past few days. Dai Tin Kuang started acting again, saying these past few days here she had gotten very used to it. The food was delicious, life was fun, and Dai Quan Kin took extremely good care of her. After that she turned again glancing at Quan Kin, silently begging this big brother to please react for her a little. At the more difficult question, the lady asked if recently they had contributed to increasing the population. Tin Kuang immediately clung to Quan Kin's arm affectionately saying of course they had, and that last night she had slept in his room. This lady even demanded Tin Kuang show proof. Not knowing what to say, Tin Kuang turned to Dai Quan Kin for help, asking if he could tell them this kind of thing. Who would have thought Dai Quan Kin just told her to act natural? On that side the marriage office people kept pressuring her, saying they were just following protocol so had to ask clearly not deliberately prying into private matters, and that it was the marriage office's regulation telling the two to please provide some evidence for them to make a good report when they got back. This vicious Quan Kin also just wanted to see how Tin Kuang would respond. Tin Kuang went along with it to the end. She said there was, even excitedly putting her foot on the table saying wasn't evidence what they wanted, she asked if the hickeys on her heels counted. This information really made the people there look at Dai Quan Kin differently, not understanding what strange hobby this was. Even Dai Quan Kin himself had to frustratedly ask Tin Kuang if he was the one who left the hickey. Tin Kuang didn't care, still stubbornly insisting to the marriage office that he was the one who left that hickey on her yesterday. After that the marriage office turned to Dai Quan Kin, saying to prove what Dai Tin Kuang said was true. He just had to answer them one thing. The female officer pushed up her glasses, asking Quan Kin to describe the longtime scar on Tin Kuang's back. Unexpectedly, Quan Kin very calmly said it was three inches to the left of her spine. While Tin Kuang was still wondering astonished how he knew that, Quan Kin had already pulled her close. He embraced her confidently asking the others if they had any more questions. Of course by now the marriage office was very satisfied and took their leave. After they had all left, Tin Kuang also wanted to slip away quickly, but Quan Kin caught her, making her explain about the red marks on her heels. Tin Kuang uncomfortably backed away. She said she was out of options, if she didn't know where to get proof from. What's more, now Tin Kuang blamed Duong Chao and KY2 for not helping her. At this time Quan Kin lazily spoke up from behind that Tin Kuang could also say she didn't have proof. Hearing this, Tin Kuang was startled and turned around. KY2 also smiled explaining, although the rules required providing evidence, but if they really didn't have any, then there was nothing they could do to her. At most they would just verbally warn her. Only now did Tin Kuang angrily blame Quan Kin, reproaching him for not telling her earlier. Quan Kin coldly replied who told her to speak so fast. At this time, Tin Kuang suddenly remembered something. She interrogated Quan Kin on how he knew about the scar three inches to the left of her spine. Quan Kin was briefly silent, then very naturally replied he had investigated it before. Tin Kuang could only scold him for invading her privacy like that, then turned her back sighing as she looked at her phone, blurting out that only work was reliable. But the problem was Han Tan back still hadn't replied to her message. KY2 enthusiastically jumped in now, asking little Tin Kuang what kind of job she wanted. He would help. Tin Kuang's wish was to find a company with high pay, good benefits. Behind her, Quan Kin just humped, saying she had just graduated yet already wanted these things. Having her itch spot scratched, Tin Kuang flared up, saying she had almost been hired by Coco TV, still resentfully recounting her excellent interview results. But the spot had been snatched away by someone with connections. Only now did KY2 privately think this girl probably didn't know Coco belonged to him, while the little girl was chattering away. Behind KY2 came a cold wind. It was Quan Kin calling his name, telling him to go outside. The two men then stepped outside. At this time, Quan Kin told KY2 to quickly investigate which companies she was applying to and swiftly arrange it very well. KY2 also assured Quan Kin that Tin Kuang would be hired quickly. Quan Kin's one requirement was not to tell her that he had arranged it, and asked for the reason. Quan Kin just said it was because he didn't want Tin Kuang to like him. Early next morning, Tin Kuang had smoothly started working at the TV station. A new beginning, a new company, she encouraged herself to try her best. Stepping inside, 
She very obediently bowed her head greeting and introducing herself to everyone. The seniors also welcomed her very warmly. Holding the documents, Tin Kuang looked around for her seat. After a while she finally found it. It's just that Luke Ann Ann, the new girlfriend of the old girlfriend's ex, was sitting right next to her. And even raised her hand waving at Tin Kuang. And of course this meeting didn't make either of the two girls happy. Both their faces were stiff and they had the same question in mind. Why did it have to be her? In the end the bitter enemies on the same narrow lane reluctantly sat down next to each other as benevolent colleagues. Luke and Anne started probing, asking if that day when she and Don then had gotten their diplomas, Tin Kuang went to film the marriage show, saying poor Tin Kuang didn't get to witness the scene of Doan then putting the ring on her, seeing she was speaking without any listeners. Luke and Anne annoyedly shouted asking Tin Kuang if she was listening. Tin Kuang absent-mindedly apologized politely, saying to let her tend to her wounds first. Tin Kuang peeled off a band-aid, sticking it on her heel where the mermaid scale had peeled off last night. At this time someone in the company suddenly shouted that on Weibo someone said the girl newly married to Dai Quan Kin suffered domestic violence. Online was a photo of Tin Kuang heel. This picture had been posted then deleted by the marriage office. So a lot of people had spread rumors that the girl suffered domestic violence. Even more unexpected was how quickly the online community ate up those rumors. After reading it Tin Kuang broke out in a cold sweat. She was flustered not knowing what to do in this situation. So Tin Kuang had to quickly lower her foot. This action didn't escape the eagle eyes of Luke and Anne. The editor-in-chief looked at the information on Weibo. Not accepting that just one photo could confirm Dai Quan Kin had committed domestic violence. Although their company had to publish news quickly they still couldn't post these kinds of sloppy, false articles just to get views. But the problem was the girl's identity was kept very hidden. No media could interview her to clarify the situation. Moreover, according to the marriage office's regulations, the station also didn't have the right to investigate internal news from that side. Should they have to rely on the state of that heel wound to investigate person by person? Hearing about the heel wound, Luke and Anne had smelled something fishy. At the same time, Tin Kuang had to secretly hide her foot. She was afraid Dai Quan Kin was so strict. He certainly wouldn't want others to know she had a wound. Otherwise she was afraid her life from now on wouldn't have a moment's peace. Tin Kuang knew domestic violence not only affected a person's life, but their reputation as well. She was afraid Dai Quan Kin would kill her. Seeing the situation was unstable, Tin Kuang decided to escape before anyone discovered her. Luke and Anne wouldn't let such a good opportunity slip through her fingers. She feigned surprise asking why Tin Kuang's heel was injured. Moreover saying heel injuries weren't very common, and that she remembered the day Tin Kuang filmed her episode coincided with the day Dai Quan Kin filmed his. Luke and Anne directly stated her suspicion, that Tin Kuang was the girl who suffered domestic violence. The people at the company who had wanted to find that girl to interview her for clarification, now see Seeing such a suspect, all crowded around to ask Tin Kuang if what Luke and Anne said was true. Even demanding Tin Kuang show them the heel wound, Tin Kuang was backed into a corner, stammering not knowing what to say. At this moment a phone ringing could be heard. She grabbed it like a lifeline and quickly ran off saying she had to answer the call first. Luke and Anne was more smug than ever now. To her the evidence was crystal clear. She just wanted to see how Tin Kuang would lie her way out of this. Looking at the phone screen, knowing the caller was Fu Ta. Tin Kuang hesitated thinking this was Dai Quan Kin telling him to come resolve the nuisance. As soon as she picked up, Fu Ta eagerly informed Tin Kuang that he had registered a Weibo account for her, even a VIP member, telling her to hurry and log in to clarify everything. Fu Ta wanted Tin Kuang herself to use that Weibo account to refute the rumors. If it wasn't clarified in time it would not only affect Dai Quan Kin's image but the presidential election as well. Fu Ta also said from now on Tin Kuang should frequently mention Dai Quan Kin on her wall. After hearing this Tin Kuang was only confused about one thing. Not knowing if Fu Ta had asked Dai Quan Kin's opinion on what he just said. She knew writing a clarification was something that had to be done. But also wondered if obediently listening like this meant she was losing out a little. And outside. Luke and Anne had hypocritically told everyone that Dai Tin Kuang must be too scared so she volunteered she would go advise Tin Kuang to show her their goodwill. After hearing Luke and Anne's words, Tin Kuang knew what to do, after posting. Tin Kuang told herself she would now go deal with that petty Lu An Since she did it herself she would bear it herself, 
having made up her mind Tin Kuang immediately got to work, making a lot of noise to draw attention then crying as she admitted she was the abused girl. This action made the whole company's eyes pop out. Tin Kuang still sobbed saying she shouldn't have exposed her wound but truly couldn't stand it anymore, and that earlier it was Quan Kin who called yelling at her for ruining his reputation. Her pitiful, aggrieved manner confused everyone, they gathered around asking concernedly. Everyone was half believing, half doubting. Luke and Anne also came over compassionately comforting Tin Kuang to stop crying. But deep down she was very smug seeing Tin Kuang married into a prestigious family yet met a violent, hot-tempered husband with great martial arts. In the end only getting an empty reputation. While she was feeling smug, someone held up their phone saying the girl named Little Mermaid had just posted clarifying everything. Luke and Anne shouted in astonishment. It was the account called Little Mermaid confirming the wound was a love bite, and scolded the dirty, sensational media, distorting the truth. Luke and Anne still couldn't believe the truth before her eyes. She turned her head back looking at Tin Kuang, still remembering vividly Tin Kuang sobbing earlier. She had just now caught on, asking if that was the real Little Mermaid then who was Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang had just been waiting for this to smile in her face, saying of course she wasn't Little Mermaid. Now Tin Kuang started teaching Luke and Anne how to work properly, saying next time she had to verify the correct target before speaking, and didn't forget to tell the supervisor that their media company could didn't just momentarily want to sensationally dazzle everyone and forget their original mission was to protect the truth. The supervisor of course saw Tin Kuang's point so turned to remind Luke An An to be more careful in her work attitude. Tin Kuang gleefully interrupted Luke An An's rebuttal to tell the supervisor that Lu An An had only been thinking of the company's benefit. Clumsy with good intentions, she even generously said she didn't blame Luke An An anymore. Because of this Luke An An had to grit her teeth apologizing to Tin Kuang, admitting she hadn't thought carefully enough, while Tin Kuang on the other hand was extremely delighted to have smoothly resolved this matter. At this time Tin Kuang's phone also rang with a notification. Tin Kuang's expression after looking at her phone was extremely surprised, because Dai Thoi Din had shared her post, with the caption sister-in-law, don't be mad, seeing his brother Dai Quan Kin's presidential candidate's post, her idol, sharing this post, to Tin Kuang this was an unexpected joy. Meanwhile, seeing Dai Thoi Din share the post on Weibo, Fu Ta felt this was really bad. He was still secretly acting since everything was still without Dai Quan Kin's permission. When Quan Kin suddenly came over asking what Fu Ta was doing, he was so frightened he jumped. Quan Kin very quickly took the phone from Fu Ta's hand. He read every word of Little Mermaid's post, including her statement that he was so fond of her slender, beautiful feet. Quan Kin wasn't angry at all. He kept carefully rereading that part. Then suddenly a line of thought rushed into his head. At Tin Kuang, she had asserted that even if all the men in the world died she still wouldn't like him. Quan Kin remembered. Then he wondered, why after saying she didn't like him was she provoking him like this now? From Fu Ta's viewpoint right now, Quan Kin was emitting thick killing intent. Fu Ta could only carefully admit wrongdoing, defending himself that he was just worried the hot search would affect the votes so took it upon himself to register the Weibo account. Even more unexpected was Dai Quan Kin because of those past memories, shoved the phone back into Fu Ta's hand. He coldly told him to inform the housekeeper that from now on he didn't want to see Dai Tin Kuang anymore. In fact, it was because he didn't want to let her freely play with his heart anymore. That night, after getting off work, as soon as Tin Kuang got home she heard she was being forced to move out and was extremely angry. The housekeeper explained she just wouldn't live in the main house anymore. Tin Kuang refused. She knew this was Dai Quan Kin's intention. She demanded to see him but the housekeeper said her words online today had angered Dai Quan Kin, and told her it was best to obediently listen otherwise she wouldn't be able to bear the consequences. Tin Kuang had no choice but to resign herself. After packing up her things she dragged her suitcase and left. Dai Quan Kin also had happened to just get home then. Tin Kuang angrily interrogated him. The marriage pact clearly stated she had the right to live here one year, saying he didn't have the right to kick her out, but he just coldly brushed past her, ignoring everything she said. Just after stepping into the hall, Quan Kin collapsed to his knees. He painfully clutched at his heart. In his head he silently thought as expected it was today. He had anticipated everything. As for Tin Kuang, she was now comfortably residing in another villa of the Dai family, her mouth still resentfully scolding Dai Quan Kin for his erratic, 
hard-to-please moods. Saying goodbye to the grievous real life, Tin Kuang decided to go on Weibo to find some joy. Reading the admiring comments of netizens, Tin Kuang felt they really were all of one mind. Writing more intimately would better prove her relationship with Dai Quan Kin, but thinking of his irritable attitude, Tin Kuang suddenly wondered if he thought that her posting these things on Weibo would later affect him being with Han Nian Nian. Tin Kuang felt uneasy. She had to go explain clearly, avoiding that petty guy taking revenge on her. Thinking it, doing it, Tin Kuang groped her way to the main house in the dead of night, but peeking into Dai Quan Kin's room she didn't see him there at all. Hearing noises from the next room, Tin Kuang paid attention approaching. She pushed open the door and indeed saw Dai Quan Kin inside. It's just he didn't look very comfortable. Tin Kuang worriedly rushed over asking if he was okay, saying he seemed really unwell. Unexpectedly she was firmly pushed away by Quan Kin, not letting her touch him. He gritted out in pain. Who let you in here? Right now Tin Kuang only cared about Quan Kin's condition, asking why he looked so pale. Quan Kin still kept chasing her out, saying he didn't want to see Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang refused to agree, arguing she had the right to care about her marriage partner. Before she could finish speaking Quan Kin grabbed the glass of water next to him, throwing it past her shoulder as if in warning, pushing his chasing her out to the limit. The glass shattered, he shouted furiously, repeating his demand. I told you to get lost. Tin Kuang turned around. She said she just wanted to help him. If he wasn't grateful then fine but throwing the glass at her. He was really going too far. Quan Kin squeezed his eyes shut as if to calm down. He enunciated each word. Not very civilized either, I'm saying it again. Get lost. Tin Kuang finally left. Quan Kin watched her retreating back. He clutched his head in pain again. He wanted her to leave him, the further the better. That was why he had been so adamant in chasing her out. He thought perhaps he had lost her again. Unexpectedly, now a warm glass of water was held out before him. Dai Quan Kin looked up apologetically. Unexpectedly it was that stubborn Dai Tin Kuang standing there. She said it wouldn't be so easy for him to chase her away. If he was uncomfortable then don't get forceful. Dai Quan Kin also seemed unable able to resist anymore. He was influenced by the care from the girl before him. Accepting the water, Quan Kin uttered a thank you. But before he could drink a sip, that pain came again. He painfully clutched at his heart. His throat also let out agonized sounds. Tin Kuang knew it seemed he really wasn't okay. She asked if he needed her to call a doctor. Before she could react, Quan Kin had suddenly dragged Tin Kuang away. He threw her outside then slammed the door shut, locking himself inside. No matter how Tin Kuang pounded on the door and called, he didn't respond. Dai Quan Kin leaned against that door. He had to restrain himself. Enduring the pain alone, Little Mermaid, he couldn't hurt her again. Tin Kuang didn't give up, she ran to the main house, frantically telling the housekeeper about Dai Quan Kin's unstable condition, telling him to quickly go check, but the housekeeper's attitude seemed indifferent. Tin Kuang then said specifically that Quan Kin kept shaking. His complexion was also very bad. Unexpectedly the housekeeper said Quan Kin had drunk a lot so was like that, and said after a good sleep he'd be fine, telling her not to worry. Tin Kuang thought he must think she was blind. She knew clearly this guy was bullsh asterisk asterisk asteriskang. She also knew Dai Quan Kin having such a severe attack certainly wasn't pretending. She couldn't not worry. Tin Kuang ran close to the housekeeper, saying if he didn't believe her then he could send people with her to go see. Tin Kuang said a group of servants should come with her. They fearfully refused. She asked another group. They stubbornly wouldn't follow. The housekeeper could only threaten all day, saying Dai Quan Kin had a recurring illness, and that if anyone meddled then Quan Kin would immediately deal with them, warning Tin Kuang not to act rashly or no one could help her. She didn't care just asking one last time if they wouldn't help bring Dai Quan Kin to the hospital. Seeing the answer was an uncomfortable silence. Tin Kuang angrily clenched her fists. She decided to take care of it herself. Tin Kuang raced desperately to Quan Kin's room. In her heart she hoped he would definitely endure. The door opened. Tin Kuang saw him sitting with his head slumped in the chair, and even had chains bound around his body. The girl was stunned wondering if he was cosplaying. Tin Kuang walked closer to him, about to call him awake but changed her mind. She felt she should find the keys first then decide. She rummaged at the bookshelf, opening a box she found suspicious. Behind her, Quan Kin blearily opened his eyes, looking towards Dai Tin Kuang. He felt extremely surprised, it seemed his illness wasn't minor. He was even hallucinating now. Tin Kuang was very happy finding the keys. Seeing Quan Kin awake she was startled into speaking. Hearing that voice, he knew he wasn't hallucinating. Tin Kuang came closer, asking if this was the key to the chains. Quan Kin replied no, 
Hearing this Tin Kuang was even more certain it was. Seeing her so stubborn, Quan Kin angrily said he warned her not to touch him, otherwise the consequences would be unbearable. Tin Kuang still ambled around then said she was kindhearted, unable to watch someone die before her eyes without helping, and so ignoring Dai Quan Kin's shouts of refusal and warnings, Tin Kuang was still determined to unlock them. When the chains were opened, Dai Quan Kin collapsed, clutching his heart as if in suffocating pain. Tin Kuang reached out wanting to touch him, but he shouted preventing her. She gently asked what was wrong with him. Before she could finish speaking, Dai Quan Kin had pinned her to the floor, his hands pressed tightly on her wrists, his mouth also opened, sharp fangs nearly touching Tin Kuang's neck. Tin Kuang now panicked, struggling and demanding he let her go. Quan Kin lowered his voice saying he was very uncomfortable. Tin Kuang didn't know what to do, she could only stare at him round-eyed. Dai Quan Kin's eyes glowed red, his fangs grew even longer, his breathing hurried as he tried again to bite her neck, but just a little more, and he had stopped himself in time his body also gradually calmed. Tin Kuang was still confused. She called his name but Quan Kin told her not to say anything, gently asking her to please help him. Tin Kuang frowned feeling his weight pressing down on her. She couldn't stand it anymore and struggled to get up, hesitantly asking if Dai Quan Kin could stand up first. Dai Quan Kin now seemed unable to notice her words. He was only attracted by the hot blood flowing in the vein under Tin Kuang's neck. Dai Quan Kin wanted it. He held her hand tightly, embracing Tin Kuang. In this moment, Dai Quan Kin's mind only knew the craving for fresh blood. Tin Kuang writhed in panic. Finally she shouted loudly Dai Quan Kin, you're hurting me. This shout made the desire in Dai Quan Kin's pupils vanish. He was like someone abruptly awakened from a dream, hurriedly apologizing to Tin Kuang, and even promised not to harm her. Tin Kuang placed her small hand on his face. She could only sigh, in the end still couldn't bear to see him so uncomfortable. With her gentleness, Tin Kuang embraced the man before her, soothing him to sleep soon. Dai Quan Kin closed his eyes. His mood was better now, it's just he still didn't expect that girl would also voluntarily hold him in her arms. That was really good. Early next morning, the dawn sunlight shone into the large room. Tin Kuang opened her eyes. She didn't know when she had fallen asleep on the floor. The scene before her made the young girl's heart flutter. Dai Quan Kin was still sleeping soundly, his arms still around her in an embrace. Looking at the morning rays shine on the brown hair and angular face of the man, Tin Kuang didn't expect he could look so gentle when asleep. This was a rare sight. Of course Tin Kuang had to seize this moment. It couldn't be missed. She got up, determined to take a selfie. Looking at the rare photo in hand, Tin Kuang was more excited than ever. This was precious material for her to post on the Little Mermaid account and dazzle everyone. Immediately the comment section was extremely lively. Everyone was envious of Little Mermaid, and also felt that after getting married, Dai Quan Kin had indeed become much gentler. Tin Kuang took this as joyous revenge, blurting that it served Dai Quan Kin right for daring to kick her out yesterday, and even biting her too. Who would have thought at this moment Quan Kin had just woken up and heard Tin Kuang say he bit her, sternly asking her to repeat it. Little Tin Kuang was frightened, immediately hiding her phone behind her back, while denying she was just muttering nonsense. After hearing this Dai Quan Kin breathed a sigh of relief feeling very fortunate, but he had worried to the point of blowing up, lecturing Tin Kuang, saying she absolutely must not bring this up as a joke in the future. At this time Fu Ta also came in. Seeing the two of them together he was rather surprised. Seeing Fu Ta, Tin Kuang eagerly told him that last night Dai Quan Kin was ill. Hearing this, Fu Ta also panicked and ran over asking about his boss's condition. Dai Quan Kin only coldly replied he was fine, and reminded Fu Ta to keep quiet. Now Fu Ta whispered in Quan Kin's ear asking why Dai Tin Kuang knew about his illness. Hadn't anyone told her not to go near him? As for Tin Kuang, she now knew to seize the moment, taking the chance when no one was looking to slip away. But after just a few steps her little plan was discovered. Tin Kuang was caught. Quan Kin demanded she quickly tell him, who let her go to the main house last night. Facing this situation Tin Kuang could only shriek in protest, saying she went there herself, was that not allowed? And said last night he was sick yet no one bothered caring. Was it wrong for her to help him? Tin Kuang couldn't help scolding him as an ungrateful wretch then turned to leave. Dai Quan Kin watched her, she didn't know how dangerous approaching him last night was. He silently hoped she would keep some distance from him, that would be safer. Dai Quan Kin decided to order Fu Ta to check the security cameras, telling him to fire all the people who met Dai Tin Kuang last night but didn't stop her from coming here. That night, in front of the Dai family's mansion there were many people. 
Tin Kuang held a mic in hand, she could only sigh vexedly because just yesterday she had an argument with Dai Quan Kin, now she had to go interview his brother, she worried something would go wrong. Dai Thoi Din now stepped out, surrounded by lights and countless mics pointed at him demanding an interview. Unexpectedly behind him was even Dai Quan Kin too. Tin Kuang was like she'd been struck by lightning on a clear day. Her three souls and nine spirits were like flying to the western paradise. She didn't expect Dai Quan Kin to actually come here too. The reporters now swarmed around the two brothers. Dai Quan Kin also didn't expect Dai Tin Kuang to actually come here to interview his brother. At this time a reporter turned to him asking why someone so against arranged marriage like Dai Quan Kin accepted the pact with Little Mermaid. Quan Kin calmly said if the country already saw them as a married couple then he had no reason to not accept it. The reporter now remembering Dai Quan Kin's firm refusal recalled him vehemently opposing this appointed partner. Seeing Dai Quan Kin seemed cooperative. The reporters shifted the focus of the interview entirely to Quan Kin and his marriage, asking why Little Mermaid had become the exception. Hearing this term exception, Quan Kin fell silent for a bit. He gestured towards Tin Kuang on the other side. Memories of the past came up, when they were little kids. Quan Kin gave Tin Kuang piggyback rides, though she told him to ignore her, to just live well his own life. Dai Quan Kin felt sad. He had listened and continued living, but in the end he still lost her. So how could he let go of Tin Kuang's hand once more now? Seeing his little brother dazing off, Dai Thoi Din smilingly assisted. Of course it's because his sister-in-law is too charming to him already right? Quan Kin, Tin Kuang, seeing Dai Thoi Din speaking up for her, Tin Kuang felt extremely excited and moved, continuously screaming inside that Dai Thoi Din really lived up to being her idol, able to speak well of a sister-in-law he'd never met before, looking again at the silent Dai Quan Kin over there. Tin Kuang felt displeased. How could he not say something nice about his own partner? The reporters followed up on Dai Thoi Din's response, asking Quan Kin if it was because living together with Little Mermaid for a while that feelings developed. Tin Kuang on the other side could only watch tearfully, praying that if Quan Kin couldn't say anything nice then at least don't embarrass her. Hearing the reporter's question, Quan Kin just adjusted his tie then declared that reporter was too tasteless. Tin Kuang froze. She didn't expect that after staying up all night nursing him when he was sick. This was how he repaid her. She felt he was really openly slapping Little Mermaid's face, who just yesterday was still showing off their intimacy to the whole world as her. On Monday at Coco TV station, the whole company was in an uproar because someone exposed Little Mermaid's photos as fake. The exposing post was by someone claiming to be a servant in the Dai family, saying this photo photo Little Mermaid took of Quan Kin drunk. That morning when Quan Kin woke up he was furious, scolding the servants for not watching Little Mermaid properly, letting her sneak into his room, resulting the whole group of servants being fired. The comments below immediately did an about face, condemning Little Mermaid as shameless and bogus, saying liars would be caught by magpies. But there were still people defending Little Mermaid, demanding the maid show proof she worked for the Dai family. Tin Kuang's face darkened, she had a bad premonition. Sure enough when she logged into Weibo, thousands were scolding her. She knew right away things would blow up like this. Now other than crying Tin Kuang was out of options. Before she was done with this disaster, another came. The editor-in-chief appeared with a chilling question, asking Tin Kuang if she was also at the interview site yesterday. Did Dai Quan Kin really have aversion towards Little Mermaid? Tin Kuang broke out in cold sweat. She could only smile wryly saying she couldn't tell either. The editor-in-chief wasn't satisfied ordering Tin Kuang to go interview Dai Quan Kin, to find out the truth behind the photo. Though Tin Kuang tried her best to refuse, the result was she had no choice. Her superiors insisted on sending her, and so Tin Kuang reluctantly got kicked downstairs to do the task. Out of options, she had to run to the Dai family's swimming pool. She had just arrived when security stopped her, saying only members could enter. Tin Kuang flashed her press pass, asking if as a journalist, she couldn't even enter to interview? The result was those guys still refused. Tin Kuang was dejected because not getting in meant several things. Yet the interview was also too dangerous. The question was shit-flavored curry or curry-flavored shit. Which would you choose? Still at a loss. Help came from behind her. Excuse me. My friend can't get in either? Seeing the granddaddy of the media circle, young master Han Cheng Bei standing before them, those security guys had to defer. They immediately bent over apologizing to the young master then welcomed them in. Seeing him, 
Tin Kuang was surprised, asking if he was the one who looked for her to buy medicine. Han Cheng Bei gestured for her to be quiet. Tin Kuang remembered in the past Han Cheng Bei was still lost, coming to find her to change his fate, and promised as long as she helped him become the Han family heir, he would give her half the fortune. Who would have thought now he had realized his wish of inheriting the Han family's media empire? Walking along, Tin Kuang curiously asked how he recognized her. Han Cheng Bei said he wasn't an idiot. When he asked for her help he had long investigated her identity already. Then asked Tin Kuang to say why she had come today. He definitely could lend a hand. Tin Kuang chuckled saying since he had gotten her into Coco already how could she dare ask more. Hearing this Han Cheng Bei was red faced saying that wasn't because of him. He said that he did see her message but afterwards something came up so he didn't make it in time. Tin Kuang felt it wasn't Han Cheng Bei helping and was extremely surprised. If it wasn't him then could it be Coco refused her then accepted her? Thinking so, she was even more determined to interview Dai Quan Kin no matter what, to prove her capabilities. Then she put on puppy dog eyes, explaining to young master Han that she had actually come today wanting to interview Dai Quan Kin, but he was a cold-blooded character, not just anyone could meet him. In her heart she especially feared Dai Quan Kin would strangle her to death for posting that photo without his permission. Han Chang Bei stroked his stylish hair, affirming it was just Dai Quan Kin so he was fully capable of helping. Then Chang Bei dragged Tin Kuang dashing inside, standing at the door of the very important people room. Han Chang Bei blithely opened the door saying he'd take her to find Dai Quan Kin. Han Chang Bei stood with arms spread like a god, loudly announcing to Dai Quan Kin that his person wanted to interview him, asking if he was free. Dai Quan Kin sprawled lazily like a big shot there. He wondered why Dai Tin Kuang was with Han Cheng Bei. Quan Kin frowned asking the key words. His person? Tin Kuang was also shocked hearing those words. As for that rascal Han Cheng Bei, he still confidently affirmed Tin Kuang was the one in his heart, and said second master Dai had to give him face. Tin Kuang did not fear a strong enemy, only a stupid teammate. She hated not being able to tell Han Cheng Bei, that now he was indirectly killing her. Hearing again that the one in Han Cheng Bei's heart was Dai Tin Kuang, Dai Quan Kin seemed about to explode, while the assistant beside him had sensed the heavy aura of death. Tin Kuang hurriedly pressed Han Cheng Bei's head down to make him quieter, at the same time giggling to affirm they didn't have any relationship. Han Cheng Bei now also silently cursed Tin Kuang as a fool. He thought if they didn't say they had a relationship then Dai Quan Kin definitely wouldn't give her face and let her interview. After that Tin Kuang continued clarifying that Coco TV station had sent her to interview today. Young Master Han was only helping her. She cried a little inside, wanting to tell Quan Kin that she wasn't cheating on him. But Quan Kin took these words as Tin Kuang speaking up for him. His face was even more scrunched up. Right now the assistant whispered to Quan Kin that sending Dai Tin Kuang to interview him was Ji Ji Xu's idea. Ji Ji Xu's intention was for Dai Quan Kin to vent his anger at Tin Kuang for her crime of taking photos without permission. While the assistant still didn't understand why Ji Ji Xu was suddenly causing trouble out of nowhere, Quan Kin had already agreed to Tin Kuang's interview request, just that he wanted a condition to go with it, which was Han Cheng Bei had to leave. Tin Kuang felt terrible. She knew even if Cheng Bei wasn't eloquent, she still wouldn't have gotten to meet Dai Quan Kin without him, so chasing him away like this wasn't good. But Cheng Bei didn't want Tin Kuang to feel awkward so he took the initiative to agree, saying as long as Dai Quan Kin agreed to the interview then he'd leave immediately. Tin Kuang was still marveling that Han Cheng Bei was a good person. She didn't expect that when he reached the door he still forced himself to act out the play, calling Tin Kuang darling, telling her after the interview to come watch him swim, saying he'd perform the best merman skills for Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang blanked, feeling the murderous aura envelop this place again. She could only smile foolishly telling Quan Kin the unrelated person had left already. They had to start the interview, but seeing Quan Kin still only focusing on those three words unrelated person, Tin Kuang had to swear she was faithful. She absolutely didn't violate anything the marriage pact stipulated. She absolutely wouldn't cheat on him during this time period. Seeing it still wasn't convincing enough. Tin Kuang placed her finger on Dai Quan Kin's lips and concluded that in terms of family status and looks, who could compare with him? Indeed very effective, that block of ice actually knew how to smile now. Tin Kuang was also stunned by that smile. Dai Quan Kin had to force himself to regain his cold pretty boy demeanor with some fake gestures, then told Tin Kuang to quickly take advantage of the time. 
Tin Kuang got to it. The first question was did he have anything to say about Little Mermaid's photos being spread wildly online? Yet Dai Quan Kin only granted Tin Kuang two words. Meaningless. Hearing only that, Tin Kuang wasn't satisfied, demanding he say more. But Quan Kin instead told her to give an example. Tin Kuang had no choice but to feed him more, telling him to talk about how online some said Little Mermaid was shamelessly bogus, unworthy of him, and that he had to strongly refute it for her to have results to report back. Dai Quan Kin set down his wine glass. He didn't expect there were still people saying Tin Kuang was bogus. He smirked replying, was he supposed to let a woman randomly take his photos? He affirmed that if the photos were posted online then it meant he had already agreed to them. As for being worthy or not, Quan Kin stated they were the best match the country had chosen, so no one would be more suitable for him than her. Still not enough. Quan Kin leaned in closer, looking into Tin Kuang's eyes and affirming he absolutely wouldn't change his heart for the girl he had chosen. Tin Kuang's face reddened, eyes opening wide in embarrassed shyness. She wondered if he was lying, but why did he look so serious? Tin Kuang clutched her chest, her heart pounded rapidly but remembering his past cold words. Tin Kuang still thought he was just appeasing the public. She didn't believe his true love was her. Seeing the girl dazing off, Dai Quan Kin had to call out. Only now did Tin Kuang jerk awake standing up, announcing the interview was over. Quan Kin still had that cold attitude, asking where she'd go after this. Tin Kuang replied she'd say bye to Han Chang Bei then head back to work. Dai Quan Kin's face was black as the bottom of a pot remembering Han Chang Bei's intimate words to Tin Kuang. He stood up, straightened his clothes saying he'd go over with her. Tin Kuang obediently agreed but truly still didn't understand what was happening. Guessing wildly, perhaps he wanted to go swimming? The swimming pool, Tin Kuang looked around but didn't see Han Chang Bei anywhere. That Dao Dao shortly after emerged from the water, stroking his stylish hair. He stepped up, walking towards Tin Kuang asking if the interview was over? Tin Kuang replied it was and didn't forget to praise Chang Bei's body was also a delicious meal. Chang Bei was also very confident, telling Tin Kuang to hurry and take out her phone to snap some shots of him. Tin Kuang held up her phone about to photograph Chang Bei, but she halted seeing behind him. The handsome Dai Quan Kin appeared, his body taut and so hot it evaporated all the water in the pool. Tin Kuang looked at his abs. Those long legs immediately attracted her gaze right onto him. Of course a series of shameless maneuvers followed. She snapped away continuously at Quan Kin, with Chang Bei ceaselessly posing in front of her. Tin Kuang used him as a screen to photograph Quan Kin. This scene made Quan Kin furious that Tin Kuang dared photograph another man right in front of him. When she heard him gritting his teeth calling her name, Tin Kuang pretended to chuckle asking why he came so fast, and said if nothing else she'd head back to work at the company. Who knew Quan Kin directly ordered her to delete all those photos? Tin Kuang tried to feign innocence and got glared at by him. He snapped, suggesting one more time, saying his patience had a limit. Don't make him repeat a third time, but thinking of those high-quality shots she just took. Tin Kuang couldn't bear it. Deleting them would tear her heart out. After that she still thought Quan Kin knew the one she photographed was him so she negotiated that she'd keep those photos. Not spread them outside, she only asked he not make her delete them. But Dai Quan Kin had been blinded by jealousy continuing to force her to quickly delete them, and even threatening in an intimidating tone that if she didn't delete them then the earlier interview would immediately be invalidated. He even crudely snatched the phone from Tin Kuang's hand. Tin Kuang was stunned. She truly believed the words he said earlier in the interview were just her delusions. Tin Kuang bowed her head, knitted brows and a pained expression. She wondered what exactly she had been hoping for. Tin Kuang took back her phone, protesting his behavior, saying they were just some photos. Did he need to threaten her to this extent? But Quan Kin still didn't concede, reminding Tin Kuang to remember her own status. While the situation was extremely tense, Sha Nian Nian stepped in, smiling radiantly as she greeted Quan Kin, saying she had come to find her brother but unexpectedly ran into him. Tin Kuang was still nauseated by her fake face. She had to be shocked when she discovered the one standing next to Sha Nian Nian was Sha Tai Da, Sha Nian Nian's brother. This was Tin Kuang's brother. She remembered when she was thrown into the sea with abusive words. At that time everyone in the Sha family scorned her. Only her brother truly loved Tin Kuang, saying no matter what she would always be the sister he cherished. He would always be by her side 
but unexpectedly after that her brother went abroad to study. She was thrown into the sea, she didn't know if he had looked for her, if he was sad hearing she had gone missing. Now Sha Tai Da expressed he wanted Quan Kin to introduce Tin Kuang to him. Tin Kuang took the initiative introducing herself as a reporter for Coco, who had come today to interview Dai Quan Kin. When she introduced herself, Tin Kuang only hoped her brother could recognize her but before anything else Sha Nian Nian butted into their conversation, even asking Tin Kuang if she needed any help from her. Seeing this, Sha Tai Da reminded Nian Nian to mind her manners, not to disturb someone else's work, but seeing the siblings like that, Tin Kuang felt disheartened, she didn't know what exactly she was still hoping for here, her brother didn't remember her anymore. Tin Kuang then turned to leave, saying since the interview was over she wouldn't disturb them further, but before she got a few steps, Dai Quan Kin told her to stop, truly a very cold, curt tone. He insisted Tin Kuang delete the photos, in front of all those people. Seeing this, Ms. Goody Two Shoes Sha Nian Nian Kud telling Quan Kin not to threaten Tin Kuang, to talk it out slowly, then she turned to scold Tin Kuang that as a journalist she should know the importance of protecting privacy. She even said that though she and Quan Kin were public figures, they still wanted private time. After singing a few lines, she turned to ask Dai Quan Kin if she was right. Seeing Dai Quan Kin given him, she felt even more smug inside. While Dai Quan Kin still thought Tin Kuang took photos of Han Cheng Bei, he wondered why she didn't delete them. Could it be she insisted on clashing with him to the end? Tin Kuang was oppressed by them together. She hated Sha Nian Nian for always being such a goody goody, and silently blamed Dai Quan Kin for having such bad eyes for women. Finally, under their pressure, Tin Kuang held up her phone in front of Quan Kin, telling him to look closely, all the photos of him were here. Now she would delete them immediately. Quan Kin was stunned for a moment, unexpectedly kicking himself. He was stunned seeing it wasn't Han Cheng Bei after all. Watching her delete the photo, Quan Kin panicked trying to stop her, hurriedly explaining he didn't mean that. But too late, Tin Kuang held up her phone asking if she had deleted them all. Could she go now? Quan Kin knew he couldn't do anything anymore so he lowered his voice agreeing to let her leave. Tin Kuang left irritated and angry, not looking at them even once. Sha Nian Nian still acted innocent, asking Dai Quan Kin if Dai Tin Kuang would blame her right? But after asking, she didn't hear a reply. Sha Nian Nian looked back and saw Dai Quan Kin, with a darkened face turning around leaving. And the happiest one was Sha Nian Nian. She laughed smugly and told herself she hoped Little Mermaid Dai Tin Kuang wouldn't blame her for making a move. Who told Tin Kuang to be Dai Quan Kin's partner? Tin Kuang now felt like the whole world was against her. Her brother didn't recognize her. Sha Nian Nian laughed mockingly at her. Dai Quan Kin, Tin Kuang didn't want to mention him. She leaned against the wall panting heavily, blaming herself for why she believed Dai Quan Kin's words that he would be good to her. Tin Kuang felt heartbroken. She knew no matter what the one he chose in the end was still Sha Nian Nian. As for her, it basically didn't matter. Finally unable to hold it in anymore. Her tears flowed out even as she tried encouraging herself not to cry for someone unworthy. The mermaid's tears fell down, crystallizing into bright, precious pearls. Tin Kuang despairingly wondered if heaven also wanted her to return to the past, not become Dai Quan Kin's partner? That's right, Tin Kuang's tears were regret medicine. Only a mermaid's tears could become genuine treasures. Han Cheng Bei had used them to change his own life. Just drinking one pill could give a chance to return to the past and change fate. Just now Tin Kuang had cried one regret pill. Could this be a sign telling her to hurry and eat it, and return to a life never having met Dai Quan Kin? Still hurting thinking about it, Tin Kuang was suddenly pulled back to reality by her ringing phone. This call was from her father. Tin Kuang wiped her tears, smiling as she talked to her father. Over there were still extremely familiar questions. Does my child still have enough money to spend? Recently you haven't called home. Is it because the TV station is very busy? Tin Kuang laughed saying her boss had given her many tasks, and bragged to her father that the leadership highly valued her. Although that person was Tin Kuang's foster father, he was still the one most reluctant to see her cry in this world. How could Tin Kuang tell him she was being bullied by Dai Quan Kin? After urging his daughter to take care of her health for a while, Tin Kuang's father changed the topic asking if her partner wasn't treating her well. Only now did Tin Kuang startle. She had been afraid to worry her parents so didn't mention Dai Quan Kin. Tin Kuang had no choice but to vigorously affirm he treated her very well. Seeing her daughter wasn't suffering any grievances, Tin Kuang's parents also felt at ease, but still wanted to tell their daughter that no matter what they would always be her steadfast support, urging their daughter that if he bullied her to tell her parents, they would immediately vent anger for her. 
Tin Kuang's tears streamed down. She kept her voice steady telling her father she had to hang up first because an interview was coming up. After ending the call with her father, her heart was even more chaotic. This was the path she had chosen, and even made her parents worry? Could this be the meaning behind the appearance of the regret pill? Just as she was about to put the pill in her mouth, Han Chang Bei popped out from somewhere startling Tin Kuang and making her drop the pill. The regret pill fell to the floor. Rolling around, Tin Kuang could only angrily say a few words telling Chang Bei next time he called her he didn't need to get so close. But Chang Bei noticed that regret pill. Seeing Tin Kuang crying, he asked who had just bullied her. Tin Kuang stiffly denied saying no one. Han Chang Bei of course didn't believe it. He knew for sure Tin Kuang was oppressed by someone so wanted to take the regret pill. Tin Kuang was tired of the questions and decided to leave this place. But Han Chang Bei knelt on the ground clinging to her legs, crying and asking why she wanted to take the regret pill. Could it be she wanted to erase him? Erase their acquaintance? Chang Bei said he wanted to become the man in Tin Kuang's heart, to make her never forget him. After a few seconds of wailing, Han Chang Bei sprang up like a spring, grasping Tin Kuang's hand pulling her along, saying he'd vent anger at anyone who bullied Tin Kuang. Han Chang Bei and Tin Kuang hand in hand immediately ran into Dai Quan Kin. Seeing this, Dai Quan Kin was furious. Tin Kuang also quickly retracted her hand, bowing her head not looking at anyone. Han Cheng Bei also suspiciously sensed some issue. Now Dai Quan Kin spoke up telling Tin Kuang to listen to him speak. But of course Tin Kuang refused, saying there was nothing for her and Mr. Sha to talk about. After that she coldly turned and left saying she had things to do. Now Dai Quan Kin could only blame himself for why he forced her like that. How could she listen to his explanation now? He knew this was self-inflicted. He couldn't blame anyone else. Tin Kuang left that gossip place. She found a corner to sit dazedly gazing at the blue sky and pondering. Although Dai Quan Kin's words were very excessive, Han Cheng Bei seemed to remind her that though regret medicine could change fate, just by changing it, the things that followed would also cease to exist. Indeed, taking regret medicine wasn't something to decide rashly. What if by then she herself couldn't recover? Tin Kuang knew it was best not to take it carelessly. Opening her phone, Tin Kuang saw 35 new messages on Weibo. It was someone named Ling Han asking to buy Tin Kuang's regret medicine. This name made Tin Kuang suspicious. Could this Ling Han really be the actor with daily scandals? After searching on Weibo for a while, Tin Kuang saw everywhere only curses and scorn for Ling Han. Ling Han didn't even want to live anymore. Tin Kuang knew she truly wanted to commit suicide now. At this time in Ling Han's apartment, a young girl could only sit in her room crying and thinking of the biggest mistakes in her past. The biggest mistake and regret in her life was signing a contract with Jin Jing Ji. Ling Han held a sharp knife in her hand, intending to slit her wrist and commit suicide on Weibo. Her farewell message to the world was also being scorned by the whole country. They scolded her for crazily wanting fame. Some even said she should hurry up and die early to cleanse social media. Seeing her ruined life, Ling Han felt extremely anguished. She had thought signing the contract meant she could achieve her dream of becoming an actress. She didn't expect the company to exploit the contract forcing her to drink and sleep around. If she resisted then she would be beaten. Ling Han had also tried exposing the deeds of those monsters but because the company found out. In the end only she became a dirty woman in the eyes of the world. She signed the contract only because she wanted to act. Why did it become like this? The humiliation was permanently attached to her head, unable to shake it off or fight back. Living like this in hell, what meaning was left? Just as she was truly about to give up, her phone suddenly lit up. It was a message from Tin Kuang, saying there was regret medicine. It would allow her to return to before she signed the contract, escaping Jin Jing Ji, and said she wasn't afraid even if it killed her. Was she really not daring enough to believe it? Ling Han anyway had no way out left so decided to believe it once. After having successfully made an appointment to meet Ling Han at 5 p.m., Little Tin Kuang decided she had to change her appearance. Every time she met a buyer she had to disguise herself as someone else. She was thinking today she'd be an old man. An old lady here, she finally settled on it. Tin Kuang brought the clothes into the room. When the door opened, Tin Kuang was wearing a wig disguising herself as an innocent little fresh meat. Before she could show off to anyone, Tin Kuang had already received a handsome compliment from Han Chang Bei who popped out from somewhere. It turned out Han Chang Bei was afraid Tin Kuang would be angered by Dai Quan Kin to the point of not thinking straight so appeared here intending to comfort her. Tin Kuang strode forward, saying now she had to be busy selling regret pills so had no time to play with him. But after hearing that reason, 
Han Chang Bei insisted on following even more. Tin Kuang threw him a look of contempt, hatefully asking if young master Han was that free. But Han Chang Bei was indeed a thoughtful adult. He said he precisely wanted to help her, because with that innocent teenage boy appearance, customers definitely wouldn't trust her. Moreover, to buy her regret pills one had to donate half their assets to the Back Dai Medical Research Institute. Han Chang Bei said honestly he felt Tin Kuang was like a scammer eliciting donations for that research institute. But Han Chang Bei affirmed that if he went along as her secretary, Secretary, then her credibility would surely increase. Because his face was the highest guarantee of credibility, Tin Kuang reconsidered and also thought he was right. She accepted him following along with one condition, no foul language. Han Cheng Bei was very excitedly promising to hold his tongue seven times before speaking. Meanwhile, Ling Han had also arrived at the meeting spot. The medicine seller said to wait for her by the window, seeing Tin Kuang in little brother mode over there. Ling Han was a bit surprised but still went over and greeted her. Very quickly after sitting down, Ling Han realized the man sitting next to her was media mogul Han Cheng Bei. Tin Kuang placed down a form, saying now she would explain the transaction process clearly to her. Han Cheng Bei also said on Tin Kuang's behalf that before buying the regret pills, she had to sign a donation contract, agreeing to convert half of her assets after rebirth into cash and donate it to the Back Dai Medical Research Institute as scientific research funds. Hearing this, Ling Han whispered suspiciously. She thought given her current situation how could she still have any assets? Thinking they were making fun of her, she felt it proved there really was no such thing as regret pills. It was just because she herself was too stupid. After that she straightforwardly told them they didn't need to waste effort deceiving her like that, because she had long been outdated. She didn't even have enough money to live. She truly had no money to donate assets like they wanted. Han Cheng Bei started utilizing his credibility, asking if she didn't recognize who he was. With his status would he go scam those pennies from her? Hearing Ling Han's blunt words, Tin Kuang couldn't help punching him. After that she seriously affirmed to Ling Han that they had no reason to deceive her, so she didn't need to doubt the sincerity of the regret pills. Just sign the contract and she could change her fate. Tin Kuang asked didn't she say earlier she would believe? Turned out the reason for Ling Han's belief was because her life was miserable enough already. One scam didn't count for much, but she was also hesitant because Han Cheng Bei had spoken up to help. So Ling Han also wanted to try once. Anyway she had no way out herself. She decided she would sign, after signing the contract. Ling Han was also curious what would happen next. Tin Kuang gave her a regret pill, telling Ling Han to hurry and drink it. Ling Han also tilted her head back swallowing it without hesitation. Following Tin Kuang's instructions, Ling Han closed her eyes concentrating her mind, recalling the moment she regretted the most. Tin Kuang told her to remember, she only had one hour to revise what made her regretful. Her fate was forever decided by her own hands. Ling Han fell into the void following her own memories. She had truly returned to the time she regretted most in the past. And she opened her eyes, in her hand was the fateful contract. On the negotiating table in the office of the managing director of Jin Jing, she was still confused that she had actually returned to the time with the contract. Those people right now were ceaselessly coaxing her, saying she only had to skim through the contracts. How could they harm her? And said later she would be their company's capable artist. Ling Han hated how foolish she was then. She had thought their urgency was because they wanted to arrange work for her. When the pen was about to be handed to Ling Han to sign, she flung it away, standing up decisively saying no. Even if she offended Jin Jing, even if later there would be no way to survive in this entertainment, circle. She still didn't want her life to once again go down that miserable path. After Tin Kuang finished selling the medicine, the sky was turning dusk. She decided to leave. Han Changbei blankly asked wasn't she waiting for Ling Han? But Tin Kuang thought they weren't going back with her anyway. They couldn't change fate either. Moreover, for Tin Kuang to make that regret pill it also took no small mental exertion. She demanded to go rest. Han Cheng Bei took the chance to drape his arm over Tin Kuang's shoulder, starting to tease her. If that's how it was why not let him treat her to a meal to make up for it? Tin Kuang was made shy by this closeness, blushing. While the two were still happily chatting, there was a vroom vroom from up ahead. Looking at the oncoming car, Tin Kuang dimly thought it looked familiar. Sure enough, Dai Quan Kin had stepped out of the car. As soon as he saw Han Cheng Bei, he knitted his brows unpleasantly. 
Tin Kuang was also secretly wondering why she kept running into Dai Quan Kin everywhere, guessing he was about to say she violated their engagement again. While Han Cheng Bei still clung tightly to Tin Kuang's neck, even teasing why did Ergoxia's face look so unpleasant as if he had been cuckolded, Tin Kuang could only painfully look at Han Cheng Bei. He really didn't know how to control that mouth of his. Dai Quan Kin didn't reply, but still arrogantly strode forward, answering Han Cheng Bei's taunt with a face breaking punch. While Han Cheng Bei cursed holding his face behind, Dai Quan Kin dragged Tin Kuang away like that. He even stopped and looked back, telling Han Cheng Bei a domineering line She's mine. Tin Kuang was thrown into the car forcibly. Despite Han Cheng Bei cursing Dai Quan Kin for being shameless, the car sped away. Tin Kuang sat curled up silently in the car. Beside her, Dai Quan Kin looked at the bouquet in his hands. He didn't know how to open his mouth to apologize. On the other hand, Tin Kuang silently caught her breath then started making a fuss asking the assistant to stop the car and let her out or she'd report them for kidnapping. The assistant still didn't realize it was Tin Kuang and gently consoled the little buddy. To watch his words, in his heart the assistant wondered where this beautiful teenage boy came from. Why did Dai Quan Kin do so much for him? The assistant suspiciously thought could that aspect of the Shaw family have issues? He felt he truly couldn't understand his boss. Didn't he still go crazy today looking for Tin Kuang? Then even bought flowers for her. Now Dai Quan Kin pretended he didn't know anything and glanced at Tin Kuang asking if she was a girl right? Tin Kuang was shocked, not expecting that even in men's clothes she was still recognized by him. But in for a penny in for a pound. She still insisted clutching her male identity saying Dai Quan Kin shouldn't think money allowed him to kidnap others forcibly. She even used this excuse to say she wasn't interested in men. Especially the type of underdeveloped, brainless men like him. Seeing this boy's mouth going too far. The assistant angrily yelled but who knew defending his boss only got him shushed by the boss. Even threatened that if he was violent with that little fresh meat he'd be kicked off the car. The assistant could only resignedly obey. Tin Kuang also didn't expect Dai Quan Kin to actually like the type of little fresh meat dressing like her. This time it looked like a terrible misunderstanding. Tin Kuang had no other choice but to firmly reject Dai Quan Kin's feelings for her. Bluntly saying she couldn't bend that way. You can't get juice from a squeezed melon. Quan Kin also didn't understand what Tin Kuang was babbling about and interrogated her on what she was talking about earlier with Han Cheng Bei. Looking at Dai Quan Kin's blackened, angry face again, Tin Kuang could only lie that Han Cheng Bei was taking her to meet her idol she liked. They had a purely sibling-like relationship, not twisted like he thought. Dai Quan Kin could only temporarily accept it and had to switch to asking her idol's name. Tin Kuang also reluctantly said Ling Han's name. Who knew Quan Kin would order the assistant to check what activities Ling Han had recently? Tin Kuang was scared stiff, not expecting he still wanted to pursue her the little fresh meat. Not only that, Tin Kuang didn't even know what choices Ling Han made after returning to the past. She worried whether the current entertainment industry even had her name or not wasn't certain. But the assistant didn't need to check and immediately said Ling Han was a big star among singers. Just debuting she had already won a big award. Moreover she had a concert at the stadium tonight. Tin Kuang had just heard Ling Han was a big star in the industry and couldn't help crying out in surprise. She wondered to herself if this was the same Ling Han, the completely hopeless woman from earlier? Or was it someone with the same name and gender? But the truth quickly struck her eyes. A huge Ling Han advertisement banner right in the city center. Tin Kuang was astonished by this step. She had truly changed her fate now. What's more, even more appealing was Tin Kuang felt she was about to strike it rich herself. Half of Ling Han's fortune belonged to her. Seeing Tin Kuang's eager expression, Dai Quan Kin smiled asking if she wanted to watch. Tin Kuang replied of course she wanted to, but she was worried since she was so hot now. The tickets must have sold out early. Dai Quan Kin straightened his tie, smiling lightly saying she also didn't see who he was. After that he ordered the assistant to go buy two tickets. The assistant had just argued that the concert started in half an hour. Where could he get tickets from? He was immediately threatened that if he couldn't buy them then don't show his face before him again next time. The assistant could only swallow his bitterness. Tin Kuang also very shamelessly took the chance to demand two front row VIP tickets. The assistant cried until his tears ran dry, secretly hoping Dai Quan Kin had accidentally taken the wrong medicine today and wasn't truly bewitched by that little demon. Dai Quan Kin hesitated for a moment now. Then he also mustered his courage bringing the bouquet out before Dai Tin Kuang. But he truly still didn't know how to apologize without angering her. While Tin Kuang still thought he wanted to propose to the little fresh meat he just met and frowned. Falling into utter confusion, 
so she accepted the bouquet, hastily praising him for thoughtfully preparing flowers for Ling Han's concert. This bouquet giving it to Ling Han would be very suitable. With his unsaid apology stuffed back in his mouth like this, Quan Kin could only obediently stay silent. This grand concert had started at the Capitol Stadium. Everywhere was the sound of fans hoarsely screaming Ling Han's name in excitement. That eagerly awaited figure finally appeared. Ling Han held the mic. Her day had finally come. Ling Han sang proving her skills. After cancelling her contract with that company, she had thought she could no longer enter the industry. Unexpectedly it was because of a singing video someone else uploaded that she became popular. The recording company respected her decision to not sign a contract, cooperating in a way both sides could accept. Her debut song immediately became a hit. Her singing voice spread to every street and alley. If not for the regret pills, Ling Han knew she wouldn't have become the current Ling Han. She also hoped he of the present was below the stage. Seeing her like this, seeing her, the audience immediately roared excitedly in unison. Ling Han bowed in thanks after completing an excellent performance. Tin Kuang was moved by that effort. He heard in that singing voice sounds of crying from happiness, as well as hidden fear and worry. Tin Kuang silently told Ling Han not to fear. She didn't need to fear those dirty, filthy things anymore. Nor did she need to use death to free herself anymore. Clutching the bouquet tightly, Tin Kuang rushed onto the stage, shouting Ling Han's name loudly. Ling Han seeing the boy who sold her regret medicine was also equally surprised. More than the surprise and being moved, his gratitude. Tin Kuang embraced her saying words of congratulations and encouragement. Everything was just a dream. Try to seize the present. Enjoy your new life. Now Ling Han could rely on the chance given by heaven. Try living on. Shine brilliantly. Returning to her original spot below the stage. Seeing Tin Kuang crying her eyes out. Dai Quan Kin felt confused. But then he also smiled handing her a tissue to wipe her tears. After that he asked a question expressing his confusion. Wasn't it just an idol crush? Did it warrant crying like this? Tin Kuang immediately bristled retorting. She said this was very touching. Someone born with a silver spoon like him definitely wouldn't understand. At this time a slice of pizza was placed before Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang was of course surprised not knowing where Dai Quan Kin got it from. It turned out he had just ordered the assistant to buy it. Knowing she hadn't eaten dinner, now she must be hungry. Tin Kuang also had no choice but to give in to delicious food. Chewing while secretly opining that indeed only men could make Dai Quan Kin attentive like this. Though she also thought Dai Quan Kin had reason for his irritable temper towards her. A marriage partner chosen by the government couldn't be as good as choosing yourself. Agreeing to live together with her was fortunate already. After thinking this, Tin Kuang sulked deciding not to eat anymore. Even when Dai Quan Kin pretended to say he'd throw away the leftover pizza, she didn't care at all. He didn't know what she was thinking in her heart. Only blankly looking at the pizza box then accidentally seeing the message on the box lid. There's a kind of happiness, that is sharing the same slice of pizza with a friend. Quan Kin froze, unconsciously placing his hand on those two words happiness. He thought of his own happiness, then turned looking at Tin Kuang smiling beside him. That was his present happiness. It was very late when the concert ended. Tin Kuang knew she had to leave. Afraid that if Dai Quan Kin discovered she was pretending to be little fresh meat he would punish her. Thinking to do it, muddled Tin Kuang thanked Quan Kin for taking her to see the concert then said she had to go first now. Of course Quan Kin wouldn't let her leave so easily. He immediately grabbed her wrist then pulled her toward him, smiling as if seeing through everything. Calling her name Dai Tin Kuang, you're my fiancé, not going home with me but going where? At this time Tin Kuang was shocked, not expecting he didn't like men but had long recognized her. Under the starry sky, Dai Quan Kin, also gently told her to go home together. At that moment Tin Kuang suddenly unconsciously blushed. Because Dai Quan Kin was like this she felt he was truly handsome, truly gentle, it seemed not close enough. He used his big hand holding her face, leaning closer, but Tin Kuang still didn't completely believe he could inexplicably treat her well. Instead she thought he wanted her to go home first then settle the score about her misunderstanding he liked men. After that Tin Kuang pushed his hand away, even awkwardly laughing saying if she didn't go home then where would she sleep tonight? But, Tin Kuang had just left his embrace when she immediately ran away saying she suddenly remembered something to deal with so had to go first, telling him not to mind her leaving a blank Dai Quan Kin looking after her behind. He smiled, 
not expecting his little fishy tail could also be shy. But it was okay, he told himself they still had a lot of time together. Dai family villa at midnight, Tin Kuang finally nestled in her warm bed, smiling non-stop feeling it was still more comfortable wearing girls' clothes. She also secretly blamed Dai Quan Kin for not saying earlier he had recognized her, making her not dare eat so she was terribly hungry. Tin Kuang decided she would get back at him by eating up his household, standing before the clean, shiny, modern kitchen. Tin Kuang felt it was fitting of a tycoon's home. She was also very curious opening the fridge door. Of course she was immediately overwhelmed because it was all premium goods. Finally Tin Kuang decided she'd choose this top-grade Kobe beef box. Very quickly she successfully made a dish. A fragrant steak was caught by Dai Quan Kin before it reached her mouth. He even sneered asking if that was a dish she made. After Tin Kuang's admission, the plate was shamelessly snatched away. Dai Quan Kin happily swallowed it but regretted it immediately after, not expecting it to be so hard to eat. Hearing Tin Kuang ask if it was delicious, although Quan Kin had never had to put something so hard to swallow in his mouth before. For. But in order to avoid hurting Tin Kuang he had to hum and obligingly praise it. After that he swallowed his bitterness and finished the whole plate, seeing Tin Kuang making him pay. Finally Dai Quan Kin also had full reason to cook for her. He even told her to hurry and take out her phone to record it as proof to provide the marriage bureau. Because they originally had the rule that during the cohabitation period he had to make her a dish, Tin Kuang could only dryly laugh when hearing his motive. So it turned out it was only to deal with their cohabitation. She then pressed record. Seeing this posture, Tin Kuang still doubted could he actually cook? Quan Kin cooked while teaching Tin Kuang, saying she couldn't just cook beef to make steak. It needed to be seasoned first then make the sauce. Finally put it in the pan. Tin Kuang didn't expect he actually knew how to cook and asked where he learned it. Quan Kin didn't reply, because the truth was he learned for her. The time in order to let his little fish who was sick eat the best dish he had practiced for a very long time. But who knew his intentions would be rejected by her? She even said even if she starved to death she wouldn't eat what he cooked. Although now he was determined to distance himself from her, he still couldn't do it. Tin Kuang was still innocently filming. She also casually calls him darling akin, saying she is very happy to eat the food he cooked, and even proactively hugs him from behind and says thank you. Quan Kin accepts even if this is him finding misery or boredom, but at least he can see her smile. He thinks the price tonight is very worthwhile. The hot beefsteak fresh from the oven. Looking at the fragrant dish on the table, Tin Kuang feels it looks very delicious. But she hasn't eaten yet because she feels a love show can't be missing this. She points the camera at Quan Kin. Tin Kuang calls out darling a kin. Can you feed me? Quan Kin shyly blushes red, stammers asking Tin Kuang what she just said. Tin Kuang still coquettishly insists, saying she is still filming so how can she have hands to eat the beefsteak? Just this once, can it be? My love. Hearing this my love. Yes. Quan Kin softens. Of course he can't refuse. He takes a small piece of beef and gently feeds Tin Kuang, making the girl blush red. Seeing the atmosphere is so awkward. Finally can't stand it anymore. She pushes him away. Stopping the game here, she awkwardly said no more filming since there was enough footage already. The whole room fell silent. Dai Quan Kin frowned. Sinister Tin Kuang just told him to put the plate down. She had to check the video first before eating. But looking at the menacing aura behind his back, Tin Kuang felt a chill down her spine. She thought she was done for this time. Perhaps because she had ordered him around too much earlier so now he wanted to settle scores with her. Finally Tin Kuang had to surrender first, admitting she was wrong to deliberately order him around earlier. She made excuses that if they weren't intimate, she was afraid the marriage bureau would think they were staging it, and asked him to be big-hearted and forgive her for this little thing. But remembering Tin Kuang's coy, sweet words from earlier, Dai Quan Kin got angry. He asked her if that kind of thing from earlier was small? Dai Quan Kin felt hurt. He felt like Tin Kuang had taken advantage of his feelings and trust to act out those fake things earlier. He coldly snorted then bent down praising her very skilled acting. Had she been this intimate before? With who? Han Cheng Bei. Embarrassed Tin Kuang could only keep protesting. She even told him that later they still had to deal with the marriage bureau a lot, telling him not to immerse himself too much like that. But Dai Quan Kin didn't care about those words. He grabbed Tin Kuang's chin. His jealous eyes interrogated her, so it meant she really had been intimate with Han Cheng Bei? Tin Kuang angrily shouted. She said so what if she had been? As long as people didn't find out during the cohabitation period it was fine. But Dai Quan Kin didn't accept that reasoning. Using the excuse that she was his fiancé for one year, he demanded she not think of other men. Otherwise he would accuse her of romantic intentions with an outsider and throw her in jail. 
Tin Kuang pushed his hand away resentfully, cursing that she also had someone she liked but he kept forcing that crime on her. After that she firmly grabbed his collar warning him that during the cohabitation period he was also her man. Aside from her he couldn't like anyone else or she would also report him. After scolding him around, Tin Kuang brought the steak upstairs to eat. While Dai Quan Kin, after being scolded around, felt life become rosy. Touching his collar, remembering Tin Kuang's words that he was her man. Dai Quan Kin was elated but at the same time remembered Tin Kuang had also said he liked someone else already. Dai Quan Kin secretly cursed which bastard dared spread lies to make his little fish misunderstand. After that he immediately called the assistant. The assistant couldn't even sleep peacefully receiving orders to investigate who recently created random rumors about him. After hearing it, the assistant immediately thought of Dai Tin Kuang, but of course it couldn't be her so Quan Kin looked into who else it could be. He even made him list the people who had interacted with Dai Tin Kuang, daring to reside in the heart of my woman, looking to die? The next morning, Tin Kuang walked into the TV station sleepy, but very quickly after she was startled awake by everyone's attitude. Everyone was staring at her intently, and they were all leaders too. Before the girl even knew what was going on the director had shouted asking her where the interview questions were. Tin Kuang knew she was done for because yesterday had been too hectic so she had forgotten, so she could only bow apologizing to the director, and was about to say she'd do it immediately but someone interrupted her. Uk An An said Tin Kuang had messed up big time, because online now everyone was saying the one Dai Quan Kin liked wasn't the mermaid maiden after all. After hearing it Tin Kuang blankly opened Weibo to look, sure enough there was an account called Lemony, saying who knows what schemes the mermaid maiden used to become Dai Quan Kin's fiancé but one one thing was certain, Dai Quan Kin had someone he liked for a long time already. Tin Kuang didn't expect after just one night she was already seen as the third party. Petty people really knew no bounds with their tricks. And on this side Luke An An was gloating asking Tin Kuang if it was because she couldn't interview Dai Quan Kin right. She even said she heard yesterday Tin Kuang had cried running out of the swimming pool. Surely she was scolded by Dai Quan Kin and ran scared. Tin Kuang angrily refuted Luke An An's idle gossip but she only took this chance to ridicule her. Finally this chaotic verbal fight was angrily stopped by the director. He held his head in despair because now even if they uploaded the interview it would be too late. It could only be seen as Dai Quan Kin's lies. Moreover, unless the company had proof of Dai Quan Kin cohabiting with that mermaid maiden. But this was very difficult since the two of them didn't want to film their private life either. Seeing it still wasn't chaotic enough. Luke An An said more that this time could be counted as a blessing in disguise for Tin Kuang. Oh she said if the interview was uploaded. On the contrary it would be useless and anger Dai Quan Kin. At that time all of Coco TV would also be implicated by Tin Kuang. Surrounding Tin Kuang were many criticisms. Saying she was a new person who couldn't handle the job. Her work attitude was also problematic. Tin Kuang blanked. She also knew because she didn't record the interview she would definitely make up for this mistake. After that she raised her hand stopping the discussion and criticism here. Tin Kuang said she still had exclusive material, more important than a recorded interview. In her heart she secretly thought it was fortunate she had recorded that last night. Seeing the full video of Dai Quan Kin gently being intimate with his masked mermaid maiden wife, everyone in the company was elated. Tin Kuang also took this chance to explain, defending that not submitting the recording was wrong but she truly didn't give up on the interview. Of course after seeing the exclusive video the director highly praised Tin Kuang, encouraging her it was okay. Anyway, Anyway this video was worth dozens of times more than that other interview. So now they had the material. This whole Coco company would seize the time to edit the video then release it to show Dai Quan Kin and the Mermaid Maiden's intimate affair. The director even loudly ordered Luke An An to go do menial work instead. That girl's face immediately stiffened. She wondered what was the basis for Dai Tin Kuang to find fortune in disaster, accomplish greatly while she had to be an errand boy. Oh she of course was unwilling. Finally it was time to get off work. Dark clouds had gathered thickly overhead. Tin Kuang looked at the sky worried because it seemed it would rain soon. At this time Luke An An sauntered over asking if Tin Kuang was waiting for her fiancé to pick her up. She even proudly bragged that luckily Doan then feared her having a hard time so picked her up after work every day. In her heart she thought although her Doan then wasn't as good as Dai Quan Kin he was certainly thousands of times better than Tin Kuang's fiancé. After hearing Luke An An's bragging. 
Tin Kuang calmly said what she said didn't concern her. Luke and An continued saying that Don then always worried Tin Kuang was matched to a bad, indecent man and became unhappy. She even said if they met Tin Kuang's fiancé today her and her husband could feel more at ease. At this point Tin Kuang finally understood Luke and An's intention was to see her fiancé. She knew although Dai Quan Kin absolutely wouldn't come pick her up. As a fiancé she was picked up by a luxury car every day. In a bit it would make Luke and An die of anger. After after that Tin Kuang confidently told Luke and Ann not to worry. Soon her fiancé who loved her every day would come pick her up. Any minute now, just as she finished speaking Tin Kuang received a call. Unexpectedly it was Day's driver calling that the car broke down on the way. In half an hour it still wouldn't make it, telling Tin Kuang to call her own car home. Knowing something was up, Luke and Ann asked who had called Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang had no choice but to awkwardly lie that they called the wrong number. At this time that Don then had driven over to pick up his girlfriend, loudly calling her name, smiling widely as he walked over hugging the bouquet looking extremely sweet and colorful. Luke and Anne also conveniently rushed to embrace him, saying she was so happy, so blissful, etc. Now Tin Kuang could only wish someone would hurry and blind her to avoid this show off before her eyes. After showing the happy family scene, Luke and Anne immediately turned asking where was Tin Kuang Kuang's fiancé, how come he still wasn't here yet? Tin Kuang was flustered, she couldn't let this shameless couple make her into a joke, but what to do now? Tin Kuang was extremely anxious. She thought to herself should have booked a better car. On her phone the Daohua car service was still making her wait. On that side Luke and Ann coquettishly said to Don then that Tin Kuang told her, her husband treats her very well. Don then was just as fake, pretending to be overjoyed saying it seemed Tin Kuang had also attained happiness. So great, scheming back and forth like this. Tin Kuang felt these two people really were a fake couple. After that she awkwardly smiled telling them her husband was stuck in traffic on the way. Telling them to go first. Actually it was rush hour so no driver accepted the ride. She didn't expect these two to look forward to ridiculing her this much. Wanting to drive them away was hard. Luke and Ann was elated. She thought it was more like Tin Kuang didn't dare let her husband be compared to Don Nan. Still not knowing where this would go, in front of them rang a loud brake screech. A lush golden Mercedes appeared. The driver in the car got out opening the door and bowed inviting Tin Kuang in. Outwardly Tin Kuang was silent but inwardly she was very shocked. She wondered whose car this was that was even more astonishing than Dai Quan Kin's car. Could it be a driver had accepted the request after all? As for these two's faces, not a drop of blood remained. Only able to gape like a dog watching others fight. Unable to believe Tin Kuang had really married an ultra-rich man. In this situation Tin Kuang also decided to recklessly get in first then figure it out later. After that she said with a victorious smile, bidding them goodbye arrogantly as she got in the car leaving Don then and Luke and Ann to share in a bellyful of anger. Tin Kuang stepped into the luxurious car, having just stuck her head in she was about to ask if this was the car she booked, but she immediately froze seeing the person inside. Outside the driver had closed the door for Tin Kuang. At gossip Luke and Ann was still desperately running wanting to see her husband's face. Tin Kuang had no choice but to tell the driver to hurry and go. The car left, Luke and Ann resentful. She thought Tin Kuang was really fortunate marrying a tycoon, and felt that if that day she hadn't married Don then perhaps now she would also be like this. When the car left the sky quickly darkened. Right now Tin Kuang still couldn't believe the person sitting beside her was. Dai Quan Kin's older brother Dai Tai Din who was also her idol. At this time Dai Tai Din looked at Tin Kuang with a friendly smile already, saying he came to pick her up without prior notice. Did it surprise her too much? Tin Kuang blushed denying it. Master Dai I'm happy I didn't even have time for it. Dai Tai Din even said later she didn't need to be so polite, just call him like Quan Kin did. Big brother was fine. Tin Kuang also obediently called him big brother once. After that she immediately asked why Dai Tai Din had come to pick her up. Was something wrong? In her heart she still worried. Afraid that it was because her and Dai Quan Kin were all over the internet he was unhappy and wanted to directly come remind her. But Dai Tai Din's reason wasn't anything major. Just that Tin Kuang's sister-in-law was having a birthday party at home today. Wanting to get acquainted with Tin Kuang for a while already so purposely asked him to pick her up and bring her over. And happened to meet some family members. Tin Kuang was still suspicious of the suddenness. After that she immediately said she felt there was no need to meet the family right now. Moreover 
over Dai Quan Kin didn't tell her today was his sister-in-law's birthday. She thought that Dai Quan Kin probably didn't want her to meet his family. But Dai Tai Din insisted it was precisely because today Quan Kin was busy that as the big brother he had to personally come here. And asked Tin Kuang if she didn't like it? Tin Kuang immediately got flustered saying no. She was just surprised. She decided even if Quan Kin didn't want to see her but her idol invited her then how could she not go? Very quickly they arrived at daddy restaurant. Tin Kuang followed behind Dai Tai Din, unable to hide the eager expression on her face. She felt it was truly thanks to her idol's blessings that she got to come to the top national restaurant and hotel for the first time. Her life could be considered fulfilled now. They entered a reserved private room. Indeed her big brother and sister-in-law were splendid. Dai Tai Din walked in smiling apologetically to everyone for arriving late. Dai Tai Din's wife, today's hostess, immediately stood up to welcome her sister-in-law. She was Yi Go Keen, wife of presidential candidate Dai Tai Din. With one look Tin Kuang recognized she was the daughter of leading world luxury jewelry brand LT, the current executive vice president of LT Jewelry. Yi Go Keen was also very affectionate asking Tin Kuang if she had called her out on her own accord, asking if she disliked it. Tin Kuang of course said she really liked it, just worriedly explained that today she didn't know it was sister's birthday so didn't prepare a gift. Please understand, happy birthday to sister. Yi Go Keen smiled saying gifts weren't important. As long as Tin Kuang came it was good. Tin Kuang also didn't expect having heard Yi Go Keen was a strong, formidable woman. But in reality she was this easy to get along with. After that she looked around to see who else was here. Before anything had happened she inadvertently met eyes with Ji Chi Shi. He was immediately shocked not expecting her. Oh my what the heck. Why was Ms. Dai Tin Kuang here? At this time Yi Go Keen also took the initiative to introduce Tin Kuang that these two were Quan Kin's younger brothers, named Ji Chi Shi, and asked if Tin Kuang and him were acquainted. Tin Kuang forced a smile but inwardly wasn't happy at all because from their awkward interaction, it seemed Dai Quan Kin truly didn't want her to come here. Ji Chi Shi was also shaking hands sweating bullets, awkwardly affirming that he and little Tin Kuang were very close. At this time someone loudly shouted calling Tin Kuang. Long. Before long a short-haired girl had rushed in and hugged her happily, saying finally got to meet you. This was Xiao Mei Hu, a lively little girl. Upon meeting she said she admired Tin Kuang for being able to conquer that difficult old man. She had just said one sentence before being pulled back to not cause chaos anymore. He was Mac Phi, an adopted Dai son, Xiao Mei Hu's boyfriend, ignoring that commotion. Yi Go Keen introduced Tin Kuang that this Mac Phi was the same as Ji Chi Shi and Duong Chao. All adopted Dai son sons working together with Dai Quan Kin. She also said Xiao Mei Hu was his girlfriend. These two were always this noisy. Yi Go Keen gestured for Tin Kuang to sit down. She said her parents-in-law were abroad traveling so that's why she told Tin Kuang to come along. She wanted to introduce her to the family, saying Dai Quan Kin was busy today so she called Dai Tai Din to pick her up. Tin Kuang also didn't expect it turned out sister-in-law had taken the initiative to invite her. She knew she truly considered her family now. After that Yi Go Keen then told her husband to call and ask why Dai Quan Kin still wasn't back yet. In her heart Tin Kuang was also wondering if Dai Quan Kin was truly busy or just pretending to be busy. Coincidentally at this time a ringing bell loudly sounded right outside the door. Yi Go Keen laughed telling Tin Kuang speak of the devil and he appears. Unexpectedly the first one to enter was Ha Ni. Nian Nian, merrily calling Yi Go Keen's sister-in-law sweetly. She had also prepared a gift to give Yi Go Keen, wishing her a happy birthday, and said she didn't say beforehand she would come, asking if sister was mad at her. Yi Go Keen could only reluctantly accept the gift, smiling happily saying she was happy she came. But actually inwardly she was confused wondering why she had also come here, and was still together with Dai Quan Kin. Wasn't this deliberately slapping her sister-in-law in the face? At this time Dai Quan Kin and Tin Kuang were looking at each other. His face became gentle and seemed to be smiling. He walked straight to Tin Kuang and sat down beside her. In his head he still thought Ms. Tin Kuang didn't like family parties like this. Looks fine too. Tin Kuang also looked at him then lowered her head thinking. Feeling no wonder Dai Quan Kin didn't tell her about his sister-in-law's birthday. It turned out to be because he wanted to bring Han Nian Nian to make her uncomfortable. Ji Chi Shi was also frowning eavesdropping in secret. He thought could it be Dai Quan Kin knew Tin Kuang would come today so purposely brought Han Nian Nian to clarify his stance? On the side, Xiao Mei Hu also sensed the smell of drama. Han Nian Nian was still so fake. Walking over telling Dai Quan Kin there was only this seat left empty. Demanding his seat. 
She smirked smugly feeling the spot beside Quan Kin could only be sat in by her. But Quan Kin didn't agree so she could only grit her teeth resentfully. Unexpectedly she still couldn't compete against opportunistic Tin Kuang. At this time Dai Quan Kin had just opened his mouth to call Tin Kuang's name, but was cut off. She said she knew what he wanted to say, and took the initiative to explain that big brother and sister-in-law had invited her here so she came. Yi Go Qin's clapping ended the strange atmosphere. She said the food could be served now. The servers also brought drinks for everyone. In front of Dai Tin Kuang was a cold watermelon juice. Dai Quan Kin just reached out and snatched it from her, making Tin Kuang startled asking what he was doing. Dai Quan Kin still firmly said she couldn't drink it. Sister-in-law like Yi Go Qin could only laugh telling her younger brother men shouldn't be so authoritarian. She even said if her older brother controlled her like this she also wouldn't listen, telling Dai Quan Kin to quickly return the drink to Tin Kuang. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin instead calmly told everyone Tin Kuang was about to have her period. Tin Kuang was both embarrassed and surprised, blushing. She didn't expect Dai Quan Kin to know she was about to have her period. Clearly she didn't fill out this information at the marriage bureau. While Dai Quan Kin felt that even her menstruation Tin Kuang didn't know about, it seemed he still needed to be by her side caring for her. At this time Yi Go Qin happily covered her mouth laughing saying so it turned out she had misunderstood, and said women should be pampered like this. After that Dai Quan Kin asked his sister-in-law to prepare him a hot red apple cider. As for Tin Kuang, she still sullenly looked at him. Thinking it seemed he cared about her period only for self-interest, if so then she would also temporarily not mind him bringing Ha Nian Nian here. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin even told the servers to bring Emperor Crab, Australian abalone, blue lobster, various tuna etc. making Tin Kuang gape, looking at the table full of seafood but they were all things to avoid during her period. Tin Kuang shook with anger, thinking Dai Quan Kin was detestable, having them bring just her a red apple cider, while ordering abalone and fish for Han Nian Nian, she wondered if he needed to differentiate his treatment like this, while Dai Quan Kin thought completely opposite, he knew seafood was the most nutritious for his mermaid's period, and felt for sure Tin Kuang would be very happy now, while seeing his smile Tin Kuang was furious, she didn't expect he could still smile until now, unexpectedly this pile of seafood was served to Han Nian Nian, making Han Nian Nian think it was specially prepared for her by Dai Quan Kin, she thus felt exceptionally pleased, secretly thinking everyone knew the one Dai Quan Kin cared for was her, and wanted to see how Dai Tin Kuang would compete with her, but when she picked up her chopsticks to eat the food in front of her, it was immediately turned away by Quan Kin making her awkward. The seafood plate was in front of hostess Yi Go Qin. Dai Quan Kin invited her to eat first, and now Ha Nian Nian also quickly apologized for being too happy and not paying attention. At this time Yi Go Qin was surprised to see Tin Kuang's eyes staring intently at the seafood plate. She could only invite the others to eat together. Inwardly blaming Dai Quan Kin for only ordering seafood for Han Nian Nian. Wasn't that making it difficult for the others here? After that invitation Tin Kuang thanked her sister-in-law, picking up her chopsticks, of course she had to eat. The seafood was ordered by her husband, she absolutely wouldn't yield it to Han Nian Nian. Tin Kuang ate furiously making outsiders think she was about to die of anger at Han Nian Nian. At this time fake Han Nian Nian told everyone she was fine since she often ate seafood, and told Dai Quan Kin that if Ms. Dai Tin Kuang liked it then yield it to her. Inwardly she thought pretending to be so thoughtful and yielding like this he would surely feel grateful to her, but unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin directly agreed, because this seafood was specially ordered by him for Tin Kuang in the first place. But Tin Kuang upon seeing his expression thought Dai Quan Kin didn't like her eating all of Han Nian Nian's portion right? So Tin Kuang was determined to make him even more annoyed, happily chewing while disdainfully looking at Dai Quan Kin. After the meal, of course Han Nian Nian didn't miss the chance to show off her singing and dancing. Tin Kuang's pleasure was leisurely drinking tea while secretly scrutinizing. She felt Dai Quan Kin's taste was also quite salty. She had never seen anyone so shameless before. It was true the mermaid sang well but not to the extent of clinging possessively to the mic not letting anyone else touch it. At this time Xiao Mei Hu brought Tin Kuang some painkillers, saying since she ate a lot of seafood tonight she'd likely have stomach pain tomorrow. After that she even whispered in Dai Tin Kuang's ear that she was on her side, saying Tin Kuang was Dai Quan Kin's wife. Don't let Han Nian Nian be smug. 
Tin Kuang had just opened her mouth to explain she didn't have that intention, but was loudly refuted by Xiao Mei Hu that they incessantly bullied her like this yet she could still let it go? Xiao Mei Hu kept shouting that if her Mac Phi dared bring another woman home to show off she would kick them out. Having just said that Xiao Mei Hu blankly asked Tin Kuang why everyone was looking at her. The exasperated Tin Kuang could only hold her head saying it was because Xiao Mei Hu spoke too loudly. But Xiao Mei Hu got even more riled up standing up and frantically declaring that she didn't say anything wrong. By law during the marriage the husband cannot have another woman. She even said that Gai Dai didn't pick up Tin Kuang but went for Ms. Ha instead. That was openly disdaining the law. Tin Kuang was extremely shocked but also felt Xiao Mei Hu was quite gutsy. But hearing this, Han Nian Nian immediately jumped up seriously asking Xiao Mei Hu to stop demeaning her and Dai Quan Kin. Xiao Mei Hu then went solo saying everything she said was the truth, telling Han Nian Nian she was the national goddess. Knowing Dai Quan Kin already had a wife yet still clung to him, one look could tell she was a shameless mistress. Left with no choice, Mac Phi could only say Mei Hu was drunk carry the little cat away. Xiao Mei Hu struggled yelling to be put down, while shouting loudly cursing Dai Quan Kin for being malicious, Han Nian Nian for being a mistress. Tin Kuang could only silently thank Xiao Mei Hu. No matter what was said the girl was truly gutsy. Just now Tin Kuang had become the focus of everyone's gaze. She didn't know how to resolve this situation. At this time Han Nian Nian acted aggrieved saying she only happened to meet Quan Kin. She didn't intend to appear with him. She even said Xiao Mei Hu was also so naive. If there were any misunderstandings in the future just ask her. She wouldn't hide anything. After that she pretended to be hurt running out in front of everyone's eyes. Tin Kuang could only force an angry smile. As expected of Han Nian Nian, had to get in a stab before leaving. At this time Mac Phi also spoke up explaining, saying Tin Kuang had misunderstood the Dai family. He said they met Han Nian Nian in front of the theater. So Quan Kin absolutely didn't do anything unlawful during the marriage. At this time Dai Quan Kin also also interrogated Tin Kuang asking why she caused a ruckus with Xiao Mei Hu. In his head he thought if they disrupted his sister-in-law's birthday party and were prosecuted, then he wasn't sure he could protect her. Tin Kuang was shocked that Dai Quan Kin actually dared blame her. She thought if he hadn't ordered seafood for Han Nian Nian then no one would suspect the two of them. The atmosphere had become extremely gloomy. It was still Yi Go Qin who stepped up to reconcile the others, telling Dai Quan Kin it was normal for girls to bicker. Don't make it too tense frightening Tin Kuang. But the hurt Tin Kuang apologized to everyone, saying she was going to the restroom then left. While this Dai Quan Kin was still calm, thinking there was nothing urgent, wait for her to return then comfort her later. Tin Kuang ran off unconsciously. She thought she was only regarded as a joke. No matter how hard she tried as a wife she still couldn't change the truth that Dai Quan Kin loved Han Nian Nian. While walking she suddenly stopped upon seeing a piano there. She recalled the painful memories from before. Getting slapped for the reason that a ugly thing like her shouldn't touch Han Nian Nian's piano. The mermaid was extremely musically talented. But the has never wanted to waste any time on her. Only after she was adopted did she start learning piano. The more she thought, the worse Tin Kuang's mood became. Anyway there was no one now. She would play a piece to relieve her emotions. Tin Kuang sat down at the piano bench, her fingers dancing across the keys, the melody speaking her heart's words. But her heart was too chaotic, she felt even playing the piano couldn't relieve it. It was all because of Han Nian Nian. But on second thought, she hated Dai Quan Kin more. She thought if not for him differentiating his treatment of her and Han Nian Nian in front of everyone, then how could Han Nian Nian act arrogant towards her? But she was also confused because he showed his care for her without hiding it in front of others too. Didn't Dai Quan Kin say unimportant people wouldn't shake his mood? Tin Kuang didn't understand why every time she thought of him, her heart would feel so awful. Unexpectedly tears started falling. At this time her phone in her pocket suddenly rang. Tin Kuang wiped her tears. It was her boss calling. The boss said there was a major accident on Hua Vin Road. Colleagues were already there, telling her to hurry to the scene and report in. Gloomily thinking misfortunes really came one after another. Having to work overtime at night, but since Dai Quan Kin ruined her mood anyway, going to work wouldn't be so bad. As Tin Kuang left, someone rushed to the piano in a hurry. He looked around but didn't see anyone, curiously wanting to know who was playing just now. The music just now carried a light yet suppressed melancholy. Each note shook people's hearts. This was veteran musician Chao Lao Jia Su. It had been a long time since he heard such spirited music. He truly hoped he could meet again that mysterious composer. Outside, a storm was brewing. 
Tin Kuang felt luckily the location was near so she could change into rain gear. If her feet got wet she'd be miserable. At this time Mac Phi called asking why Tin Kuang still hadn't returned making everyone wait. Only now did Tin Kuang panic upon realizing she had forgotten the sister-in-law's birthday party. So she immediately said she had to rush to an interview, asking Mac Phi to help explain for her. Mac Phi was shocked reporting back to Dai Quan Kin stuttering. Dai Quan Kin immediately seized the phone scolding her for leaving without a word. That would make others think how, and demanded she return immediately. Tin Kuang only felt Dai Quan Kin was truly ridiculous, only now remembering she was his legal wife. Then she asked didn't he say before the farther from him the better, now she would obediently do so. Saying that then hanging up, Dai Quan Kin looked at the phone. He knew the little mermaid was angry again. Seeing the heavy rain, he worried something would happen to her. On this side, Dai Tin Kuang had arrived at the scene, grabbing a mic to frantically start interviewing in a panic. Rain poured down on Hua Vin Road. Tin Kuang was reporting live for Coco TV station. On Hua Vin Road there was a major chain accident of cars crashing into each other. Among them a bus of elementary students on a field trip to Daddy City. Due to the sudden heavy rain Hua Vin Road was severely flooded, posing a huge challenge for the rescue workers. Not a few good Samaritans passing by joined the rescue of the school bus. The students have all been safely evacuated from the bus now. There were no more children left inside, but right now the water around the bus kept rising. The bus was also about to tip over, crash. Tin Kuang didn't expect there was still another little girl on the bus. At this rate she would drown. She still remembered when she was six years old, abandoned in the sea during a huge storm. The waves kept crashing making her feel like she was about to not make it. Tin Kuang saw her own circumstances in that child. She couldn't let the tragedy repeat. She had to protect that child. Then she told the cameraman to go film something else first so she could help. Others had also noticed there was still a child so hurried to find tools. But Tin Kuang worried finding tools would take too long. Standing still waiting rather than her taking action herself would be better. Later after she was adopted she often climbed trees. Tin Kuang thought it couldn't challenge her. And so she climbed up, simultaneously encouraging the child to hold on tight. The girl looked horribly distressed, about to not make it, finally unable to hang on. The little girl's hand slipped and she fell, eyes closed not daring to look. Luckily at the last second Tin Kuang managed to grab her hand. She urgently yelled at the girl to not let go. She would pull her up but she herself also couldn't guarantee it since she had pulled with all her might already. Who knew Dai Quan Kin had been behind her for who knows how long. He was with her pulling the child up. Seeing Tin Kuang kept losing focus looking at him. Dai Quan Kin reminded her to grab the child tight. Finally the girl was pulled up, crying and wailing to Tin Kuang, who had to comfort her, saying she'd bring her somewhere safe. Tin Kuang put her own raincoat on the girl, affirming there was no more danger. Meanwhile Dai Quan Kin called Mac Phi over to bring the child. To reassure her Tin Kuang said she'd tell her a secret, that she herself was a superhero so she wasn't afraid of any danger. Who knew the girl didn't know what a superhero was? only knowing about the Super Mermaid. Tin Kuang knew the Super Mermaid was a famous movie character played by Ha Nian Nian herself about saving the world. Although troubled, Tin Kuang thought that if she admitted it the girl would feel reassured, so she reluctantly acted the part of Han Nian Nian, so she told the child she herself was the super mermaid. The girl looked at Tin Kuang's legs, asking why there was no fishtail, then struggled yelling that Tin Kuang was lying. You're not a mermaid, you're lying. You can't protect me. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin rushed over hugging Tin Kuang telling the girl she wasn't deceiving her, and said Tin Kuang was only temporarily too tired to hide her fishtail. Tin Kuang was the most beautiful mermaid in the world. Tin Kuang didn't expect Dai Quan Kin to be gently helping her, involuntarily blushing. Finally Dai Quan Kin succeeded in coaxing the child, putting her on his back to carry her somewhere safe. Dai Quan Kin slowly climbed down. The water below had risen to his calves already. Dai Quan Kin handed the child to Mac Phi for him to bring her somewhere safe. Behind, Tin Kuang drifted into thought, feeling as long as he didn't have to face a wife like her, he was warm towards anyone. Tin Kuang thought it was still best she left, little more and he'd vent his anger on her again, having thought that she immediately jumped down. But Tin Kuang didn't expect the water to have risen so high already. But since she had waterproof pants on she could walk quickly and probably wouldn't transform. At this time Dai Quan Kin had unexpectedly picked Tin Kuang up, 
embarrassing her so much her face turned red loudly asking what he was doing. But Dai Quan Kin immediately scolded her for acting rashly. The water was so deep yet she dared walk ahead without waiting for him. Seeing his tense manner, Tin Kuang was also surprised. She wondered if he was worried for her. Now she also just noticed Dai Quan Kin wasn't wearing a raincoat. Tin Kuang reached out to wipe the rain from his face. That small gesture made Dai Quan Kin stop and ask what she was doing. The distance seemed closer after Tin Kuang said she wanted to wipe away the rain for him. Moments later Dai Quan Kin hugged her tight. He told her not to do pointless things. Be careful moving you might fall. Listen to me. Besides he felt he should be the one sheltering his little mermaid. On this side, Mac Phi finally brought the child somewhere safe then hurriedly wanted to return to the dais. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin had carried Tin Kuang away already, shocking Mac Phi. After that Dai Quan Kin gently put Tin Kuang down. He said elder sister had sent rescuers here already. Now he had to go there. He also told Tin Kuang there were many people so he didn't want anything happening to her. Quan Kin entrusted her to Mac Phi then left. Now Mac Phi finally had a chance to tell Tin Kuang not to anger Dai Quan Kin any anymore. He said seeing it rain he immediately came here to find her. Elder brother Dai Din couldn't stop him either. Only now did Tin Kuang realize he was also very concerned about her. Seeing Dai Quan Kin working to help people in the rain like that, Tin Kuang felt he looked really handsome like that. On the ride back, Dai Quan Kin received a call from his sister-in-law. Yi Go Kin asked who he was carrying just now. The online forums already had photos posted all over. Dai Quan Kin immediately said don't worry sister-in-law. That was Tin Kuang and he'd take care of the online photos. Hearing about the online photos, the curious Tin Kuang also wanted to take a look. On Lieutenant TV station's Weibo reporting the photo of Dai Quan Kin's back carrying Tin Kuang with the headline Quan Kin publicly affectionate in the rain with a girl not his mermaid goddess. Below countless fans of the mermaid goddess cursed the girl in the photo as a shameless flirt without knowing that was the mermaid goddess. Seeing Lieutenant TV stirring up trouble, Tin Kuang got angry. She knew Lieutenant TV supported another powerful candidate, so especially liked spreading bad rumors about her idol Dai Din. What cracked relationship with his wife, turned his back on his younger brother Dai Quan Kin. She had long seen this kind of thing before. After that Tin Kuang fiercely said she'd use her mermaid goddess account to clarify this. Dai Quan Kin unexpectedly took this chance to tease her, asking if she was hurting for him. After that he tenderly patted Tin Kuang's head saying no matter what happened he would wouldn't use her as a shield. Being fondly teased, Tin Kuang couldn't help but sneeze, spraying snot all over Dai Quan Kin. She could only profusely apologize, afraid he'd really be angry this time. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin instead caringly placed a hand on her forehead to check her temperature, saying luckily she didn't have a fever. While Tin Kuang was still stunned he had covered her with a small blanket, so tight she almost couldn't breathe, but he was just worried she'd catch a cold. After that he told Mac Phi to hurry home. After showering, Little Tin Kuang leisurely browsed Weibo, but the top hot search was Dai Quan Kin's affair. Third party appears, those unclear immediately cursed Dai Quan Kin for being a playboy. Everyone was busy rescuing but he went and cheated on the mermaid goddess, saying that who else would dare support Dai Din. They even saw the lovestruck look in Dai Quan Kin's eyes, affirming the woman in his heart was truly the beloved pampered darling. Reading this Tin Kuang was furious. This was clearly malicious slander. Dai Quan Kin was busy rescuing how could he be cheating. She immediately typed up a rebuttal, but lovestruck look, what darling, it's me, the mermaid goddess. She really wanted to use this mermaid goddess account to clarify. Let this gossip hungry mob unaware of the truth see clearly. But now Tin Kuang was truly curious. How could netizen see the one in Dai Quan Kin's heart was his darling? Tin Kuang zoomed into the photo, wanting to see where this lovestruck look was. But upon zooming in she really did seem to see something like that. Of course Tin Kuang had to find a way to deny that thought. She loudly screamed at herself to wake up. This was just an illusion, not real just as she finished saying so. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin had been standing behind her for who knows how long and spoke up asking, what's real or fake here? Tin Kuang was startled, dazedly denying it, she felt she really was hopeless. Now even finding this scoundrel handsome, Tin Kuang felt she really wasn't normal. After that she could only explain to Dai Quan Kin that she just meant let her post on Weibo to tell everyone the darling he carried was her. Hearing this, Quan Kin felt extremely embarrassed. He didn't expect her to discover these feelings of his. He then gently dried Tin Kuang's hair, asking if she was going to let everyone know she was the darling he doted on. Too shy, Tin Kuang flusteredly denied it, saying that was a comment, 
not her. She said how could she be the darling he utterly doted on. She just saw his brother being slandered too horribly so wanted to put them in their place herself. She even wanted to show him the phone to see their vicious curses. After knowing it wasn't her own words but the netizen's words, Quan Kin got angry, messing up her hair then saying he didn't want to see, telling Tin Kuang to just post however she wanted. Tin Kuang held up her phone asking if he didn't need to see the draft first. Quan Kin read her caption, what lovestruck look, what darling, it's me, the mermaid goddess, his face immediately softened and he agreed. Quan Kin gently stroked Tin Kuang's hair, secretly scolding her for being a silly child. You've always been the darling I utterly dote on. Before Tin Kuang could hit post, her Weibo had a notification that Coco TV station had debunked the rumor about the mysterious woman in Dai Quan Kin's heart. Tin Kuang was shocked and panicked, thinking could it be her identity was exposed already. Yesterday at 5 p.m. on Hua Vin Road there was a traffic accident causing congestion. Afterwards due to the sudden rainstorm leading to severe flooding, a school bus got trapped under the water, extremely dangerous. After the incident, Dai Quan Kin brought the day's rescue team to Hua Vin Road first, putting all his effort into rescuing the trapped woman and child. The rescued citizens personally thanked him. Moreover, the TV station provided very clear video footage. The online masses also unanimously acknowledged Dai Quan Kin as a man who disregarded the storm, drenched like a drowned rat yet still held the child in his arms. They also recognized the other stoic men rescuing with Dai Quan Kin had Day's logo on their clothes, so concluded the one Dai Quan Quan Kin held wasn't a mistress but an accident victim. Reading this, Tin Kuang was overjoyed. She even told Dai Quan Kin after the clarification. Everyone unanimously turned around praising him as handsome. But Quan Kin didn't find this very interesting. He only cared whether Tin Kuang had posted on Weibo. But Tin Kuang said didn't this already get resolved? Why would she still need to post? She didn't want everyone knowing she was the mermaid goddess either. Having said that, Tin Kuang turned around saying bye to Quan Kin and returned to her room. Quan Kin was extremely unhappy, secretly blaming everything on Kiki too, suddenly clarifying on Weibo for no reason. He'd have to beat that guy up. The next morning Tin Kuang woke up and immediately went out for breakfast. Quan Kin was already sitting there waiting. At this time Tin Kuang's phone had a new notification again. Online was a video of the little girl in yellow recounting being rescued by the super mermaid goddess, then carried back by a super handsome guy. Hearing this, the netizens immediately affirmed the one Dai Quan Kin carried was definitely Ha Nian Nian. They even said Dai Quan Kin and Ms. Ha were supposed to get married. That's why the two didn't pay the singles tax. Who knew Dai Quan Kin got his name entered into the marriage bureau's lottery wheel for others. The mermaid goddess got lucky winning Dai Quan Kin. And so those netizens unanimously deemed the mermaid goddess to be the third party. Seeing the account of the rumor starter, Tin Kuang was very tired seeing it was that maid again. Clearly Dai Quan Kin was the one who fired her so why did she keep cursing Tin Kuang? Tin Kuang truly wanted to say the one beside her was Dai Quan Kin, but the angles showing her were all cut out already. If she posted now wouldn't it make everyone's efforts hiding her identity be in vain? Tin Kuang typed up a series of clarifications, but hesitated putting the phone down again. She looked up at Dai Quan Kin, feeling he was happy while she kept getting bullied everywhere by his maid. Moments later Tin Kuang flipped her attitude to sweet. Darling, I'm full, I'll go to work first. See you tonight. This made Dai Quan Kin's face immediately flush red. Tin Kuang turned to leave. She just thought if she didn't act like this, would everyone in the house see her as the mistress? Clearly Tin Kuang was the officially recognized proper wife, and she felt she and Quan Kin were very good currently. Mac Phi's face right now was utterly confused about what was happening, while Dai Quan Kin had a satisfied smile. Unable to hide his happiness, then he stood up telling Mac Phi to hurry and go. Come home early tonight since he had Tin Kuang waiting. Mac Phi could only look at his colleague beside, also feeling muddled. Wait. Did Master Dai just smile earlier? And smiled gently right? Next day Tin Kuang coincidentally met the editor-in-chief at a big concert. Now she finally had a chance to thank Professor Thang for cutting her screen time. She even wanted to treat them to a meal. Professor Thang shrugged saying they were just following orders from above. Otherwise who could ignore such big news? Tin Kuang smiled happily. She said even so she had to thank them. If not she would have been truly exposed. Her life would surely be chaotic. Just thinking about it was scary. 
but in her heart Tin Kuang felt this made sense too. Because after all Coco TV belonged to Dai Quan Kin. Not wanting to publicize her, worrying it'd affect his company was normal. It's just the editor-in-chief still couldn't imagine Tin Kuang really was the mermaid goddess. He also reminded her that her post this morning had received huge backlash. Now Han Nian Nian's fans had cursed Tin Kuang to be a B asterisk TCH. After all there was no video proof. The editor said perhaps only if Dai Quan Kin posted clarifying the one he loved wasn't Han Nian Nian could it work. Hearing this, Tin Kuang's face flushed. She recalled the moment Dai Quan Kin walked side by side with Han Nian Nian. Tin Kuang could only smile helplessly saying this was impossible. How could he help her deal with Han Nian Nian? That's the one he likes. At that time, Dai Quan Kin was with Mac Phi going to welcome some important person. This was Kiu Van, Dai Quan Kin's head bodyguard. After greeting him, Dai Quan Kin sat down. His phone rang with a notification sound then. It was a post by the mermaid goddess. Turns out after hesitating, Tin Kuang had decided to post. Affirming the girl Dai Quan Kin held wasn't Han Nian Nian. She even said Quan Kin always called the mermaid goddess little sweetheart. He wasn't cheating at all. Reading the words little sweetheart, Dai Quan Kin was surprised. He secretly wondered if his little mermaid had realized his feelings. At this time his captain Kiu Van secretly asked Mac Phi if in the time he was away training, boss had started dating. Seeing Mac Phi's shocked expression, Kiu Van analyzed that previously boss wouldn't play with his phone when working. Unless it was the Deus distinctive ringtone reminding him. He also said boss didn't like smiling. But looking at his expression now shocked Mac Phi. His master was indeed smiling. Mac Phi panicked not knowing who boss was in love with that he didn't know about. Mac Phi's muddled face thought, the first person he eliminated from suspicion was little Tin Kuang. Mac Phi was certain affirming Dai Quan Kin wouldn't like that girl. Thinking of Han Nian Nian again, Mac Phi also felt they hadn't interacted recently. So who could it be? Mac Phi thought for a bit then went on Dai Quan Kin's Weibo page to take a look. His expression after couldn't hide the shock. Scene change. At this time at the music festival where Tin Kuang was, a celebrity had stepped onto the red carpet, attracting countless camera flashes after. That was Han Nian Nian arriving. Behind her was also a manager lady. She quietly reminded Han Nian Nian that earlier Lang Han and Mr. Si Yu had gone inside. Han Nian Nian couldn't let them suppress her. Han Nian Nian instead answered very smugly. She disdainfully said she didn't believe just relying on Lang Han's throat she could match her. That would be lowering herself. The manager lady then said Mr. Si Yu had made a post looking for someone. She said besides Han Nian Nian yesterday, who else could have played the piano? Just wait a bit longer for Mr. Si Yu to know the one he was looking for was Han Nian Nian and it'd be even more interesting. Han Nian Nian took out a pen and signed smugly. She flicked her hair smugly thinking who else in this world was worthy of the peerless mermaid beauty like her. Not far away, Tin Kuang watching the performance had also seen her. At this time the entire stadium simultaneously rang with countless phone notifications. Everyone took out their phones, all surprised at the new information. That worried manager also brought a phone over for Han Nian Nian to see. It was two posts by Dai Quan Kin. He shared the mermaid goddess post, affirming his precious sweetheart was her. At the same time he also posted saying the Thien Gun law firm had sent lawsuits to all rumor spreaders. Not a single one missed. These were all public actions protecting the mermaid goddess, affirming the feelings between the tycoon and his wife. Reading this, Han Nian Nian was shocked like being struck by lightning. I don't understand what Dai Quan Kin is doing. Why did he post something like that? At this time the assistant had to quickly remind Han Nian Nian that the media was watching her. She couldn't reveal any ugly expressions. The editor-in-chief beside Tin Kuang directly stepped forward to interview, asking Miss Ha if she saw Dai Quan Kin's post yet. How are you feeling now? Han Nian Nian could only smile and say she only wanted to answer music-related questions. But deep down she hated Tin Kuang to the bone. She still felt insignificant little Tin Kuang shouldn't be arrogant. Because this was just politics, Dai Quan Kin wouldn't look at Tin Kuang for a long time. After asking that probing question, the editor-in-chief gleefully told Tin Kuang he had gotten revenge for her, smugly telling Tin Kuang to look at Han Nian Nian's ugly expression. Furthermore, he said didn't Tin Kuang's husband also stand up for her? Tin Kuang's face flushed red. Her eyes couldn't hide the joy but she still shyly told Professor Thang to stop teasing her. At this time the MC had already announced the music festival was starting, so the reporters were invited to their seats. 
Professor Thang still didn't forget to remind Tin Kuang to remember her assignment. Later during Professor Siu's speech she could film it for an interview after. Tin Kuang obediently nodded. Immersing into the bustling atmosphere of the music night, she still kept a small corner of strange peace and satisfaction in her heart. In contrast to Tin Kuang's feelings, Han Nian Nian currently felt like someone had stabbed her butt. Extremely resentful, she still held the view this was a political marriage. Certain Dai Quan Kin didn't like Tin Kuang. Next second, Professor Si Yu was invited on stage to give an opening speech. Tin Kuang was very interested in following along quickly taking notes for her report. The MC now mentioned Professor Siu's post from yesterday, asking if he was looking for someone. Professor Siu immediately excitedly said last night he heard a piece of music. It was definitely a masterpiece. Unfortunately when he went over, that person had left. Since then old man Siu couldn't forget. He wanted to be able to hear it once more in his remaining years. Below, the audience immediately buzzed, surely all very curious about that person. In Ha Nian Nian's mind at this time suddenly came up with an idea. She felt if she told Professor Siu now that it was her yesterday, that way she could divert the media's attention. Having thought of this, Han Nian Nian immediately made a sign to her manager. The madam caught the cue and immediately acted, saying thank you to Professor Siu for praising Han Nian Nian. Han Nian Nian also acted very surprised. Putting on a stunned expression, the assistant said sincerely, saying that last night Nian Nian had played a piece in the first floor lounge of Tin Tai Heen. Around 8 p.m., hearing just that much, the audience below became extremely excited. To be able to receive praise from Professor Siu, as expected of Han Nian Nian, the mermaid princess of her braindead fans, Han Nian Nian now acted like she was scolding her assistant. She said didn't she tell the assistant to only speak at the end? Like this she was delaying the opening ceremony schedule. Hearing this, the assistant immediately said she always knew Nian Nian was humble, but the song she just composed made Professor Siu love it so much. He even posted online looking for the person. The assistant said since Han Nian Nian was here already, how could she bear to let Professor Siu be anxious searching in vain? Standing below, Tin Kuang felt this play was very good. Keep going like this. Tin Kuang was certain the best actress award this year would belong to these two hams. After that, the assistant and Nian Nian fed off each other, deciding to perform a piece for Professor Siu to see. Wanting to create a perfect ending to this music night, the MC was of course very excited to loudly introduce the next performance by Miss Ha Nian Nian. At this time Professor Siu was still looking at Nian Nian with a very happy and pleased expression. She sat down at the piano, hands on the keys, eyes closed indulging in the music. Tin Kuang was also very interested in seeing her perform. When the music enveloped the huge space, the faces of the fans revealed joy and amazement, but that mattered little compared to Professor Siu's silent sigh and disappointed expression. Tin Kuang also smiled commenting. She knew this was mechanical playing without any feeling, yet still wanted to catch Professor Siu's eye. Tin Kuang felt Han Nian Nian was really confident. After the performance ended, the amateur female MC excessively flattered Han Nian Nian to high heaven, constantly praising the masterpiece, also praising Han Nian Nian for truly being talented to make Professor Siu unable to forget. The male MC turned to ask Professor Siu if he surely didn't expect the moment he awaited to come so quickly. Professor Siu could only give a dry laugh. Han Nian Nian made a teary expression of joy, shamelessly saying she didn't expect the impromptu piece she played to receive high praise from Professor Siu. The MC also mentioned the critiques of the online music experts. Nian Nian relied on the gifted throat of the mermaid and national popularity to top the charts for so long. He also asked Professor Siu if he was very happy. Professor Siu could still only smile helplessly. This further provoked Han Nian Nian's outrageousness to erupt. She said she had only wanted to play this piece then give her speech. She didn't expect casually playing at a restaurant would receive such high praise from Professor Siu. She smiled brightly saying she hadn't named this piece yet, asking Professor Siu if he minded her naming it having lived these years. Right after the MCs declared this a perfectly grand ending, excited cheers sounded from below, but of course some still weren't convinced. For example, this blonde girl sitting next to Tin Kuang, just looking at Han Nian Nian, she blurted out asking why it was always Han Nian Nian. 
Is the mermaid so great? Right now Tin Kuang also nodded agreeing. Seeing that, the blonde girl turned to ask if Tin Kuang was also an anti-fan of Han Nian Nian. Hearing the question, Tin Kuang acted surprised saying Han Nian Nian even had anti-fans? Then she vigorously waved her hands denying she wasn't anti. And on the stage, old man Si Yu finally spoke up rejecting Han Nian Nian's proposal to name her piece. Han Nian Nian's face turned green, her smile slowly freezing. She felt this old geezer wasn't giving her face. Old man Si Yu now explained in more detail, bluntly saying while Han Nian Nian's piece was good too. Unfortunately it wasn't the piece he was looking for, even coldly telling her to pick another name instead. Below, the audience started getting noisy, uttering disappointed words making Han Nian Nian tremble on stage. At this time old man Si Yu smiled at the reporters again saying although this piece was good it wasn't the same. He hoped they could help him find that other piece. Han Nian Nian now still stubbornly said she had a few more pieces in her album. She wanted to play some others for Professor Si Yu to listen to. Han Nian Nian wasn't resigned. Today she had to get her face back no matter what. Wouldn't accept this humility humiliation, but the professor still directly ignored her, even laughing saying after playing so long she must be tired, so should rest. Tin Kuang sitting below, using a special sound wave asked Professor Si Yu if the piece he heard was this melody. Having said that, Tin Kuang started singing. The professor was immediately captivated by the music, eyes wide open. He immediately excitedly said this was the piece, even calling out loudly asking the program team to show him who was singing. The spotlight immediately shined on Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang immediately stood up, calmly walking towards the stage, ignoring Ha Nian Nian's anger. Professor Si Yu sincerely requested Tin Kuang to sing it again since he didn't hear clearly earlier. Tin Kuang didn't refuse, immediately singing. Professor Si Yu's eyes lit up like seeing gold, unable to hide his joy, in this game. Ha Nian Nian ate chili. After listening, Professor Si Yu excitedly asked if Tin Kuang was the one playing yesterday. Tin Kuang immediately denied it again, saying it was her friend named Wei Tik. Her rather modest friend didn't come today. Ha Nian Nian didn't expect her radiance to be completely stolen by Tin Kuang and became extremely angry. She silently cursed Tin Kuang for being an insignificant white lotus sticking her nose everywhere. At this time Professor Si Yu had also inadvertently noticed Ha Nian Nian's negative bitter mood. He decided to teach her a lesson. Professor Si Yu pointed his thumb at the piano behind, asking Tin Kuang if she knew how to play. He wanted Tin Kuang to play a bit so he could judge her skills. Ha Nian Nian's eyes bulged out like boiled pig head hearing this. She felt this old geezer really wanted to slap her face in front of everyone. As for little Tin Kuang, facing the stream of invitations she confidently stepped forward, calmly sitting at the piano. Last night Tin Kuang had just improvised without sheet music, but Tin Kuang could absolutely play with her skills. With all the emotions she had at that moment, the divine sound rang out captivating all listeners in happiness. Truly it had touched their hearts. Everyone had to admit the music was great. The quality surpassed Han Nian Nian's new piece, making everyone feel the intense emotions conveyed in this song. It really lived up to being the piece acknowledged by Professor Si Yu. It was truly different. Ha Nian Nian was extremely bitter. That spotlight shined on Tin Kuang. While she had to stand in a corner on her own stage, Tin Kuang stopped playing. As soon as the music ended a panicked scream rang out. Ha Nian Nian fainted. The female MC immediately panicked rushing over, loudly shouting for everyone to save the national treasure. The reporters quickly raised their cameras, scrambling for the breaking news. Tin Kuang was also a bit confused, blurting out asking if Han Nian Nian would be okay. Only the increasingly spicy ginger-like old man Si Yu smiled calmly answering she was fine, just pretending. Only now did Tin Kuang realize who had replied to her. Now she finally had a chance to greet him in a fluster. Professor Si Yu smiled asking for Tin's name. Yes, Tin Kuang also shyly said her name. While Professor Si Yu had realized there was no one named Wei Tik to begin with. Yes, Tin Kuang was extremely surprised asking how he knew. Professor Si Yu laughed merrily. He said not only did he see through her lie, he could also detect she was in love. Tin Kuang felt confused and denied she didn't. Professor Si Yu still insisted Tin Kuang had someone in her heart. Yesterday her peace still carried sorrow. Today it was full of sweetness. Professor Si Yu asked if a lot had happened to Tin Kuang today right? Somehow after hearing that question, 
Tin Kuang immediately thought of Dai Quan Kin, remembered his gentle caring gestures, unable to restrain her inner conflict. Tin Kuang yelled telling herself to get a grip, even saying Dai Quan Kin was a malignant tumor. In another development, at this time Dai Quan Kin was in the car with Kiu Van and Mac Phi. He started interrogating Mac Phi why Han Nian Nian came to the hotel with him yesterday. Mac Phi recalled Kiu Van's analysis yesterday, believing Boss was in love, so he hesitantly said he thought there were feelings between Quan Kin and Han Nian Nian so he leaked a little to her. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin told Mac Phi to stop the car then got out himself. And now Mac Phi also knew he was in trouble and quickly admitted his mistake, tearfully begging for forgiveness saying he wouldn't dare next time. But poor Mac Phi didn't receive mercy. It was like he got kicked to the curb. Dai Quan Kin sat in the car, eyes looking out the window. He asked why so many people thought he liked Han Nian Nian so much. Kiu Van explained it was because he really liked the mermaid. Mermaids were everywhere. Furthermore the only mermaid in the world was Han Nian Nian so everyone thought that. Dai Quan Kin didn't expect his liking mermaids to be so obvious. But the mermaid in his heart, from beginning to end only had one person. He didn't expect even if he lived again he still couldn't avoid that little mermaid tale. At this time Kiu Van continued. He said he didn't believe Dai Quan Kin liked Han Nian Nian. He felt Boss simply liked mermaids. After that he asked if Dai Quan Kin had known Miss Tin Kuang early on, and still liked her right? Having a sore spot poked, Dai Quan Kin's face flushed as he shut his eyes saying he didn't like her. Didn't know, but those clumsy lies couldn't fool Captain. He knew full well Dai Quan Kin was pretending. The car stopped at the front gate. Dai Quan Kin had just gotten out when he saw Mac Phi biking over yelling something had happened. Dai Quan Kin immediately frowned tensely, gasping tiredly. Mac Phi reported Miss Tin Kuang had just been taken away. Arriving here, Dai Quan Kin impatiently shouted asking what had happened. Turns out just now the National Treasure Commission contacted Mac Phi, saying Miss Tin Kuang was taken to drink herbal tea. Dai Quan Kin's face showed alarm. He had a bad premonition. He knew for sure this wasn't good. Hearing this National Treasure Protection Bureau's name, Dai Quan Kin asked Mac Phi if Tin Kuang had provoked Han Nian Nian. Kiu Van had also gotten the news. He said online rumors said the Dai family's helper was fired. To get revenge the mermaid goddess caught Han Nian Nian, making her faint and hospitalized. Quan Kin didn't understand how this related to Tin Kuang. He asked Kiu Van if the Protection Bureau knew Tin Kuang was the mermaid goddess. The National Treasure Protection Bureau was the professional prep team for Han Nian Nian. Anyway their motto was always cannot underestimate the sacred national treasure. As long as they saw Han Nian Nian's image being damaged, they would look for someone to drink fresh herbal tea. Dai Quan Kin was extremely angry. He saw this protection bureau still wasn't disbanded. Truly too wasteful of tax money. Dai Quan Kin fiercely told Mac Phi to cancel all later schedules. Now they would go to the protection bureau. At this time in a certain hospital's hallway, Tin Kuang was being harassed by a group of men. Protection Bureau's staff, Tin Kuang still tried her utmost to explain she was just a reporter. Absolutely had no intention of harming the national treasure. She clearly said the MC pulled her up. Objectively speaking she was shot while lying down. This immature national treasure protection guy was lecturing Tin Kuang, saying in that chaotic situation she shouldn't have spoken up, also saying the country only had Ha Nian Nian as the mermaid. If she had any mishaps could Tin Kuang shoulder this responsibility? This time Tin Kuang still endured, but that guy pushed further saying Tin Kuang was a citizen so had to be responsible for protecting the national treasure. Even threatening if Han Nian Nian was harmed the national treasure would go extinct. This would be a tremendous loss. Even worms will turn. Tin Kuang couldn't stand it anymore and retorted harshly, saying if you're scared of extinction then tell her to hurry up and get married and have kids. Three years give birth to two, ten years give birth to a dozen. Both increasing the population and the number of national treasures, can even gift them to other countries to increase friendship. Despite Tin Kuang's anger, that guy still didn't care at all and demanded she go apologize to Han Nian Nian then they wouldn't pursue her responsibility anymore. On the other hand if she didn't apologize Tin Kuang would be punished. Detained for a month, Tin Kuang was so angry she trembled. She felt why did she have to apologize to that wretch. She didn't do anything wrong. Tin Kuang's eyes looked through the window. Inside, Han Nian Nian was lying down. Beside her, her parents were worriedly asking about their daughter healthy as an ox. Tin Kuang recalled childhood memories. Just Han Nian Nian pretending to be sick and weak a bit. Tin Kuang would be tossed aside, told to understand, to love her sister more. 
little Tin Kuang could only cry. She was also in great pain, bone deep pain, until when Tin Kuang had a fever lying in bed, expecting care from her parents, but seeing her daughter sick, that mother felt Tin Kuang was very troublesome, only caused problems, Tin Kuang at that time could only apologize, apologize for getting sick, only her brother Ha Tru Da truly cared about her, the doctor said after Tin Kuang's bone marrow was damaged her immune system weakened, needed special care, Ha Tru Da could only interrogate and blame the parents why they treated her so differently, why didn't they care about the child, the cruel mother still only denied responsibility with the excuse caring for Nian Nian was already tiring enough, no time left to care for another. Moreover she looked down on her youngest daughter for being ugly, saying Ha True Da was still young so didn't understand. She said this family wanted to break class, to rise up to be upper class so could only rely on Ha Nian Nian. Thinking back, Tin Kuang could only sigh. The painful memories flooded back making her have to close her eyes and shake her head to dispel the dark clouds. Tin Kuang just stepped inside like that. Mrs. Ha, Tin Kuang's birth mother looked at her with vicious bitter jealousy. She only knew this was the girl who stole the man from Nian Nian's heart. Then she snobbishly told Tin Kuang to wait outside. Wait until Ha Nian Nian woke up to come apologize. Hearing this, Tin Kuang asked permission to smirk. As expected, she still didn't recognize her own daughter at all. Tin Kuang said she didn't come to apologize but to collect debts. Then she shoved the old woman aside and barged in. Old man Ha was reading the newspaper. Seeing Tin Kuang enter he jumped up. Who allowed you in here? Have you no upbringing? Tin Kuang pulled up a chair dryly laughed then sat down with arms crossed. She said her upbringing didn't allow her to respect him. The married couple panted and gritted their teeth. They didn't expect this girl to actually dare be so arrogant. They scolded Tin Kuang for being shameless. Even threatened to have the protection bureau imprison Tin Kuang. Unable to listen anymore. Tin Kuang picked her ear. She sneered saying in a challenging way full of implication. The ones who'll be imprisoned by the protection bureau seem to be you all. Tin Kuang provocatively said didn't know how many years attempted murder of a national treasure would get. Hearing this, the couple scolded Tin Kuang for being crazy, even saying how could they kill their own daughter. Tin Kuang glanced at the bed. Her own daughter was lying there pretending to sleep, now scrunching her face in anger. After that Tin Kuang said she didn't have time to play with them. She said today she came to advise them that in the future don't bother her. Best to automatically keep their distance when seeing her. Finally those words poked that slippery eel mermaid awake. She scolded Tin Kuang for speaking nonsense. Even threatened if Tin Kuang still refused to apologize she would immediately call the investigator. Tin Kuang clapped her hands, smirking challenging her to hurry and call. He said she also wanted the investigator to come, to hear how certain parents threw away a six-year-old national treasure into the sea to let it live or die. Surely the protection bureau would also be very interested in this story. The whole room suddenly fell silent. All three Ha family members speechless, eyes widened, not believing their ears. Still the slippery Ha Nian Nian saying her parents only gave birth to one fairy and that was her. Tin Kuang smirked smiling. She said when she was little she followed her parents out to sea fishing. By chance recorded the entire process of a mermaid fairy being thrown into the ocean by Mr. and Mrs. Ha. Such a precious image. Should it be sent to the protection bureau to watch? The married couple was struck in the heart. Still stunned as if temporarily chat banned unable to say anything. Ha Nian Nian now had to shriek defending. Saying her little sister was critically ill right after being born. Since she couldn't be saved her parents could only reluctantly let her go into the sea. She even told Tin Kuang not to threaten them with delusions. At this time Mrs. Ha also stuck out her neck arguing. She said that was flesh and blood from her body. Saying a small child like Tin Kuang knew nothing. Tin Kuang dryly laughed, critically ill? She asked them wasn't it to save the most perfect mermaid fairy in the world that she got sick. Tin Kuang said she heard when Ha Nian Nian was little she had chronic leukemia. The family had to sacrifice her sister's life to save her. A life for a life, Tin Kuang asked in these past years living well right? Ha Nian Nian couldn't refute, stuttering asking how Tin Kuang knew. Tin Kuang cut in saying her family had saved that pitiful mermaid fairy and knew a lot of things, even asking if they wanted to listen. At this time Mrs. Ha's hands and feet were trembling, wanting to ask about that mermaid's condition now. Tin Kuang decisively said she was already dead. Hearing this, she had to grab the table edge to stand steady. Unexpectedly after hearing her youngest daughter had died, 
that mother breathed a sigh of relief like a burden had lifted. Tin Kuang was heartbroken, her eyes filled with tears. When she herself was thrown into the icy ocean, she could still clearly hear the curses of her flesh and blood. They said if not for Tin Kuang's bone marrow being able to save Nian Nian they wouldn't have raised her for long. Because she was an ugly little thing, didn't even know shame crying and causing the Ha family to lose face. Tin Kuang couldn't stand the resentment and immediately left. Behind, Ha Nian Nian still cursed after her. She said these were all Tin Kuang's one-sided fabrications. She even said Dai Quan Kin loved her. Even if Tin Kuang took his body, she could never have his heart. Tin Kuang also refuted, saying if so then that cross-eyed trash man no one would look at. After that Tin Kuang opened the door and stepped out. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin was behind the door. He just held Tin Kuang in his arms without saying anything. This trash man wants to beg you to care for me, can I? Tin Kuang was surprised and temporarily speechless. Only guessed one thing, after so many terrible things happening, Dai Quan Kin's embrace was to Tin Kuang like blazing sun meeting pouring rain. Dai Quan Kin's eyes also couldn't hide his love. Seeing him, old man Ha blinked repeatedly. Son-in-law you're here, visiting Nian Nian right? Tin Kuang's heart ached as she shed tears. As if dragged back to reality by those two words son-in-law, she pushed Dai Quan Kin away in aggravation. Trash man, if you've come to visit Ha Nian Nian then don't touch me. Dai Quan Kin calmly replied word for word. He said she wasn't his. Why would he visit her? After that Quan Kin grabbed Tin Kuang's hand, pulled her inside, he sat down then placed Tin Kuang on his lap. The two Ha elders still tried clinging to their self-proclaimed son-in-law, even asking what he meant by this. Dai Quan Kin smiled. He said it was true he liked the Ha's daughter. Hearing this, that mermaid scum was smug. But at this time Quan Kin continued. He said did he say the one he liked was Miss Ha? Even Tin Kuang was stunned eyes wide not understanding what he meant. While Ha Nian Nian's old mother had jumped up, she interrogated Dai Quan Kin why their Dai family built so many mermaid figurine parks. If he didn't like Ha Nian Nian, why pay them so much image royalty? If not Nian Nian then who did he like? Dai Quan Kin frowned saying besides Nian Nian, didn't they have another daughter? Shouldn't they know in their hearts? Ha Nian Nian's mother immediately recalled what Tin Kuang had just said. She was frightened but still tried covering up saying there was no second daughter. Besides Nian Nian there were no other daughters. After that she turned to scold Tin Kuang. Thinking Tin Kuang had said nonsense in front of Dai Quan Kin. She once again asserted she never had a second daughter. Never. Tin Kuang was so heartbroken she trembled. She didn't expect there to be such a heartless mother in the world. At this time it was still Dai Quan Kin hugging her tightly. He asked her wasn't she afraid of being struck by heaven saying this. Outside, thunder rumbled angrily in succession making her shake uncontrollably. The terrified old woman collapsed to the floor. Her face ghastly pale. At this time Dai Quan Kin also directly told Ha Nian Nian this engagement was the older generation's idea. He never agreed at all. He said the woman Dai Quan Kin wanted was never Ha Nian Nian. Even saying if she had delusions she should hurry to the psychologist. Saying so then dashingly pulling Tin Kuang away. Behind, Ha Nian Nian was like a madwoman. Shrieking how could Dai Quan Kin say he liked her sister. Quan Kin turned back smiling smugly asking why not. Ha Nian Nian's eyes bulged out like boiled pig head. She started uncontrollably cursing randomly. Saying that little sister couldn't compare to her. Even saying how could Dai Quan Kin take out that ugly fish to humiliate her. Hearing this. Tin Kuang was extremely angry. She jerked her hand out of Dai Quan Kin's, stepped forward pointing right at Han Nian Nian's face telling her to listen clearly. Tin Kuang said from now on she would make it very clear. The one truly undeserving of comparison was her. After speaking they left dragging each other. Sitting in the car, Tin Kuang secretly glanced at Dai Quan Kin. He had been on the phone for half an hour already. Truly very busy. Tin Kuang guessed this World Economic Conference seemed very important. Knowing she was looking at him, Dai Quan Kin's face flushed. Seeing him concentrating on the call but actually silently blaming himself for publicly saying he liked the Ha family's youngest daughter. He worried not knowing what his little mermaid would think hearing this. She wouldn't laugh at him right? Seeing her expression, he again wondered if she had any feelings. At this time little Tin Kuang's phone buzzed. Dai Quan Kin curiously took a peek at her phone screen. It turned out Tin Kuang was messaging Han Tan back. He was asking her tomorrow to be a tour guide for his brothers to go out to the island. 
Tin Kuang also immediately agreed telling Han Tan back to come to the TV station gate to pick her up tomorrow. It had been a while since Tin Kuang went home. She really missed everyone on the island so smiled happily like that, not noticing the black-faced brother sitting beside her. But this time Han Tan back sent another long mushy message, saying Tin Kuang was big sister, the hope of his life, even saying he hadn't gotten to put Tin Kuang in his heart yet. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin's face darkened, because this woman was his. He couldn't let the boy put her in his heart like that. Dai Quan Kin couldn't help letting out a few contemptuous dry laughs. Seeing him move, Tin Kuang turned asking if he had said something. Quan Kin made an excuse that tonight he had to return to City Z. The economic conference was early tomorrow so he couldn't be absent. Telling her to come with him. Hearing this, Tin Kuang was extremely awkward. She made the excuse that she didn't even have clothes prepared. She was about to say tomorrow she still had things to do but Tin Kuang was interrupted by Dai Quan Kin. He said today because of her he kept urgent traveling very tiringly. Even saying he would have someone prepare clothes for her, so she wouldn't be without a change of clothes. Seeing Dai Quan Kin's tired appearance. Tin Kuang felt if she said tomorrow she had to take Han Tan back sightseeing, he would definitely be choked to death by him. To appease this hot and cold man, Tin Kuang turned to place her small hand on his face, then gently massaged Dai Quan Kin's temples making his face flush. Tin Kuang asked why Dai Quan Kin wanted to take her along. Embarrassed, Dai Quan Kin looked away avoiding her gaze. He said she was a reporter. Didn't she want to interview at the World Economic Conference? Tin Kuang asked again but Dai didn't assign her to cover this area. Area. But Dai Quan Kin said if they didn't arrange for her, then shouldn't she know to seize it herself? A soldier who doesn't want to be a general isn't a good soldier. After that he asked Tin Kuang if tomorrow he arranged exclusive interviews with some big shots in the economic industry for her. Asking if she would go, Tin Kuang immediately happily nodded agreeing. So the girl had to turn to one side to text Han Tan back cancelling their appointment. Saying the station suddenly announced overtime so she couldn't go. Although very disappointed, Han Tan back had to accept being stood up. After that he lamented to brother Luke saying he was a young master who had seduced countless girls but now got stood up. Han Tan Bak said Tin Kuang couldn't go because she had overtime tomorrow, even asking brother Luke why he was interested in a small island. Hearing this, he replied recently being busy he wanted to find a peaceful place to relax, also saying if Han Tan Bak's friend didn't have time then next time. Han Tan Bak also told brother Luke they'd set another date then said he had things to do and left. In the room remained brother Luke and his assistant, seeing her boss tired. The assistant suggested arranging another island for him to vacation at. That Luke guy threw down a thick document below the table then told his assistant to look. Unexpectedly after just opening it to look, the assistant had to change color in panic crying out. This woman, what exactly was her identity? He asked if the Miss Dai that young Master Han knew was the mermaid fairy who made Dai Quan Kin waver. He asked if Miss Dai had ordinary looks. How could she make Dai Quan Kin moved? Mr. Luke stood up looking out the window. He said that was why he wanted to go to her hometown to check. He wanted to know just what kind of person this Miss Tin Kuang was. In the documents information was Miss Tin Kuang's details and the one the state arranged to be her fiancé, including Dai Quan Kin. Dai family's second son, CEO of Dai Group, Cultural Entertainment Media Industries, Food, Education, Lam Han Fong, eldest son of real estate mogul and Lam Group, founder of investment company NHU Lam Toy Fong. Glancing over, the assistant discovered her matchmaking system was all top 10 richest men in the country who didn't want to marry. He wondered if this was luck or capability. Feeling this Miss Tin Kuang's identity was truly strange. After that young master Luke told his assistant to hold investigating Han Nian Nian and Dai Quan Kin. This Miss Tin Kuang was so mysterious. Had to thoroughly investigate first. Speaking again of Dai Quan Kin and Miss Tin Kuang. The two were currently on a private plane. Dai Quan Kin was sitting comfortably when he suddenly scowled curling over. He knew his old illness had relapsed again, just didn't expect it to be now. After that he immediately ordered his subordinate to emergency land the plane. Kiyu Van panicked asking if Dai Quan Kin's old illness relapsed. At this time he already couldn't stand steadily anymore. Pupils contracted, sharp fangs grew long and his skin turned corpse pale. Dai Quan Kin told Kiyu Van to quickly contact ground crew. Find the closest landing spot, on a plane with this many people. He was afraid he couldn't control himself. After speaking Dai Quan Kin laboriously stood up and ran away. Kiyu Van could only follow his request, calling for help while telling Dai Quan Kin to temporarily lock himself in a room to endure for a bit. Dai Quan Kin opened the room door, 
Unexpectedly inside Tin Kuang was sound asleep. Seeing her sleeping so well, he was even more determined to not let her see him in this state. With no other way, Quan Kin had to run away again. He crawled into a small compartment, locking himself inside, then laboriously ordered his subordinate to guard this place. No matter what he did, don't let him out. This was an order that couldn't be disobeyed. Another thing was absolutely don't wake Miss Tin Kuang. His employees had just responded yes when Tin Kuang's voice rang out. He groggily walked out asking what they were doing. Captain Kiu Van immediately stood blocking the bathroom door, telling her it was nothing, inviting Tin Kuang to keep resting in her room, saying when they landed he would call her. Meanwhile inside, Dai Quan Kin had already started craving blood. Unable to endure he smashed things noisily. Tin Kuang seriously interrogated them on who was inside. The employees had no choice but to lie that Dai Quan Kin got drunk and went crazy. It was nothing. Tin Kuang immediately recalled Quan Kin writhing in pain on the night of the full moon. She angrily told the people. What drunk, he had a relapse of his old illness right. Even Captain Kiu Van and his entourage were shocked that she knew of the Kin family's illness. Knowing they couldn't hide it, Kiu Van explained to Tin Kuang that Dai Quan Kin's illness followed no rules. Very hard to prepare care for so whenever going out he had to have many guards beside him. The purpose wasn't to protect him, but to restrain him to protect others. Hearing this, Tin Kuang couldn't hide her compassion. No wonder every day going to work Dai Quan Kin also had a whole convoy following him. She thought he liked showing off. So it actually had a reason. The noises from the bathroom now grew louder. All were fierce punches on the metal door. Must be very uncomfortable. Tin Kuang told them not to lock the door. Just let him out. She knew when the illness relapsed he would be in great pain. Would be chilled and shivering. Kiu Van was about to explain to Tin Kuang that Master Kin wasn't chilled and shivering, but for another reason, but he suddenly froze. He couldn't say it, Kiu Van's memory flashed back to little Dai Quan Kin. When having an episode he couldn't help but suck his beloved puppy dry until it died. Dai Quan Kin fearfully told Kiu Van he didn't want to be a bloodsucking monster, even saying for Kiu Van to hurry tie him up. Inside, Dai Quan Kin could only know to use his tie to tie his own hands to restrain himself. Seeing himself like this, even he himself was disgusted, let alone his little mermaid. Helpless, Dai Quan Kin could only bang his head on the door. The thirst for blood burning his body. The painful feeling like some addicts going through withdrawal. Memories flashing back in him. Tin Kuang at that time knowing he was a bloodsucker said he was disgusting. Scolded him as a monster, just leaving him like that. Dai Quan Kin now blamed himself for not realizing sooner. Even if he put her in his heart he still wouldn't receive her love. Which girl would agree to live with a monster? Dai Quan Kin painfully shut his eyes tight. The thin cloth couldn't restrain the formidable strength of one about to drown in bloodthirst. Dai Quan Kin punched the door strongly. The thin metal couldn't withstand it and tore a large hole. Behind that he saw Tin Kuang look at him. Her gaze seeing him was extremely stunned. Seeing her, Dai Quan Kin's heart ached. He tried to restrain his actions, turning to tell Kiu Van to knock Miss Tin Kuang out. Miss Tin Kuang tried to rush in but was held back by everyone. She interrogated Quan Kin on what basis he did this. Inside, Dai Quan Kin still urged his captain. Kiu Van, can't you hear me? Why haven't you made a move yet? Tense, Miss Tin Kuang could only plead for Kiu Van not to move. Embarrassed, Kiu Van suggested Tin Kuang return to the bedroom. Protect herself, listen to Master Kin. With unwavering conviction, Miss Tin Kuang was still determined to persuade them. She said locking him in the bathroom did nothing. Right now he needed to lie still best with another pillow to hug. Hearing this, the employees were surprised because they never heard before that when Master Kin had episodes he needed that. Although embarrassed, Tin Kuang still had to loudly say last time he had an episode and hugged her all night like a pillow then it stopped. She insisted they move aside and let him out. The bathroom had so many germs he'd get even more sick. One confused employee still asked Tin Kuang. How could Dai Quan Kin hug her all night but she wasn't bitten? Tin Kuang blankly asked why would he bite her. The employee finally couldn't hold it in anymore and explained that when Kin had an episode, the thirst for blood would overwhelm reason. Hugging her all night he couldn't possibly not bite her. Hearing his secret being told to Tin Kuang, inside Dai Quan Kin angrily shouted for him to shut up. Hearing the words bloodsucker, Tin Kuang turned to look at Dai Quan Kin with disbelief. Heartbroken, Dai Quan Kin knelt down. What he feared had come. 
his little mermaid knew now. He was afraid she knew of his strange illness. Discriminate against him even more, he actually thought correctly to some degree. Because Tin Kuang was also wondering why Quan Kin's illness was the desire to drink human blood. She asked herself if he was a vampire or something. Thinking this, Tin Kuang silently ran away. She entered the room, the sound of the door closing rang out. Watching her go, Dai Quan Kin's heart shattered. He saw it was still the same. She still hated him this much. The bathroom door now collapsed, unable to withstand anymore. Dai Quan Kin's whole body drenched in sweat, his eyes no longer wild but brimming with naive sadness. Kiyu Van turned saying to Master Kin this way was no good. He still just grit his teeth telling Kiyu Van to find something to restrain him. He absolutely could not let himself become a bloodsucking monster. Very quickly a huge iron chain bound Dai Quan Kin. Embarrassed, Kiyu Van brought Dai Quan Kin a glass of cold water, comforting him that Miss Tin Kuang was just a new graduate inexperienced with life so was a little afraid. Heartbroken but still trying to seem fine, Dai Quan Kin told Kiyu Van it was just him overthinking. In his heart he blamed himself for being too affectionate, thought she'd be like last time again. Case however much still unwilling to leave. Clinging stubbornly, history really repeated itself. How could Dai Quan Kin dare hope for a different future? He felt the state matching him with her, truly tormented her and was also tormenting him. Unexpectedly when he thought he was the most miserable, Tin Kuang happily burst in, in her hands holding some kind of bowl, cheerfully shouting loudly that Dai Quan Kin was saved. Seeing the bright red bowl, Kiu Van shrieked, panicking thinking it was precisely blood. Dai Quan Kin was even more agitated, asking Tin Kuang what she was doing. Why did she dare take her own blood? Seeing this, Tin Kuang waved her hand telling them not to talk nonsense, saying this wasn't blood, telling Quan Kin to not worry, drinking it would cure him. Dai Quan Kin was still suspiciously pale. If not blood then what was it? He secretly thought what a silly girl. Didn't she say she hated him? Why do this? Why not avoid him but take her own blood instead? At this time Miss Tin Kuang still only thought of him. Seeing him this uncomfortable she said this wasn't blood, telling him to not worry and just drink a sip first. Dai Quan Kin didn't believe her. Even more angry he ordered Kiyu Van to take Tin Kuang away. Panicked, Kiyu Van opened his mouth, behind. The employees had come over, seeing the situation was bad, Tin Kuang clicked her tongue. She knelt down beside him, not understanding why this guy just wouldn't listen to her. Tin Kuang had no choice but to use harsh measures, raising her hand to pinch Dai Quan Kin's cheek. A moment later Tin Kuang closed her eyes and nose drinking all of the bright red bowl, then directly mouth fed Dai Quan Kin in front of his shocked eyes. This could be considered their first kiss although the purpose wasn't very romantic. At this time Tin Kuang still felt very annoyed because Dai Quan Kin still hadn't opened his mouth. His cheek was completely flushed red. In his eyes only Tin Kuang. He finally opened his mouth and drank all of the liquid. This scene directly made the lonely pups here gape in shock. Truly an eye-opening experience. Strange knowledge had been absorbed. After leaving Dai Quan Kin's lips, Tin Kuang smiled smugly. Thinking she had a bit of experience in this, how could she lose to him? Dai Quan Kin lowered his head, continuously avoiding Miss Tin Kuang's gaze, even asking her why she wasn't ashamed. Hearing this question, Miss Tin Kuang disagreed, coming even closer saying they were a legal married couple. What she did to her husband wasn't improper. Embarrassed, Dai Quan Kin refuted saying they were just a contractual couple. Hearing this, Miss Tin Kuang still calmly patted Dai Quan Kin's shoulder. She told him not to worry, she still remembered this was a one-year contract. Also knew he didn't like her, he said it at the hospital already. The one he liked was the Ha family's little daughter, Miss Ha Queen Queen. Frowning, Dai Quan Kin lowered his head. That's right, the one he liked was Ha Queen Queen. But he also wanted to know when Tin Kuang would acknowledge her own identity. After that Tin Kuang poured the rest left in the bowl into her mouth again. Dai Quan Kin panicked turning to yell loudly asking Kiyu Van what he was still standing there for. Though so immediately Tin Kuang was carried away by a group. After that mischievous girl was taken away. The door was promptly shut behind them. Restoring the quiet gloomy atmosphere to the room. Dai Quan Kin glanced again at the bright red bowl. He still couldn't believe why she could do that. Why take blood then feed him directly by mouth. He could hear Tin Kuang outside still stubbornly reminding him to drink the rest of that half bowl. Blushing, Dai Quan Kin didn't know if he could believe she had changed. No longer hating him, resenting him, or wanting to leave him anymore. After researching the blood bowl, 
Kiyu Van reported to Master Kin that this didn't seem to be real blood. Remorsefully he said it seemed they had misunderstood Tin Kuang. Even asking if Dai Quan Kin wanted him to go ask. Dai Quan Kin didn't know why he suddenly felt lost. Saying forget it, he was tired already. Telling Kiyu Van to keep away from him a bit. Then seeing Dai Quan Kin silently fall asleep. Kiyu Van was extremely shocked that his family's master Kin had actually stabilized already. He also quickly removed the iron chains on him, covering Quan Kin with a jacket. Outside the moon was high. This time the plane could continue the journey without having to emergency land. A while later Dai Quan Kin startled awake. He was surprised that he had recovered so quickly. At this time he immediately went to find his little mermaid. Running to the bedroom, at this time Tin Kuang was also peacefully asleep. Touching his lips, Dai Quan Kin inadvertently recalled the afternoon's kiss and his face flushed. He just sat down gently beside the bed, secretly gazing at his moon, just raised his hand to brush Tin Kuang's hair back. She immediately rubbed her head against his hand happily. Dai Quan Kin smiled gently. She still had this habit. He then leaned down close beside little Tin Kuang, in her sleep sensing something warm approaching. Tin Kuang hugged his neck, conveniently pulling him down tightly embracing him. Seeing Tin Kuang at such a close distance again, Dai Quan Kin shyly flushed red seeing her little nose start sniffing. Dai Quan Kin wondered if he had some strange fragrance? At that time, in Tin Kuang's dream, she saw herself under the ocean as the mermaid queen. At this time an attendant reported that someone claiming to be Tin Kuang's partner sought an audience. Hearing this, Tin Kuang blankly said she didn't have a partner. This must be some bold human trying to trick her. Angry, Tin Kuang slammed her hand ordering the imposter to be brought in. Two mermen immediately brought in a masked man in black. Frowning, Tin Kuang asked who he was. Even threatening if he dared trick the mermaid queen her then he'd be killed. Unexpectedly he politely bowed then respectfully kissed her hand. Sweetly calling her darling saying how could he trick her. He introduced himself as the recipient of Tin Kuang's first kiss. For short her partner, right? Hearing he was the recipient of her first kiss, Tin Kuang hesitated. At this time the other side suddenly rang with another voice asking how could he still not know she had had a first kiss partner. Hearing the call, Tin Kuang turned to that side, asking who just spoke. It was Dai Quan Kin appearing with the air of a CEO. Seeing this, Tin Kuang fearfully hurriedly explained to Dai Quan Kin that she didn't know that guy, telling Dai Quan Kin not to misunderstand. Hearing this, the masked brother pulled Tin Kuang's hand, saying she must know him. He was the recipient of her first kiss. On the other side, Dai Quan Kin also struggled, cursing her as a traitor for daring to have another partner behind his back. The two kept arguing continuously. Helpless, Tin Kuang finally had to scream, stop arguing. Then she was startled awake by her own scream. Terrified, Tin Kuang clutched her heart. That dream really frightened her to death. Dreaming again of that huge tumor Dai Quan Kin. Tin Kuang was certain this was a nightmare. But remembering the masked man claiming to be her first kiss. Tin Kuang was lost in thought. She remembered her first kiss was when she fell into the sea. Adrift on the rough stormy sea. Tin Kuang saw a boy on a small boat rushing over. Telling her to hang on. That boy saved Tin Kuang. She remembered he was Tan Quan Deep, an unfortunate child who never knew happiness. To save Tin Kuang, Tan Quan Deep kissed the little girl. Tin Kuang knew without him, there wouldn't be her of today. But the heavens like playing tricks on people. Waves rose again, tormenting the already tattered fates of the two children. A moment of danger, Tan Quan Deep told Tin Kuang to swim away. Don't worry about him, stirred. Tin Kuang suddenly remembered it was almost the anniversary of Tan Quan Deep's passing. She decided when going back she'd burn some spirit money for him. He was so poor, wiping her face. Tin Kuang looked in the mirror then was confused wondering if her lips were naturally red like that. After getting ready, Tin Kuang walked out in high spirits. But the people outside had wrinkled faces like monkey butts. Bewildered, Tin Kuang scratched her head, feeling the atmosphere was strangely odd for some reason. At this time seeing Dai Quan Kin red-faced walking out of the room, Kiyu Van awkwardly coughed. Seeing Dai Quan Kin after that shyly asked him to get some ice. Kiyu Van's clever mind started analyzing. He looked at Tin Kuang with admiration and surprise. Not expecting the young miss looking petite was truly powerful. Sensing someone looking down on her. Tin Kuang turned asking Kiyu Van what the problem was. Kiyu Van had no choice but to evade. Saying in a bit he'd take Tin Kuang to the hotel again. While Master Kin had to go somewhere else. The morning sun had gilded the whole city. Kiyu Van's convoy stopped in front of the hotel.
hotel. Just getting out Tin Kuang met a colleague asking why she was there. Tin Kuang said she got an interview with a big shot so the director sent her. Her colleague happily laughed wide-eyed, saying interviewing a big shot of course they had to send the prettiest reporter of their station. This was their Coco spirit. Meanwhile Luke and An An's face looked very dissatisfied. At this time Kiu Van notified Tin Kuang that soon Master Kin would dine with some famous people in financial circles, telling her she could interview them over the meal. Before letting Tin Kuang respond, Luke and An had perked up, really. We can eat together together with Mr. Tian too? Kiyu Van promptly crushed her small joy, saying Master Kin only invited Miss. Seeing this, Luke and An was unhappy objecting on what basis only Tin Kuang was invited when they were also Coco reporters. Kiyu Van truly at this time just resented he couldn't tell her. Of course it was because Miss was the one in Master Kin's heart. Tin Kuang had to speak up explaining her partner introduced and helped contact Mr. Tian for her, then was about to leave. Unexpectedly Luke and An still pulled Tin Kuang's hand back. Furious saying she was the one who arranged the financial conference interview. She thought Tin Kuang was stealing her credit. Furthermore, Luke and Ann felt Tin Kuang was resentful about having her boyfriend stolen so grew vengeful. Agitated, Luke and Ann said T. Doan then led her on first, saying if Tin Kuang liked T. Doan then that much then she could give him back to Tin Kuang. Irritated, Tin Kuang yanked her hand back, saying Luke and Ann overthought already. Her stolen credit showed it basically didn't belong to her in the first place. Secondly Tin Kuang said she didn't care about T. Doan then already. If they married she could even bless them to grow old together. Thirdly Tin Kuang said Luke and Ann could also ask her partner to arrange an interview if she wanted. But immediately Tin Kuang mockingly said it seemed Luke and Ann's partner wasn't that great. After saying her piece, Tin Kuang arrogantly left, leaving behind the resentful Luke and Ann wondering just how amazing was Miss Tin Kuang's partner. She was still bothered by the image of Tin Kuang getting into that fancy gold car. Luke and Ann didn't expect Tin Kuang's partner could pick her up in a luxury car, and arrange an interview for Tin Kuang with the financial financial boss too. At this time, out of jealousy and envy Luke and Ann thought if it wasn't for Tin Kuang pushing T. Doan then on her, he would have been hers already. Meanwhile, Kiu Van had brought Tin Kuang to the meeting building. He reminded Tin Kuang that Master Kin hadn't arrived yet, telling her to go inside first. The empty seat was Master Kin's. She should sit next to that seat. Cracking the door open, inside was the noisy laughter of the financial bigwigs. She took a deep breath to calm down then raised her hand to knock. Tin Kuang walked in smiling introducing herself as a reporter from Coco TV, saying Mr. Tian arranged this exclusive interview for her. Those people also very friendly invited Tin Kuang to sit down quickly. Tin Kuang went to sit in the empty seat like Kiyu Van said earlier. Beside her was a fat old man pouring wine, his heavy cheeks already flushed red, speaking familiarly praising Tin Kuang for growing up beautifully, even saying if she drank this whole glass he'd do the interview. Tin Kuang waved her hand declining, saying she was allergic to alcohol, wanting to toast him with tea instead of wine, but he thought this didn't give him face. Seeming drunk, he angrily said a small reporter like Tin Kuang should know better, asking if she still wanted the interview. Tin Kuang's face darkened, now she thought if that tumor was here, certainly she wouldn't have been forced to toast, so she reluctantly smiled saying she'd toast him the glass. The fat guy now relaxed his face, saying Tin Kuang had to be like this to know better. Who would have thought the wine glass in Tin Kuang's hand was immediately taken by someone everyone knew was who? The icy voice rang out. The wine she toasted, I'm afraid Mr. So can't handle it already. Frowning, Dai Quan Kin said if Mr. So wanted wine then let him toast him. Others hurriedly spoke up, saying Master Kin was protecting his employee. Truly a good boss, Dai Quan Kin didn't respond. He coldly put his arm around Tin Kuang's shoulder and sat down. This Mr. So still nitpicked saying Master Kin overly protected his employee. Not giving him face like this, could they still sit together? Dai Quan Kin threw him a sharp look, saying if he couldn't sit then please leave. This tense move made the other bosses murmur too. Wondering why Dai Quan Kin protected the small reporter like that, could there be something between them, they'd never heard of it before. At this time a young executive told Dai Quan Kin not to get so agitated but introduce a little. Smiling, Dai Quan Kin asked if he wasn't always curious who could move him. Hearing this, everyone's faces couldn't hide their surprise. Tin Kuang was embarrassed to red face. She didn't understand what he was doing. Why suddenly reveal everything like this? That executive loaded the issue then reached out familiarly calling
calling Tin Kuang's sister-in-law, saying he had long admired her. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin's guardian wouldn't even allow a handshake. The young executive could only resignedly accept. Arrived here everyone understood how high Tin Kuang's position was in Dai Quan Kin's heart. Fatty So also lowered his tone admitting wrong, apologizing to Tin Kuang even asking to punish himself with three glasses, also claiming to be the first to accept Tin Kuang's interview. Don't fight me for it, watching him drink sloppily. For a moment Tin Kuang was confused, unable to say anything. The young man now said fatty so didn't need to fight over it, because the first to get sister-in-law's interview must be him. If not he'd feel guilty. Seeing this, Dai Quan Kin got jealous again asking what fate he and Tin Kuang had. Unexpectedly, the young executive happily held up his phone bragging he was Lam Han Fong. His fate with Miss Tin Kuang was the comma sign. Indeed, on his phone was still the system notification, saying Lam Han Fong was listed as one of Miss Tin Kuang's randomly matched prospects. Seeing this, Tin Kuang also had to admit it was true. This time was right when she did the lottery draw at the civil office. Han Fong now resentfully asked why Tin Kuang didn't choose him, when his number was the nice 88,888,888. Recalling it, at the time Tin Kuang really wanted to choose this grand lucky number but the system gave her too short a selection time. She hadn't chosen yet when the system automatically spun for her already. The two chatted happily, not noticing someone unhappy behind them at all. Dai Quan Kin later saw the system notification saying Lam Han Fong was eliminated by another player. No fate with the young miss. Try harder to increase competitiveness to successfully escape singleness, then teased him. Dai Quan Kin said with his unique fate in the system he still had to try hard to escape being single. Like this he didn't even have one word. After that he turned to Tin Kuang scolding wasn't Lam Han Fong already eliminated. The strong win the weak lose. What's the need to show regret? Seeing him scold her but his face was awkwardly flushed red. Tin Kuang didn't understand what his expression meant. Meanwhile Lam Han Fong very quickly realized this master kin had eaten vinegar. Seems pretty tasty. After that the executives urged each other to start the meal to avoid wasting sister-in-law's time. Eating, hearing sister-in-law once. Ten times sister-in-law. Tin Kuang felt both embarrassed and dizzy. Until evening, she finally finished the interview work. Sitting in her chair Tin Kuang's face clearly showed exhaustion. Basically her identity was exposed. She went from interviewer to interviewee. Those guys didn't answer properly. Tin Kuang asked about company development. Lam Han Fong instead asked if Master Kin treated her well, was faithful to her, even wrinkling his brow asking if he still had a chance. Another curiously asked which school Tin Kuang graduated from to know Master Kin so well. Fatty So called for Tin Kuang to send her home address so he could send gifts as apology. In the end it still had to be Dai Quan Kin speaking up telling them to answer the interview properly. Don't ask random things. If you don't know then ask him. Thinking of this, Tin Kuang inadvertently smiled. Her cheeks also flushed pink. She was thinking how could that guy be upset for her. After that Tin Kuang asked the vice president if there were any other arrangements tonight. If not she wanted to go out for a bit. The vice president said there was nothing else. Even asking where Tin Kuang Kuang wanted to go. Did she need him to arrange a car? It turned out Tin Kuang knew Dai Quan Kin's birthday was coming up so she wanted to go to the duty-free shop to buy some gifts. Things were cheaper there. The vice president now recalled Kiu Van's analysis. Guessing the one in Dai Quan Kin's heart was Tin Kuang so he knew the chance to make amends had come. He knew the young miss was a new graduate. Surely didn't have much money yet. Buying gifts for Master Kin would be difficult. Therefore the vice president generously took out the duty-free shop's credit card to give Tin Kuang to use. Tin Kuang was very hesitant because this was to buy Dai Quan Kin a birthday present. Using the vice president's card to buy would be inappropriate. Seeing this, the vice president put on a trustworthy expression telling Tin Kuang not to worry. The important thing was the thought, who paid Master Kin certainly wouldn't care. After a while, the vice president enthusiastically even prepared a car for her. Telling her to shop at ease, he would definitely keep it secret. Tin Kuang also had to accept the vice president's good intentions. Done. The vice president happily called Master Kin, telling him to guess where Tin Kuang asked him to prepare the car to go earlier. Bored of this beating around the bush, Dai Quan Kin told him to fart it out or he'd hang up. Elated, the vice president announced to Dai Quan Kin that Tin Kuang was going to buy birthday gifts for him. Over here, after hearing that information, Dai Quan Kin couldn't hide the joy on his face. He didn't expect she would take the initiative to buy him birthday gifts. The vice president added that earlier Tin Kuang told him not to let Dai Quan Kin know to surprise him. 
Dai Quan Kin said he would pretend he didn't know anything. Hanging up, Dai Quan Kin was still feeling touched. He wondered how that silly girl suddenly became so cute. She didn't remember his birthday before, always irritating him on his birthday. Now she even secretly went to buy surprise gifts. Seeing his little mermaid wanted to surprise him, Dai Quan Kin decided to give her an even bigger surprise. Thinking it, Dai Quan Kin immediately told the vice president to arrange it. Speaking of Tin Kuang, at this time she had arrived at the duty-free store. Her phone also received a message from the vice president. He said tomorrow Tomorrow was Dai Quan Kin's birthday so it'd be best if she gave it tomorrow morning, to get the first gift spot. Furthermore, he said Master Kin's rest and work times were very punctual, usually waking up at 6.30 a.m. then exercising for an hour, so Tin Kuang could take advantage to come at 6.30, knock on Dai Quan Kin's bedroom door and give the gift, that way he would certainly be very happy. Seeing this, Tin Kuang asked if Master Kin wanted a party at home, so could she give the gift at midnight tonight instead? But according to the vice president, at midnight Master Kin would be sleeping already. His sleep was very punctual, starting rest at 10.30. Seeing this, Tin Kuang felt a little regretful, because if not giving the birthday gift right at 0 hundred then what was the point? She started plotting, already knowing tomorrow was Dai Quan Kin's birthday and also Tan Quan Deep's memorial day. Dai Quan Kin would be resting after 10.30. Tin Kuang thought why not do Tan Quan Deep's memorial service first tonight at midnight. At exactly midnight, Tin Kuang thought now that tumor must certainly be asleep already. She decided to run far to burn spirit money or it wouldn't look good. So Tin Kuang sneakily took some spirit money bundles and went to a distant corner to start burning. Tan Quan Deep, I'll burn more for you. Don't be stingy spending it okay? You came from an impoverished rural area. Three generations were poor. Barely finishing elementary school already having to work for money. Truly life was not easy at all. Tin Kuang was sad thinking of Tan Quan Deep having to be shark bait to save her. Tin Kuang knew she really could have saved herself then even though she was still small. Still confiding to Tan Quan Deep. Tin Kuang suddenly sensed someone's footsteps approaching. Looking up, unexpectedly it was Dai Quan Kin looking at her with disappointed, sad, and angry eyes. He then called telling everyone to stop looking for Tin Kuang because he found her already. Tin Kuang still didn't know Dai Quan Kin misunderstood. She still wrinkled her brow asking if he wasn't sleeping yet. Gloomily Dai Quan Kin said the servants discovered she was missing at midnight so went looking. Regretfully Tin Kuang just opened her mouth to apologize. When she was interrogated in Quan Kin's anger asking if she snuck out at midnight to burn spirit money for him. At this time Tin Kuang could only try to explain she was burning it for her friend, not for him. Tin Kuang also felt confused how Dai Quan Kin could think of something so weird. Who would burn spirit money for someone on their birthday? In Dai Quan Kin's mind now were memories from long ago. In the previous life, Miss Tin Kuang angrily asked him why she couldn't burn spirit money on his birthday. Even asking if his birthday was so important, she still had to celebrate with him. She said she was burning money to curse him. Now, Dai Quan Kin could only gloomily ask Tin Kuang why she did that. Tin Kuang broke into a sweat. She knew he had misunderstood her. She was about to grasp his hand apologizing. But Dai Quan Kin still wouldn't listen, even angrily asking if she wanted him dead that much. Tin Kuang still tried to explain he misunderstood her but Dai Quan Kin basically didn't listen. The unresolved knot from the previous life made him even more certain she still hadn't changed in this life. Still hating him as before, exhausted, he told her to leave. Behind, besides crying out an injustice for him to listen, Tin Kuang could only feel helpless. Dai Quan Kin on his own birthday had to say those heartbreaking words. Perhaps we should break up. He thought maybe from the start. He shouldn't have harbored this fantasy. Why would she change for him? Tin Kuang bowed her head silently. She calmed herself, consoling it was okay. That tumor just misunderstood. Now the spirit money misunderstanding was also very hard to explain. Tin Kuang slapped herself to force herself to be clear-headed. Tomorrow she would explain to him again. But she worried he wouldn't let her attend the birthday party. Worried the gift she prepared hadn't been given to him yet. Heartbroken. Tin Kuang collapsed in the cold night. Tears kept running down, soaking the stack of spirit money in her hand. In the end, that very night Tin Kuang prepared her luggage to leave because Dai Quan Kin told Kiu Van to arrange a hotel for her to stay at. Tin Kuang still held hope asking Kiu Van if Dai Quan Kin said how long she'd stay. The silence and awkward expression on the squad captain's face extinguished Tin Kuang's hope. She told Kiu Van if tomorrow Dai Quan Kin was still angry to help her give him the gift. The gift she left on the bedside table in the room. 
Kiyu Van sadly said to Tin Kuang that birthday gifts had to be personally given by her to have meaning. He said he believed Master Kin would certainly quickly take her back. Tin Kuang still tried to smile saying she should pack first just in case. She knew Dai Quan Kin's temper, nothing anyone said would get through. Even asking Kiyu Van if he hadn't said to kick her out yet right? Kiyu Van replied no then invited Tin Kuang into the car. Distracted, Tin Kuang looked back at the mansion one more time, and sadly got in. Up there, Dai Quan Kin was still silently watching her. He wondered what he should do with her. The next day Tin Kuang still got up for work as usual. Catching a taxi, she also called Kiyu Van saying no need to pick her up. Just getting in. Unexpectedly there was already a man sitting inside. The driver now apologetically said not to mind. It was just a pooled ride. Business wasn't easy. Hoping she'd understand. Tin Kuang murmured okay then asked if he could take her to the TV station, was it on the way? The driver grinned widely saying of course, of course. The car raced away until Tin Kuang realized the road was stranger and stranger. She tensely yelled asking where the driver was going. Then immediately demanded he stop. She felt something was wrong already. Indeed, the sinister man sitting next to her showed his true colors. He used a drugged cloth to cover Tin Kuang's face. Panicking, the girl wondered if this was an assault in the cab. Luckily she had great martial arts. Tin Kuang smashed her phone right into his face, followed by a series of punches, looking very violent. Scum, villain, dare to have wicked designs on me. Five years ago I caught sharks barehanded. Don't know if you were even born yet. After punching him dizzy, Tin Kuang ordered the driver to stop the car. The driver now also sweated bullets, but still kept stepping on the gas. Tin Kuang knew he was asking for pain. She grabbed a white cloth, directly choking him threatening to strangle him if he didn't stop. The driver now panicked and admitted wrong, saying he just took money to do it. Tin Kuang was even more furious making him reveal who was behind it. Turns out the person who hired them was at a construction site not far away. He said to bring her there then he'd pay. Panicking, Tin Kuang told him to quickly drive back. The driver agreed on the surface but thought this brat had some skill but her mind wasn't so good. Because they were almost at the site now, he knew even if she sprouted wings she'd hardly escape. Very quickly, the car arrived at a large abandoned construction site. The driver had nothing left to fear and raced in. Then shouted calling his buddies out, saying inside was a very tough woman, had already knocked a tam out. Immediately, a group of punks appeared, speaking arrogantly asking what nonsense the driver was spewing. Now a tam was tossed out of the car. Tin Kuang arrogantly stepped out, facing the gangsters head on. She wasn't afraid of any punk. Twisting her wrist Tin Kuang asked who wanted to go first or if they'd all go together. Those guys weren't real men either. Encouraging each other to surround Tin Kuang. In another development, at this time Dai Quan Kin was holding his own birthday party with countless prestigious guests attending. Seeing the vice president, he worriedly asked if he still hadn't contacted Tin Kuang yet. The dumbfounded vice president apologetically said he still hadn't contacted her yet. Dai Quan Kin was even more worried. He thought this little mermaid couldn't have left home already right? At this time, Ha Tru Da also slowly walked over asking Dai Quan Kin why he looked so glum on his birthday. Also asking where was his spouse? Could they have fought? Meanwhile, Dai Quan Kin seemed to have received some news from Kiyu Van. He immediately stood up, his murderous face making Han Fong shrink back. Like that Quan Kin went straight with his subordinates. Not a word, leaving Ha Tru Da standing bewildered wondering who provoked that man again. Dai Quan Kin had just left when the assistant of Ha Niem Niem tearfully ran to Ha Tru Da saying his sister was about to be beaten to death. He said it was Master Kin's spouse, Miss Tin Kuang. Angered at being kicked out by Master Kin she made a mess at the Ha House. The assistant said Tin Kuang was crazy. It was clearly the Ha House servant speaking nonsense but she still made a mess at the Ha House. Right now in Ha Tru Da's house many things were smashed. The house was about to collapse. This news immediately shook up the whole party. They all thought the online news was true. Dai Quan Kin and Ha Niem Niem truly loved each other. Now the assistant also kept urging Ha Tru Da to quickly return. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin stopped. He said he also had to go see. His spouse missing all day. Why was she at the Ha House? Dai Quan Kin was certain his little mermaid couldn't randomly lose contact. Moreover go make trouble at the Ha House. Something must have happened. Tin Kuang carried a baseball bat, fiercely dragging a tam from the car, saying she wanted him to clearly see the face of the one who hired him. Like that dragging a tam, Tin Kuang kicked the door open. Ha house guards also gathered to block the door, stopping her 
but seeing the battered a tam thrown before them, those men were also immediately intimidated. Ha Niem Niem with her parents stood upstairs, yelling and scolding Miss Tin Kuang for daring to go crazy here. They even threatened to call the police and charge her with trespassing. Downstairs Tin Kuang still angrily smashed things with the bat, then arrogantly sat down telling them to go ahead and call the cops. Anyway she also wanted to tell the cops, how they had arranged to kidnap her. The Hez didn't believe Tin Kuang would go that far. They only knew to curse angrily. Old man Ha now told Tin Kuang she had hit and smashed enough. He said he wouldn't pursue it today. Ordering Tin Kuang to leave immediately, Tin Kuang again lifted the bat, sneering asking if he thought this was fair already. Old man Ha still didn't admit wrong, only saying they were unlucky, also still hadn't done anything to Tin Kuang, telling her to quickly leave. Ha Niem Niem arrogantly relied on her national treasure status, saying even if Tin Kuang had video she could do nothing. Moreover she herself would face a sad outcome. Tin Kuang was driven mad by these people's arrogance. One swing smashed a vase to pieces. At this time Ha True Da had also returned home, urgently telling Tin Kuang to stop. Ha Niem Niem immediately jumped into her brother's arms, crying that Tin Kuang wanted to kill her, crying woefully as if greatly wronged. Why did her brother only come back now? He didn't know how arrogant this woman was. Seeing Ha True Da gently comfort Ha Niem Niem, Tin Kuang's heart ached again. She had countless times dreamt of when her parents were about to throw her into the sea. Her brother hurriedly returned, just like now, shouting loudly to stop. He would comfort her, patting saying don't be scared. Brother's back now. Tin Kuang's heart ached to tears. Ha True Da was always the one Tin Kuang awaited love from the most. But now that brother was scolding Tin Kuang for being arrogant. Before her brother, all Tin Kuang's anger was replaced by feelings of hurt and resentment to the extreme. He demanded Tin Kuang reasonably explain everything today. If not then, before he finished speaking, Dai Quan Kin had entered. If not then what? Dai Quan Kin brushed past the Haz, going straight to Tin Kuang, embracing his little mermaid telling her to tell him what happened. Before that caring inquiry, Tin Kuang's emotions burst into tears rolling down her face. Dai Quan Kin was even more anxious. What did they do to you? Madam Ha now told Dai Quan Kin that he didn't know what awful state Miss Tin Kuang smashed their house into, how crazily she went. Of course Dai Quan Kin believed everything had a reason. He asked if they'd speak now, or should he call someone to ask. Having spoken, Dai Quan Kin glanced at a tam crawling on the ground trying to sneak away. Hearing that, he immediately stood up hurriedly denying having any involvement. About to confess, Han Niem Niem's golden hair flicked as she fearfully silenced a tam. But the frightened a tam still decided to confess, saying someone hired them to kidnap Miss Tin Kuang force her to hand over a video recording, also saying the client said they just had to get the recording then directly silence her. Ha True Da still basically didn't understand the issue. He frantically asked what video recording, also saying if someone was hired then why did they mess up his house. Old man Ha now hurriedly told his son not to listen to others nonsense, again helped by Ha Niem Niem's lies that Tin Kuang came to make trouble out of jealousy for her. Seeing their family still unwilling to speak, Dai Quan Kin decided he would tell Ha True Da his himself. He said Tin Kuang had recorded a video 16 years ago of Ha True Da's parents throwing his little sister into the sea. Hearing this, Ha True Da was shocked, not believing his own ears. Dai Quan Kin continued, he said he couldn't help but laugh at Ha True Da's naivete, asking if he really believed his sister had jumped into the sea to run away from home? The girl was only a few years old then, he heard she was seriously ill then. How could a seriously ill child run away from home? Ha True Da was too shocked by what he just heard. He furiously asked his family if what Dai Quan Kin said was true. Of course those phony intellectual scum didn't admit it. But the more Ha True Da thought back on the oddities of his parents then, the more he believed Dai Quan Kin. His little sister was only six then. When Ha True Da returned home, his parents said she had run off on her own. A six-year-old girl with a frail body like that. At this time Dai Quan Kin told Ha True Da he had gotten the reasonable explanation he wanted. Also saying Tin Kuang was the benefactor who saved his sister's life. Hearing that, Ha True Da eagerly asked where his sister was now, but Dai Quan Kin basically didn't even want to tell him. He didn't want Tin Kuang's identity exposed, remembered by this worthless bunch. Thinking so, he told Ha True Da the girl had died already. 
couldn't be saved. Now Ha Tru Da inadvertently looked at Tin Kuang. A brother's emotions arose. He felt like he saw the image of his cute little sister in her. Now Tin Kuang only knew to fretfully tell Quan Kin to go. She was heartbroken knowing her brother had always been deceived by them. They said she ran away. Before leaving Dai Quan Kin gave Ha Tru Da three days to resolve his family's matters. Then give him an explanation. Or he'd have to bear the consequences himself. Tin Kuang walked away dejectedly. Trying to hold back sobs choking in her throat. She wanted to tell her brother she missed him so much. After stepping outside, ignoring the vice president and Dai Quan Kin waiting to invite her into the car, Miss Tin Kuang still angrily strode away. Of course Dai Quan Kin couldn't let his little mermaid swim away. He ran and grabbed her wrist, then directly carried Tin Kuang despite her struggling. Dai Quan Kin placed Tin Kuang in the car, softly said be good, let's go home first, but still angry, Tin Kuang refused, even threatening if Dai Quan Kin didn't let go she'd punch him too. Dai Quan Kin placed a warm kiss on Tin Kuang's forehead instantly silencing her. He said wait until in the car then she could hit him however she wanted. Unexpectedly once in the car, the little girl just sat sobbing silently in a corner. Still the man in any case should take initiative. When she is silent and avoids him then he should know to approach and ask. Miss Tin Kuang now cried aggrievedly telling Dai Quan Kin not to touch her. A tip to coax your girlfriend is the more she pushes you away, the closer you should get. Dai Quan Kin applied that rule, reached out to hug Tin Kuang's waist then embraced her tightly. Tin Kuang still sulked saying wasn't it he who didn't want to see her, wanted her to leave his world? Why was he hugging her? Dai Quan Kin. Had he become too cowardly? Of course a smart man would admit being a coward to his wife, only asking her to return home with him. Dai Quan Kin gently admitted wrong, saying those late night words were only because he was too angry. He said today was his birthday. There was a party at home. Everyone was waiting for them to return. Tin Kuang looked at him, felt his sincerity. Dai Quan Kin in his heart truly hoped she would return. He was also waiting for her birthday present for him. Tin Kuang also took this chance to explain, saying last night she really was burning spirit money for her friend not cursing him. Seeing Dai Quan Kin was still doubtful. Tin Kuang firmly said if he didn't believe he could have the vice president investigate. On this day 10 years ago, her friend died saving her. The savvy vice president also poked his head down saying he'd investigate immediately. At this Dai Quan Kin embraced her. He felt even without that person it was fine. Her willingness to explain to him already made him very satisfied. Vice president was also very reliable. Hadn't even started yet already investigated and affirmed Tin Kuang wasn't lying. On this day 10 years ago, someone named Tan Quan Deep died in a shipwreck. Dai Quan Kin looked at that Tan Quan Deep's profile. He was startled seeing the time and location were correct. Ten summers ago, Tin Kuang had indeed encountered an assassination at sea. Strangely, Dai Quan Kin also had those memories. As if he was Tan Quan Deep. Quan Kin didn't think much of it. He embraced Tin Kuang, saying he was wrong to misunderstand her. Also dotingly telling Tin Kuang at the villa there was lots of delicious food waiting for her. Cakes, seafood, grilled meat, juice. Very quickly Tin Kuang was back at the villa, in a glittering party dress with dishes she loved. While happily enjoying, a little girl ran over hugging Tin Kuang. Tiu Mai Hu had been waiting for Tin Kuang for a long time. Happy her friend finally arrived. Miss Tin Kuang conveniently fed Tiu Mai Hu a piece of cake, also asking if she thought the tumor's birthday party was fun. While happily chatting, that goose trio came over, asking Tiu Mai Hu wasn't she supposed to know how to dance? Why when they told her to dance a little she ran out here? Those people were deliberately trying to make things hard for Tiu Mai Hu, making the usually bold girl shyly hide behind Tin Kuang now. Seeing Tin Kuang, those people were also very arrogant asking who she was. How could a servant of the household also dare speak loudly to esteemed guests? Then that group continued attacking Tiu Mai Hu, saying if Tiu Mai Hu didn't know how to dance then just directly admit she was crude without refinement. Tiu Mai Hu was provoked to anger. About to retort, Tin Kuang quietly asked wasn't it true Mai Hu knew how to dance? Turns out Mai Hu claimed she had been learning for two months already. Just got a little nervous when dancing. Who knew that vulgar group wouldn't be gentle? Didn't pay any attention to Tiu Mai Hu when dancing. Understanding her friend's issue, Tin Kuang folded her arms inviting Tiu Mai Hu to dance a song. Tin Kuang winked confidently telling her friend to trust her. Tin Kuang would make Tiu Mai Hu explode. Very quickly after, the whole party was abuzz noticing the girl dancing. Dai Quan Kin also watched then his soul was stolen without knowing when. It was Tiu Mai Hu and Tin Kuang flexibly dancing to the music. Of course not forgetting to do difficult moves too. 
just that after a spin, that girl went back to her guy already. Mac Phi sweetly held his girlfriend's waist. Over here Dai Quan Kin had also caught the moonlight of his life. His meaningful gaze couldn't hide it. Dai Quan Kin smiled saying he never knew she could dance too. Also whispered in Tin Kuang's ear asking in the end how many more surprises about her he didn't know yet. Tin Kuang blushed. This was just a dance. In fact Maine still knows ballet. Folk music, tango too. The surrounding guests had started curiously gossiping wondering who the girl dancing with Dai Quan Kin was. Also discovering Dai Quan Kin's gaze at her was too meaningful. They're a perfect match. Dai Quan Kin closed the dance with a romantic move, successfully reaping huge thunderous applause from the watching audience. They then crowded around asking about this girl's identity, telling him to hurry and introduce Tin Kuang to the public. Surrounded by the crowd Tin Kuang silently slipped away. Her target was the table full of food. First she had to fill her stomach, not even crawling to the buffet yet. Tin Kuang stopped seeing Dai Quan Kin sitting at the piano. Under the stage lights, he said today he'd introduce a person to his friends here. The stage lights immediately shone on Tin Kuang, just as she still didn't understand what was happening. Dai Quan Kin's fingers were already on the piano keys. The music rang out. Tin Kuang immediately recognized this was the song that made the late master fall in love at first sight with her. She didn't understand why he was playing this song. Dai Quan Kin then raised his voice inviting everyone to listen to him sing this song. The warm singing voice rang out. The lyrics like the words he wanted to tell the girl he loved. Do you know you're the shining star tonight of mine? This fate is so funny. I really wanted to hold your hand walking the Milky Way. When our eyes meet. Captain Kiu Ven cleverly invited Tin Kuang to Dai Quan Kin's side. Tin Kuang still didn't know what he intended. Her feet stepped but it was too dark to see. But romantically, he had carefully prepared. Every step she took, the stars shone. A dreamscape making men marvel, women admire. Tin Kuang blushed going forward. Dai Quan Kin looked at her, continued singing. If we could meet again, what I want most is you'll also love me. Could it be you can step on my twinkling stars? The song ended in melodious music and gentle light. Dai Quan Kin took her hand, hinting for her to cut the birthday cake with him. The cake worth several new grads monthly wages was brought out. Dai Quan Kin held Tin Kuang's hand. Together they lowered the knife cutting the celebratory cake. Amidst the cheering guests, he gently fed her a piece. They exchanged a look affirming the deep affection they held for each other. Of course a good man would give the first cake piece to his important person. Now an excited guest curiously asked Dai Quan Kin what was the name of the song he just sang. It sounded so good. Dai Quan Kin immediately replied it's a song recently very hot online, called you're the shining star tonight of mine. Dai Quan Kin looked at Tin Kuang, said he had written the lyrics based on her name. The last three words of the song were her name. At the same time he also introduced to everyone that she was the fated match heaven had arranged for him. Miss Tin Kuang. Hearing that, the girls exclaimed clever, also asking if they could post the recording on Weibo. Miss Tin Kuang now still wanted to clarify that this song was originally sung by her friend, Ah Queen Queen, and the lyricist was Dai Quan Kin. Then she told that guest if they liked it, go ahead and post it. She even thanked them for helping her promote the song. That guest then playfully teased Tin Kuang, saying this was Master Kin publicly confessing, implying she was the shining star in his night. Miss Tin Kuang was still shyly denying it was just coincidence, was immediately lifted up by Dai Quan Kin. Before all those eyes, he said they should freely enjoy. The remaining time he wanted to be alone with the woman heaven had arranged for him. Dai Quan Kin carried the little fish to a corner, shyly blushing, Tin Kuang told him not to make a scene like that. Quan Kin kicked open the door. Startled, Tin Kuang realized this was his bedroom. Then she turned saying Dai Quan Kin better not mess around, or she wouldn't be polite with him. After, she reminded him not to forget they only had a contractual marriage. They'd separate after a year. Dai Quan Kin bent down getting right in Tin Kuang's face, asking hadn't she ever heard this saying? Dai Quan Kin sat down. He said if women's words could be believed, pigs could climb trees. Looks like he wanted to completely deny that contractual marriage business. After, Dai Quan Kin's mind was very unstable, kept scooting close to Tin Kuang smiling wickedly, making the girl panic and push him away, telling him to calm down a little. Had he drank too much and the alcohol was going to his head? She said she wasn't a loose woman, telling him not to move. 
Seeing that, Dai Quan Kin patted Tin Kuang's head with affectionate eyes. Of course he knew that. He whispered the gift he wanted was her birthday present for him. Others had all gifted already, only she was left. Miss Tin Kuang's face flushed red. She ran making excuses about getting a gift from the bedroom. Only now did Dai Quan Kin comfortably sit down. Teasing that silly girl made him very happy. But in this moment, he still couldn't enjoy complete happiness. The thirst for blood came again. Dai Quan Kin collapsed, painfully hugged his heart. He leaned on the wall, stumbling with each step. There were too many people in the villa. He couldn't scare them. He had to stay away from them a bit. Just then Tin Kuang happened to return with a gift in hand. Who would have thought she'd catch Dai Quan Kin climbing over the railing? Looking like he wanted to jump, Tin Kuang hurriedly pulled him back. Dai Quan Kin, are you crazy? I just hadn't given you a gift yet, so you thought to jump off the building? Pulling him up. Tin Kuang scolded him for not being able to take even a little criticism. How could he become a boss like this? Now Dai Quan Kin patted Tin Kuang's head saying he wasn't jumping but had something to do. Also telling her not to tell others okay? Tin Kuang looked at him confused, asking if his illness had flared up again. Then to Dai Quan Kin's surprise, Tin Kuang pressed him down telling him not to go. She said she had a way to suppress his illness. She'd go get it now also saying he had to trust her. After, Tin Kuang brought a cup of water, telling him to see, it wasn't blood at all. Then she took out a pearl necklace, useless to others but happened to suppress Dai Quan Kin's blood thirst. Very effective, Tin Kuang then asked about the origin. How long he'd been sick, Dai Quan Kin calmly said it was from an accident. Ten years already, hearing that long period of time, she couldn't restrain her shock asking if he hadn't drunk blood for ten years. She recalled his bodyguard said he locked himself away to avoid drinking blood. How strong his will must be. Dai Quan Kin looked at the bright red water. He couldn't help covering his nose frowning asking why this smelled like blood. Tin Kuang had to explain a type of seaweed smelled very similar to fresh blood. These pearls she had were cultivated among that seaweed so had that fishy bloody smell. Tin Kuang held up the cup, moved it toward Dai Quan Kin, saying it smelled very alike but wasn't blood. She absolutely wouldn't trick him into drinking what he disliked. Seeing Dai Quan Kin hesitate, Tin Kuang kept encouraging him at his side. Drinking it could suppress his bloodthirst already. Dai Quan Kin took the chance to tease, putting on a spoiled face saying he'd only drink if Tin Kuang fed him. Tin Kuang had no choice but to indulge him, brought the cup to Dai Quan Kin's mouth coaxing the child to drink medicine. If he didn't drink it he'd get a spanking. After making that overgrown child drink it all, Tin Kuang carefully wiped his mouth, then standing far flung the birthday gift at Dai Quan Kin, telling him sleep well. Remember to close the door for her when he left. Dai Quan Kin refused and ran over pinning Tin Kuang to the wall, reminding her this was his room. Then pulled Tin Kuang's hand startling her, not knowing what he intended. Dai Quan Kin made Tin Kuang lie on her back on the bed while he was on top of her, smiling teasingly asking if the birthday gift was only this, then brought his mouth close to her fair smooth skin asking if there wasn't anything else. When the situation was critical like this, a phone ring happened to free Miss Tin Kuang. She said it was her father calling. Dai Quan Kin embraced Tin Kuang, asking why she panicked like that, telling her to hurry and answer. Then he himself took the call. To Miss Tin Kuang's shock, Quan Kin spoke confidently and politely. Son greets father, have a nice evening father. Dai Quan Kin held his little wife sitting in his embrace, speaking very politely with her parents. Over here, the old couple was also very curious taking turns looking at their son-in-law. The boy named Dai their country had chosen for their daughter. Proudly, Tin Kuang for the first time introduced him to her parents, also asking if they thought Dai Quan Kin was handsome. Seeing her son-in-law, Tin Kuang's mother started instructing him, telling him her daughter could cook, could also work outside. Only one thing she couldn't do was swim, telling him not to take her to dangerous deep waters. Hearing that, Dai Quan Kin forced a laugh, his head immediately recalling the awful taste of the beefsteak Tin Kuang had cooked before. Tin Kuang's father also came instructing his son-in-law. He said his daughter had a frail body, extremely delicate strength, she couldn't even step on an ant, saying not to bully his daughter, to pamper Tin Kuang a lot. Hearing this frail body bit again, Dai Quan Kin was confused if they were talking about Tin Kuang. This girl standing tall with head in heaven and feet on earth, but to please the parents, Dai Quan Kin hurriedly replied yes, saying he would definitely take good care of this frail girl. After talking a while it was getting late, after telling the parents not to worry, he would take care of their daughter well. He bid the parents good night to rest. At this time Tin Kuang also didn't need to worry her parents would be too concerned for her anymore. After ending the call, 
Tin Kuang patted Dai Quan Kin's shoulder, praising he wasn't bad, also knew to coordinate with her, hadn't wasted her giving him medicine. Tin Kuang passed things to Quan Kin, smiling happily telling him to hurry and open it. Dai Quan Kin took the gift and opened it. Inside was a very beautiful watch. Seeing that watch on Dai Quan Kin's wrist, Tin Kuang exclaimed it was worthy of the watch she chose. So beautiful. Now Dai Quan Kin knew his bloodthirst was suppressed but he seemed to sense another thirst had appeared. He shyly asked if her medicine had any side effects. Moreover he kept swinging his legs, crossing them as if covering something. But seems like legs couldn't cover it anymore. He grabbed a pillow, pressed it on his lap to hide it. He asked Tin Kuang if anyone else had drank this medicine before. If they mentioned any side effects. Miss Tin Kuang seriously pondered. She said he was the first one. Now she suddenly remembered back then she saw someone else taking the medicine. Medicine. People drinking this could prevent blood thirst but would ignite the flames of love. If it was their partner, don't be careless letting them drink recklessly. After, Tin Kuang sympathetically said to Dai Quan Kin he probably didn't have any issues. After all they were only legally married on paper. Dai Quan Kin looked at her, wondering if Tin Kuang was trapping or tormenting him. Tin Kuang still didn't really understand the issue worriedly approached asking if Quan Kin felt uncomfortable anywhere. If he had any side effects? Quan Kin still hugged the pillow tightly. Blushing replied no he wasn't uncomfortable. Tin Kuang worried more telling him to say where he felt uncomfortable. Embarrassed, Dai Quan Kin bowed his head asking what she thought igniting the flames of love meant. Tin Kuang awkwardly laughed saying she didn't drink it either. How would she know? then told him to just hang himself. This time she wouldn't stop his jumping. He should boldly go ahead and jump. Dai Quan Kin started whining, saying he didn't know what side effect this was. He just wanted to hear her say loving words. Wanted to embrace her, didn't want to be apart. His mind now only had Tin Kuang's image. Also wanted to hear her call him dear Kin. Just wanted to say he loved her too. Also asking if Tin Kuang took advantage of his illness to make a move on him. Pretending to be aggrieved saying he didn't expect she was this kind of person. Miss Tin Kuang hurriedly soothed him, saying she truly forgot the side effect. When young she heard about it but didn't remember clearly, she truly didn't cast any love spells on him. Seeing Tin Kuang apologetic, Dai Quan Kin whined for her to say loving words to ease him, made her call him dear Kin a few times. He said now he really wanted her to call him that. Miss Tin Kuang also had to indulge the sick man, shyly called out dear Kin, but Dai Quan Kin still demanded she put more emotion into it. Calling like that how could it be enough to extinguish the flames of love burning in his heart? Tin Kuang's face flushed red. She reached out embracing Dai Quan Kin's face. Sweetly called Dear Kin once more. She asked how he felt now. Dai Quan Kin felt his body burning hot. He said seems like it had some effect already. Also telling her to keep going. Add a bit more emotion. Cooperating. Miss Tin Kuang whispered in his ear calling again. At this Dai Quan Kin jumped up saying he had to go to the bathroom. Also telling Tin Kuang to hurry and rest. He didn't know how long this side effect would last. Now Tin Kuang also felt like her body was burning. Before leaving, Dai Quan Kin said the side effect might last 3 to 5 days, telling her to prepare some affectionate words tomorrow to say to him, the dear Kin still wasn't enough. Hearing the side effect would last so long, Tin Kuang immediately froze for 3 seconds. Dai Quan Kin returned and immediately showered with cold water. In his heart he still couldn't believe the little fishtail truly didn't mean it, but seems he overdid the cold shower and was about to catch a cold, sneezing. But Dai Quan Kin still felt the cold shower didn't seem effective. He gritted his teeth saying Miss Tin Kuang just wait. Tin Kuang had long fallen asleep in her room, not knowing what she dreamed that she mumbled dear Kin in her sleep. Early next morning Tin Kuang woke up latest in the house. At the dining table the men were already eating breakfast. While eating, Dai Quan Kin couldn't help continuously sneezing making the younger brothers panic asking if his red face meant he had a fever? Dai Quan Kin denied saying he was fine, but showering cold 30 times. How could Quan Kin endure it? When Miss Tin Kuang pulled out the chair next to him and sat down, the younger brothers happened to notice Dai Quan Kin's new watch too. Tactless KYKY2 even uncouthly commented the watch was only tens of thousands. Too cheap, unworthy of Dai Quan Kin. The brat had just said that. The atmosphere at the whole dining table immediately became strange. 
Under the piercing gazes of Tin Kuang and Quan Kin, it was still the vice captain who explained to KY2 that this was Tin Kuang's birthday present for Dai Quan Kin. Quan Kin also proudly said this was from Tin Kuang using her first month's wages to buy for him. He wasn't lacking watches tormenting himself. KYKY2 still let his mouth run away. He said little Tin Kuang only got paid a few thousand yuan a month. Intern time also deducted 20%. I could still buy this watch. It wasn't fake right? Tin Kuang immediately firmly corrected. Ignore the vice captain's signals. She still declared it was real. It was the vice captain who lent her his credit card, saying to let her buy a birthday gift for Dai Quan Kin, or else even using up her whole salary wouldn't be enough. Poor vice captain now immediately got a piercing glare from the boss. The vice captain could only turn his head not daring to look straight. After, Quan Kin turned questioning Tin Kuang why she didn't use her one month salary to buy for him. In his heart he still remembered she had said using her salary to buy a gift for the most important person. That would prove Dai Quan Kin was important to her. At this Tin Kuang smiled embarrassedly explaining her first month's wages hadn't come yet. And it was very little, even getting an advance wouldn't be enough. That much was enough for Dai Quan Kin to explode in anger at the vice captain. Questioning him why Tin Kuang's monthly wages were only a few thousand. Also deducted 20% the vice captain broke out in cold sweat messaging KYKY2. Raise her salary, trust me bro. Receiving the message, KYKY2 immediately cleverly turned saying to Tin Kuang that while the base salary was low there was productivity bonus. Mid-year bonus, totaling this month about 40 to 50k roughly. Hearing this, Tin Kuang was surprised asking how she had a mid-year bonus when she'd only worked one month. KYKY2 put on a serious face telling her to trust him. This was inside info newly updated. Right on time for Tin Kuang to catch the mid-year bonus timing. Moreover Tin Kuang had interviewed many big shots. Extremely productive. KYKY2 was very smug. Basically he could make up whatever he wanted. A poor monkey like Tin Kuang hearing money immediately had bright eyes. Then calculated this way minus what she advanced, plus the vice captain's card. She still had quite a bit left. Tin Kuang smiled brightly looking at Dai Quan Kin, saying this way she could buy that shirt she had her eye on the other day. She felt using the vice captain's card was still very awkward. Waving her arms and legs excitedly, Tin Kuang asked Quan Kin if he liked the kind with ruffles at the chest. That white shirt, did he like it? Did he think it was cheap? After a glance from Dai Quan Kin, KYKY2 immediately told Miss Tin Kuang today was payday so he'd give her the morning off, saying she'd been tired lately, should take a walk to unwind. Hearing this Tin Kuang was extremely excited praising what a good boss. After the act, KYKY2 didn't forget to flash a trustworthy smile to Dai Quan Kin. When Master Quan Kin stood up, before leaving he didn't forget to remind Tin Kuang to send him a message after an hour. What to send she should figure it out herself. Duong Chao and KYKY2 quickly caught on grinning knowingly. Tin Kuang on the other hand only knew to stare after him blankly, not expecting this poisonous love to be so powerful. He thought once the side effects ended, Quan Kin would surely regret it a lot. One hour later, right now Dai Quan Kin was chairing a very serious intense meeting. The atmosphere looked extremely grave and tense. At this moment Dai Quan Kin's phone suddenly buzzed. It was Tin Kuang texting him on time, asking if he was still okay? Here's a big hug. Dai Quan Kin immediately smiled gently in reply. What do you think, Tin Kuang? Seeing this, Tin Kuang texted apologizing for not knowing the side effect would be so big. His reaction after getting Tin Kuang's message really changed too obviously. Seeing that smile from Dai Quan Kin, his subordinates were moved to tears. Thanking heaven and earth Tin Kuang got the day off today, so was free to text him steadily. At 11 she texted him a cheesy line. At 12 noon another one. I'm tall but can't reach you. You can bend down. At 1 p.m. a text saying it was 1 already but she didn't miss him. Let's say she missed him at 1.30 Dai Quan Kin of course thoroughly enjoyed this feeling. On the contrary, Tin Kuang felt so awkward she had nowhere to hide. This side effect really harmed people too much. She originally couldn't say these kinds of words. Moreover Dai Quan Kin would never do this kind of thing. This was clearly fireworks ignited by love. But saying goes saying comes. Tin Kuang felt after the side effect, Dai Quan Kin's usual cold demeanor seemed much more lovable. Another hour passed. Another message was sent from Miss Tin Kuang reminding Quan Kin it was time to miss her now. After sending it, Tin Kuang was shocked by her own cheesiness. She told herself she couldn't fall deeper into this love trap anymore. Afterwards she went to the mall, observed for a while and spotted a very nice shirt. Extremely suited Dai Quan Kin. She decided to check out, 
Just after checking out this item, Kin Kuang saw two figures approaching behind her. It was Ha Nian Nian walking in with Ha Tru Da. Her mouth kept sweet talking consoling her brother not to be mad about yesterday, saying the parents didn't mean it, and she only recently learned of her sister's situation, sincerely missing her younger sister. Tin Kuang abruptly turned around. Seeing Ha Nian Nian she immediately felt very unlucky. Ha Nian Nian also saw Miss Tin Kuang and came over to greet, also asking if she was buying a shirt for Dai Quan Kin. After Tin Kuang's um, Ha Nian Nian started concealed attacks, jabbing at her, Miss, it's not me splashing you with cold water, but this brand is too cheap. Master Quan Kin only wears designer brands. Tin Kuang had to hurry and console her not to worry, also saying she told dear Kin this morning he made her feel too highly she couldn't reach, but he replied it was fine, he could bend down lower. This laughter, this bragging immediately choked Ha Nian Nian speechless with anger. Ha Tru Da sensitively told Tin Kuang gifts were important for the heart, not differentiating noble or lowly. He believed as long as it was Mrs. Gift, Dai Quan Kin would like it. Ha Tru Da then apologetically told Tin Kuang about that day, also expressed wanting to treat her to a meal to apologize. In Ha Tru Da's heart, he also didn't know why just looking in Tin Kuang's eyes made him think of his younger sister. Seeing him so apologetic, Tin Kuang quickly said it wasn't his fault. Finally after a few sentences Tin Kuang agreed to eat with Ha Tru Da. She felt extremely happy because finally she could openly and above board eat with Big Brother. Just one thing, Ha Nian Nian was also here. Tin Kuang felt a bit annoyed. Afterwards they went to a high-end restaurant. Ha Tru Da expressed wanting Tin Kuang to tell him about his younger sister's life when she was still at her house. Tin Kuang was also very willing to casually make up stories. She said at that time Queen Queen's health wasn't good. Her parents tried their best to care for her but in less than two years Queen Queen still couldn't make it. But in those last two years, she composed some songs. Hearing their sister could compose music, the two were very surprised. Tin Kuang also took the chance to say she had played one of Queen Queen's songs at a restaurant and got praised by the old master. At the time she didn't say the truth for convenience's sake and took the pen name Wei Tick for Queen Queen. But Ha Nian Nian still didn't believe it, saying the girl didn't understand music, couldn't even play an instrument. Seeing her attitude, Tin Kuang recalled her past cold treatment, not even allowed to touch the piano. She continued saying she remembered young Queen Queen told that her older sister had strong self-respect and always wanted to be the best, in order not to provoke her older sister. So Queen Queen always hid her musical talents, letting her older sister Ha Nian Nian have the spotlight. Hearing this, Ha Nian Nian jumped up furious, while Tin Kuang was also determined today to make the older sister die of anger, or she wouldn't be Miss Tin Kuang. Afterwards Tin Kuang turned calling Ha Tru Da Brother Ha, also asking if her calling him like this, the same as Queen Queen, would he mind? She gave Ha Tru Da a music piece, saying it was composed by Queen Queen and the lyrics were written by Dai Quan Kin. Tin Kuang told Ha Tru Da that Dai Quan Kin said for Queen Queen's song, he had to write the lyrics, to be worthy of the beautiful love. Tin Kuang wanted to use this to get back at Ha Nian Nian, while Ha Tru Da was very concerned hearing this was a song his younger sister wrote. On the side, Ha Nian Nian knew she was humiliated so felt very resentful. Afterwards this sinister tea quickly regained calmness, ready to bite Tin Kuang. Ha Nian Nian smiled saying if her younger sister could become the irreplaceable white moonlight in Dai Quan Kin's heart, as a woman she'd be happy for her. But she also hoped Tin Kuang wouldn't care about her younger sister's position in Dai Quan Kin's heart. Tin Kuang knew well Ha Nian Nian wanted to use this white moonlight to provoke her. Of course she immediately acted like she didn't care, because Tin Kuang said she and Queen Queen were best friends. Ha Nian Nian resentfully could only gnash her teeth enduring anger. After watching, Ha Tru Da put down his phone, thanked Tin Kuang for promoting his younger sister's music. He still felt guilty because his family did bad things to Tin Kuang, the one he saw as his sister's savior. So Ha Tru Da really wanted to compensate Tin Kuang, asking if she had any requests. Tin Kuang didn't ask for anything. She only said she wanted people to stop bothering her. Her safety was enough. In fact deep down what Tin Kuang wanted most was an older brother. An older brother who could protect her. Ha Tru Da also promised on the spot he wouldn't let things like the other day affect Tin Kuang again. He worried because of the bad thing that happened. His younger sister's soul in heaven wouldn't be at peace. Also didn't know why. When looking at Tin Kuang he felt such a strong sense of familiarity. At this time Dai Quan Kin called Tin Kuang's phone. This action shocked Ha Nian Nian tremendously. Tin Kuang took the call, 
the CEO's voice rang out, complaining why she still wasn't home. Did you buy the stuff? Tin Kuang said she bought it already, and also took the chance to tease Han Nian Nian. She told Quan Kin that someone said the stuff she bought would lower his status so she didn't know if she should buy it anymore. Yes, Quan Kin angrily shouted very loudly. Who said that? As long as it's something you give me, it's an invaluable treasure in my eyes. Just tell her that. Then he also asked Tin Kuang to immediately come home, because he already missed her to the point of going crazy. Tin Kuang also tenderly pampered yes, my darling kin in front of Han Nian Nian. Now Tin Kuang suddenly felt that a man struck by love poison is really shameless. Like this would make Han Nian Nian die of anger. Tin Kuang then stood up and said she had to go, because her darling akin at home can't leave her for even one second. She also told Ha True Da that he didn't need to explain last night's events to Yes, my darling kin because she would tell him herself. Consider this meal as clearing debts. After saying that, Tin Kuang arrogantly left, leaving behind one regretful, one resentful. Ha Nian Nian jumped up, grabbed her brother's hand, saying yes, my darling kin why do you say you like Ha Queen Queen but act so cheesy with Miss Tin Kuang? Ha True Da didn't know what to say about that, but he only knew to tell his younger sister one thing. Dai Quan Kin didn't like her, telling Ha Nian Nian to accept the truth. It seems today Ha Nian Nian was provoked to madness by Tin Kuang. She started having malicious schemes. In her madness, Ha Nian Nian told her brother the president gave her the privilege to choose a man. She asked Ha True Da. If she chose Dai Quan Kin then wouldn't his marriage to Tin Kuang be stopped immediately? Hearing this malicious thought, Ha Tru Da was startled telling Ha Nian Nian feelings couldn't be forced, and he didn't want her to do that either. But at this time she had lost all calmness. In Ha Nian Nian's mind were 10,000 whys. Why couldn't she? If she had the right then why couldn't she use it? These two siblings were too annoying. Best to change scenes. Meanwhile, right now Dai Quan Kin from showering cold too much had developed a fever and needed an IV drip. He was reading a newspaper waiting for his wife to return when Kiu Van rushed in reporting something bad had happened. Kiu Van said there was an explosion at the biggest gas station in the city, causing a fire. Moreover Dai Thoi Din's convoy was just refueling there at the time. Right now the situation wasn't clear yet. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin anxiously told Kiu Van to quickly explain the situation. It was said the fire had now spread towards the residential area. The death toll had exceeded 100 already. The fire department had also been called for help. But the issue was Kiu Van had contacted Dai Thoi Din's head of security but couldn't get through. At this time Dai Quan Kin also couldn't maintain calmness. He blankly looked at his phone. Inside were images capturing the scene. It was truly a terrible accident. Most frighteningly, Dai Quan Kin saw the car that usually picked up Miss Tin Kuang, his wife's ride, overturned and wrecked. Tragically in the sea of flames, Dai Quan Kin was even more worried. He immediately called Tin Kuang's phone but no one picked up. Tense, Dai Quan Kin tossed the phone back to team leader Kiu Van, yelling for him to immediately call the Little Mermaid's company. Miss Tin Kuang, finally he got through to the company. Only then could Quan Kin's nerves relax a bit to ask about her situation. Who knew the company's attitude was so hesitant? Dai Quan Kin was scared to the point he could barely stand firmly. The terrible news was Miss Tin Kuang had rushed into the sea of flames. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin's pupils immediately constricted. Panicked and horrified, the gas station exploded. So at that time after getting off the car holding her phone to cover it, as a result she heard Dai Thoi Din's convoy was refueling inside so rushed into the flames. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin was stunned speechless. He collapsed. Luckily Kiu Van caught him. Afterwards Dai Quan Kin agitatedly ripped out the IV. He told Kiu Van to immediately prepare the helicopter. Master Day's helicopter very quickly arrived at the tragic scene. As soon as Dai Quan Kin got off the car the driver had to shakily apologize for not being able to stop Tin Kuang. He said hearing Dai Thoi Din was inside she ran in without a word. Dai Quan Kin's heart felt choked. A woman he loved most. Someone he cherished most. Yet he could only stand by unable to do anything. Having lost composure, Dai Quan Kin stopped a firefighter, telling him to quickly give him his protective gear. But the man angrily scolded Dai Quan Kin for making trouble. At this time his subordinates also had to advise Dai Quan Kin to calm down. Many experts like these would definitely save Miss Tin Kuang and Dai Thoi Din. Right after finishing the sentence, the gas station in front exploded. Flames and smoke billowing high as if reaching the blue sky. But one second later, Kiu Van had to exclaim for Dai Quan Kin to quickly look ahead. Dai Quan Kin was also at a loss for words. In the blazing flames, Tin Kuang was slowly walking out, on her back carrying a man. It was Dai Thoi Din. When he calmed down, 
Quan Kin immediately ordered people to call an ambulance. Seeing Dai Quan Kin's worried face, Tin Kuang smiled as if nothing had happened to reassure him. She said she found Dai Thoi Din in the restroom. Thank heaven and earth at the moment of explosion he happened to be using the restroom so hid inside. While Dai Quan Kin only kept asking Tin Kuang if she was injured, Dai Thoi Din was very quickly taken away by the ambulance. Seeing Tin Kuang still casually chatting, Dai Quan Kin immediately yelled at her. Who told you to rush in like that? Getting yelled at, Tin Kuang shrank back, in her heart still silently retorting if she hadn't gone and his older brother would have died already. Yet he was still being fierce with her. Dai Quan Kin was just too worried. He hugged her, blaming her for thinking she was a superhero, asking if she thought of the consequences, thought about how worried he was. Seeing his tension, Tin Kuang also understood his care and worry for her. Tin Kuang smiled reassuringly, saying she wasn't stupid. She was sure of her own safety before going in to rescue others. Heartbroken, Dai Quan Kin carried Tin Kuang back. He hugged her tightly to the point of hurting her a bit. Tin Kuang knew although he had a foul mouth, he still appeared whenever she needed him most. Dai Quan Kin seemed to have lost Tin Kuang, lost the bright star in his dark night, now seeing her safe before him. Unable to contain his emotions, he buried himself in Tin Kuang's embrace, afraid to lose her again. Only silly Tin Kuang still thought he cared for her this much because of the poison. Secretly wishing if he usually worried for her this much it'd be so great. Afterwards everyone went to the hospital. Dai Quan Kin also demanded the doctor do a full examination on Tin Kuang no matter how she refused and insisted she was fine. Tin Kuang was afraid if they examined her and found her body wasn't normal, her mermaid identity would be exposed. Afterwards Tin Kuang made an excuse to shoo Dai Quan Kin away to go check on Dai Thoi Din's emergency treatment. Unexpectedly Dai Quan Kin said he had called his sister-in-law over so there were enough people there, and forced Tin Kuang into the exam room. After an examination in the VIP room, Kiyu Van rushed in horrified handing Dai Quan Kin the results, saying the doctor said all of Miss Tin Kuang's readings were abnormal so they recommended a more thorough exam. Dai Quan Kin said he understood, then told Kiyu Van to erase all of Tin Kuang's test data and inform the doctor he would invite an expert to examine her. Dai Quan Kin knew well Tin Kuang was a mermaid so of course her readings were abnormal. Luckily after the chaos he went to check her reports. Tin Kuang was still safe and sound. YNG Yu Keen at this time was beyond grateful to Tin Kuang, promising to be her sister-in-law for life after learning Tin Kuang risked herself to save her husband. Afterwards YNG Yu Keen turned declaring in front of Dai Quan Kin from now on aside from Tin Kuang. If anyone wanted to be Dai Thoi Din's sister-in-law she would be the first to object. Although Tin Kuang knew she and Quan Kin only had a one-year fate, hearing sister-in-law say this, Tin Kuang was also very touched. This counted as gaining the sister-in-law's approval. Afterwards Dai Quan Kin went to discuss something with the doctor. After he finished talking, little Tin Kuang behind also tiredly sat down to rest with eyes closed. At this time Quan Kin ran over asking how she was, also covering Tin Kuang with a thin blanket. Knowing Tin Kuang was tired, YNG Yu Keen told Quan Kin to take her home to rest. She could handle things here. Despite Tin Kuang's embarrassment, Dai Quan Kin still carried her, unwilling to let the exhausted Tin Kuang walk herself. The sister-in-law behind saw this and could only smile secretly. In Dai Quan Kin's arms, Tin Kuang kept whispering she wasn't so tired she couldn't walk. Moreover with so many people watching, Tin Kuang felt very awkward and demanded Dai Quan Kin put her down. But Quan Kin still wouldn't let go. Even arrogantly said if he called her tired then she was tired. Tin Kuang could only sigh exasperatedly complaining to heaven. Thinking this was clearly the influence of that poisonous love. Otherwise how could he insist on carrying her like this? Afterwards she also smiled encouragingly for him to go on. Carry her all the way home. Dai Quan Kin blushed happily. Of course, another thing was the news of the fire goddess at the gas station rescuing people hit number one on hot search. Online news sites were filled with posts praising a beauty who saved a hero, a fire goddess who rescued the presidential candidate. Only one issue was the brainless netizen started shipping them. Pairing a female hero with a married presidential candidate made Dai Quan Kin mad as he got his IV. Already jealous, then seeing Miss Tin Kuang happily scrolling by, Quan Kin glared at her making Tin Kuang's hair stand on end, 
not knowing what he was up to. A moment later, Dai Quan Kin requested Tin Kuang to use Little Mermaid's account to post a selfie. He wanted netizens to know the little fish rushed into the flames because Dai Thoi Din was his brother. He wanted them to write good posts, best to ship Dai Quan Kin and Miss Tin Kuang instead. Of course Tin Kuang didn't want the whole world knowing she was the Little Mermaid. Moreover bluntly said Dai Quan Kin was changed in personality by the love bug. Seeing Dai Quan Kin's confusion, Tin Kuang continued, Without the love bug then why did he tell her to send love texts? Dai Quan Kin explained he had tricked her. The side effects were just strong lust. He had showered with cold water three times last night already getting rid of it. Then pointed at the IV drip, saying look, it's fever reducer not any love bug. Told her to hurry and post the photo. Tin Kuang went closer to look. Indeed amoxicillin, reduces fever in two hours. Only now did she fall back realizing this man's heat was from fever not side effects. Tin Kuang angrily asked if this Dai Quan Kin was playing her. Seeing this, Quan Kin flipped it back on Tin Kuang, saying she took advantage of his illness, to give him medicine with lust effects, making his whole body hot and bothered. That was her playing him. Tin Kuang denied with a red face, saying she didn't know about that, didn't do it on purpose, she said if she knew she definitely wouldn't have let him drink it, while Dai Quan Kin kept teasing, saying she didn't need to explain. He understood her intentions, Tin Kuang was teased until blushing while insisting she didn't like him, yet Quan Kin still retorted, saying if she didn't like him why was her face red, just take today's messages from her as her true feelings, also asking when she called him dear Kin, if it didn't feel sweet inside, this rotten man's words made Tin Kuang fuming mad, she flicked her tail and left saying she wouldn't talk to him anymore, she'd go to sleep, but Dai Quan Kin still pulled her back, not letting her off said to post on Weibo then sleep. At this time outside the door Kiyu Van's voice reported the stuff she lost in the fire was found. He opened the door without hesitation, unexpectedly catching a sight he shouldn't see so Kiyu Van fled dropping the stuff. Tin Kuang picked up the bag, happily said this was a birthday present for Dai Quan Kin, bought with her first paycheck, also the most expensive clothes she'd ever bought, while handing it to Quan Kin. Miss Tin Kuang introduced the shirt, saying it was a dress shirt, bought according to his height, didn't know if it would fit. Dai Quan Kin wanted to try on the shirt so directly pulled out the IV in his hand, making Tin Kuang panic scolding him for removing it himself, even about to go find bandages for him. But right after Dai Quan Kin took off his clothes making the red-faced Tin Kuang freeze, he then put on the shirt Tin Kuang gifted him, also asking her to help him button up, embarrassed. Tin Kuang did as told. While still nagging he was hurt yet still tried on clothes. Just like a little wife, Dai Quan Kin didn't miss the chance to tease Tin Kuang. He said the shirt fits so well, knew his measurements well. Usually she must have secretly measured a lot. Teased, the embarrassed Tin Kuang turned away wanting to go back to her room. Dai Quan Kin also knew when to stop, thanking Tin Kuang thanking her for tonight saving his brother not minding the danger. But he still told her in the future if she encountered something like this, don't act rashly. Also reminded her to sleep well but remember to post on Weibo. On Dai Quan Kin's end, he also quickly snapped a photo of himself, feeling it wasn't bad at all he posted on Weibo. Showing off the shirt today his little fish specially bought as a birthday gift, fit very well. Miss Tin Kuang on the other hand lay in bed wondering why Quan Kin wasn't poisoned yet kept wanting her to say loving words. Afterwards she specially followed Dai Quan Kin's post from earlier. Laying flat in bed with a confused mood, she wanted to know the answer just what was going on. The next morning Tin Kuang went to work, dragging an exhausted face from lack of sleep, mumbling morning greetings to everyone. Seeing Tin Kuang, her co-workers immediately swarmed around her, praising how awesome she was for the feat of saving the presidential candidate yesterday. Also said she already had fans online. Tin Kuang was still confused not knowing what was going on, even extremely baffled thinking her mermaid identity was exposed. Not far away, contrasting everyone's joy and congratulations. Luke and Anne was black-faced wondering why Tin Kuang was always the shining one. No news could overwhelm her radiance, but what she hoped for immediately happened when the panicked company announced hot news. Han Nian Nian wanted to marry. Han Nian Nian just posted on Weibo that she wanted to start a family and would use her privilege to choose the man she liked. On Weibo she said her 25th birthday was coming up soon. Han Nian Nian said she wanted to enter the wedding hall with him, said although the state gave her the privilege to choose a man she only liked him. Everyone at the station stretched their eyes watching with turbulent moods. Especially Tin Kuang, the girl had a bad feeling. 
Tin Kuang felt this him was referring to Dai Quan Kin right? At this time teacher Thuong spoke up. He said indeed the country had given her the privilege. Any unmarried man would do. Even if he didn't agree the country would force him to be with her. Moreover if the other party objects they would have to serve three years in prison. The whole family banned from politics for life. Hearing this. Tin Kuang yelled angrily. What kind of freak privilege is this? Others at the company also agreed it was freakish, but basically believed in this world. Which man wouldn't bow before Han Nian Nian's tail? Tin Kuang worried again. She wondered if Dai Quan Kin would reject Han Nian Nian? Moreover right now was the critical time for Dai Thoi Din to run for president. How could the whole family participate? How could Thoi Din continue running if banned from politics? Tin Kuang thought at that time Dai Quan Kin was forced to marry her for his brother. Now there's no way he'd marry Han Nian Nian right? That night at the hospital room, Han Nian Nian actually came to visit Dai Thoi Din. Right then Tin Kuang also poked her head in asking the big bro. Seeing Tin Kuang, Dai Thoi Din immediately smiled without needing watering, saying he was much better, also lucky to be saved by sister-in-law. Of course he also had to warn her not to do such dangerous things again, or else he couldn't return an intact wife to Quan Kin. Tin Kuang still said the same things, affirming she considered the stakes carefully before rescuing him. At this time another esteemed guest came to visit. It was Dean Bak, Dai Thoi Din's friend, the incumbent president only 35 this year. Seeing Dai Thoi Din, Dean Bak hurriedly asked how he was, also praising Dai Thoi Din for his luck. Such a big explosion yet didn't die. Face still so handsome. Dai Thoi Din just smiled removing Dean Bak's hand, saying he was out of options, if he accepted Dean Bak's words how could he die so easily. At this time Dean Bak looked at Tin Kuang, recognizing her as the fire goddess who saved Thoi Din. Embarrassed, Tin Kuang humbly said she didn't dare accept that title, it was just nonsense from netizens. On the contrary Dean Bak felt those four words weren't exaggerating at all. He also told Dai Thoi Din that he had arranged a professional organization to investigate. If nothing unexpected then Dean Bak would give Thoi Din an explanation. All this time no one paid any attention to Han Nian Nian so she had to bring it up herself to get noticed. Thanking President Dean Bak for traveling so far to visit her cousin. Dean Bak also politely responded with a few sentences. Afterwards he suddenly remembered Han Nian Nian wanting to marry. Asking if she had decided on a groom yet. Han Nian Nian replied she had decided. She wanted to submit the marriage registration to Dean Bak on her 25th birthday. Afterwards she smiled brightly saying she really hoped the country could hold a grand wedding for her. Dean Bak smiled saying Han Nian Nian's marriage was a national affair. The state would surely pay attention. The slow ticking bomb also asked Dean Bak what if the other party didn't want to marry her. Dean Bak replied as long as he wasn't married yet there was no need to argue. But who could reject me? marrying her. However Dean Bak was very curious who she had her eyes on. Han Nian Nian smiled slyly, saying she was joking, she was certain he wouldn't reject. Now Tin Kuang was more anxious than ever. Han Nian Nian hadn't done anything yet already wanted to marry. Moreover using her privilege, she must want to marry Dai Quan Kin. Stepping outside, Tin Kuang happened to run into Duong Chao rushing and panicking. Tin Kuang wondered asking deputy why Duong Chao was like that. Deputy guessed Duong Chao must have been shaken. Moreover the one who caused it was her arch enemy. At this time Dai Quan Kin was still leisurely sipping tea as usual. He thought since the country had allocated this way, it meant there was no issue. He saw so many paired targets succeeded. Why wouldn't Duong Chao give it a try? Tin Kuang could only silently grieve over Han Nian Nian's matter. She asked Dai Quan Kin if just a mandated marriage had to be carried out unconditionally. Worried it'd affect Dai Thoi Din's election. Even if Duong Chao refused, the effect on Dai Thoi Din would be very small. On the contrary Dai Quan Kin said she oversimplified things. The more Tin Kuang spoke the angrier she got. Tears streaming as she interrogated Dai Quan Kin. Could it be as long as it affected his brother then other people's happiness could be disregarded? As long as it benefited his brother he would accept any arrangement? Dai Quan Kin was startled by Tin Kuang's attitude. Tin Kuang also didn't understand what was happening. Her feelings were terrible. When Tin Kuang was about to leave, Dai Quan Kin stopped her. He anxiously asked Miss Tin Kuang if someone was bullying her. Tin Kuang irritably replied it was him. Handle yourself. In her heart she still thought Dai Quan Kin was a man who disregarded personal happiness for his goals. So if Han Nian Nian's privilege was granted, he would also follow right? Dai Quan Kin shyly handed Tin Kuang a feather duster, telling her to handle it, don't feel wronged anymore. Tin Kuang furiously yelled, saying who wanted to hit him. 
Dai Quan Kin innocently asked if the tool wasn't right, then change it to a keyboard, or durian, Tin Kuang didn't want to talk to him anymore, pushing him away, saying she didn't want to joke with him anymore. Dai Quan Kin pressed close to Tin Kuang again. He knew she thought he'd sacrifice his own happiness for political goals, wasn't truly sincere with her, making her feel wronged. Embarrassed by the close distance, Tin Kuang immediately turned away. Dai Quan Kin still continued teasing Tin Kuang, saying why was she closing her eyes? Scared to look at him or scared he'd see through her heart? Shamelessly threatening if she didn't open her eyes he'd kiss her? Or was that what she hoped for? Teased, Tin Kuang bristled angrily telling him to stop spouting nonsense. She didn't have any hopes. Dai Quan Kin still wanted to play dumb. Asking if it wasn't real why was her heart beating so fast? Asking if she liked him? Sulking, Tin Kuang denied. Deep down she also rejected her feelings. How could she like him? For politics he could sacrifice his whole life. She wouldn't like him. Dai Quan Kin still wanted her to recognize those feelings. If you don't like me why do you always cling to me when my old illness acts up? Care for me? Just as Tin Kuang was about to deny, Dai Quan Kin jumped in. He said she did it because she liked him, so seeing him unwell made her heart ache. If you didn't like me why react so strongly? Tin Kuang, tell me do you like me or not? Want to turn one year into a lifetime with me? He blocked Tin Kuang's mouth again. Dai Quan Kin didn't want to hear her lies. He only wanted to hear her heart. I heard your heart. You said you didn't hope this love was political from the start. I heard you want to date me. Finishing speaking, Dai Quan Kin placed a kiss on Tin Kuang's lips. Afterwards Tin Kuang also closed her eyes accepting and enjoying it, until her senses returned. She startled and pushed Dai Quan Kin away. Her heart fiercely denied, still not believing she wanted to date him, thinking he was shameless, must be drugged by something. She wiped her lips then ran away without looking back. In the locked room, Tin Kuang lay in bed rolling around yelling. She touched her lips again, recalling Dai Quan Kin's eyes and words. Dazed she wondered if she really liked him. Then Tin Kuang immediately shook her head tossing away that thought. Her face was bright red and body burning hot. Tin Kuang decided she had to visit Duong Chao and comfort her. She ran outside into the cold, dark night. On a bench in the corner was the dejected, head down Duong Chao, with KYKY2 and deputy beside her trying to comfort in frustration. Duong Chao was very unwell kept saying she didn't want to be married off. KYKY2 comforted saying Duong Chao was shaken now, so accept the state's decree. Thinking of that man who kept wanting her, Duong Chao went mad, she wanted to castrate that man into a eunuch. Deputy was also tired of Miss thinking she was a man, having to fan and encourage her, saying Duong Chao was originally a girl, being swayed by a boy was normal, then asked why she didn't pay the singles tax. Duong Chao dejectedly said she already paid, but her spot was stolen so she she paid 20 years tax at once. Hearing this, Tin Kuang was confused. While KYKY2 started mocking Duong Chao, saying people pay max 10 years at once. She paid 20 years at once. The system would definitely think she was political. If not giving her a match then who? Criticized, Duong Chao went mad pouncing on KYKY2. Only now did Tin Kuang dare ask deputy if Duong Chao was a girl. After deputy's nod, Tin Kuang asked KYKY2. And it was true. Now Tin Kuang flipped asking why she was the last to know. Deputy smiled embarrassedly using the excuse that Tin Kuang didn't ask. While Duong Chao now just wanted to be alone, telling them to leave. Deputy also smiled ruefully saying Duong Chao had played with guys since little. So saying that, even Deputy forgot she was a girl sometimes. Tin Kuang was also at a loss. The amount of information was too great for her to process temporarily. Tin Kuang dejectedly returned to her room. Sitting down. Tin Kuang received a message from Dai Quan Kin. He reminded her to re-examine her heart tonight. If she wanted to date him then post a selfie on Weibo. He awaited her reply. Tin Kuang puffed her cheeks pouting. Ha! Huh, who wants to date you rotten man? Suddenly changing, but recalling tonight's kiss. Tin Kuang couldn't hold back tears from her torn heart. Done for, finished, yet not bad thinking about it. Now all Tin Kuang could think about was Dai Quan Kin. Unresigned. Tin Kuang decided to find something to distract herself. She called Han Tan back. He was overjoyed Little Miss finally called him. Tin Kuang then asked Han Tan back if anyone wanted to buy regret potion recently. Unexpectedly there was a real customer. Han Tan back said it was a friend of his. His sister died young, only now learning the truth why she died. He wanted to buy Tin Kuang's regret potion. Price negotiable. Hearing this, the suspicious Tin Kuang asked Tan Bak's friend's name. Why his sister passed away, indeed. Han Tan Bak asked if Tin Kuang had heard of state treasurer Han Nian Nian's brother. Ha Hu Da's CEO of Mermaid Corporation? Excited. 
Tin Kuang dropped the call. Unexpectedly Big Bro wanted the regret potion to go back and save her. She wondered if Big Bro regretted it and wanted to go back to the past to save her? Han Tan back was still urging Tin Kuang for an answer. Would she take this order? Tin Kuang smiled coldly then said she wouldn't take it. This customer didn't match her criteria. Also didn't explain further to Han Tan back. Ignoring his shouts asking for a clear reason. Tin Kuang hung up. She knew although Big Bro meant well she didn't want to change her life. Remembering a past customer she had advised. Tin Kuang was curious if he was online. The next day. Tin Kuang also just got off work at Coco TV station. In her heart she still worried about Dai Quan Kin demanding she post a selfie on Weibo. She thought, why not take a few photos herself? Or else waiting for Han Nian Nian to tell the president and steal Dai Quan Kin from her? Tin Kuang was afraid that was because she and Dai Quan Kin only had a certificate of cohabitation, not yet marriage registration. Just thinking about Han Nian Nian's smug face, Tin Kuang got mad again. She could lose to anyone in this life. The only one she absolutely couldn't lose to was Han Nian Nian. Thinking so, Tin Kuang raised her phone to take a photo. That time a car drove up behind her. A man walked over asking if she was Miss Tin Kuang. Seeing he had the right person, he opened the car door inviting her to come along. But the confused Tin Kuang asked who he was. Why make her go with him? He promptly showed his work badge. This was Tan Dao, aide to the president. Tan Dao said a few days ago Tin Kuang must have seen him outside VIP patient Dai Thoi Din's room. President Dean Bak wanted to meet her today. Hearing the president wanted to see her, Tin Kuang felt uneasy, suspecting Ha Nian Nian had made her move. Seeing Tan Dao's serious expression, Tin Kuang could only obediently follow along. The car had just departed when Tan Dao demanded Tin Kuang hand over her phone. When Tin Kuang resisted asking why, Tan Dao simply replied no reason. Just an order, finished speaking. He outright snatched Tin Kuang's phone, even cuffed her hands too. Agitated, Tin Kuang repeatedly asked what was he doing. Did he know this was illegal? Yet Tan Dao said whether Tin Kuang was guilty or not, she knew clearly in her heart. He said the president had no time to argue with her, so required her cooperation. Tin Kuang was utterly confused. She didn't know what they wanted to do. That night, Tin Kuang was escorted to a mansion. Unexpectedly Han Nian Nian emerged from somewhere, smiling smugly asking Tan Dao why Miss was handcuffed. Could it be she committed some crime? Tan Dao calmly replied Tin Kuang did cause trouble, while Tin Kuang could only bow her head following behind. When brought to the waiting room, she indignantly interrogated them just what crime did she commit. If not even if he was the president she wouldn't let this go. From start to finish she still felt everything was strange. Escorting her here then letting Han Nian Nian laugh at her. At this time Tan Dao accused Tin Kuang of stealing others' personal information. Registered Weibo and also scammed on Weibo. Looked like Miss Tin Kuang was quite gutsy. Miss Miss Tin Kuang denied, demanding proof or else this was Tan Dao slandering her. Seeing she still didn't admit it, Tan Dao angrily banged the table asking if Tin Kuang knew whose personal information she stole. On the table was also a document clearly stating the information of a Weibo account called Regret Potion Seller Uncle, registered under the name Luit Tu. Now Tin Kuang was confused wondering if her regret potion selling had been exposed to Dean back. She admitted Luit Tu was her grandpa, also asking if he had a problem with that. Tan Dao smiled saying Tin Kuang really was gutsy. Also asked if she knew who Luit Tu was to dare claim so randomly? Tin Kuang replied although not blood-related grandpa but still her adopted grandpa. Was there a law against adopting a grandpa? Black-faced, Tan Dao said seemed like Tin Kuang still hadn't repented. Then asked if she didn't know who she had tricked into buying regret potion. Now Tin Kuang evasively denied, saying she just did minor business. Selling fruit candies called regret potion. Was that not allowed? At this time Tan Dao pointed right at Tin Kuang's face, declaring the one she tricked was the president himself. Tin Kuang's first thought upon hearing this news was she didn't expect the president had also come to her for regret potion. Then Tin Kuang indignantly told Tan Dao not to spout nonsense. When had she ever sold regret potion to the president? Tan Dao angrily banged the table again, saying she not only tricked the president, but also stole the president's grandfather's personal information. Registered Weibo to trick the president. At this time Tin Kuang froze. Mr. Lack was the president's grandfather, yet she used the president's grandfather's account to sell regret potion. She exclaimed in surprise asking Tan Dao if he meant grandfather Lack was the president's grandfather? Seeing she still dared call grandfather Lack, 
Tan Dao got annoyed. He said old man Lack was someone she could randomly claim as a relative? Tin Kuang silently thought normally many people came to her for regret potion. Only ghosts would know what identity the president used. Now Tin Kuang remembered there was a customer who didn't reply to messages and blocked her. Could it be that customer? At this time Tan Dao warned Tin Kuang that if she dared leak anything related to the president, watch out for her life. Just as Tan Dao finished speaking, the door was pushed open from outside. It was the victim, President Dean Bak himself. Seeing Tin Kuang, he was surprised asking Tan Dao if it was her. Tan Dao firmly confirmed Tin Kuang was the one who not only impersonated Lak Tu but also claimed to be Lak Tu's adopted grandchild. Tin Kuang still didn't admit this crime. He said Lak Tu was originally her adoptive grandpa, saying if they didn't believe then call grandfather Lak to personally clear things up for her. After a glance from Dean back, Tan Dao understood and left. Tin Kuang shouted for Tan Dao to wait, because her phone was still in his hands. She insisted he return her phone so she could call grandfather Lak, telling her grandpa that his grandson's dog was bullying her. After that Dean Bak also agreed to let Tin Kuang make the call. Tan Dao had no choice but to obey, taking out the phone and returning it to Tin Kuang. After a long hopeless dial tone, Tan Dao smiled smugly at Tin Kuang telling her to stop pretending. Tin Kuang said she didn't bother pretending, and was certain Grandfather Lack was busy so didn't hear the phone. She guessed maybe he was fishing so wanted to call again. Seeing Dean Bak smile, Tin Kuang grew even more panicked inside, desperately hoping Grandfather Lack would hurry and save her, or else his granddaughter would be killed. After Tin Kuang called for a while, Uncle Lee picked up. The uncle immediately scolded her for finally remembering Uncle Lee. Impatient, Tin Kuang asked if Uncle Lee was with Grandfather Lack. Luckily he was. She immediately demanded to speak to Grandfather Lack. Seeing her grandpa, Tin Kuang cried for help. Seeing his granddaughter cry, worried Grandfather Lack told her to quickly tell him what happened. Sobbing, Tin Kuang tattled that someone said she was shamelessly gutsy, didn't know there was heaven above and earth below, dared to randomly claim to be his adopted grandchild, and also locked her up. Tin Kuang told her grandpa to hurry and look. She was even handcuffed. Seeing this, Grandfather Lack got so angry he dropped his fishing rod. Furiously he stood up asking who dared do this to Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang pointed firmly at Dean Bak, saying it was him. Now grandfather gnashed his teeth calling Dean Bak's name. He took Tin Kuang's phone, forcing a smile asking after grandfather's health. Grandfather Lack immediately interrogated him on daring to cuff his granddaughter's hands. Dean Bak lowered his voice explaining it was just a misunderstanding. He said Tin Kuang had secretly used his identity to register Weibo so he was looking for her to ask about the situation. Hearing this word secretly used, Grandfather Lack asked if it was his account for selling regret potion, also saying he told someone to register it for his granddaughter to use. Unexpectedly Dean Bak would cuff his granddaughter over this matter. Grandfather said now that Dean Bak was president he had quite the nerve, daring to bully his own granddaughter. Dean Bak regretfully said he didn't order anyone to cuff Tin Kuang, it was his subordinate being overzealous. Glancing at Tan Dao once, Dean Bak promised grandfather he would resolve this properly. Tan Dao also knew to be tactful, saying he would remove Tin Kuang's cuffs immediately, and apologized to Elder Lack. Elder Lack irritably replied just one sentence, saying the one who needed to apologize wasn't him. Thus Tan Dao had to obsequiously apologize to Tin Kuang and remove her cuffs. But Grandfather Lack was still very angry, declaring to ignore Dean Bak's face, then gently told Tin Kuang he had taught that punk a lesson for her. In the future Dean Bak wouldn't dare bully Tin Kuang again. Also worriedly asked if her wrist still hurt. Tears streaming, Tin Kuang whined saying the pain was gone. Just that she really missed her grandpa's grilled fish. Seeing Tin Kuang and Elder Lack happily chatting. Tan Dao and Dean Bak never expected there'd come a day they were scolded like this. Tan Dao even whispered to Dean Bak asking if the person in that video could really be his grandfather? Hearing this, Dean Bak felt Tan Dao was saying unnecessary things. Of course that person was his grandfather. It even made him feel like he was the adopted one. Now finished, Tin Kuang happily bid her grandpa goodbye. Before hanging up, Grandfather Lack still didn't forget to scold Dean back to take good care of his granddaughter, also saying later if anyone in the capital dared bully the girl, he would find and settle scores with them. Dean Bak could only laugh helplessly saying he understood. The call ended, Tin Kuang glanced at Tan Dao once, asking if he believed now? Tan Dao had to admit he had eyes but failed to recognize Mount Tai. Tin Kuang still wanted to tease, telling him to kneel down. Seeing Tan Dao still hesitating, she asked if he was reluctant to kneel just this little for her. In the end Tin Kuang still didn't want to make things hard for him 
telling him to go because she still had things to discuss with his president. Dean Back signaled for Tan Dao to withdraw. After it was just the two of them, Dean Back asked Tin Kuang, did regret potion truly exist? Tin Kuang smiled saying of course it did. Dean Back was now also patiently willing to hear her introduce a little about it. Seeing Dean Back impatient to hear about regret potion, Tin Kuang wanted to mess with him more. She complained her throat felt dry, wanting him to first pour her a glass of water before she'd speak. Unexpectedly the president was also very obedient, personally handing water to Tin Kuang. After drinking, Tin Kuang said out of consideration for him as grandfather Lack's grandson she wouldn't make things difficult. Now Tin Kuang affirmed regret potion truly existed, able to restore the things we missed, the regrets that could create a turning point. Hearing it could truly create a turning point, Dean Back was extremely shocked. Tin Kuang was also very confident saying meeting her was already Dean Back's turning point. Then she solemnly looked straight at Dean Back, asking him to quickly say his wish, what he wanted to restore. Head tilted, Dean Back silently asked if she knew about the extremist terrorist attack three years ago. Three years ago, his wife Tin Nam went on a business trip, but was kidnapped by foreign extremist terrorists. Dean Back personally led the team to wipe out those extremists but Tin Nam was hidden in a water dungeon. By the time he found her, because she was soaked too long Tin Nam had a miscarriage. That was also why afterwards they couldn't have children. Dean Back knew although Tin Nam didn't say it, but when sleeping she would always dream then sob calling baby. Mommy is sorry to you. Big bro felt the real one at fault was himself. He didn't protect well the one he loved and their child. He even pretended like nothing happened. Wanted to make amends but it was useless. Dean Back said if possible he wanted to return to that day. Even if later they had to divorce. He didn't want Tin Nam to suffer anymore. He wanted Tin Kuang to tell him what he needed to do. Tin Kuang smiled directly demanding he grant her a privilege. Then she would give him a regret potion pill, able to restore his marriage and child. Tin Kuang had thought for sure this time she didn't need money but a privilege. She must make a privilege greater than Han Nian Nian's, or else her heart wouldn't be at ease. Dean Back was also curious, asking what privilege Tin Kuang wanted. The privilege Tin Kuang wanted was for no one to be able to steal her man away. Dean Back said she already had legal protection for that. At this point Tin Kuang directly expressed her worry. She said sometimes the law also couldn't protect, for example someone with privilege, who fancied someone else's man could shamelessly steal him away. She said she only wanted one privilege. When that woman who dared have intentions towards her man, her privilege would become invalid. Dean Back understood right away that Han Nian Nian wanted to steal Dai Quan Kin. Embarrassed, Tin Kuang avoided saying she was just giving an example, to explain to Dean Back the kind of privilege she wanted. Unexpectedly Dean Back said he couldn't grant her this privilege, because Han Nian Nian's privilege was bestowed by the state. Even if he was president he couldn't interfere in this matter. On the contrary he advised Tin Kuang that if she wanted to protect her happiness, instead of relying on privilege, it'd be better to marry the man. Once married, even if Han Nian Nian fancied him she couldn't steal him away. Tin Kuang weakly argued, saying if she could get married then she wouldn't need any privilege. Basically she still thought Dai Quan Kin didn't want to marry her. They only had a cohabitation certificate, not an actual marriage certificate. So Han Nian Nian could steal Dai Quan Kin anytime. Therefore she could only try persuading Dean back to think about his marriage, about his child, and agree to this deal. Giving her a privilege is hoping for Dean back's unborn child. After all, all. Dean Back is still a person who is devoted to the country. He said in his personal capacity, he could give Tin Kuang anything she wants but absolutely cannot abuse this presidency for personal gain. He firmly refuses Tin Kuang on principles. As he finished speaking, a woman's voice rang out, a sarcastic and bitter compliment. You really are a good president of impartiality. Tin Kuang looks back in surprise. It was Tin Nam, the beautiful, rich but depressed and suffering first lady. Tin Nam approaches Tin Kuang. She said what can you expect from a man who only cares about national interests? Won't compromise even when his wife and child are threatened? Relying on that president who only knows impartiality, is not as good as letting her save the child. Tin Nam said as long as she can save the child, even at the cost of her life she won't refuse. Seeing his wife so agitated, Dean Back rushes over telling her to listen to his explanation. But Tin Nam angrily blames Dean Back, saying now why does she have to listen to him, asking if he really can't grant that privilege. She believed he truly couldn't, but even if he could he still wouldn't grant that privilege, because he was someone who only knew national interests. Facing this tense family drama, 
Tin Kuang had to step in to mediate, saying out of consideration for Grandfather Lack she'd make another condition, asking them to accept her as an adopted sister. In the future whenever she encountered troubles, Dean Bak would have to protect her like a blood sister. Tin Nam of course agreed. As long as Tin Kuang could save her sister, she would become Tin Nam's own sister. After settling the deal, Tin Kuang gave them a box. Seeing the glittering regret pill, Dean Bak was extremely surprised. He felt it looked just like a pearl. Tin Kuang encouraged them to trust her, saying basically Tin Nam just needed to prepare a glass of water for him to swallow the pill down. Then she turned to instruct Dean Bak that after drinking he had to concentrate and think of where he wanted to return to at that time. She also told him to remember there was only one hour of destiny changing time. The outcome still lied in his hands. Hearing only one hour, Dean Bak looked at his watch hesitating, saying he still had a national level banquet later, wanting to wait until after the banquet to drink it. Hearing this, Tin Kuang just laughed and patted his shoulder praising he was too responsible to society already, telling him not to always only think about work, and she explained he only had one hour in the past. Time in the past and present weren't the same. No matter how long he was in the past, it wouldn't affect the present. However, the people involved would retain their memories. For example her, big bro, and sis-in-law. So for Tin Nam, the pain of having lost her child would always remain. It would never disappear. Dean Bak looked at his wife, imploring that if he could save their child, then could they please not divorce? Hesitating a little, she handed him the glass of water then told him to go save their child first then come back and talk. After that Tin Kuang pulled her sister-in-law out first so as not to disturb Big Bro. The two stepped outside, a moment later, Tin Nam was stunned, saying it seemed she could hear their child's cries. Behind them now rang a little girl's voice, Mommy, Mommy. Both Tin Kuang and Tin Nam were flustered looking back. Turned out when he returned to the past, Dean Bak had tried his best to save his wife and child first. Tin Nam had also successfully kept the fetus safe. The baby was later born. Dean Bak and his wife named their daughter Dean Tran Tik. Returning to the present, now Tin Nam couldn't hold back tears seeing in her husband's arms their three-year-old daughter eagerly calling for mommy. Tin Nam immediately ran towards her daughter, for the first time holding her child in her arms. All the mother's pain and resentment seemed to be erased. The adorable daughter seeing her mom cry puffed out her cheeks blowing to soothe her mom. Seeing the happy family, Tin Kuang also felt warmth in her heart. Tin Kuang then quietly turned to leave. Now a staff member stepped out politely bowing, asking if she was Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang knew indeed the memories had been refreshed. Now she was invited by the president to the state banquet instead of brought in for questioning by Tan Dao. The staff told her the president said to arrange a seat for her. Please follow him. Tin Kuang followed him inside. It was a solemn and joyful state banquet. Tin Kuang sat down at a table, sipping a small glass of wine watching happily caring for their daughter over there. Tin Kuang felt those who drank regret potion were all like this. Finally able to make up for a lifetime of regret. She was sad wondering why she was the only one who drank regret potion yet still couldn't save Tan Kuan Deep. The more she thought the sadder she got. Tin Kuang tilted her head drinking down the wine in her hand. After that she angrily used her Weibo account Miss Tin Kuang to write some scolding words for Tan Kuan Deep. Saying she was willing to use the rest of her life. Too bad he was as stubborn as a bull. After writing, Tin Kuang heavily put down her phone on the table, sighing as she looked up at the night sky. Her phone very quickly received a notification. It was an account named Dai Doc Luku, Dai Quan Kin's clone account replying to her, saying her remaining life was already set. She couldn't just change it as she wished. Reading this, Tin Kuang scolded him as a rotten man, pretending to be a villainous master. Then she replied saying that Dai Doc Luku was spouting nonsense. His whole life was the one that was set. Now Dai Quan Kin naturally used that Dai Doc Luku account to message Tin Kuang telling her to screenshot for evidence. Confused, Tin Kuang asked evidence of what? Villainous Dai Quan Kin replied to her. Didn't you say my whole life was already set? Reading this line, Tin Kuang unconsciously smiled. Her face was also much more relaxed now. Perhaps the power of love made one forget their sorrows. At this time the girl sitting behind Tin Kuang suddenly mockingly said. Unexpectedly the national treasure of country A represented the highest musical level of country A. Turns out it was just like this. Ears hurt. Tin Kuang retorted, saying the national treasure was just her country's spokesperson, also saying every girl from country A was a treasure, talented and skilled, also saying if the young miss didn't believe, she would sing her a song to try. The pink-haired girl was still bent on winning, saying her country's singers compared to the national treasure, 
country A was much better, saying in the future it'd be best if country A didn't take the title of world's number one singer belonging to country A anymore. The pink-haired girl was trying to compare national treasure Han Nian Nian to the howling of seals at sea. Hearing her words, Tin Kuang thought, this girl had some skills, she might have been sent by country K to disrupt the hall. Of course Tin Kuang wouldn't let this happen. After that Tin Kuang stood up and told that girl that who said the national treasure wanted to compete with her. To compete with her, just casually bringing anyone would do. Then Tin Kuang pointed at her own face, saying for example, me, the pink-haired girl got so angry she slammed the table standing up asking Tin Kuang's name. Tin Kuang introduced herself as a nameless little soldier of country A. After saying her name she asked the other's name. Seeing this, Pink Hair's assistant stood up introducing her as the noble supreme princess Tritiatrin of their country K. Hearing this, Tin Kuang recognized she was the famous singer. Princess Tritiatrin, no wonder she wanted to sing. Now Tritiatrin whispered something into her assistant's ear. Then the assistant obediently left. At the same time, the audience had burst into excited applause as Han Nian Nian finished her performance. The MC on stage then introduced the next act would be by Country K's delegation. Country K's Princess Tritiatrin was invited to sing. Tritiatrin's face clearly showed confidence as she breezed past Han Nian Nian. Down below, Y Go Keen also knew Tritiatrin wanted to compete in singing with Han Nian Nian so told her. Indeed she was a skilled singer. Tritiatrin's singing voice caused Han Nian Nian to be stunned. After that she grumpily sat down, saying had she known earlier Tritiatrin wanted to compete she would have sung a bit higher just now. Also blamed Tritiatrin for waiting until she finished singing before saying she wanted to compete. Han Nian Nian felt this was outrageously oppressing people because this round she also hadn't displayed her best yet. Han Nian Nian bitterly blamed herself for being careless. Earlier the Minister of Culture had come to greet them, this time Country K visiting. Certainly it'd be an intense competition. It was just Han Nian Nian didn't expect. Someone would daringly jump in to compete with her. Now Han Nian Nian didn't know what to do. Should she sing some more? Ai Go Keen now told Han Nian Nian that Tin Kuang said she could compete with Tritiatrin. Hearing this news, Han Nian Nian exclaimed asking her cousin sister, could Tin Kuang have gone crazy? At this time Tin Kuang was standing behind the wing. Backstage also came asking her what song she wanted to sing so the person behind the stage could prepare. Those people kept enthusiastically asking if Tin Kuang was sure, also telling her it'd be better to follow the next songs. Tin Kuang only requested they prepare a piano for her. She wanted to sing her own composed song that others had never heard before. Then she told the MC to keep several acts for her so Tin Kuang could go change outfits. They also agreed to keep 10 acts for her to have more preparation time. But Tin Kuang said she only needed four. After four acts she would go on stage. And the song she wanted to sing was the first Sunshine of You as Me. This is the song Tin Kuang wrote for Tan Quan Deep. Now she finally has a chance to perform it. At this time, Princess Ki Tuyat Tran had also successfully completed her performance. She glanced down, looking around for the nameless person from earlier. Not seeing Tin Kuang she assumed she was too scared and ran away. Then Ki Tuyat Tran sat down again to mock Han Nian Nian. The resentful Han Nian Nian could only remind Ki Tuyat Tran to restrain herself. She went next to Y Go Keen and was told by her cousin to calm down. Things like this can only wait for Tin Kuang. Han Nian Nian retorted telling her cousin not to expect anything from Tin Tin Kuang because Tin Kuang already lost her shoes running away, losing all the country's face. Why Go Keen still affirmed that Tin Kuang is not that kind of person. Han Nian Nian then blamed her cousin for trusting Tin Kuang after only knowing her a few days. Then took the chance to vilify Tin Kuang in various ways. She was convinced that Miss Tin Kuang did not have the ability and instead humiliated the country. She thought Tin Kuang's challenge with Ki Tuyat Tran was just a trick to prevent her from going on stage. Very quickly after four hours, Acts. The MC introduced Tin Kuang's song. My first ray of light is you. The lights in the room all turned off. To focus that light onto the stage, Tin Kuang sat at the piano. The sweet lingering music rang out. Why Go Keen turned to Han Nian Nian saying to wait and see Tin Kuang's performance. Tin Kuang on stage had started singing. The singing voice of a mermaid queen. As deep as the ocean. As high as a whale's cries across the sea. Singing about Tan Kuan Deep. The first one who saved her. Thus Tin Kuang couldn't help shedding tears. Years. The emotional song ended. Tin Kuang bowed thanking the audience. Han Nian Nian still shamelessly went to ask Princess Tritiatrin if she was convinced yet. 
Princess Tritiatrin admitted the world's number one voice was indeed in country A. But it didn't seem to be Ha Nian Nian, right? Princess Tritiatrin sneered saying Ha Nian Nian's voice was still far inferior to the nameless little soldier Miss Tin Kuang's voice. Even the princess couldn't compare. Saying how could Ha Nian Nian not feel embarrassed calling herself the world's number one voice. 50% laughing 100% angry Ha Nian Nian. She was just like that. I think the number one voice should belong to Miss Tin Kuang instead. Those words Miss Tin Kuang kept echoing in Ha Nian Nian's ears, making her feel oh so humiliated and bitter. After singing, Tin Kuang headed out to the balcony standing silently there. Each time she sang this song, her mood was uneasy. At this time a man's voice called out the name Miss Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang looked back, wondering why Ti Don then was here. Ti Don then now asked if she was the one performing earlier. He said he never knew she could sing so well before. Then seeing Tin Kuang's red eyes, he showed concern asking why she was crying. Tin Kuang coldly brushed his hand away, asking why he was here. Turned out Ti Don then was hired to work in the president's office. He asked if Tin Kuang still hated him. Tin Kuang just walked away saying he was thinking too much. Unexpectedly this guy pulled her back. Shamelessly asking if he divorced Lok An An would she come back to him? Tin Kuang angrily shook his hand off. Asking didn't Ti Don then look down on her as weak. So how did he now realize Lok An An wasn't as good as her? This shameless guy actually rushed to hug Tin Kuang. Admitting he was wrong. He said she could hit or scold him but he couldn't continue deceiving himself. Last time seeing her in the cohabitation car. He said he knew he couldn't let Tin Kuang go. Now he begged her to give him a chance. Also promising he wouldn't treat her that way again. Tin Kuang immediately pushed him away, affirming she wouldn't chew back up the grass she had spit out. Then she gave him another slap for daring to shamelessly hug her. Tin Kuang declared they would each go their own way from now on, telling him not to bother her. Ti Don then stood there silently holding his cheek, while Tin Kuang turned her back and left. Unexpectedly someone had taken a photo of them. At Dai Manor, Big Bro Dai Quan Kin had just finished showering when Deputy excitedly said he should quickly look at this. Dai Quan Kin picked up his phone. Inside was the scene of Ti Don then hugging Tin Kuang. Dai Quan Kin didn't get angry yet. He only asked deputy who sent this to him. Turned out it was an employee of a rival media company who spread it on Weibo. With a VIP big shot backing it to boost propagation. Someone recognized it was Tin Kuang so forwarded it to deputy. Dai Quan Kin heard this and immediately knew someone was plotting against Tin Kuang. He was wondering who it was. Then he told deputy to handle the photo cleanly. Don't leave any loopholes. At this time team leader Kiu Van walked in saying there was something he wanted Dai Quan Kin to see. Dai Quan Kin still asked the same question. Asking who sent this, Kiu Van said it was a friend of his currently working as security in the president's office who forwarded it. It was the video of Tin Kuang singing last night. Dai Quan Kin immediately recognized the song lyrics were the words he had said to Little Mermaid before. Also wondering could it be she specially wrote this for him? He asked Kiu Van the song title. After knowing my first ray of light is you was the title. Dai Quan Kin had to try very hard to hide his happy smile. Then he told Kiu Van to go out. Send him this video later. Only now did Dai Quan Kin show his true emotions. Happily surprised that he had just gifted Tin Kuang a song yet so quickly she had responded. Dai Quan Kin immediately called Tin Kuang. He still happily thought that turned out in Tin Kuang's heart. He was the son. Just that calling Tin Kuang only got voicemail. His emotions gradually faded after 5 minutes of no connection. By the 10th minute the flames of anger burned within him. He wanted to know who she was talking to for so long. Right now Tin Kuang was talking to Han Tan back to resolve that photo issue. She said she didn't know who took it. Wanting Han Tan back to give her a smooth solution for this matter. Han Tan back was very confident he could handle this matter smoothly. Only that he didn't know where the original photo came from. The most important thing now was to find the original photo to investigate who was behind this incident. Tin Kuang thanked Tan Bak. She knew she had to check the cameras to see who had harmed her. Hearing this, Han Tan Bak panicked, thinking this was impossible because the cameras belonged to the president's office. They couldn't just check whenever they wanted. But to Tin Kuang this wasn't an issue. Now the most important thing was proving her own innocence. With the help of First Lady Tin Nam, Tin Kuang was allowed to check the president's office cameras. Now Tin Nam asked the staff what was going on that they still couldn't find anything. The staff now awkwardly thought maybe the cameras were broken. But Tin Kuang saw the scenes before and after were there. 
only the part with her was interrupted, firmly believing someone had erased it. Tin Nam also immediately made a fuss to support Tin Kuang, saying she would take them all in for questioning. If the cause couldn't be found out they'd all be fired. The staff now frightened finally confessed that Han Nian Nian had come to the monitoring room looking for to die. After being asked who to die was, everyone's eyes turned towards a fat, bespectacled, quiet man sitting in a corner. Tin Kuang immediately went to interrogate him why Han Nian Nian was looking for him. To Dai answered that Han Nian Nian's earring was lost and couldn't be found. So he helped her check, that was all. By now Tin Kuang had affirmed to her sister-in-law who had taken those secret photos of her. Tin Nam asked if she was suspecting it was Han Nian Nian? Tin Kuang also recounted they didn't get along. Aside from her there was no second person who wanted to harm her. After that she heavily patted today's shoulder saying now she would go find Ha Thien Nian to get to the bottom of this, wanting sister-in-law to interrogate this person a little. In the banquet room, seeing Tin Kuang kept looking around. I Go Keen asked if Tin Kuang was looking for someone? Tin Kuang turned back smiling asking Big Sis if she had seen Han Nian Nian anywhere? Why Go Keen answered earlier she had something urgent come up so left first. After hearing this, Tin Kuang's eyes became sharp, saying if she had done nothing wrong why did she have to slip away so quickly? Now why Go Keen pointed at Tin Kuang's phone, saying it had been ringing non-stop, was it something urgent? Only now did Tin Kuang look at her phone, it was Big Bro constantly calling her. Seeing this, Tin Kuang thought Big Bro must be calling so much because he wanted to interrogate her. He wondered could it be he didn't trust her one bit? On the other side, seeing Tin Kuang still not picking up, Dai Quan Kin worried she had encountered some trouble. And so midnight turned to dawn, one lifting her skirt going to Ha Nian Nian's, one standing waiting under the bright moon in anxiety. Tin Kuang stepped into the Ha Manor with overwhelming murderous aura causing all the bodyguards to shrink back. She arrogantly pushed the door open and went in. As for the bodyguards, after the previous fight, they knew for sure they couldn't stop her telling each other to go inform the old master and young master to find reinforcements. They hurriedly called more guards over, saying the one who came to wreck the house last time was barging in again. Without a word Tin Kuang immediately glared at him, causing him to be so frightened his legs went limp as he ran away tail between legs. At this time Han Nian Nian was very leisurely swimming in the mermaid pool, face up drinking wine and singing. Seeing Tin Kuang, she immediately showed fear, then questioned Tin Kuang if she thought this was her house. Coming whenever she wanted. Now Tin Kuang looked at Han Nian Nian asking wasn't it that if she didn't provoke her for a day, her whole body would feel irritated and uncomfortable? Hearing this, Han Nian Nian turned away saying she didn't understand what Tin Kuang was saying. Angrily, Tin Kuang bluntly interrogated why she secretly took photos of her and her ex then posted them online. What was she trying to do? Also said Han Nian Nian shouldn't think that just because she was the national treasure, she wouldn't dare hit her. Even threatened to turn Han Nian Nian into fish sauce. At this time old master Ha also led a group of armed people here, ready to confront Tin Kuang again. Unfazed, Tin Kuang just said if old man wanted to fight then bring it on. At this time, Ha Tru Da also panicked and came over, looking like he had just finished bathing clothes still not neat but was told by the family to come stop everything. Dejectedly he asked Tin Kuang what was going on now. Seeing Big Brother, Tin Kuang immediately turned back into the image of a wrongfully aggrieved little girl, telling him to go ask Ha Nian Nian. Ha True Da questioned his sister what was going on, why she was in conflict with Tin Kuang. Ha Nian Nian indifferently said Tin Kuang was so ferocious. How dare she provoke her? Plus last time Big Bro said Tin Kuang was the benefactor who saved his sister's life, said Han Nian Nian had to be grateful. She said she still remembered clearly. Seeing her still denying it, Tin Kuang held up that photo asking if this was the gratitude she was talking about. Curiously, Tin Kuang interrogated Han Nian Nian if it was because she didn't get Dai Quan Kin so she was venting on her, telling her not to think that just erasing all evidence from the CCTV meant she wouldn't know it was her doing. Han Nian Nian said Tin Kuang was spewing nonsense. Still angry, Tin Kuang shouted demanding she hand over the original photo. If not she would give the police the video of their family slaughtering her loved one. At worst the fish dies and the net splits. When Tin Kuang was agitated, Dai Quan Kin waiting anxiously at home called again. Tin Kuang angrily picked up, telling him not to call anymore, she would explain it all later. Also said couldn't he give her some time? With troubles at home, also thinking of how big brother Ha Tru Da didn't remember her anymore. Tin Kuang felt extremely distressed. She still remembered in the past big brother had said to Tin Kuang, that no matter what she became, he would recognize her. Standing before big brother now, 
Though it hurt, Tin Kuang still couldn't help wishing he would protect her like when she was little. Now Ha True Da consoled Tin Kuang not to worry, then said he would get to the bottom of this for her. Hearing this, Tin Kuang immediately cheered up a bit. Under Big Brother's interrogation, Ha Nian Nian of course still denied it, even asking if he didn't believe his own sister. Ha True Da emphasized asking again if it was Ha Nian Nian who took the photos, telling her to confess and he would apologize for her. But if she knew she was wrong yet didn't correct it, he wouldn't forgive her. Ha Nian Nian immediately acted aggrieved, then thrashed around crying in the pool, weeping and wailing. Seeing this, Ha Tru Da told Tin Kuang there must have been a misunderstanding here. He said he believed in his sister's character. Although Ha Nian Nian was arrogant, she wouldn't harm others. Also said he would help find where this photo came from. Tin Kuang stubbornly insisted it was her doing. Although the CCTV was erased, only she had been there. It was Ha Nian Nian who told people to erase the video. Ha Nian Nian cried saying it was the president's office CCTV. How could they obey her orders? Then said she only went there to look for her earring. Saying if Tin Kuang didn't believe her then ask the staff. Ha True Da's trust gradually leaned towards his sister. But seeing Tin Kuang still stubbornly accusing, he sternly said it was baseless talk. He couldn't accept it, upset. Tin Kuang asked if he thought she was falsely accusing Ha Nian Nian. At this time old master Ha said not to waste words with Tin Kuang. Also said Tin Kuang thought she and his daughter were alike, keeping grudges over little things. Waiting for a chance to retaliate, old man said his daughter was raised nobly. Not to mention perfect, she was still one in ten thousand. Having said that, old man turned to coax his daughter, guaranteeing with him here no one could falsely accuse her. Upset, Tin Kuang didn't know where to vent. She had to remind herself that Han Nian Nian was still Big Brother's sister. How could Big Brother side with her when there was no evidence? When Ha True Da's eyes met Tin Kuang's gaze, something within him stirred. A familiar feeling but he didn't know why. While Tin Kuang was like one waking from a dream, she knew in this world there was no one for her to rely on. She wouldn't hope for anyone. Even more wouldn't be like when she was little. Behind parents watching them defend Ha Nian Nian and everything. Also holding onto the dream of waving her tail begging for mercy. Seeing Tin Kuang so silent, Ha True Da suddenly felt pity. He called out Miss worriedly. Now Tin Kuang turned her head to leave. He said loudly if they wanted to protect Ha Nian Nian felt she was innocent then she had nothing more to say. She told them to just wait for the police to come investigate the truth of Ms. Hoi Queen Queen being murdered by the Ha bloodline tomorrow. Hearing this, old master Ha panicked and hastily stopped Tin Kuang. Very quickly all the bodyguards surrounded her. Tin Kuang just smiled asking if he thought she had come unprepared. Tin Kuang said she had arranged everything. Just half an hour more and if she didn't leave the Ha Manor, someone would hand over the video recording to the police. Not much time left. Old Master Ha had no choice but to grit his teeth and told the servants to back down. He asked resentfully what Tin Kuang wanted. Tin Kuang still only wanted to demand the photos and check if Ha Nian Nian had sold it to anyone else. She said if tonight Ha Nian Nian still didn't tell the truth then the fish dies and the net splits. Time now was running out. A family head like old Master Ha anxiously shouted at his daughter, telling her if she did it to quickly hand over the photo. But Ha Nian Nian stubbornly refused to admit it. Not believing it, he forced his daughter to hand over her phone. Ha Nian Nian thrashed her tail, turning her fish tail into legs to climb onto shore. She confidently held up her phone telling father to look, affirming there were no photos of Tin Kuang inside. Indeed after scrolling for a while, the gallery only had photos of Ha Nian Nian. She now gleefully asked if Tin Kuang had anything else to say? Tin Kuang still firmly said not having it on the phone just meant Han Nian Nian had deleted evidence. Also said if she was truly innocent. How did she coincidentally go to the monitoring room at that time? Now Han Nian Nian weakly crawled into her brother's arms. Saying Tin Kuang insisted on splashing her with dirt. Seeing his sister continuously sneezing. Ha True Da dotingly patted her head, telling her to go change clothes to avoid catching a cold. He said if this matter wasn't done by Ha Nian Nian, he wouldn't let anyone falsely accuse her. Ha Nian Nian just shakily went into the house like that. Tin Kuang immediately blocked her path, saying not to go before making clear. Ha True Da immediately defended his sister, telling Tin Kuang to take out evidence if not she was currently causing trouble without reason. 
He worriedly cared for Han Nian Nian, saying his sister's health was weak. If she didn't change clothes she'd get sick. Asking Tin Kuang to be considerate of others. Tin Kuang recalled her childhood again, feeling now big brother completely didn't belong to her anymore. She choked up then interrogated him that Han Nian Nian having a cold was a big deal. Though her photo matter was small, Ha True Da became more and more agitated. He said he had endured Tin Kuang until now because she once saved his sister. Ha True Da said Tin Kuang couldn't use having saved Ha Queen Queen as an excuse to harm his family. And so, Ha True Da supported Ha Nian Nian away, still not forgetting to affirm as long as he was here. He wouldn't let anyone harm his sister. Tin Kuang's heart shattered, but she couldn't say she was also his sister. She painfully called Ha True Da one time big brother. Ha True Da panicked not believing his own ears. After that Tin Kuang immediately turned to leave, sobbing bitterly. In Ha True Da's arms, Ha Nian Nian told him to ignore Tin Kuang and hurry up and take her back, then to act out like she was the victim. Ha Nian Nian staggered and fell into big brother's arms. Ha True Da and old master Ha worriedly carried her back, quickly calling for the doctor. No one paid any more attention to Tin Kuang. She was alone with her shattered heart. Speaking of Dai Quan Kin, waiting for Tin Kuang he still hadn't slept, watching her singing video over and over. At this time Kiu Van reported he had confirmed Tin Kuang's location to be at the Ha Manor. Dai Quan Kin then asked why she had run to the Ha Manor. Kiu Van answered Tin Kuang suspected those photos were secretly taken by Han Nian Nian so went to settle scores. Dai Quan Kin still didn't understand why that silly girl had run over there alone. He worried she'd be bullied and immediately arranged a plane to fly back, stepping outside. While changing Dai Quan Kin hurriedly called ordering his younger brother Mac Phi to lead people to the Ha Manor to protect his sister-in-law. Also said now no matter how crazy she was just let her be. But if the Ha family bullied Tin Kuang then don't be courteous with them. After that he told Duong Chao to cleanly handle those online photos of Tin Kuang. While he hurried back. On the way back. Dai Quan Kin received a call from Mac Phi. He immediately asked if Tin Kuang was bullied at the Ha Manor. Mac Phi gloomily reported they had arrived late, hearing from the Ha guards that Tin Kuang had cried while running out of the Ha Manor. Hearing his beloved was bullied, Dai Quan Kin was extremely furious. He asked where Tin Kuang was now. Mac Phi had contacted Tin Kuang and knew she was on the way to the president's residence. When Mac Phi asked if Tin Kuang needed help, she said no need because the president would help her. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin suspiciously asked again who would help Tin Kuang. Mac Phi affirmed it was President Dean Bak. After that Duong Chao called to say big bro, what you told me to do is done. Also said even if she didn't make a move, those photos would still be handled by Han Tan Bak. She said afterwards she went to find Deepla to see if any were left. Result was Deepla had already been taken away by the president. Hearing it was Dean Bak and Han Tan Bak again. Dai Quan Kin became jealous. He felt Tin Kuang was the same as before. Anytime something happened she looked for Dean back. He recalled Dean Bak's words telling him that he and Tin Kuang should just get a divorce. That would be best for them both. Always advising divorce not reconciliation. Dai Quan Kin saw Dean Bak as the rock blocking his path of love. At this time Tin Kuang had been brought by Han Tan back to the president's residence. He panicked and questioned if they could really go inside this late at night. Miss Tin Kuang confidently said after one call from her. Someone would come out to receive them. Han Tan Bak was surprised asking if Tin Kuang had some other identity. Could it be she had sold the regret pills to the president? Tin Kuang said she and the president were relatives. He was her cousin so of course she could go in. At this time Tan Dao came out to receive them. Tin Kuang told Han Tan Bak to hurry in. She'd explain the rest later. Seeing Tan Dao, Tin Kuang immediately asked if he had recovered the video yet. To Dai had said anything yet. Tan Dao answered to Dai was still tight-lipped. While the technical side would quickly recover the video. In the monitoring room, after hours of tireless work the technicians had recovered it. Tin Kuang eagerly rushed over to watch. The missing video segment appeared. Again seeing the scene of Tin Kuang slapping T. Don Than. Han Tan Bak excitedly praised what a nice hit. Tin Kuang carefully watched then told the staff to pause and zoom in on the corner. Indeed no one besides Han Nian Nian could be the culprit. Hiding behind the flower pot secretly taking photos of Tin Kuang. Miss Tin Kuang became more furious saying she knew it was her doing. Han Tan Bak yawned then said Tin Kuang should quickly download the video to explain to her partner. He really wanted to go home and sleep. After that Han Tan Bak asked who Tin Kuang's partner was that earlier she had called him so worriedly. Tin Kuang bitterly looked at her phone. Now it was 4 a.m., 
she denied being worried, just wanting the truth to quickly come out. She thought Dai Quan Kin must still be sleeping now so decided to call him after it got light. At this time Han Tan Bak asked Tin Kuang a bunch of questions. He didn't know where to take Tin Kuang. She didn't say where she lived. Also kept her partner a secret. Truly distant. Just then car lights shone into Han Tan Bak's eyes. He immediately recognized it was Dai Quan Kin's car. Complaining resentfully that last time's grudge wasn't settled yet now he shone lights in his eyes again. Frightened, Tin Kuang told Han Tan Bak to hurry drive the motorcycle away. But Han Tan Bak rolled up his sleeve saying he wasn't afraid of Dai Quan Kin. He said last time he got slapped because he was ambushed. So this time he wanted to prove his true skills for Tin Kuang to see. At this time Dai Quan Kin had gotten out of the car. Frightened, Tin Kuang pressed close to Han Tan Bak, hugging his arm. This made Dai Quan Kin even angrier. Han Tan Bak arrogantly raised his fist wanting to settle scores with Dai Quan Kin. But seeing Dai Quan Kin not looking at him, Han Tan Bak restrained himself, asking where his eyes were looking. Also said the woman that belonged to him could be looked at if he wanted to look. Dai Quan Kin coldly smiled, the woman that belonged to you. Ask her if she agrees to that. Naively, Han Tan Bak challenged Dai Quan Kin back, telling him to try calling Tin Kuang to see if she'd react. Dai Quan Kin immediately used that sharp gaze, looking at Tin Kuang telling her to hurry over here. Seeing Tin Kuang go over there, Han Tan Bak still clung to Tin Kuang, saying Dai Quan Kin told her to go so she went, making him really lose face. Now Tin Kuang had no choice but to affirm to Han Tan Bak that she truly belonged to him. Han Tan Bak still thought Tin Kuang was hiding her partner from Dai Quan Kin and they were secretly involved. Miss Tin Kuang had no choice but to clearly tell him, Dai Quan Kin was her partner. Han Tan Bak couldn't believe his ears. Stiffening in place, Tin Kuang sitting in the car, waved saying she was the mermaid girl online, then thanked him for helping, promising to treat him to a meal next time. Han Tan Bak stood there stupidly, only blaming himself for not realizing this earlier. Sitting in the car Tin Kuang kept explaining, saying last night it wasn't that she didn't want to answer his calls, just that she wanted to clarify everything first, then show him that video, telling him to watch and he'd understand. Dai Quan Kin just frowned asking if she thought he didn't believe her. Confused, Tin Kuang asked then why did he call so much. Dai Quan Kin looked straight at Tin Kuang, saying she thought calling a lot meant he didn't believe her. Why did she think he was a fool who could be easily schemed against like that? Tin Kuang still not understanding asked what he was angry about. Dai Quan Kin also didn't know how to explain it to that slow-witted girl. Ordering the driver to the Ha Manor. Tin Kuang asked why they were going to the Ha Manor now. She said this early they must still be sleeping. Dai Quan Kin became even more angry. Early, what early, I couldn't sleep. You couldn't sleep, the guilty relying on what to be able to sleep peacefully. Later, Dai Quan Kin and many underlings had come to sit, eat and drink at the Ha Manor. Old Master Ha still half asleep irritably asked Dai Quan Kin what was going on. He said Miss Tin Kuang just came and made a fuss. Now he came again when the sky still wasn't bright. What did he want to do? Quan Kin smiled contemptuously. What did I come here to do? He then heavily put down the teacup. The sloshing tea revealed his resentful mood. He asked what that bunch did. To make his woman run crying out of their manner? Dai Quan Kin knew the only one who could make Little Mermaid cry. Could only be the one she was attached to. Ha True Da. And now Ha True Da. Again recalled Tin Kuang calling him Big Brother. He felt the first time they met there was familiarity. Ha True Da also began suspecting she was Hoi Queen Queen. After that Ha True Da asked if Quan Kin came alone. Why didn't Miss come? Quan Kin coldly smiled. Come to do what? To let you make her cry more? Ha True Da said he didn't do anything. At that time, Miss Tiu Tu insisted that the voyeur was Ha Nian Nian. He said Nian Nian had just finished swimming and was weak and susceptible so he asked Tin Kuang to calm down and let Ha Nian Nian go back to her room first. Yes, Quan Kin sneered that Tin Kuang was bullied by Ha Nian Nian. But Ha True Da not only defended Ha Nian Nian, but also told Tin Kuang to calm down. Ha Nian Nian was still choking up, directly saying Tin Kuang spit blood while framing others, saying Tin Kuang did shameful things that then ran to their house making trouble. Seeing the younger sister speaking recklessly, Ha True Da told her to watch her words. But Ha Nian Nian cried and said that was the truth, and asked if her brother didn't comfort her when she was falsely accused. Yes, Quan Kin was also nauseated by her vicious words. He felt she needed evidence to stop this mess here. With a snap of Quan Kin's fingers, the video of Ha Nian Nian secretly filming Tin Kuang was shoved in her face by his subordinate. Miss Ha, 
Is this the evidence you need? Ha Nian Nian's face was drained of blood, and everyone in the Ha family had to gasp in shock. Ha True Da then turned to ask his sister what was going on. The girl peed herself saying she was too angry to think straight. Who told Tin Kuang to come make trouble at the Ha Manor before, and also steal her limelight? Ha True Da knew his sister had been spoiled rotten telling her to come with him to apologize to Tin Kuang. Dai Quan Kin coldly said his woman didn't need those kinds of things. He wanted 10% of Ha Group's shares for Tin Kuang as compensation for mental distress. Hearing this, old master Ha lost his temper scolding Dai Quan Kin for being a robber. While Ha Nian Nian said Quan Kin was crazy because even she only had 20% of the shares. How could they have to give Tin Kuang 10% over this little matter? Enraged, Quan Kin stood up asking her. In her eyes, plotting against his woman was a small matter? He said again, her hiring someone to kill his wife, why still no explanation until now? After that he ordered his men to give the Ha family a transfer deed, with a warning that if they didn't sign then Dai Group and Ha Group would become enemies. Dai Group would use all resources to regain justice for Madam Chief Financial Officer. Even if the fish dies and the net splits, both sides suffer losses. If it didn't make the Ha family go bankrupt, Dai Quan Kin wouldn't stop. At this time Ha Tru Da cautiously asked if Dai Quan Kin could let him meet Tin Kuang? Dai Quan Kin bluntly said no. He wouldn't let him have another chance to hurt her again. Just asked if Ha True Da gave the shares yet. Hurry up and decide. At this side old master Ha threatened if his son gave them he'd sever ties. Ha True Da said they couldn't confront the Ha family. He decided to give Tin Kuang 10 of his own shares. Hearing this, Dai Quan Kin banged the table in protest. He said he wanted 10 of Ha Nian Nian's shares. Also said Ha True Da should look carefully or he'd say he tricked him. Hearing someone touching her interests, Ha Nian Nian immediately flipped out, snatching the transfer deed, saying the shares were from her father. Why should she give them to Tin Kuang? Ha Nian Nian didn't agree but True Da took back the contract. He recalled what Grandpa once said, that if the youngest agreed to donate marrow to Ha Nian Nian then she'd get 10 shares. After she passed away, these shares were put under Ha Nian Nian's name. He knew Dai Quan Kin wanted to take the shares that belonged to Hoi Queen Queen for Tin Kuang. That further proved Tin Kuang was Hoi Queen Queen. Ha True Da held the pen asking Quan Kin if he signed. Would he agree to let him meet Tin Kuang? Seeing his younger sister keep pestering and demanding them back, Ha True Da had people take her to rest. Ha Nian Nian wailed and cried, looking at Quan Kin screaming asking what gave him the right to treat her like that. What made Tin Kuang better than her? Dai Quan Kin gave Ha Nian Nian a loving gaze filled with affection to answer that she was his woman. At this time Tin Kuang sitting in the car waited a while and finally saw Dai Quan Kin come out. She eagerly asked what took him so long in there. Also said she heard Ha Nian Nian shrieks out here. Dai Quan Kin didn't say. Just asked if Tin Kuang thought about where she was wrong yet. Flustered, Tin Kuang guessed he was jealous over Han Tan back and explained she only asked him for help. Truly nothing happened. At this time Dai Quan Kin arrogantly raised her chin. Then deeply kissed her in one breath. After that kiss, Tin Kuang shyly covered her mouth, blushing. Only now did Dai Quan Kin interrogate her why she didn't answer after he called so much. Tin Kuang opened her mouth to explain but he said to forget it, no need to say more. He thought she'd surely say things to anger him again, then say he didn't believe her. While Tin Kuang saw his attitude and knew she was busted, he must be overthinking and misunderstanding on his own. At times like this, she still had to be gentle, move closer hug his arm, whisper that she was afraid he'd get angry so hurried to find evidence to prove her innocence before calling to explain to him. Dai Quan Kin coolly asked who said he would get angry, then gave Tin Kuang the transfer deed. Seeing Tin Kuang's surprised expression, he explained it was compensation for mental distress that Ha True Da gave her. Tin Kuang's eyes widened in shock asking if Quan Kin rushing to the Ha Manor made them willingly cut their flesh to compensate her. He explained these were originally Hoi Queen Queen's shares that fell into Ha Nian Nian's hands. Also said if she dared bully Tin Kuang then should cut her own flesh to compensate. Only now did Tin Kuang recall Grandpa's words. That if she donated marrow to Ha Nian Nian then she'd get 10%. After that Tin Kuang looked at Quan Kin with extremely grateful eyes. Dai Quan Kin also winked at her. Making Tin Kuang immediately fall for his handsome looks. Tin Kuang held his hand saying thanks. She said she didn't know he had done so much. Embarrassed. 
Dai Quan Kin turned away, also reminding Tin Kuang to keep her distance from Dean back and his gossiping wife from now on. Tin Kuang curiously asked why. Weren't the president and his wife very close with Dai Quan Kin's older brother? Quan Kin didn't explain, just told her to remember his words well. That couple was very sinister, then he knocked on Tin Kuang's head lecturing her that in the future if anything came up she couldn't resolve, had to call him right away. Tin Kuang raised her face asking what if he was busy and didn't have time to help her? Quan Kin said he wasn't that busy. No matter how busy she still had to call him right away. After that he punished Tin Kuang to go home and write this sentence 100 times. Though unwilling Tin Kuang had to accept it. Not until much later did they return home. Dai Quan Kin hurriedly dragged Tin Kuang away. Giving her pen and paper to start the punishment copying. Or he'd use the clan's punishments. Ignoring Tin Kuang's strong protests from behind. Dai Quan Kin Tin pretended to be deaf, turning away to enter the room and shut the door. Tin Kuang sat before the notebook, wondering why he was treating her like a primary school student with punishment copying. After that she took her phone, texting asking if Quan Kin was sleeping. Seeing this, Dai Quan Kin asked if she finished the copying, who knew the brat said she was hungry, demanding to eat the beefsteak he made. Quan Kin smiled happily seeing the message. While Tin Kuang blamed herself wondering why she was like this, she just wanted to see if the big lump would pamper her. Quan Kin quickly replied to Tin Kuang, Hungry? If the copying isn't finished then don't expect to eat anything. This sentence ruined Tin Kuang's mood. She thought as expected this was the real him. How could he pamper her? But sounds already came from the kitchen below. Tin Kuang quietly tiptoed down. Peering over, she was extremely shocked seeing Dai Quan Kin taking out a large piece of meat to prepare steak. Tin Kuang immediately sat back down, not understanding why seeing the big lump pampering her like this, made her whole body suddenly feel hot. Dai Quan Kin still didn't know he was being spied on. He only paid attention to the food he was preparing for Tin Kuang. When he brought the food over, Tin Kuang pretended not to know, laughing saying didn't he say he wouldn't make her steak? Quan Kin still tight-lipped, did I say I made this for you to eat? Tin Kuang gave him the densely written punishment paper. Afterwards Dai Quan Kin also placed a gift before her. Tin Kuang's eyes brightly lit up seeing it. Then she asked what it was. Blushing, Dai Quan Kin turned away. A gift, Tin Kuang let out a happy exclamation while eating. Her expression extremely delighted. Quan Kin secretly watched her. His heart complex because in his memories whenever he gave her gifts she threw them aside. He didn't want to hurt so decided to find an excuse to leave first. Then he said he'd go for a run. After he left, Tin Kuang showed her true nature. Eyes shining like stars looking at the gift. Feeling the big lump giving a gift was a blooming century plant. Once in a hundred years, the gift was also very exquisite. A beautiful pair of gemstone earrings. While admiring them, Tin Kuang couldn't help praising he had good taste. After thinking of something, she rushed into the room, rummaging the wardrobe. After changing into a purple dress matching the earrings, Tin Kuang took a selfie. Then she used the mermaid girl account to post it. Didn't the big lump always want her to post selfies? Looking at this gift, she wanted to satisfy him. She was curious what reaction he'd have seeing her photo. But before anything, Tin Kuang received a Weibo notification saying her post violated community standards, forcing her to change the content. Tin Kuang's eyes bulged out, not expecting her own selfie could violate regulations. After posting several times, that notice still appeared. Furious, Tin Kuang was determined to defy Weibo. That night, in Dai Thoi Din's hospital room, Quan Kin had come to visit his brother. Duong Chao and some others were also there. At this time Quan Kin's face was gloomy as he asked Duong Chao if all of Tin Kuang's photos were blocked now. Duong Chao answered with a very smug expression, even saying Dai Quan Kin didn't know how hard she worked. Worked. Also said yesterday on average Tin Kuang posted every three minutes, forcing her and the whole team to exert max effort to delete them in time. Dai Quan Kin hugged his head disappointingly. He silently thought she was like a sister, not expecting her to be an obstacle. He hated not being able to ask Duong Chao if she knew how hard it was for Little Mermaid to take the initiative to post photos, then to see if there was still a way to salvage the situation. Quan Kin asked when Tin Kuang posted the photos, still gleefully boasting of her feats. Duong Chao answered this morning, saying luckily she discovered it in time to have staff handle it. She also reminded Quan Kin to remember. On the first day he brought little Tin Kuang back. He told her to pay attention to public opinion, not let Tin Kuang's identity be exposed. Duong Chao confidently said she remembered clearly every order from Quan Kin. Quan Kin's face darkened again uttering a few words through clenched teeth. Very good, very good. Duong Chao still thought it was praise and turned to look at KY2 with a smug expression. See, Big Brother Kin is praising me. Terrified, 
KY2 shrank back, stuttering that she didn't think Big Brother Kin meant that. Now Dai Quan Kin relaxed his face muscles saying to Duong Chao that she liked gossiping the most. So did she want to hear this melon from him? Extremely excited, Duong Chao told him to hurry and say it. At this time Dai Quan Kin affirmed he liked Tin Kuang, and asked Duong Chao what she thought of this melon. This immediately made Duong Chao and KY2 freeze. After that KY2 panicked asking if Quan Kin was sure. They still thought the one he liked was Han Nian Nian, so were very shocked now. Even Dai Thoi Din spoke up asking if his younger brother was certain, since Quan Kin and Tin Kuang had only known each other over a month. While Sister Nak Kin's expression was extremely eager for gossip, Dai Quan Kin just calmly said this kind of liking couldn't be defined by short or long time. KY2 still didn't understand, asking why Quan Kin established the mermaid theme park, made mermaid goods, invested so much only to change his feelings for Han Nian Nian? Quan Kin enunciated each word clearly. He said he didn't like Han Nian Nian one bit. Also said even if he invested in the mermaid it wasn't because of her. He didn't want to hear careless idle gossip, because the only one he loved was Tin Kuang. After saying this, Quan Kin left, his heart brimming with joy, because Little Mermaid taking the initiative to post photos like this was acknowledging the relationship. He hurried home wanting to comfort Little Mermaid, for the matter of not being able to post photos would make her misunderstand. As soon as Dai Quan Kin opened the door he anxiously asked where Tin Kuang was. The servant now reported after receiving a call Tin Kuang worriedly packed up and left. This news left Dai Quan Kin frozen. What? Little Mermaid packed up and left? Asking the others in the house, he got the same result, that after receiving a call she worriedly left. Dai Quan KY thought Little Mermaid must have encountered something. Seeing the Memorial Day note on his phone, Dai Quan Tin turned to ask staff when was Memorial Day this year? The staff member answered there were still two days until Memorial Day. Now he silently thought if he remembered correctly, Little Mermaid's father passed away on Memorial Day. He recalled the memory from before on Memorial Day. Dai Quan Kin was having people prepare a big surprise for Tin Kuang. Duong Chao at the time asked him that on Valentine's Day last time Tin Kuang said he set off too many fireworks. So why was he preparing another big surprise now? Quan Kin sadly explained it was because he took the initiative to announce their relationship so Tin Kuang got angry complaining. While Duong Chao boredly said the whole family disliked Tin Kuang, yet he still insisted on marrying her into the family. Really didn't know what drug Tin Kuang gave Dai Quan Kin. At the time Quan Kin confessed there were many things he did on his own that angered Tin Kuang. He thought she herself wanted to reveal the mermaid identity, not expecting her parents at the Ha Manor to be so despicable, not only showing her off for capital gains, but also unethically deceiving her. At the time Duong Chao still advised Dai Quan Kin that he should have listened to his parents, because after all his parents also hated Tin Kuang the most. Amidst troubled thoughts, Dai Quan Kin remembered receiving a phone call. When hearing someone report Tin Kuang was missing, he immediately had people hurry to search for her. Standing behind, Duong Chao frowned saying didn't Tin Kuang run away again? Then advised him that if it didn't work out they should divorce. Who else was like them? At the time Quan Kin still resolutely said he couldn't divorce because he loved her. After that he ran off leaving Duong Chao behind sighing. He loved her but it wasn't certain she loved him. Then Quan Kin went to the hospital. Only then did he scold himself why didn't he know his father-in-law had passed away. Seeing Tin Kuang sitting crying alone over there, he quietly approached calling. When Tin Kuang turned around her face was already filled with grief and her lifeless eyes didn't speak. The time Dai Quan Kin blamed himself. When Tin Kuang needed him most, yet he was busy with useless romantic things. Returning to the present, Dai Quan Kin tightly gripped the phone in his hand. This time he wouldn't force her to marry him anymore. Their lives had changed already, but he also thought his father-in-law's life could change too. Then he hurriedly rushed to the hospital. Now Miss Tin Kuang's mother was crying her eyes out outside the kidney clinic. Now Tin Kuang had also rushed over, anxiously asking her mother about her father's condition. Her mother now forced a smile to comfort her child saying it was nothing, just his old illness recurring. But Tin Kuang already knew everything and sobbed, saying didn't he go for regular dialysis? Why did the doctor announce it was critical illness? She was extremely agitated and wanted to go find that unscrupulous doctor, because she had found many sponsors for his research institute. Now hearing it was critical illness, Tin Kuang said wasn't that money spent in vain? But now her mother pulled Tin Kuang back, smiling telling her to hurry in and see her father because he'd certainly be very happy knowing she came back. In the hospital her father
father lay in bed, tubes all over his body, his hollow cheeks already sunken in, looking extremely lacking in vitality. Seeing her father's miserable state, Tin Kuang couldn't help but shed tears. But her father seeing his daughter still forced a smile, saying little Tin Kuang, you're this old already yet still such a crybaby? Don't cry anymore, your father isn't dead yet. Tin Kuang stroked her father's gray hair, saying she wouldn't cry and he also wouldn't die, because her father would definitely live a long life, then live with mother until their hair was white and teeth fallen out. Her father now looked at his daughter, then turned to look at his wife, then looked behind Tin Kuang but didn't see anyone. He angrily raised his head asking Tin Kuang, little rascal, where is that die guy, letting you come here alone in the middle of the night? Then yelled at his daughter telling him to come see him. Tin Kuang explained to her father that she left in a hurry and didn't have time to inform him yet. Also said if he knew he'd certainly rush over. Today he was quite busy too. Tin Kuang said she'd call him later. Before leaving, Tin Kuang's father wanted to see if this man could put his mind at ease in trusting his daughter to him. So was very angry and unwilling telling Tin Kuang to call him now, and told her next time if leaving home to go far away she had to inform him first, otherwise then why even need a husband? Seeing her father this ill yet the first person he thought of was still her, Tin Kuang felt extremely pained. She held the phone saying she'd call right away, but in her heart she was also very worried because she didn't know what he was doing now. He must be very busy right? She didn't know if he'd answer her call. If he didn't answer then Tin Kuang didn't know what to tell her father either, but Dai Quan Kin answered right away, also asked asking if she was at the hospital? Tin Kuang was extremely surprised, not knowing how he knew about this. After that Tin Kuang cautiously asked if he was busy now, if he could come to City T for a bit? She said her father wanted to see him. The more she spoke the sadder Tin Kuang felt, tears falling down finally choking up saying she was starting to miss him a bit now too. Just as she finished speaking, Quan Kin had already appeared right behind her back. Tin Kuang turned around in surprise. Dai Quan Kin's forehead still dotted with sweat, face flushed after hurrying over. He said he had arrived. Panting, he stepped closer to Tin Kuang. Seeing him, Tin Kuang weakly fell into his arms tightly embracing the man before her. Hearing him softly comfort her that it was alright, he was here now. Tin Kuang now obediently nodded her head lightly like a well-behaved little kitten. Dai Quan Kin stroked her head, kissed her hair, saying he had brought kidney specialists over from the capital already. They were discussing treatment plans with the lead doctor. He comforted her not to worry, everything would be fine. Hearing Tin Kuang thanking him, Dai Quan Kin then pinched her cheek indulgently saying between them there was no need for thanks. He held her in his arms affectionately again. The misfortunate old father in the hospital bed also smiled content seeing this scene, thinking it seemed he had no more worries now. However, the group of kidney specialists he brought still gave a sad result after discussing, which was they truly were helpless now. At most the patient could hold on two or three more days. Frightened, Tin Kuang's body shook and she collapsed weakly into Dai Quan Kin's arms, while he was extremely agitated saying they were the best experts in the country. No, the best globally. How could they not cure him? But they could only apologize, saying the patient's condition was very rare. There had never been a case cured successfully before. At this time Tin Kuang could only shed sorrowful tears. Because her father raised her for so many years, she felt she hadn't fulfilled her filial duty to him yet. She recalled that year when released into the sea. She was ambushed, after separating from Tan Quan deep she fainted on the sand. Luckily Miss Tin Kuang was picked up by her parents. Even though she was still filled with hostility then, they ignored that and cared for her. They gave her the parental love she never had before. Let her know the warmth of family. Father said the buns at that bakery were delicious, wanting to buy them all for Tin Kuang to eat. And mother seeing little Tin Kuang wearing a dress was so pretty, wanted to buy all the dresses in the shop for Tin Kuang to wear. After that they discovered her talents, willing to raise her, and helped her handle going to school. Seeing Tin Kuang's talent with piano, father even bought her a piano to nurture it. He said little Tin Kuang just had to be happy and they'd do anything for her. Becoming their child was the happiest thing in her life, but now facing having to lose her dear father soon. Tin Kuang could only plead for Dai Quan Kin to save her father. Seeing Little Mermaid crying pained his heart. He comforted her to cheer up and not cry. Otherwise when her father woke up later he'd also be pained. And a miracle could still happen. Hearing his encouragement, Tin Kuang wiped away her tears. Smiling saying she was mermaid fairy. She was a mermaid with very good luck. He silently encouraged herself to become truly strong. Otherwise when her father woke up later seeing her cry he'd be very sad. 
Dai Quan Kin embraced her, in his mind he was feeling very conflicted. Could it be he had to use his way to make her father continue living? After Tin Kuang stepped outside, team leader Ki U Van quietly asked Quan Kin in this situation, should they prepare funeral arrangements first? Dai Quan Kin was struggling to think and asked Ki U Van a question. If you were about to die now but there was a way for you to live on, but it wasn't a good way, could even say it was the beginning of another torment. Do you want to live or want to die? Ki U Van didn't understand but answered he'd want to live. Dai Quan Kin asked again. What if it was the beginning of other torment then? Kiyu Van replied he still had parents, still had people he couldn't let go of. Even if it was the start of other kinds of torment, he would still choose to live. A miserable life was better than having to die. Dai Quan Kin silently didn't speak. His hand unconsciously clenched tightly. Until night when there was only Tin Kuang's father left in the room. Quan Kin opened the door stepping in. He stood before her father asking if he could save him, but had to pay another price. A different kind of torment, would he agree? Not understand. Understanding his meaning, her father asked what the price was. Quan Kin painfully gritted his teeth saying the price to pay was blood drinking. Of course hearing this anyone would be unable to hide their shock. Dai Quan Kin continued explaining. Then there would be an unbearable thirst to go drink blood. Like a vampire but not easy to control. He said drinking blood would be very agonizing but could save his life. Seeing her father silent. Dai Quan Kin continued speaking. He painfully said Tin Kuang didn't want to lose her father. He also didn't want to see her so heartbroken. But he didn't want to force him either. He told his father to think it over then tell him again. Her father now sat silently on the bed. It was a very long time later before he spoke asking Dai Quan Kin so you aren't human. But a vampire right? You aren't human. You are a bloodsucking ghost. Hearing her father's questions. Dai Quan Kin could only lower his head silently. After that he affirmed saying he was human. But he could could give his father the first embrace, protect his life. The price to pay was from now on there would be an uncontrollable thirst for blood. Dai Quan Kin said he was once severely injured. On the verge of death, he had accepted the choice of the first embrace. Although since then he couldn't control his blood thirst. But he also said he never regretted that choice. He couldn't abandon those he loved. At this time Dai Quan Kin received a call from Tin Kuang. She said her mother had fainted, was in the emergency room telling him to hurry over. Dai Quan Kin then hurriedly said he had something urgent to take care of and would be back. His father-in-law now still lay in bed surrounded by all kinds of thoughts. So vampires really existed in this world. The things in movies were real. But he didn't expect his son-in-law said he wasn't a vampire. So now he started wondering what kind of magical creature it was. He turned and looked at the family photo placed at the head of the bed. Painfully wondering if after he passed whether his wife and child could accept it. He hadn't gotten to live with Lan Go until their hair turned white yet. Hadn't gotten to hold Tin Kuang's hand walking her down the aisle yet, hadn't gotten to hold his grandchild yet, he wept, clenching his teeth, he knew he didn't want to leave them, the room door was pushed open again, Dai Quan Kin entered, the old father wiped his tears asking why his wife and Tin Kuang hadn't come back yet, what happened? Quan Kin recalled earlier when the doctor said they wanted to bring father home, Tin Kuang sobbed. But she still didn't want to miss this, because she still hoped a miracle would happen. He still clearly remembered the pained look in her eyes when she asked if he believed a miracle would happen. Dai Quan Kin then told his father just now mother was agitated and fainted but a body check showed she was fine. His father-in-law now could only sigh. He seemed hesitant and asked if the first embrace he mentioned was real. Quan Kin said he himself was the one who survived after the first embrace. The situation was dangerous then, basically one foot already stepping through the gates of hell. His father-in-law now smiled helplessly saying old song always feared neither heaven nor earth his whole life. In the end still feared death and clung to life. Quan Kin knew he had decided and asked if he had thought it through carefully. Old song said he had thought it through carefully already. He wanted to live. No one wanted to die after all. After that he stretched his neck out telling his son-in-law. Come now, I've decided. Go ahead and bite. Dai Quan Kin scratched his head in confusion telling his father-in-law that he wasn't a vampire. Also didn't have fangs. The old father now broke into a relieved smile. Saying that was good then, he wouldn't have to suffer pain. After that he shed tears asking his son-in-law if one could instantly recover after the first embrace. If one could become immortal? Dai Quan Kin replied one couldn't. Hearing his father-in-law say book said one could. Quan Kin just awkwardly laughed saying that was nonsense, 
father. Finally he brushed those random questions aside, grasping Quan Kin's hand saying he would give this old bag of bones to him. That was the handshake creating a miracle. Meanwhile, Miss Tin Kuang had supported her mother out of the ward. She said they could take their belongings home now. The three of them would live together from now on. Led Dr. Bak Kin Ngu now seeing Tin Kuang called her over. He said he had been looking for her, informing that her father's indexes had recovered. Surprised, Tin Kuang even asked if the doctor was lying to her. Bak Kin Ngu affirmed he wasn't lying to her, saying the aide had taken her father for re-examination. Soon there would be other indexes. For now it seemed the important indexes had improved already. Tin Kuang and her mother shed tears of happiness and joy. Looking over the exam results together, Bak Kin Ngu assessed this case could be called a medical miracle because the indexes were all near normal already. Seeing his wife and daughter happy, Song Truyan Khoi was also very glad, silently thanking his son-in-law for letting him know what it felt like to lose something then have it again. After that he turned saying to his daughter, that having her boyfriend here was of course fine. Speaking of Dai Quan Kin, now he was alone in the car. There were also guards standing guard outside. He looked extremely annoyed. His hand was tightly gripping a ring with a beautiful mermaid design. His face was flushed red, veins bulging on his neck. Heath clenched, looking extremely agonized. For him after performing the first embrace ritual was when it was most difficult to get through. A while later he suddenly sat up. His whole body drenched in sweat, flushed face, panting for breath. His phone was ringing. It was his little mermaid calling. Dai Quan Kin answered, his voice extremely weary. Tin Kuang happily informed him her father's condition had improved. Dai Quan Kin then asked if she felt more at ease now. Tin Kuang happily said now with him by her side she was very good, she really wanted to hug him. Hearing these words, Quan Kin felt much more comfortable himself, as if there was a mermaid fairy right beside him embracing him. After that he lied to her that he felt a bit sleepy so would find a hotel to sleep and rest, told her not to worry about him. Tin Kuang said she just wanted to share this happy news with him, then told him to sleep soon, rest properly, wished him good night. Dai Quan Kin held the phone close wishing her the same. After that he played the song Tin Kuang sang to listen to, You are my first ray of sunlight, with the melodious music and song his lover wrote for him. Dai Quan Kin hoped it could be a way to help him get through this difficult period. By Monday Quan Kin had recovered and returned to the hospital. Now Tin Kuang's family were gathered together in the ward. He then told his in-law that he wanted to take Tin Kuang back to the hotel to rest. Her parents immediately told him to take her away quickly. Look after her, she hadn't slept properly for a long time and now had dark circles under her eyes. At this time Dai Quan Kin gently leaned over picking up the sound asleep Tin Kuang into his arms. Behind them was mother-in-law's happy voice praising what a good-looking couple the two were. Tin Kuang lightly stirred embracing him, her precious gemstone earrings clinking together catching Quan Kin's attention. This made him happily think everything would change. In the past she never wore what he gave her. Now it was different. The two of them were settled in a hotel room. Quan Kin silently admired his sleeping mermaid fairy. After that he indulgently placed a kiss on her forehead. He gently got off the bed pulling the curtains looking outside. Out there was a large poster celebrating Memorial Day. Only now did he suddenly remember today was Memorial Day. Then immediately called his underling telling them to buy flowers and bring them over. In another development, Duong Chao's people had been up through the night glued to their computers without sleep. Dark circles clearly visible under their eyes. Exerting all their capacity, they finally gained control of the hot searches regarding the mudslinging incidents about Miss Du Thoi Din. Duong Chao then praised his underlings for a job well done, encouraging them to keep at it for one more hour than rest. But these employees were already so exhausted they were foaming at the mouth, one more hour meant working until morning. They told Duong Chao today was Memorial Day pleading to spare their poor souls today. Duong Chao retorted what did this day have to do with hot searches. Another colleague hurriedly reminded the perpetually single Duong Chao to get a grip. Some colleagues still wanted to go out and celebrate Memorial Day. Duong Chao reflexively argued back that she wasn't single as she had Quan as her partner. As soon as the words left her mouth she knew she had slipped up. Then before her employees she spat out a mouthful of saliva, acting as if she never said anything, causing them to freeze up immediately. Tongue-tied, not knowing how to explain, Duong Chao told the staff whoever had a partner should go celebrate Memorial Day with them. An hour later looking at the empty office, Duong Chao could only resign herself, not expecting just earlier they were like lifeless corpses. At her dismissal they instantly transformed into energetic people, truly formidable, 
Duong Chao's phone now also received a message notification. It was from that Lan guy sending it. He asked since today was Memorial Day yet she still hadn't gone home. Did she intend to go astray? He even threatened to go report to the matchmaking agency. Duong Chao had happily devoted herself to work from morning to night, now being accused of intending to go astray. She got angry wanting to retort. But now she received a message from Dai Quan Kin. He asked her to make his post trend. Seeing this, Duong Chao opened Weibo and went to see what Dai Quan Kin had posted. In Weibo was a photo of Tin Kuang sleeping soundly next to him, as beautiful as a newly bloomed flower. More importantly, he had also tagged the mermaid fairy's name with the caption thank you, country. Duong Chao immediately blew her top scolding. Kin brother, do you feel I haven't worked overtime enough? Just then some kind of sound could be heard, making Duong Chao look around to see what was going on. At this time, Lan Tram Mac, Duong Chao's partner, suddenly appeared right behind her, even audaciously whispering in her ear. As expected you're working overtime, never thought you were this productive. Duong Chao was startled thinking it was a ghost whispering by her ear. She shriveled up, seeing it was Lan Tram Mac she yelled at him to not startle others like that in the future if possible. Unexpectedly, that Lan was able to easily lift Duong Chao up by the collar with just one hand, causing Duong Chao to struggle asking what he was doing, to quickly let her go so she could continue working overtime. After hearing the two words working overtime, Lan Tram Mac then sneered, telling her there was a power outage notice, did she still want to work overtime? After that he pinned her against the wall, exactly like an arrogant boss asking if she was trying to avoid him. Duong Chao's face turned red as she immediately pushed him away, saying who cared to avoid him, also felt he was overestimating himself. She said it was just because she didn't see the notice. In the end, Duong Chao also couldn't escape her fate being dragged home by Lan Tram Mac. Because the matchmaking laws said on a lover's day like this the partners must be together. He threatened if Duong Chao didn't fulfill her duties he would report to the marriage bureau. Duong Chao of course could only be angrily resigned, saying this was her house telling him to stop whipping out those laws to threaten her. So as everyone had seen, the girl who always considered herself a macho man now also had a partner. And this guy was her rival from 20 years ago. This Lan was the Kin family's rival, so Duong Chao also saw he was her rival. Now seeing Duong Chao looking at him, that Lan Tram Mac who was anything but tranquil then sneered, asking what she was looking at, had she fallen for him? Duong Chao recalled 10 years ago, to scare this rival, the brat had brought a worm close to Lan Tram Mac's face. Who knew the tanned brat would close his book, look at her and ask an eternal question, fallen for me? This directly made Duong Chao jerk in shock, involuntarily squeezing the worm dead in her hand. After that, she was the one who got scared by the mess and ran away. When she grew up a bit, once Duong Chao saw Lan Tram Mac talking to a girl, she hid behind bushes taking photos, wanting evidence to accuse Lan Tram Mac of a premature relationship with the teacher. In the end, she was still teased by that guy until her face turned red. Looking at what? Fallen for me? Duong Chao got startled and fell backward. Her hand also smacked some brown stuff. Off. Recalling this, Duong Chao could only sigh because this guy was still as hateful as 10 odd years ago. She leaned back saying Lan Tram Mac was truly shameless, reminding him that right now he was freeloading in her house. She said to just consider she was taking care of a junior, so he should know his place. In Duong Chao's mind she was just comforting herself, saying it was because she saw him fail in the fight over inheriting the family clan, getting kicked out and looking so pitiful that she took him in, not because of some matchmaking draw or anything. Surely that was it. Duong Chao laid down on the chair at the beach, exhausted, her stomach now gurgling after a whole day of working overtime at full capacity on deadlines, thinking about the image of her brother Dai Quan Kin going down to the kitchen for his girlfriend. At this time Duong Chao commanded Lan Tram Mac, saying as someone she had taken in, now after boss here had spoken, he should also make a late night meal to show his gratitude. Who knew Lan Tram Mac would just answer her with three indifferent words, don't know how. Duong Chao was so angry she lectured him, saying in life there were not only elegance but also necessary needs. After that she used her strength to push Lan Tram Mac out of the house for the reason that if he couldn't even cook, what more use did she have for him? Seeing Lan Tram Mac obediently cooking, Duong Chao felt extremely satisfied, silently thinking seeing a person who was once high and mighty with the most power in the Lan clan now ordered by her to cook food. Duong Chao felt very happy. While eating, Duong Chao said no matter what, 
Lan Trammack was once the highest authority in the Lan clan. Why did he get kicked out by a little turtle? She asked didn't he plan to retaliate? After that she eagerly asked how much resources and manpower he needed to kick that little turtle out of the Lan clan. Boss here could help him. That Lan Tram Mac didn't miss any chance to tease Duong Chao. He asked if Duong Chao wanted to help him regain justice, asking if she discovered she loved him already. Duong Chao was just about to bite her own tongue and retorted in agitation, saying no matter what, Lan Tram Mac was someone she had taken in now. Her person could only be bullied by her, and said did external riffraff dare show off might before Lan Tram Mac? At this time Lan Tram Mac placed a dish of food in front of Duong Chao. Seeing the food, the brat immediately praised saying it looked decent, not bad for the underling she raised. He also had some talent. Lan Tram Mac told her to eat then was about to leave saying he had to go to the bathroom. Unexpectedly, Duong Chao immediately stopped him, saying to take this card and spend it. No need to save in the future. Duong Chao said she did this because she feared others saying she couldn't provide for him. Lan Tram Mac ashamedly laughed asking why she gave the card without the passcode. Duong Chao puffed her cheeks saying how could she do that, telling him to look on the back of the card as written. Lan Tram Mac flipped the card over looking at the back. Seeing this number sequence he smiled smiled saying it seemed to be his birthday. Little girl, did you secretly love me in the past? Duong Chao was embarrassed, waving her hands and feet around, thinking he was ridiculing her wearing boyish clothes. I know I'm a girl. Don't need you to keep emphasizing it like that. After that Duong Chao explained she had just randomly set the passcode that no one could guess. She said the enemy's birthday. She felt it was the most secret. Lan Tram Mac then took the card turning to leave, still waving it saying he would use it carefully. At this time Duong Chao covered her reddening face, silently thinking how unlucky she was to have drawn lots and gotten matched to this guy born to cross words with her. As for our main couple, waking up they were still embracing each other sleeping in the hotel. Getting here. Surely no girl wouldn't be envious of Tin Kuang. As soon as she opened her eyes, a strong, blurry male body was right before her. When Tin Kuang was still groggy, Dai Quan Kin had greeted Good Morning Tin Kuang. After that, not giving her time to react, he fed her a delicious tongue porridge. After that Dai Quan Kin released her lips, thinking he was done but who knew he was just letting her catch her breath before continuing to kiss her. This was also too much for Tin Kuang already. So early yet he was already using his charm on her like this. Who could resist? Tin Kuang sank deep into that kiss, blurrily enjoying it but when reason gradually took control of her brain, Tin Kuang finally came to her senses pushing him away then shyly covered her face running off, leaving Dai Quan Kin sitting there in disheveled clothes blankly. Guess he was already satisfied. Tin Kuang in the bathroom kept pouring cold water on herself, pouring while cursing Dai Quan Kin to death silently. She almost lost control just now because of him. Looking in the mirror, Tin Kuang reminded herself to keep some integrity for the wedding night. Tin Kuang stepped out of the bathroom with an extremely serious expression, not even glancing at her lover as she turned away saying she had to go visit her dad at the hospital. Dai Quan Kin then informed her that her father-in-law had gone out with her mother-in-law already, telling her not to bother them. Blushing, Tin Kuang argued back that her father would never say such things. Quan Kin then showed her the message from father-in-law he sent him, saying he and her mother had gone to celebrate Memorial Day, and told Quan Kin not to let Tin Kuang come bother them. Tin Kuang read the message sullenly, not expecting her father to see her as a nuisance. Dai Quan Kin handed clothes to Tin Kuang, telling her to change then go out with him to find breakfast. Unexpectedly this normally cold person gave her a couple's outfit. Just thinking about walking around together with him made Tin Kuang twist uncomfortably all over, thinking this rascal really was a master huh? After changing, Tin Kuang and Quan Kin stepped outside. She said City Tea was most famous for seafood so suggested they eat at a streetside stall. Then awkwardly laughed saying she didn't know if he was used to it. She knew he was noble. Maybe only ate at three Michelin star restaurants. After that she persuaded him a bit more. Saying the taste wasn't bad just the surroundings were a bit messy. In Dai Quan Kin's mind flashed a memory from the past. His previous life. Seeing him eat street side food with difficulty Tin Kuang said they weren't the same kind of people. His noble body couldn't eat street food. Because of those words from Tin Kuang, Dai Quan Kin then bought that stuff to eat and get used to it. This made his sister Duong Chao extremely worried stopping him, telling him not to ruin his stomach. Dai Quan Kin still forced himself to swallow it. He wanted to eat until his stomach was no longer noble. Finally seeing her brother vomiting and retching violently, Duong Chao could only throw her hands up. 
feeling he really was beyond saving, having lost his mind for that woman. In this present, Quan Kin firmly said he could eat it. Because of this Tin Kuang was very happy saying today she would treat him as the host. They passed by a shop met a girl inviting them to scan for a code to get free bunny ears. Also praised his girlfriend was so pretty. Wearing bunny ears would surely look cute. At this time Dai Quan Kin just laughed saying Tin Kuang wasn't his girlfriend. This directly made Tin Kuang confused interrogating him. Asking if he didn't see her as his girlfriend why were they wearing couples outfits. Had kissed her that morning. Also said though he didn't successfully upload the confirmation pic they were still partners. How was he being so unreasonable? The next moment Dai Quan Kin grasped Tin Kuang's hand smiling telling the shop girl she was his fiance. These words of his of course made Tin Kuang very happily beam. They successfully got two bunny ears, entering the eatery eating while teasing each other. Tin Kuang kept asking Quan Kin to put them on. Also asking didn't he want to match her wearing bunny ears. Finally Quan Kin still helplessly had to accept Tin Kuang forcing the bunny ears on his head. His cute appearance directly made Tin Kuang's heart flutter chaotically. Quan Kin blushed turning away. Looking silly didn't he? Of course Tin Kuang's answer would be. Adorably silly to death, the two lovebirds chirped at each other all morning. The lives of people in love were truly beautiful. On the contrary, Han Nian Nian seemed uncomfortable. That morning seeing Dai Quan Kin posting Tin Kuang's pic, she immediately smashed her phone in anger. Seeing this, her assistant carefully and tactfully approached to persuade her, saying she should let go. Lately Luke Han Lam, Luke Qian Wen's younger brother wasn't pursuing her? The assistant said his older brother and Dai Quan Kin's older brother were both running for president. Their powers were quite comparable. Telling Han Nian Nian marrying into the Luke family was also good. Han Nian Nian became even more furious throwing things at the older sister. Yelling at her to shut up. To Han Nian Nian. This wasn't about marrying anyone. But no one had dared snatched anything from her before. She was upset thinking Tin Kuang stole her man. Snatched her spotlight. There were those 10% shares too. This resentment. Han Nian Nian couldn't swallow it. The assistant still tried hard to persuade Han Nian Nian, saying now the internet all knew Miss Tin Kuang and Quan Kin were engaged. If she used her power now to snatch him it would only leave the image of a third wheel. Hearing this, Tin Kuang felt it made sense. She thought Deep Li was right. Her perfect image could not be ruined by Tin Kuang. The one she saw as a little white lotus. So Han Nian Nian thought before she used her privilege. She must find evidence proving Tin Kuang was at fault with Dai Quan Kin. Moreover, she thought she still had that wordless romantic confession that could prove Dai Quan Kin's love for her. Han Nian Nian believed once she publicized this, netizens would say she and him were destined to end up together in the end. Thinking this, she was about to carry out her plan, but who knew she would be stopped by bodyguards not letting her leave. They said young master Ha Tru Da had ordered her to reflect at home these days. Han Nian Nian didn't believe what she just heard. Me, Han Nian Nian, reflect? Bodyguards could only repeat the young master's instructions, telling her to self-reflect at home. Ha Nian Nian asked where her brother was. After hearing the bodyguard say Ha Tru Da went to visit Tin Kuang's sick father, this slovenly girl immediately fainted on the spot. At this time in Song Tru Yin Khoi's hospital room, Tin Kuang had also gone there to retrieve her forgotten phone. Turned out after eating, when going to pay Tin Kuang realized she forgot her phone. She had said she would treat but ended up using Quan Kin's money. Tin Kuang felt embarrassed not knowing where to hide her face. Her mother now told her daughter that while she was gone, the phone kept ringing, reminding her to check if something urgent happened at the company. Seeing there were 31 messages, Tin Kuang was also a bit surprised. Turned out the cheerful co-workers at her company had found out Tin Kuang was the mermaid made fairy and excitedly messaged her. Tin Kuang's face darkened, not expecting her identity to be exposed. She was wondering who did such an unethical thing. But on the hot search, Tin Kuang saw the info of Dai Quan Kin publicizing her. Tin Kuang's face flushed seeing his post. The comments below were also very lively. Unexpectedly the mermaid fairy was the fiery beauty goddess. Tin Kuang looked wondering when did he take this pic. Even posted on Weibo thanking the country. Though confused, Tin Kuang still couldn't hide the smile on her lips. Just then there was a knock on the door. Seeing Ha brother walk in, 
Tin Kuang was extremely surprised. He even brought fruit saying he couldn't find Tin Kuang in the capital. Hearing her family was severely ill and she returned to Tea City so he came over to see. Seeing Tin Kuang's parents, Ha True Da set down the fruit basket on the table then bowed deeply in greeting. Ha brother's slightly ostentatious actions made Tin Kuang's parents bewildered. Tin Kuang could only introduce this was the CEO of the Ha Clan Corporation, Ha True Da, someone she knew from the capital. After that Tin Kuang took the thermos saying she was going out for hot water. Ha True Da unexpectedly told her parents he would go help Tin Kuang. At this time the elderly couple could only exchange bewildered looks. Tin Kuang stepped outside feeling chaotic. She didn't know what this older brother was up to. She wondered if he had recognized her or wanted to repay her family for saving Ha Queen Queen. Very quickly, Tin Kuang's doubts were answered when Ha True Da grabbed her calling Queen Queen. Tin Kuang immediately denied saying she was Miss Tin Kuang. Ha True Da grasped her shoulders, saying resolutely that he knew she was Queen Queen. Not knowing since when, Ha True Da's gaze had become extremely sorrowful and regretful. Tin Kuang was moved by that gaze but still weakly affirmed she wasn't his sister. Ha True Da still didn't give up, grasping Tin Kuang's hand saying his apology to his sister. Tin Kuang withdrew her hand then immediately turned her head. You have the wrong person. I miss Tin Kuang. Ha True Da with all his emotions. Hugged Tin Kuang saying he was sorry for not being able to protect her. Hurt to tears but still denying it. Tin Kuang wept. Just then a stern female voice suggested the two move aside a bit. Ha True Da and Tin Kuang hastily did so. It turned out to be a reminder from a female doctor. She wanted to clear the way for a patient. That female doctor was also very cold. Randomly bumping Tin Kuang's shoulder then sauntering away. Ha True Da kept looking at that doctor. As if recognizing something. The female doctor now told the nurse to call Dr. Bak Kin Ngu for her, saying she would wait for him in the operating room. Tin Kuang held her shoulder, asking in concern if Ha True Da was okay. Seeing his expression, she asked if he knew that doctor. But Ha True Da flatly denied saying he didn't. In his heart Ha True Da was self-hypnotizing. Surely it was just an illusion. How could it be that person? Tin Kuang was exasperated, as if she believed they didn't know each other. Ha True Da's soul had run after that person already. In the operating room, Dr. Bak now said to that female doctor that her condition today wasn't very good. Could something have happened? She replied the surgery had no mistakes. Then sighed saying she had met Ha True Da. She also realized she still couldn't do it yet, still couldn't see him as a stranger. The female doctor leaned against the wall, facing the sky with a bitter laugh asking Bak Kin Ngu if she was very useless. Bak Kin Ngu asked where she met him. The female doctor replied it was at the neurology department, also said it seemed Ha True Da had a new girl girlfriend. She thought he wasn't the sentimental type. Believed the girl who could make him take the initiative to hug her at the hospital must be the one he loved. Bak Kin Ngu could only advise her not to overthink. He felt she was adorable. Tin Kuang was still interrogating him, asking if he really had a solution, telling him to be frank with her. Quan Kin just said he wasn't too sure. He sighed saying 50-50, things had come to this, they could only gamble once. At this time, Tin Kuang looked at him and firmly assured him to just do it. Even if the final result was not what they wanted, she would have ways to handle the aftermath for him, as long as his heart was always with her. Hearing these words, Quan Kin stroked her head affectionately, saying he would immediately go do it, as long as she supported him from behind and didn't let him be eliminated. She then pulled his head down, and placed a kiss on his forehead, saying to give him some strength from love. Yes, Quan Kin shyly blushed red, then pointed at his cheek saying he wanted one here too. Tin Kuang immediately indulged him, and at this time, at the Ha house, Wai Go Keen and her mother were sitting talking. Wai Go Keen's mother asked if Nian Nian really had to do this. Ha Nian Nian said whatever, telling her not to advise her anymore, telling her to go rest since this condition wasn't suitable for examining patients. But the female doctor said she had professional ethics, guaranteeing she wouldn't let personal matters affect her work. Hearing this, Bak Kin Ngu said he had a recovering patient, telling his colleague to help observe after he left for research. To report anything immediately to him, the female doctor agreed, then slapped herself reviving her spirits. The two of them after that entered Tin Kuang's father's ward, seeing Ha True Da. Bak Kin Ngu slightly furrowed his brows. After that he introduced to Mr. Song that this was his junior sister named Thuong Dam Nian, also their specialist doctor. He said he had to leave for research for a while. 
telling Mr. Song if he felt unwell anywhere to have his family find Dr. Thuong. After the introduction back Kin Ngu left, before leaving not forgetting to quietly remind Thuong Dam Nian not to be distracted. Taking care of patients was the best thing to do. At this time Ha Tru Da indeed saw it was Dam Nian and called out to her, but she paid him no mind. Only went over reminding Tin Kuang's father to rest well, to get family if anything happened. Ha True Da got rejected by two women in one day, sadly wondering, meeting again yet she didn't even glance at him? He didn't expect after so many years she was still so heartless. Watching Ha True Da follow Thuong Dam Nian out, only now did Tin Kuang dare heave a sigh. Her parents understood, stroking Tin Kuang's head, asking if she wanted to admit it, Tin Kuang hugged her mom, saying she didn't know. At this time, having finished her tasks Thuong Dam Nian silently sat in her office. Ha Tru Da knocked on her door, greeting it had been a long time making her flustered. Though close, the distance felt endless. Meeting an old love again, Ha Tru Da asked, Are you well? Thuong Dam Nian pressed her temples, appearing tired, coldly asking Ha Tru Da if he had any business. If not then please leave if it didn't relate to the illness. Ha Tru Da pulled over a chair sitting down, saying he wanted to ask about the condition of the patient in room 19. Thuong Dam Nian said if he wasn't family she wouldn't disclose the patient's condition. Ha Tru Da affirmed he was family already, also considered the son's half already. In his heart he thought if Uncle Song was his sister's foster father then he was also his father. He truly just wanted an excuse to talk with Dr. Thuong, who knew his manner of speaking made her misunderstand he was her son-in-law, though unwilling. Dr. Thuong still arranged Mr. Song's medical record to tell him about it. Just then a nurse came in reporting the patient in room 56 had taken a turn for the worse. So Thuong Dam Nian had to leave Ha Tru Da there waiting while she dealt with it. Ha Tru Da smiled saying he wasn't in a hurry. But after Thuong Dam Nian left, he held his head tiredly. Just then Thuong Dam Nian's phone lit up with a call from her son. His heart ached, to verify he had to press answer. Not expecting that little bow to immediately call out for his mom. Ha Tru Da hurriedly asked who the kid was looking for. What's his mom's name? The boy said he was looking for his mom. Thuong Dam Nian, and asked who this mister was in return. Ha Tru Da punched the wall angrily. His heart complicated, since when did she have a child? After that he asked who its father was. The boy said back Kin Ngu, also asking why this mister stole his mom's phone, and threatened that he had installed a virus and tracker on the phone, saying if he didn't return it to his mom the phone would explode. Ha Tru Da had no choice but to tell it that Thuong Dam Nian had gone to the ward already. The sly boy snickered. Oh, Mr. Saved His Own Life. Bye. Ha Tru Da now also noticed a photo on the desk. It was a happy family photo. It was Dr. Bak Kin Ngu, the main doctor treating Mr. Song. Ha Tru Da was extremely angry, not expecting she got married already, and even had a child. Just then after finishing examining, Thuong Dam Nian rushed back. Basically she didn't want him seeing those family photos. But when she got back, Ha Tru Da had left already. Thuong Dam Nian gave a cold laugh wondering what she had been waiting for. He already had a girlfriend, but in the time after. Dam Nian was completely unable to focus on anything. Just then a colleague asked her, wasn't Dr. Bak's patient, a daughter named Miss Tin Kuang right? Seeing Dam Nian seemed to know nothing. That colleague told her the daughter of the patient in room 19 was the mermaid fairy, and the fiery beauty goddess, to enlighten the clueless Dam Nian. Those doctors started gossiping heavily, saying the experts invited from the capital were all called over by Miss Day's boyfriend. Also said her boyfriend made trending dog food on Memorial Day reaching number one on hot search. Another excited colleague even said she saw him hugging and comforting Tin Kuang, even carried her back home to rest. Really so sweet. After listening Dam Nian didn't know what else to comment. A serious girl like her didn't like gossiping much. But after listening, Dam Nian suddenly stood up making her colleagues wonder asking if she wasn't eating anymore. She had only eaten a little Dam Nian smiled saying she was full already before leaving. Outside it was pouring, passing by the window. She coincidentally caught sight of Ha Tru Da together with Tin Kuang. Unintentionally she recalled the beautiful old memories of the two. She lowered her head sadly. Some memories, the more beautiful, the more more heartbreaking. Seeing Ha Tru Da kneeling to give Tin Kuang a piggyback, Dam Nian thought it seemed he really cherished her a lot. Dam Nian could only give a bitter laugh, then slapped her own face to snap out of it and get back to work. Meanwhile Tin Kuang out there was still firmly rejecting the older brother's kindness. She said she could walk herself, and she wasn't Ha Queen Queen either. Ha Tru Da just smiled hearing this saying whether it was true or not his heart knew, even daring her to take off her shoes and step 
barefoot in the water. At this point Tin Kuang had no other choice. Tin Kuang finally had no choice but to obediently let the older brother carry her. Considering it the angel admitting she was his sister, Ha Tru Da was still gently reassuring Tin Kuang to not worry. He wouldn't throw her out into the rain. He knew her feet couldn't touch water. He talked about when they were little, asking if she still remembered. Back then he also carried her like this. She wasn't very heavy then. Ignoring his story, Tin Kuang on his back remained very calm. According to his story, they seemed to be finding their childhood memories. Every time Ha Tru Da finished school, she would wait for him at the gate. At this time Tin Kuang sharply called out Ha brother, with an angry tone inside. She said she didn't have any impression of what he said at all. Ha Tru Da could only sorrowfully apologize. Just then Dai Quan Kin called Tin Kuang's phone. He was sitting in the car coming to pick her up, asking why she still hadn't come out when it was raining already. Ha Tru Da secretly listened to their conversation. He immediately felt very jealous of Quan Kin. After that he loudly and curtly said telling Dai Quan Kin not to worry. I'm carrying her, I won't let her get wet. Tin Kuang was scared by Ha Tru Da, not expecting the older brother to butt in. On this side, Quan Kin frowned asking Tin Kuang who was talking just now. Frightened, Tin Kuang denied no one. Probably a passerby, but of course Dai Quan Kin knew clearly. He harshly said Ha Tru Da better stay away from Tin Kuang. Ha Tru Da basically didn't want to listen. Not conceding, then angrily took Tin Kuang's phone. Tin Kuang felt her end was not far anymore. She still believed Quan Kin didn't know anything yet, then would think she was cheating on him. Arriving at the hotel entrance, Tin Kuang jumped down saying this was far enough then hurriedly bid Ha Tru Da farewell. She anxiously and nervously called Quan Kin right away. As soon as he picked up, Tin Kuang immediately explained in one go that she and Ha Tru Da were not what he thought. Also said he came to visit because he wanted to repay the debt for saving her family's sister. Then coincidentally discovered Tin Kuang was afraid of water so carried her to the store. After finishing speaking, Tin Kuang awaited. One second, two seconds, three seconds. But Quan Kin just sighed saying only this one time, no next time. He basically knew it was the husband carrying his little mermaid wife. So what was there for him to overthink? Then cared to ask if Ha Tru Da carried her to buy sanitary pads. He after that cared to remind Tin Kuang not to stay up. He would have his guards watch over his wife's father at night, telling her to go back and rest at the hotel. Seeing Tin Kuang still worried about her father, Dai Quan Kin loudly shouted into the phone telling Ha Tru Da to watch the night. Now he would call and tell him. At this time Tin Kuang still didn't understand why Dai Quan Kin let her brother guard. Could it be he wasn't afraid of being cuckolded? Meanwhile, in Thuong Dam Nian's office, she was talking with her young son. The boy seemed to be very severely ill. Thuong Dam Nian knew her son's old illness had relapsed and was extremely worried. At this time little man said to his mama that he didn't want to take medicine anymore. Thuong Dam Nian could only coax her son saying she would come home right away. But the boy shook his head fussing for his mom not to come back. He said he wouldn't be able to restrain himself from biting his mom. Ending the call. Thuong Dam Nian ached with relentless sorrow. She hurriedly packed up rushing home, still worrying why her son had relapsed so quickly this time. Seeing Ha Tru Da at her door, she was extremely startled, wondering when he had arrived, and how much he had heard. Ha Tru Da now also solemnly said he didn't expect after five years without seeing her she already had a child. Thuong Dam Nian angrily retorted, saying at her age having a child wasn't normal, also asking if he thought she was like him able to pay $10,000 each month in bachelor taxes. Ha Tru Da still spoke in that cold tone but mixed with anger, asking so she married Bak Kin Ngu, seeing her silently not answering, even avoiding him. Ha Tru Da stepped forward interrogating. At this time Thuong Dam Nian gave a mocking laugh, asking with his attitude, could it be he still hadn't gotten over her after these five years? This wasn't like the style of young master you. Seeing this attitude, Ha Tru Da angrily grit his teeth saying Thuong Dam Nian was overconfident. Dam Nian was also angry now leaving. She said who she married had no relation to him. Ha Tru Da still didn't want her to leave before everything was clear. He grasped her hand asking if her wanting to break up with him then was to marry Bak Kin and Ju. Dam Nian was so angry her face turned red, saying this had nothing to do with him, also asking if if he wanted to know about patient hash 19's condition, it'd be better to go ask those experts from the capital instead. They knew more clearly than her. 
Ha True Da now spoke that he came to find her for something. Losing composure Dam Nian shouted for him to speak quickly so she could leave. He said he only wanted to prescribe a box of painkillers. Hearing this Dam Nian was surprised asking if Mr. Song was in so much pain he needed medicine. Also said his IV already had painkilling components. Hearing Ha True Da say the medicine wasn't for Mr. Song but for Tin Kuang. Dam Nian also worriedly asked if Miss Dai was uncomfortable somewhere. At this time Ha True Da explained Tin Kuang would soon have her period. So he wanted to prescribe her a box of medicine in advance to relieve her pain. Also said Tin Kuang only used this brand, but it was unavailable outside, so he could only come to the hospital to get it prescribed. After hearing this matter, Thuong Dam Nian's gaze immediately turned icy cold. She turned her head saying her hospital couldn't arbitrarily prescribe medicine. At this time Ha Tru Da again acted worried, saying he only wanted to prepare in advance. Afraid if Tin Kuang was alone and uncomfortable at the hotel at night unable to buy medicine then what to do. Saying if he could buy it at the pharmacy then he wouldn't have come looking for her. After hearing this sentence Thuong Dam Nian thought indeed if it wasn't because of Tin Kuang he wouldn't have come looking for her. After that she also nodded agreeing. Reminding herself in her heart not to be compassionate. Bringing humiliation on herself, she had to quickly finish to leave this place. Outside it poured rain. Thuong Dam Nian finally made it home, rushing inside asking in panic if Little Man's illness had relapsed. At this time the old woman said to her daughter that Little Man was currently locking himself in his room, also not taking medicine or letting her inside to see. In her hands she held a tray of medicine, telling her daughter to quickly feed the boy the medicine. After taking it he would feel better. Little Man lying in his room had a series of knocks sounding at his door. The shivering boy lay on the bed calling out, saying he didn't want to take medicine, didn't want to be a monster. Turns out after learning of the boy's condition, the bad kids at school all ridiculed saying little man was the kindergarten freak. Blood drinking monster, they all avoided and provoked the boy, gradually forming a psychological shadow in his heart. Little man lay on the bed holding his head uncomfortably, biting his lips continuously denying it. Thuong Dam Nian could only helplessly take the medicine back out turning around. Outside in the living room, her mother's voice sounded asking why her beloved grandson wouldn't take his medicine. Then scolded Thuong Dam Nian for being a doctor. Kin Ngu was also a doctor. Both were doctors yet couldn't cure a child's illness. Then how could they be parents? Thuong Dam Nian was also extremely pained only knowing sorrowful apologies. The rain continued pouring for days. Ha True Da didn't have a day he didn't carry Tin Kuang back, making her wonder if the older brother was deliberately softening her, taking care of her so attentively. At this time she truly wanted to call him older brother already in her heart. Seeing the little sister sniffling, Ha True Da wiped her nose. After that Tin Kuang jumped down smiling saying after all she wasn't Ha Queen Queen intentionally saying his charm was so great, yet he cared for her, if she fell for him what to do. At this time Ha Tru Da sorrowfully thought even the child was pitying him, so what should he do now? Seeing the dejected look of the older brother like that, Tin Kuang beamed changing topics saying she was thankful for him taking care of her parents that night, telling him to contact her if he needed anything. Seeing the older brother give her a box of painkillers again, reminding her to rest well, Tin Kuang felt the older brother was so thoughtful. Clearly a 32-year-old unmarried man. She wondered if there really wasn't a girl who caught his eye. Curious, Tin Kuang asked if he really didn't know Dr. Thuong. Hearing this question Ha Tru Da immediately froze but still said he didn't. At this time Tin Kuang gave her opinion saying she thought Dr. Thuong was beautiful. And also smart, saying if the older brother liked her he could start pursuing now. At this time older brother Ha sighed telling Tin Kuang not to speak anymore. Because she was married already and her child was 5 years old. Hearing this information, Tin Kuang was extremely surprised but at the same time also affirmed for certain he knew that person, because he even knew she had a child. At this time Ha older brother said somewhat bitterly continuing that her husband was precisely the main doctor treating Tin Kuang's father, Bak Kin Ngu. Hearing this Tin Kuang's jaw dropped not expecting Dr. Bak to be married, because she had never heard him mention this before. Seeing this, Ha Tru Da asked if Tin Kuang knew Dr. Bak? Tin Kuang of course knew him very well because her father also trusted Dr. Bak a lot. Moreover she thought Dr. Thuong was so beautiful. Marrying Dr. Bak was a perfect match of talent and beauty. At this time Ha Tru Da's face clearly showed dissatisfaction. Where was this match of talent and beauty? 
Tin Kuang still innocently said wasn't it obvious they were a perfect doctor couple. Moreover Bak Kin Ngu was also very famous in the medical field. Tin Kuang said he was stable. Marrying someone like him would certainly be happy. After hearing this Ha Tru Da lowered his head dejectedly, then cursorily bid Tin Kuang farewell before walking away. So after those probing words, Tin Kuang could be certain there was an issue here. Also hearing her large tumor was the older brother's good friend. Tin Kuang called him to ask if he knew anything between the older brother and Dr. Thuong. The curious flame within her blazed. As soon as Dai Quan Kin picked up she excitedly asked if he knew if Ha Tru Da had a girlfriend before. Hearing him say out Thuong Dam Nian's name, Tin Kuang became extremely excited. Sure enough those two had issues. She told Dai Quan Kin that today older brother Ha looked upset seeing Dr. Thuong. His soul immediately departed. Quan Kin then told her that the two of them used to be in love. But five years ago Thuong Dam Nian dumped Ha Tru Da. After that she married Tin Kuang's father's main doctor Bak Kin Ngu. At this time Tin Kuang was also very curious asking the reason for their breakup. Quan Kin replied love matters outsiders shouldn't intrude on. And he only knew that Ha Tru Da gave Thuong Dam Nian a sum of money after which Thuong Dam Nian left Ha Tru Da. Hearing Thuong Dam Nian was this material Realistic. Tin Kuang was extremely shocked, while Quan Kin was certain something fishy was going on here. Because what kind of person Ha True Da was Tin Kuang already knew clearly. Remembering her biological father, Tin Kuang believed he was someone she knew best. It seemed this was deliberately sabotaging a relationship. At this time Quan Kin asked if Ha True Da had seen Little Man yet. She hadn't heard of this and asked who Little Man was. But at this time Quan Kin suddenly realized he was saying too much and went silent. Tin Kuang urged him to speak quickly instead. In the end he had no choice but to say Little Man was Thuong Dam Nian's son. Hearing she already had a child Tin Kuang felt great regret believing this meant her brother had no more hope. Tin Kuang could only blame Ha Tai Fu, also asking why heaven didn't just strike him dead. It seemed they were chatting too much on the side. Now Quan Kin was truly concerned for Tin Kuang, asking if she had bathed yet. Tin Kuang replied not yet because she had just returned to the hotel and called him right away. Of course hearing that sentence Dai Quan Kin was extremely happy. He reminded her to quickly bathe then rest well to be ready for the hospital tomorrow. After the call ended, Dai Quan Kin sighed wondering how the child little man was doing now. He recalled four years ago in T City, when Tin Kuang took the college entrance exam, although Quan Kin had determined in his heart to not get involved with her anymore, knowing letting her go was also letting himself go. But he still remembered in their past life because of an accident she missed the final exam leaving lifelong regret. Quan Kin didn't want Tin Kuang to repeat that mistake so followed her like a stalker. After Tin Kuang finished her last exam she hurried to get a taxi. Dai Quan Kin fully disguised then rushed over posing as a taxi driver to take her, dropping her at the hospital to visit her sick father. At that time being able to help her made him very happy, also thinking that since they didn't recognize each other, then he also hoped she would have no more lifelong regrets in this life. Just as Quan Kin was about to get in the car to go home, he caught sight of Thuong Dam Nian carrying a newborn baby rushing into the hospital. Looking at the baby in her arms, he thought of how Ha True Da had told him Thuong Dam Nian gave birth to his son but the child died right after birth. Quan Kin froze wondering if this child was the son in Ha True Da's words. He then bowed his head following thinking that if it was that child then perhaps he could help it. Speaking of Tin Kuang, she was now comfortably bathing in the tub, but she still felt the swimming pool on the Dai family grounds was best for swimming freely and comfortably, not being in this cramped place. Like that she recalled the twinkling lights like stars in front of the mermaid pool and the shining mermaid statue too. Tin Kuang blushed wondering if those stars were a hint for her. Finally Tin Kuang had to dunk herself to calm down again. She thought there was no way that could happen. She was just being delusional. Tin Kuang picked up the remote turning on the TV, thinking she should watch TV to think less. On the TV now was breaking news of a gas station explosion killing five people. The reporters surrounded Dai Thoi Din, asking how he felt, if this would affect this year's presidential election, asking if the exact cause of the gas station explosion had been investigated yet. Could it be someone really wanted to assassinate him? Asked if any 
organization had claimed responsibility for this incident. Was this related to his opponent in this election, Luke Chien Wen? Dai Thoi Din declined all questions. He said he had to attend a memorial service for the guards. They had all heroically sacrificed so he was extremely heartbroken now. In another development, someone was also extremely angry still unable to find the culprit behind this incident. And also felt someone was planning to harm Luke Chien Wen. Han Tan Bak said to Luke Chien Wen that now during the sensitive presidential election period, he thought Dai Thoi Din was staging a misery scheme. Otherwise why was only he unharmed while the others all died? Unexpectedly after hearing this Luke Chien Wen laughed saying this was quite a good idea. After that he immediately ordered his lackeys to go do something. Han Tan Bak understood this Luke wanted to guide public opinion to make this seem like a misery scheme staged by Dai Thoi Din himself. Even praising Luke Chien Wen for being so capable. But Han Tan Bak was still worried if public opinion's sharp point was directed at the misery scheme Thoi Din supposedly staged himself, wouldn't Tin Kuang also be affected? Hearing this Luke Chien Win sneered. Han Tan Bak immediately put on a serious face saying he could guide public opinion however he wanted he didn't care. But he wouldn't allow him to harm Tin Kuang. Luke Chien Win then acted intrigued asking if it seemed Han Tan Bak was very concerned about this girl. Han Tan Bak extremely agitated said Tin Kuang was the light of his life. Anyone who dared harm her was this Han Tan Bak's enemy. Luke Chien Win set his teacup down. Asking if Han Tan Bak loved a married woman. Also said she was already the legal wife of Dai Quan Kin. But Han Tan Bak said the love he had for her was not romantic love but pure devotion. She was the faith of his life. At this time Han Tan Bak suddenly received a call. While listening his face seemed calm but after hanging up he was extremely agitated. He said his old man had called him home. Before leaving he seriously warned Luke Chien Win not to touch his faith no matter what. After the door slammed shut and Han Tan Bak left. At this time one of Luke Chien Win's subordinates placed a file before him. Inside were documents about information on Tin Kuang. Kuang. Moreover there were also seemingly intimate photos of Tin Kuang and Ha Tru Da. After looking Luke Chien Win asked the employee who sent this. He replied anonymous, then asked if Luke Chien Win wanted to make these photos public. But he waved his hand saying these photos were unrelated to him. They didn't affect Dai Thoi Din and even less so Dai Quan Kin. Moreover he knew his younger brother Han Lam was pursuing Han Nian Nian. After that Luke Chien Win changed the topic asking the employee about last time when he told him to investigate Tin Kuang. What was the progress now? The employee said her father's name was Tong Truyen Khoi. Mother Bok Lan Go, he couldn't find anything special about them. But he was certain Tin Kuang was their adopted child. Her real identity still couldn't be found yet. He thought Ha Tru Da was also so concerned about Tin Kuang. Suspecting perhaps this young miss identity wasn't as simple as they thought. Luke Chien Win said this was an issue that didn't require investigating. The urgent matter now was finding out who splashed the dirty water on him. And at the same time regain his image from this gas station explosion incident. Looking at the photo in hand, Luke Chien Win exhaled an immortal line. Miss Tin Kuang, you are quite interesting too. Early next morning, Tin Kuang had just woken up so felt extremely comfortable since it had been long since she slept so well. But she also couldn't have expected her peaceful morning to be destroyed by news online. The number one trending topic now was the info of Dai Thoi Din staging the gas station explosion himself. After reading this absurd news, Tin Kuang wondered if she should speak up to say how dangerous that fire really was. Misfortune comes in pairs. At this time Tin Kuang received a call informing her father's condition wasn't very promising inviting her over immediately. At the hospital, Tong Truyen Khoi lay shivering on the bed very uncomfortably. At this time Thuong Dam Nian asked why he wouldn't take his medicine. Clearly his current condition was very dangerous. But Tong Truyen Khoi was extremely agitated knocking the medicine from the doctor's hand down. He shouted at them to get out, leave so he could be alone in peace. At this point he finally understood the bloodthirst his son-in-law mentioned. He was certain if his son-in-law could do it so could he. He couldn't lose to the young. At this time Thuong Dam Nian was also extremely confused because because his indexes were the same as her son's. She then signaled for all the other doctors to go outside. After closing the door, only two people were left in the room. Thuong Dam Nian told him to tell her the truth. She asked if his current torment was because he wanted blood. Seeing he was still silent, Thuong Dam Nian continued persuading him to talk to her, because she had seen this disease before. A strange illness that wouldn't get better without drinking blood. She also honestly told him her son had this disease too. Just today he had relapsed again. As his doctor she needed to grasp his physical condition so hoped he would share. At this time Tong Truyen Khoi wearily said not to give him those miscellaneous medicines anymore. 
just like she thought, leave him be. Kin Kwong outside had just arrived and heard everything already. Unable to believe her own father also had the disease of wanting blood. Thuong Dam Nian still patiently asked Tong Truyen Khoi if he could tell her why he had this disease. Unexpectedly the stubborn boss only answered one sentence that it was just to live. Other things were unrelated. Now Thuong Dam Nian realized why in the past she received reports of critically ill patients. Then their condition suddenly stabilized again. Then she remembered that year the doctor said little man was beyond saving but a miracle happened after. Could it have been because of this disease too? When Thuong Dam Nian said she would bring him a bag of blood, Mr. Tong became extremely agitated stopping her saying he didn't need it. At this time Tin Kuang rushed in crying kneeling beside her father's bed, asking father why did he get this blood drinking disease. She interrogated him on who caused him to have this disease. Was it Dai Quan Kin? How could he do this? He was ill yet spread it to others? How could he? Seeing his daughter about to misunderstand his son-in-law, Old Tong explained it was voluntary. Otherwise now Tin Kuang would have been at his funeral already. Hearing her father say such ominous things, Tin Kuang covered his mouth scolding him to shut up. But in her heart she had gradually changed her thinking. Now she understood why her father's illness suddenly improved. Turns out her large tumor had saved father. After that she told her father she had a way to cure this disease, and told him to first just drink some blood for now. Seeing he still didn't believe, Tin Kuang affirmed she was serious, then, coaxed father to drink blood first. Because his body wasn't as good as Dai Quan Kin's, he had to endure for a period first. Old Tong now could only listen to his daughter, leaving everything to her. Tin Kuang went into the hallway and immediately called Quan Kin, who was puzzled seeing her call asking if she didn't rest at the hotel, to come to the hospital so early. At this time Tin Kuang irritably asked what he did to her father, hurting him so much. Hearing this Dai Quan Kin could only keep silent unable to say anything. Seeing Tin Kuang blame him for not telling her, Dai Quan Kin could only bow apologizing. But at this time Tin Kuang said thank you, turns out she just wanted to tease him a little. Tin Kuang told Quan Kin her father had told her everything already. After that she told him to rest assured, she would save him and father because she knew how to cure this disease from its root. At this time Quan Kin also unloaded the burden in his heart, and jokingly said don't say those two words thank you to him. If she wanted to sincerely express gratitude then she had to say two other words. Hearing this Tin Kuang puzzled asked what two words were those. At this time he smiled saying the two words akin. Tin Kuang blushed embarrassedly stuttering she already knew. He still teased her after. That she had to use these two words at the end of each sentence. For example just now she could have said knew already akin. Tin Kuang was so embarrassed she quickly bid him goodbye then hung up. Her face was flushed but her lips smiled softly. Hugging the phone to her chest her heart felt warm. Knowing he teased her to the point of embarrassment. That big tumor texted comforting her to be good. After replying to him with a cute cat icon. Tin Kuang was fired up. Now was the time for her to do the right thing. To cure father's and Dai Quan Kin's disease from its root. It seemed she had to go to the ocean this time. Just didn't expect older brother Ha Tru Da having her followed here already. Thinking she was about to return to the hotel he wanted to take her. Tin Kuang apologetically told older brother Ha he was up all night watching her father last night already. Rest tonight. Also said if he was busy to return to the capital first because she still had things to do. But Ha Tru Da said he wasn't busy and still wanted to go with Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang declined saying this was her private matter so he didn't need to follow. Then she turned leaving first. Leaving Ha Tru Da still standing there watching her unblinking. Half a day passed. At this time Tin Kuang was driving a boat out at sea. After driving tiredly for hours Tin Kuang was very sleepy. Thinking it was just her. Hearing a noise behind Tin Kuang turned back shocked to see it was older brother Ha. She agitatedly asked why he followed her. Ha Tru Da replied he was worried so had no choice but to follow. Also said if she was sleepy then quickly go rest while he took over driving. At this time Tin Kuang was still stunned that there was another living person secretly following yet she didn't detect. But the main issue was that place, she couldn't let her older brother know. But turning back the shore was nowhere in sight. Tin Kuang also had to let it go since they already went so far. After that she agreed to let him drive instead, told him to just follow her map. When they arrive call her, Tin Kuang was very troubled because she also couldn't make him swim all the way back if she chased him into the sea. For now she had no choice but this. Thinking so she lay down to sleep. In another development, 
Captain Kiu Van rushed in telling Dai Quan Kin to quickly see the news. Turns out someone had posted photos of Ha Tru Da piggybacking Tin Kuang online. Therefore now countless people were flooding and scolding Tin Kuang as a flirt. Already having Dai Quan Kin yet still not satisfied. Others curses at her were as long as a petition. After seeing this Dai Quan Kin was extremely angry throwing his phone down ordering his subordinates to investigate who did this. Kiu Van was very worried her boss would misunderstand Miss Tin Kuang so explained on her behalf that he shouldn't be fooled by these photos. Because with her father still critically ill how could Tin Kuang be in the mood to be affectionate with others? After hearing Kiu Van's words Quan Kin only asked one question of why his deputy wasn't as smart as him. Kiu Van asked if this time it was a misunderstanding. Quan Kin laughed tilting his head back saying Tin Kuang and Ha Tru Da couldn't happen. At this time Kiu Van announced Tin Kuang already posted on Weibo proving this photo was real. But if she didn't clarify quickly then an unsavory image would arise damaging her reputation. Dai Quan Kin was silent. He didn't mind telling everyone Ha Tru Da was his brother-in-law. But he respected what his little mermaid thought. If she didn't agree to make their relations public then he wouldn't force it. Quan Kin called Tin Kuang but she didn't pick up. He thought Tin Kuang Kuang was very angry so turned off her phone, then redirected the call to Ha Tru Da, but unexpectedly Ha Tru Da's phone was also out of service. Dai Quan Kin's temper flared, secretly thinking could it be they wanted to elope after their affair news leaked? At the Ha family, at this time Ha Tai Fu was scolding his daughter why she made that Weibo post. Did she know how much it would damage her brother's image? Ha Nian Nian still indifferently said she was just recounting the facts, also asked father how could he not see her brother was treating Miss Tin Kuang Kuang too well. Her mother at this time just smiled gently teaching her daughter. Said she knew she was angry but still couldn't speak ill of her brother like that. Ha Nian Nian explained she just wanted to get back her shares. If the two of them clarified then Tin Kuang would have to return her shares to prove innocence. After smirking asking if father and mother hoped their family shares fell into outsiders hands. Seeing the two elders looking at each other silently. Ha Nian Nian knew she had the upper hand and returned to her room to rest. Reading netizens comments scolding Tin Kuang. Kuang. Ha Nian Nian felt extremely gleeful finally seeing Tin Kuang's hypocrisy exposed by the public. After that she sinisterly laughed, thinking Miss Tin Kuang was now beyond the pale. So if she wanted to marry Dai Quan Kin, the public wouldn't feel revulsion anymore. At this time in Quan Kin's company, the atmosphere was heavier than ever. He looked at his phone thinking seems like they had no intention of calling him, so he felt extremely resentful. He was certain that little brat must have thought he would misunderstand so didn't dare call him. It seemed last times 100 lines punishment still wasn't effective. At this time his assistant knocked on his door informing the vice president had arrived. When he asked what business the vice president had with him, his assistant said she also didn't know. He could only tell the staff to invite him into the reception room and he would be there shortly. Dai Quan Kin went into the reception room, blurting asking which wind brought the vice president here. The old man now smiled saying certainly it was the spring wind, because he came with good news to tell him. At this time Dai Quan Kin smirked asking if it was good news that required the vice president to personally inform him. Also said just a phone call and he would have gone over. Fan Dang Long at this time had a staff member take out a document giving it to Dai Quan Kin. Sipping tea, the old man half smiled saying unexpectedly their country's treasure chose to marry into his Dai family among countless options. Fan Dang Long even praised this was a real case of untalented man and beautiful woman that heaven arranged. Truly a beautiful romance. Looking at the marriage proposal letter National Treasure Ha Nian Nian sent him, Dai Quan Kin frowned asking if the vice president didn't know he already had a legal spouse. Fan Dang Long replied he already investigated. Although he and that young miss already had the marriage certificate they hadn't registered the marriage yet, so Miss Tin Kuang could only be considered his fiancé. If she was just a fiancé, facing National Treasure Ha Nian Nian's privilege, the state allowed them to nullify the relationship, regain single status then marry Ha Nian Nian. Dai Quan Kin was extremely angry. He sternly said please relay to Han Nian Nian for him, that he doesn't want her type. He said tomorrow he would go register his marriage with Tin Kuang. But Fan Dang Long said according to the law protecting national treasures. Once Han Nian Nian submitted the marriage application, the Civil Affairs Bureau could no longer process marriage registrations for him with others. And now Quan Kin only had two options left. One was to accept marrying Han Nian Nian. Two was to accept criminal prosecution. Dai Quan Kin was extremely frustrated and defiantly said, then prosecute 
Vice President Fan Dang Long's assistant now spoke up telling him to think carefully, because once he accepted prosecution he would have to serve three years in prison. Moreover, his Dai family including parents and brothers, would also entirely lose political rights and privileges. He said his older brother was still in the presidential election period. If he refused to marry Ha Nian Nian then Dai Thoi Din would immediately lose his eligibility to run. Old Fan Dang Long now stood up telling him to slowly think it over. He and Ha Nian Nian would give him three days to make a decision. If after three days his answer was refusal, they would request a criminal trial in court. After requesting a criminal trial, Dai Thoi Din would immediately lose eligibility to run. Being removed from the presidential candidate list, Dai Quan Kin sat silently in the room. His mood was extremely chaotic. His younger siblings now popped their heads in asking how it was. Seeing Ha Nian Nian's marriage proposal letter on the table, Duong Chao was extremely angry unable to believe she could do this kind of thing. KY2 smirked praising that family was so capable. Ha Tru Da stole little Tin Kuang, while his sister stole Quan Kin. This was certainly with the intent of destroying others' marital bliss. KY2 then worriedly asked if Quan Kin planned to compromise with them. Before letting Dai Quan Kin answer, Duong Chao said of course that was it. She repeated Dai Quan Kin's words to her before, that the marriages of people like them were to consolidate the country including Dai Quan Kin's marriage, were all for Dai Thoi Din also said even if not for older brother Din then for the siblings who lived and died together. Their marriages couldn't cater to personal preferences. Duong Chao proudly repeated Dai Quan Kin's words, that once they became famous, it would be the leverage raising Dai Thoi Din to the presidency. Only then would they be a political family. Duong Chao was very proud because she remembered every word Dai Quan Kin said. Otherwise she would have refused to take in that cold-faced one. While KYKY2 now could only hold his head helpless at his unreasonable child. He knew the situation now was Dai Quan Kin unwilling. Yet the current circumstances still demanded he sacrifice for politics. Did he now have to tell Thoi Din to ask him to withdraw from the presidential race? The more KY2 thought the more headache he felt sighing. It seemed the Dai family and little Tin Kuang really had to part ways. Speaking of Tin Kuang and Ha Tru Da, at this time their boat had docked at an island. She happily introduced this place where she lived as a child to her older brother. Older brother Ha was surprised asking if she and her adoptive parents all lived here. Tin Kuang recounted she was only adopted by her parents at 12 years old, before that she lived here. They walked into the forest together, seeing such a pristine environment. He still couldn't believe asking if she lived here six years. Tin Kuang still innocently laughed saying the living conditions here were actually very good. There was even a very beautiful waterfall over there. Hearing this, older brother Ha blamed himself more for giving up searching for his sister that year, leaving her to live in this godforsaken place. Crossing the clear babbling creek, they arrived at a small wooden house. This was where Tin Kuang wanted to go. She happily called loudly inside. Granny, Granny come see who's back. The sound of the creaky wooden door rang out. An old woman in ethnic clothing stepped out. Seeing Tin Kuang she called out two words Ku Tu. Tin Kuang quickly rushed over hugging her, saying little Ku Tu missed Granny so much. Did Granny miss her? Ha Tru Da hearing this name was puzzled asking who Ku Tu was. Tin Kuang replied that was her name here. Muak A Ku Tu. Then Tin Kuang told her brother to wait outside because she and Granny had a lot to catch up on. Hearing the door slam shut right in front of him, Ha Tru Da immediately felt very awkward. Granny now put down her cane saying a child like Tin Kuang couldn't just randomly visit her. After that she told her to quickly say what happened that caused her to dangerously return. She now said her adoptive father contracted the blood drinking disease, asking Granny how she should treat him. Hearing this Granny wondered asking why her adoptive father got this illness. Could it be they found her already? Tin Kuang quickly waved her hand saying no, then smiled saying this story was a bit long just urging her to quickly tell her so she could return to treat her adoptive father. Granny said the solution was very simple. She just had to return and inherit the throne. Tin Kuang was so shocked she fell off her chair then angrily said how is this related to her inheriting the throne. Granny clearly knew if she inherited the throne they would force her to marry the successor of the blood drinking clan. Tin Kuang had no interest in the throne, even less interest in that successor. But Granny said the only way she could think of was inheriting the throne, marrying the blood clan's heir. Anyway the antidote was in their marriage ceremony items. Hearing this Tin Kuang cracked her knuckles asking who that heir was. She really wanted to punch him until he vomited out the antidote. But even Granny didn't know. She didn't know who it was. She only heard 10 years ago the old clan leader chose an heir. And he also told the boy. As long as he was willing to marry their clan's queen he 
he could inherit everything from him. In the end he refused. Hearing this Tin Kuang said wasn't that perfect already. The man was uninterested, the woman also unwilling. But this way she wouldn't get the antidote, so Granny still advised her to inherit the throne. Marry the heir then the ceremony items would be brought over. Tin Kuang was increasingly getting a headache because it went back to this matter endlessly. She told Granny to quickly select a queen to marry over there. Granny said that year Tin Kuang defeated all the other heirs. Aside from her no one else was qualified to become queen, so only her marrying over would be proper and righteous. Tin Kuang now realized she almost forgot about this matter. She was also very confused, wondering why she could defeat them all back then. That year after being abandoned by her parents in the sea, she was washed onto Bo Kok Island by chance. That was how she met Granny. Thanks to Granny she learned under the sea was a mysterious kingdom. A Dak Lan De Tu Ket Kwa Dai Te Tu. There a high priest saw she had a special bone structure, making her one of the heirs to the kingdom's throne. Tin Kuang thought this was good fortune, not expecting the king's hundred-year-old sons and daughters to hate her deeply. From age 6 to 12, she strove to be invisible, completely not participating in the fight for the throne, fleeing the competition fights. But when the fight for the throne was at its peak, she still couldn't avoid the massacre. Finally Tin Kuang couldn't endure it anymore and defeated all the rival heirs. Tin Kuang now sighed deeply full of regret, if she knew earlier she would have kept them to polygamously marry. Granny now comforted her, said this wasn't a fatal illness. Also told her to just let her father maintain drinking blood. Tin Kuang recalled Dai Quan Kin suffering side effects from drinking blood beads. She was immediately alarmed telling Granny they couldn't use blood beads. That wouldn't work. Tin Kuang finally returned. On the way she kept worrying asking herself if this trip was useless. Could it be her father and that big tumor could only rely on drinking blood to survive? At this time Ha True Da saw the large ship ahead saying isn't this summer's jewel? Why did it stop here? Seeing Tin Kuang didn't know, he explained. Summer's jewel. Every summer it goes out to sea for pleasure cruises. On that ship were all unique elites. He also said this year if not for a reason he would have participated too. Just now didn't know why they stopped here. Tin Kuang observed then pointed over there asking her brother if he saw the motorboat surrounding the large ship. After a moment older brother Ha immediately recognized Summer's jewel was surrounded by pirates. Hearing pirates hijacking a ship. Tin Kuang was very shocked, seeing Summer's jewel surrounded. Older brother Ha immediately held up his phone saying they must quickly call the police. While Tin Kuang didn't expect the robbers would dare enter her territory to commit crimes, then told her older brother to quickly steer over there so she could teach those guys a lesson. Seeing no signal, older brother Ha said they should run to find the naval patrol instead. How could the two of them defeat pirates? Seeing her brother steering the boat away. Tin Kuang impatiently asked what he was doing. She still had to go clean up those pirates. But her brother insisted on not turning back. Tin Kuang had no choice but to use force. She said she'd have to knock him out to go handle them herself. Saying so she grabbed a fire extinguisher hitting him over the head. At this time on Summer's Jewel a group of brazen pirates were assaulting the cruise passengers. They were all armed. Saying everyone better obey or face unpleasant consequences. They then shouted for anyone who hadn't handed over money to quickly give it all here demanding everyone sit down with their hands on their heads. Then a blonde guy holding a bag approached a married couple, ordering the madam to take off her pearl necklace and put it in the bag. Seeing her husband about to reclaim the pearl necklace he gifted her for her 50th birthday. The madam had to restrain her husband telling him to calm down. Seeing this, Blondie immediately held a gun to the man's forehead, telling him not to look at them like that. A squint-eyed guy now approached them, then asked his underlings if they knew who these two elders were. That guy said these were the birth parents of Dai Thoi Din and Dai Quan Kin. Today they were considered to have caught a big fish. After that they invited Mr. Dai and Madam to take a ride. The couple were escorted onto that small motorboat. The squint-eyed one ordered his disciples to carefully take care of these two for him. No funny business, watching them celebrate gleefully out there. A man approached a young master sucking candy asking if they needed to intervene. The little young master observed for a bit then turned leaving saying no need. Because someone else already took care of it. Sure enough, at this time one of the pirates' motorboats was hit by something causing them all to waver. Tin Kuang stood braced on the roof of her boat shouting loudly, Robbers, hand over all the valuables on your boat here, seeing they were still frozen. Tin Kuang repeated in an even more annoyed tone, Did you hear clearly? 
quickly take it all out, robbers. After making out it was just a girl. All the pirates laughed mockingly and contemptuously. They even considered this a heaven-sent gift. A good day capturing rich people. And an extra fresh little sister too. Still the belligerent blonde one. He directly climbed onto Tin Kuang's boat intending to get close to her. But Tin Kuang kicked him flying flattened into the wall. Seeing she had some skills, the whole group rushed up at once. The cruise passenger's eyes bulged wondering if that girl was also a pirate. How could a lone girl dare confront a whole gang like that? Some thought this was just black eating black. They were all pirates, in no time the group of men were beaten into the sea by her. Tin Kuang still stood proudly saying she already told them to quickly hand over the people and money if they wanted to be spared. She mockingly added they only had some cat scratching skills yet dared go rob on the seas. At this time a gunshot rang out. A bullet whizzed past Tin Kuang. The squint-eyed one sinisterly laughed. He said she better not move or she die. Hearing someone threaten her life, Tin Kuang smiled then began singing. In an instant the pirates were enraptured by her voice. Their bodies went limp, but it didn't stop there. Now they were startled awake seeing a group of at least 10 sharks swimming over surrounding them. Seeing sharks, they immediately panicked gripping their weapons raising their alertness. Seeing this, Tin Kuang smirked asking who was now struggling to survive. Blondie heard this and frantically asked if she called these sharks here? They still basically didn't believe this was just coincidence. Because how could sharks obey humans? Sitting at the boat's bow, Tin Kuang told them to just try it. Today if they didn't hand over the people and money, let's see if they could leave here alive. Tin Kuang tilted her head singing again. The school of sharks became increasingly ferocious, smashing into the pirates' motorboats flinging them into the water. Seeing the sharks open mouthed rushing at them, the formerly aggressive pirates now only knew to paddle and swim quickly to survive. Moreover, now three huge sharks were also heading for the pirates' leader's motorboat. Squint Eye knew he was no match for sharks and immediately raised his hand to surrender, telling Tin Kuang to speak. He even kowtowed to Tin Kuang, saying he was blind to Mount Tai, begging she have mercy and not order the sharks to bite them to death. Tin Kuang sang again. The sharks all became docile. When he still holding someone in their mouths immediately spat them out. Tin Kuang leaned down asking Squint Eye if he could hand over the people and money now. Of course Squint Eye immediately agreed. She promptly ordered them to place all the valuables in front of her small boat, then leave within one minute. After licking her lips threatening if they didn't obey she'd turn them into tasty treats for her pets. Thus all the cash, jewelry, and valuables were tossed in front of the elderly couple. The elderly couple didn't say anything but both felt this little girl able to control sharks, was truly powerful, just still didn't know if friend or foe. When Tin Kuang stepped onto the motorboat, Mr. Dai immediately stood to shield his wife. Tin Kuang smiled friendly, concernedly said to be careful of catching cold. He could still catch the cruise now. Then asked if they knew how to drive the small boat. Mr. Dai said he knew how to steer a boat, just still suspiciously asked if she would let them go, not needing these possessions? At this time Tin Kuang waved her hand saying please return the items to their owners, then said she didn't need them. Now the elderly couple finally finally breathed a sigh of relief, praising Tin Kuang as a beautiful girl, no way she could be a pirate, thanking her for saving their lives, then thinking she was busy, she climbed back onto her boat and left, Mr. Dai tried to stop her to ask her name so he could repay her later, but Tin Kuang said no need, also said if they wanted to remember who she was, then just remember her benefactor's name, her benefactor's name was Tan Quan Deep, Tin Kuang thus leapt away leaving Mr. Dai still reluctant, seeing this, his wife poked him saying knowing the girl's benefactor's name was enough. When they returned they could investigate a bit. They must go thank that girl's family. Mr. Dai hugged his wife, praising the young girl doing good without leaving her name. They certainly must properly thank her. Tin Kuang returned, seeing her flattened brother on the chair. She felt very apologetic, it was an emergency so she had no choice but to do that to him. After that she steered the boat back to the city for him. It wasn't until next morning that Ha Tru Da woke up frowning asking his sister. Tin Kuang asked how he was, telling him they were back in the city already. Ha Tru Da held his head asking after knocking him out. Did she go handle those pirates? Tin Kuang laughed saying she only got carried away. After knocking him out she calmed down. Even sailed faster than him. Seeing her brother's skeptical gaze, Tin Kuang acted weak saying how could she beat pirates with guns? Hearing this, Ha Tru Da could only silently retort. Weak his foot, saying his men could defeat her? Now back, Tru Da's phone finally had signal. He looked at his phone then asked Tin Kuang if she still refused to admit being his sister? 
Tin Kuang still denied it. He then showed her the online information, saying if she didn't admit being blood siblings then afraid what was written here was true. Seeing the information, Tin Kuang was extremely shocked. She immediately grabbed her phone. Seeing the big tumor calling, Tin Kuang knew she was done for. As soon as she picked up, Quan Kin asked if her previous punishment wasn't enough. Tin Kuang said she just saw his call, then hurriedly explained it wasn't what he thought online. But Quan Kin just angrily ordered her to write her punishment 100 times then talk, then immediately hung up. Tin Kuang's face was sullen as if near death. She thought he believed she cuckolded him. Seeing Quan Kin hang up, thinking he must be very angry, Tin Kuang called back. Indeed Quan Kin was furious. As soon as he heard Tin Kuang's call he immediately cursed Ha Tru Da, saying his sister had submitted a marriage application to the state, and the name she wrote on it was Quan Kin's. Quan Kin furiously said to pass on to her that he wanted her to know. She wants to marry him? Dream on. Hearing this news, Ha Tru Da was extremely stunned. He asked Quan Kin what the hell Ha Nian Nian was doing. Tin Kuang also didn't expect that wench actually abused her privilege with Quan Kin, but now it was too late to register marriage. Tin Kuang anxiously thought to herself she had the antidote. It would be fine. Quan Kin furiously retorted True Da's words. What was she doing was exactly his business to manage. Then before letting True Da retort, Quan Kin immediately hung up. Seeing Tin Kuang's worried expression, older brother Ha hurriedly comforted her saying he would stop Ha Nian Nian. Ha Nian Nian was sleeping when she received her brother's call. She angrily scolded her brother for disturbing her sleep. Hearing True Da ask why she put Quan Kin's name on the marriage application, Ha Nian Nian just sneered praising her brother for getting the news fast. Ha True Da asked if she knew what she was doing, saying Quan Kin didn't love her, telling her to withdraw it. But this shameless girl said if she couldn't have his heart then she must possess Quan Kin's body. She was very pleased believing Quan Kin wouldn't be able to resist or else Dai Thoi Din would lose his eligibility to run. Saying so, she hung up going to sleep, ignoring her yelling brother on this side. Ha Tru Da was out of options and could only turn to comfort Tin Kuang. Queen Queen don't worry, when I get back I'll resolve this. Tin Kuang said tonelessly, asking how he planned to handle it, planning to tell Ha Nian Nian she was Queen Queen. Tin Kuang looked at him angrily, asking if he thought doing that would make that wench stop stealing her man. Moreover, Tin Kuang also denied she was Queen Queen. Tin Kuang now turned angrily, warning him if he said she was Queen Queen to outsiders, their siblinghood ended here. Furthermore, Tin Kuang also wanted him to send a message to that shameless wench. Steal my man? Dream on. By late night they successfully returned to the hospital. Tin Kuang angrily walked ahead not waiting for her brother. This scene was seen by the nurses. They started gossiping saying what boyfriend girlfriend. Clearly Tin Kuang was Quan's wife yet now she was always with Ha Tru Da. He felt Tin Kuang was deceiving Quan Kin. As soon as Quan left she got ambiguous with Ha Tru Da. Her character was truly lowly. These words happened to be overheard in full by Thuang Dam Nian. When she saw Ha Tru Da sitting in the hallway, she angrily came over reminding him to watch his behavior or it would affect Miss Dai. Saying so, she tried to leave but Ha Tru Da held her back asking what she meant. Dam Nian frowned saying he knew what she meant, telling him not to harm Tin Kuang. That girl wasn't bad, don't let her be ruined by him. Seeing True Da's sullen face, Thuang Dam Nian became flustered asking what he planned to do. True Da said he wouldn't do anything, just wanted to ask what she was doing. Concerning herself with his matters like that, could it be she still couldn't forget him? Dam Nian immediately struggled denying it, saying if she couldn't forget him then why did she break up with him that year? Ha True Da frowned tilting her chin up, saying she could also after breaking up with him, discover her current husband wasn't as good as him and regret it. Dam Nian still explained she was just concerned for a patient's family member. Right now their photos were all over the internet. Even the nurses at the hospital were gossiping actively. Dam Nian advised him if he truly liked Miss Tin Kuang then he should keep his distance to avoid causing her trouble. Also said he didn't know how that affected girls. Saying so, she tried to leave but was blocked by Ha Sa's arm. He said it wasn't like Dam Nian thought. Dam Nian embarrassedly reminded him to be more careful since this was a hospital. Ha Tru Da now realized she misunderstood and explained Tin Kuang was the long-lost sister he told her about. Dam Nian humped asking what about him saying he was also her adoptive father's son. True Da felt this wasn't an issue at all. He saved her sister so of course he would also treat him as father. In the future he must treat him even better. But this time Tin Kuang walked out of the ward. Seeing Dr. Thuang, she smiled greeting. Oh Dr. Thuang is here too? This made the two very awkward. 
Tin Kuang then laughingly said if they had something to discuss then please continue. She could look for the doctor after. The door closed. Ha Tru Da and Thuang Dam Nian looked at each other, wondering if this couple could still be saved. A few days later, Bak Kin Nu returned from his research trip, and also went to discharge his transfusion patient to transfer him to the capital hospital. Seeing Bak Kin Nu with Thuang Dam Nian, Ha Tru Da felt very conflicted. Dam Nian felt the same. She wondered to herself, once he left, it would certainly be very difficult to meet again. At this time Tin Kuang also came to thank Dr. Bak for seeing her father off. Also said when he successfully researched the artificial kidney to let her know. Bak Kin Nu said Tin Kuang could rest assured because he would always monitor her father's condition. Seeing Ha Ca still frowning there, Tin Kuang urged him to hurry and go. But Ha Ca suddenly turned back, stepping towards Bak Kin Nu grabbing his collar warningly. Treat her well or I won't let you off. A true Da said so and angrily left. When the car drove a distance, Bak Kin Nu asked Dam Nian if she hadn't told True Da they were fake spouses. Turns out years ago they lived together to avoid having to draw lots for marriage. Hearing this, Dam Nian only asked if Bak Kin Nu thought her feelings five years ago didn't work out. Could it work out now? Hearing this Bak Kin Nu challenged her, telling her to quickly take her heart back from that car so they could test if their fake relationship could become real. Hearing this, Dam Nian could only scold herself for being foolish. After five years she still couldn't take back those feelings. At this time, Tin Kuang was caring for her father at the villa in the capital. After father slept, she quietly stepped out sighing deeply. She was still bothered about Ha Nian Nian's marriage application. After that she returned to her room, not expecting Dai Quan Kin to already be waiting for her there. His handsome looks made Tin Kuang unconsciously become enthralled gazing at him. Quan Kin on the other hand seeing her became like an angry father. Interrogating Tin Kuang if she had written her punishment 100 times yet, Tin Kuang yelled not expecting he still had the mind to think of this. Dai Quan Kin pinched Tin Kuang's cheek strongly, saying if she still hadn't finished writing her punishment then to continue after eating. After that he changed the topic, teasingly asking how she planned to explain the photo of her with Ha Tru Da. At this time, Ha Tru Da suddenly walked in saying he had prepared a press conference already. He said he wanted to announce Tin Kuang as his sister. By then this would be clarified. Dai Quan Kin hugged Tin Kuang, smiling coolly asking if True Da wanted to announce it. Had he thought about if Tin Kuang agreed to be associated with that rotten group of relatives again? Ha True Da was extremely awkward because Queen Queen was his sister. If he didn't say so this matter would be endless. Quan Kin bluntly told True Da that his woman only had Tong Truyan Koi and Bok Lan Go as parents, and warned True Da not to arbitrarily decide. True Da still refused to back down arguing stuff stubbornly that she was his sister. Dai Quan Kin scolded Tru Da for being completely unfit as a brother, saying if Tru Da didn't run to City T then they wouldn't have this mess. Tin Kuang standing on the side felt puzzled. Her brother should stop, but the big tumor acted as if he knew she was Ha Queen Queen. Tin Kuang still didn't dare believe the big tumor knew her identity and hypnotized herself it was just an illusion. She raised her hand saying she had to clarify she wasn't Ha Queen Queen. Immediately scolded to shut up by both men. But Tin Kuang thought in this case she was the one with the right to speak. After that she stubbornly denied her identity with brother Ha. Saying even if he held a press conference she wouldn't acknowledge it. Then she smiled saying to Quan Kin that they didn't need to explain the photo. The innocent will naturally be innocent. At this time Dai Quan Kin seriously reminded Tru Da to behave because he kept clinging to his woman. So he should go home and find his son. Is his sister more important or his wife and child more important? He should think for himself. Seeing Tru Da bewildered asking what son. Quan Kin sneered saying he came to City T yet still didn't know anything? Not even knowing Thuang Dam Nian gave birth to his child. His son now called someone else father. Quan Kin told Ha True Da. If he were him he would immediately run to City T to bring home his wife and child. True Da agitatedly shouted for Quan Kin to explain clearly. Quan Kin sat down saying if he still didn't see clearly then he should go to City T. Find a boy named Little Man then do a DNA test. Ha True Da looked at his phone, intending to call Dam Nian but hesitated. Tin Kuang eavesdropping on the side was shocked not expecting her brother already had a child, also wondering how the big tumor knew. After Ha True Da ran off, Tin Kuang cuddled into Quan Kin's arms, telling him to explain how he knew that. Quan Kin could only say it was by chance. How would he know now? 
should he say when Tin Kuang went to university back then, he had disguised himself as a taxi driver? He stroked Tin Kuang's hair. What she cared about now wasn't whether he wore a green hat. She had to comfort this hurt heart somehow. Tin Kuang lazily explained just patting his shoulder saying if he believed she didn't cuckold him then the innocent will naturally be innocent. She didn't have to bother explaining. After she whined wanting him to tell the story of Thuang Dam Nian giving birth, asking if the child was cute, if he had any photos of him? Quan Kin then pinched her cheek saying this story of him wearing a green hat wasn't important right? Tin Kuang still insisted he speak. In her heart she had accepted that child as her nephew already. Quan Kin had no choice but to say five years ago he went to City T to send that hateful thing to school. Then that wench wanted to go to the hospital. In front of the hospital he happened to see Thuang Dam Nian holding a newborn baby so he guessed it was Ha Tru Da's son. Hearing this, Tin Kuang sulked interrogating him who that hateful thing was. His first love? Seeing her attitude, Quan Kin asked if she was jealous? Tin Kuang said everyone had a past. She didn't care to eat his stale vinegar, but angrily kicked his butt, then ran off saying she refused to talk to him anymore. She had to go find her father. Quan Kin watched her leave. The corners of his lips curled up, his gaze showing tender love. Then he also followed her to visit father. He told father if not for the good facilities here he wouldn't have wanted them to travel this far. At this time, Mother Bok Lan Go explained to her son-in-law that Tin Kuang and True Da weren't what he thought. Quan Kin just laughed saying he didn't misunderstand. He and True Da were close friends. True Da said Tin Kuang was his sister so he also asked True Da to take care of Tin Kuang. Bok Lan Go sighed deeply, saying if Quan Kin was a close friend then help her advise True Da not to misunderstand Tin Kuang as his sister. Quan Kin said mother could rest assured, saying he would promptly advise him. But hearing her say this, he also believed they didn't want the little mermaid to regain her birth parents either. Bok Lan Go asked if he thought of a way to handle the online information yet? Quan Kin said mother needn't worry, saying he had a way to resolve this. He already blocked the news and instructed the guards to prevent reporters from disturbing them. Quan Kin gave her a new phone, telling her to temporarily turn off her phone for now. Use this one to have some peace. Tin Kuang took the phone. She said she had turned it off long ago or it would have been bombarded with notifications and bothered her to death. After that seeing Quan Kin still at the villa, Tin Kuang curiously asked why he didn't go back. Quan Kin replied he also had a storm to avoid. Relaxing at the villa was quite nice. He thought to himself at home he'd definitely be pestered to death, each advising him to prioritize the big picture. Quan Kin then told Tin Kuang to shower first then he would shower, since Kiyu Van still hadn't brought his personal items over. He was busy. At this time Tin Kuang wondered since this villa was out of bedrooms, where would he sleep? Quan Kin closed his book smiling asking her couldn't their current relationship share a room? Tin Kuang now remembered that Tik already announced her online, but his matter-of-fact tone made her embarrassed. Quan Kin pulled Tin Kuang's hand over, sitting her in his lap, asking her if she didn't agree? He already went public, did she think he would be abstinent? Tin Kuang immediately pushed him away, telling him not to mess around, her parents were still here, then urged him to go home and rest. Dai Quan Kin kissed her hand acting aggrieved saying he didn't want to be alone in the cold empty room. Tin Kuang's skin crawled backing away saying nowhere was it cold. It was at least 38 degrees now. Quan Kin could only sigh, even hoping his old illness would recur so the little mermaid would care for him. He lazily sprawled on the chair lamenting being a man was suffering. When needing to be sick there was no sickness. When not needing it he kept being tormented. Tin Kuang scolded him for speaking nonsense. Quan Kin still rambled on, saying then his girlfriend would make him drink medicine. After drinking it would ignite the flames of love. Tin Kuang said no more, go shower. Oh, so impatient? Don't worry. He wasn't in a rush. Tin Kuang really couldn't imagine it. Agitatedly leaving, as she left, Kiyu Van brought Quan Kin's things over. Also reporting the young masters at home were all pursuing him asking where he was now. Quan Kin waved his hand telling Kiyu Van not to tell them. Too noisy, he didn't want to hear nonsense. But Kiyu Van also had to remind him that the vice president's time limit for him wasn't much longer. Saying if he didn't agree to marry Ha Nian Nian, very soon he would receive a court summons. By then Dai Thoi Din would lose his presidential candidate position. Quan Kin took his things then said he should just do his job as his guard well. The rest he needn't bother with. As Kiyu Van withdrew, 
Quan Kin also hugged his things going into the bathroom. Unexpectedly he saw Tin Kuang with just a thin towel wrapped around, about to leave. The two looked at each other, red cheeks. Tin Kuang immediately slammed the door shut hiding inside, leaving Quan Kin grinning foolishly outside. Turns out there would be times she was so shy. After a while Quan Kin finally got the chance to enter the bathroom. By the time he came out, Tin Kuang was lying in bed with her back facing him, continuously making very exaggerated snoring sounds. She also wondered if he wouldn't find out she was pretending to sleep right? He now sat on the bed smiling telling her to snore a little softer, or else the executives in his company would know he was lying next to a little fairy who liked to snore loudly. Tin Kuang startled immediately went silent, and turned asking why he was having a meeting now? Dai Quan Kin with earphones replied now it was morning abroad, very suitable for meetings, then seeing her sulking attitude, he leaned in close smiling asking if it was because he didn't hug her that she was angry? Tin Kuang extremely embarrassed pulled the blanket over her head, saying speak softer, she was going to sleep now. She originally wanted to ask him about Ha Queen Queen, but he was also very busy. It was midnight yet he was still working. After finishing he turned off the lights then hugged her. Tin Kuang still not asleep asked if his family was all advising him to marry Han Nian Nian? Quan Kin didn't reply, equivalent to admitting it. He only asked if she was worried. Tin Kuang didn't answer, but in her heart she had a response. What she worried about wasn't Ha Nian Nian abusing her privilege but his choice. She thought if he abandoned her to choose Ha Nian Nian due to his forced circumstances. Like T Don then, the man took the initiative to abandon her. Then don't expect her to look at him again. The man of Miss Tin Kuang, must be wholeheartedly devoted only to her. Quan Kin now reached out hugging her shoulder, smiling telling her not to worry. As long as she was willing to be with him, no one could snatch him away from her. He teased Tin Kuang saying if she wanted then she should take the initiative, say she wanted it. Tin Kuang too embarrassed turned angry immediately kicking him off the bed, then hugging the pillow aggrieved saying if he couldn't resolve it himself then agree to marry her. Anyway in the end she still had a way to bring him back. Quan Kin jokingly asked if she wanted to relinquish him to Nian Nian, held tightly by him. Tin Kuang still struggled to say she was just hypothesizing if he couldn't resolve it himself. Quan Kin looked into her eyes affirming, other than properly caring for her parents, she needn't worry about anything else. He said this was just Ha Nian Nian, if he still couldn't handle this matter then what more did she need a man like him for? Saying so he angrily laid down going to sleep, hugging her, all the troubles outside would fade away. The next morning as Tin Kuang woke up, she saw before her a huge bouquet of roses, on top was a message for her to trust him. Hugging the bouquet in her hands, Tin Kuang smiled feeling today would be another energetic day. She then changed clothes and went online to search for information and work, but unexpectedly discovered Dai Thoi Din's name was no longer on the presidential candidate list. Moreover there was information that authorities were investigating Dai Thoi Din as the mastermind behind the gas station bombing, so he was being sued. A presidential candidate involved in lawsuits would be stripped of the qualifications to be president. Tin Kuang silently pondered wondering if this matter was related to Han Nian Nian forcing marriage with Dai Quan Kin. She wondered if her TV station would have any other insider information. Indeed, after calling teacher Thuong, that editor-in-chief told her the vice president gave Dai Quan Kin three days. One was to marry Ha Nian Nian or accept prosecution. The result was three days later Quan Kin persisted in not marrying. Now the court summons was also issued. Even Dai Thoi Din's presidential candidate status was stripped. It was said the two brothers became enemies. Seeing Tin Kuang so shocked, the editor-in-chief asked about her and Ha Chu Da's matters, saying wasn't she going to care for her father? How did she get caught up in this? Unable to explain it. Tin Kuang wearily explained generally there was nothing between them, then hung up. She intended to call Quan Kin but stopped herself. She thought he had a way to resolve it. Didn't expect it deteriorated to the brothers fighting each other like that. It seemed she also had to pay the manor a visit to check. But before leaving Quan Kin instructed the guards not to let Tin Kuang go out. Also said if she needed anything to just tell them to buy it. They would go for her. She continuously asked them to stand aside so she could go home. But the guards were also helpless. Only able to plead for her understanding. Because if they didn't listen to Dai Quan Kin then they'd be fired. The two of them thought for a while also not knowing what to do. 
because after all Tin Kuang was also the boss's love. If they stopped her they'd have to use force. That wouldn't be right either, in the end they still let her go. Even volunteered to drive her there. Tin Kuang had just rushed into the Dai Manor when she heard Dai Thoi Din scolding Quan Kin saying he didn't have a brother like him. Then saw Dai Thoi Din angrily storm out. Behind Duong Chao now rushed out towards Tin Kuang asking why she was here. Tin Kuang said she heard something happened at home so wanted to come check it out, also asking if Quan Kin was here. Duong Chao replied he was probably in his study, earlier Quan Kin and Thoi Din had a huge fight. After that Duong Chao angrily scolded Tin Kuang for going overboard, while Quan Kin did so much for her, yet she secretly met with Ha Chu Da behind his back. Tin Kuang also didn't have time to explain, just said she was innocent, then immediately went upstairs to find Quan Kin. She peeked into the room and saw him tensely calling someone on the phone. Tin Kuang couldn't help running over to hug him from behind. Quan Kin helplessly could only smile and sigh asking why she ran over here. Hadn't he told her to stay calmly at the villa? Tin Kuang said she saw the news that his brother lost his presidential candidate status. Worried so came to check. Tin Kuang interrogated him saying he had a way to resolve it. Why did it become like this? Also said if he refused it would be three years in prison. Hearing Dai Quan Kin ask if she was afraid he'd go to jail. Tin Kuang replied she wasn't afraid, because deep down she had a way to resolve this mess for him, but it was a bit difficult because the antidote wouldn't be ready until next month. Right now she was a bit anxious. At this time Quan Kin gently asked her not afraid meant trusting him, or not caring if he went to jail or not. Tin Kuang flung his hand away, saying she trusted herself. For some reason, seeing her blindly confident and calm expression, Auntie, I'm telling you, it would be better for her sister-in-law to advise Tin Kuang to let Quan Kin go. Why Go Keen was furious but still calmly asked her once again. You definitely won't withdraw the marriage application right? Ha Nian Nian said this was her doing. They could mutually benefit. She was married over, then they would be sisters-in-law, relying on her influence. The public would support brother-in-law even more. While what could Dai Tin Kuang bring to the Ha family? Auntie grasped her sister-in-law's hand asking didn't she want Auntie's happiness? Why must she make Make it difficult for auntie to believe in that outsider child Dai Tin Kuang. Go Keen extremely angry flung her hand away saying she herself wanted happiness yet stubbornly insisted on marrying someone who didn't love her. What kind of happiness was that? Also clearly knowing brother-in-law was in the presidential election period yet still did this. Sister-in-law sneered asking who was making it difficult for who. In her heart she knew clearly. Ha Nian Nian was still stubbornly confused. Hugging her sister-in-law telling her to quickly advise Dai Quan Kin to let Tin Kuang go. That way both sides benefit. She said now he still hadn't agreed to marry her. Meaning his side still hadn't pressured him enough. Why Go Keen still bluntly scolded her for not having the ability for a man to marry her yet blamed them for not pressuring enough. That couple was currently sweet and happy, but she intentionally interfered. How is this behavior different from a mistress destroying others' family happiness? At this time Ha Nian Nian's mother stood up defending her daughter saying Go Kin's words went too far. Because previously Ha Nian Nian and Dai Quan Kin's families had set an auspicious date for them already. She said everyone clearly knew in their hearts who stole whose man. Also affirmed that little mistress was precisely Tin Kuang. Why Go Kin still resolutely stood by the benefactor who once saved her husband, saying the engagement discussions were unilaterally brought up by her side. Quan Kin never agreed, even more never mentioned picking an auspicious date. While Tin Kuang properly met her younger brother, as a state-recognized marriage partner, she said she advised till she ran out yet those mother and daughter still didn't listen, angrily pulling her mother's hand to stand up, saying if relatives behaved to this extent it was better to not have any. She said from now on she would consider herself to not have any cousins named Ha Nian Nian. Ha Nian Nian's mother still shamelessly urged them to calm down, and invited them to stay for a meal. Go Keen only turned her head saying today she left these words here. If Nian Nian persisted like this, she would only offend all of the Dai family, making their family's hearts turn cold. At this time provoked to madness, Ha Nian Nian grit her teeth saying the sister talked till the end yet it was all empty threats. Not one bit got through right? She actually picked up a teacup on the table, and hurled it at Go Keen's forehead, her mouth cursing. What can't you obtain? I'll show you who's the one who can't obtain anything. If Dai Quan Kin doesn't love me then what? I'll see how long he can persist. Why Go Kin's swollen forehead? She only turned her head coldly saying she didn't have a cousin like this. The mother and daughter now supported each other to the car. Why Go Kin hurt so much she stumbled, forcing her mother to support her daughter, reminding her not to get angry lest it harmed her health. Coincidentally, 
Go Keen now raising her head happened to see the Ha Chu Da father and son standing there watching her. She also took the chance to announce to her cousin that starting now, all collaborations between YT Group and Ha T were completely stopped. No need for any more cooperation in the future. At this time Ha Chu Da could only sadly say he saw the news about Thoi Din's matter already. He would go advise Ha Nian Nian himself. Go Keen got in the car telling Chu Da it's best if he could persuade her. Otherwise the Y and Ha families would resent her to the bone. Ha Chu Da just took his son's hand. Hadn't even reached the front gate yet when behind him sounded a loud crash to the ground. His family's guard now reported Go Keen got into a car accident. In another development, at this time Han Tan Bak came to Luke Chien Win asking if this time it really wasn't him who leaked cousin Tiu Tin Kuang's photos. Luke Chien Win's assistant immediately explained on his behalf that his boss didn't have time for things like this. Tan Bak now waved his phone saying today Chu Da released surveillance video evidence on Weibo, proving Tin Kuang had nothing to do with Ha Chu Da. On the contrary there were many supporters of them. Also said to Luke Chien Win no matter who uploaded this video they should be disappointed now. That assistant now asked Tan Bak if he really wanted to see Go Keen return empty-handed. Tan Bak now recounted Go Keen going to the Ha family to beg Ha Nian Nian to let go. But unfortunately Ha Nian Nian's attitude was too resolute, angering her to the point of unsteadily driving, even crashing straight into your family's front gate. In the end you had to personally send her back to the Y family. Could this be fake? Luke Chien Win's assistant now also searched the news saying after Go Keen returned to YT Group, she terminated all collaborative projects with Ha T. It seemed she had no other choice but to force the Ha family to back down. An Tan Bak also said he didn't expect Quan Kin to persist this much for cousin Tiu Tin Kuang. Go Keen could also only use this method to soften the Ha family. Luke Chien Win thought this matter wasn't simple at all. After all Dai Quan Kin wasn't an impulsive man who for a girl would overlook his brother's presidential campaign. According to their investigation, after Dai Thoi Din was eliminated from the presidential candidate list, the negative impact Luke Chien Win received in the gas station bombing incident was completely washed away. Public support had risen significantly and now Luke Chien Win's only opponent left was Fan Dang Long. But Luke Chien Win knew as long as Quan Kin let go. Dai Thoi Din would reappear on the presidential candidate list. With the final voting one week away this couldn't be underestimated. This bunch still wanted to provoke Ha Nian Nian to cling on tighter. Because with her personality even if the fish died the net broke she had to achieve her goal. Han Tan Bak supported this. He said as long as Dai Quan Kin and Tiu Tin Kuang broke up, he would immediately marry her. Han Nian Nian now was smashing things, crying while talking on the phone with someone named Tian Ho I Van, saying everyone else only thought of their own interests without caring for her happiness. That Ho I Van always supported Nian Nian in the capacity of a best friend. In the end said after talking and talking they made plans to go shopping and meet tomorrow. Now the conversation's content changed to badmouthing Tin Kuang. Long. Ha Nian Nian scolded Tin Kuang as despicable with a vicious heart, while Ho I Van also added fuel to the fire saying she knew early on Tin Kuang was no good. After the call ended, that Ho I Van confidently turned back telling Vice President Fan Dang Long that Ha Nian Nian definitely wouldn't give up, she would get Quan Kin even if she died trying. Dang Long now repeatedly comforted that during the time before the presidential election, she must make an effort to appease Ha Nian Nian well, as a daughter she should bravely pursue her own happiness. Their goal was to try provoking Ha Nian Nian to bite down harder on Dai Quan Kin. Fan Dang Long also thought this was an unexpected good thing that could happen right at the final moment of the presidential race. Ho I Van now asked her father how confident he was in percentage for this election. Because aside from Dai Thoi Din, Luke Chien Win was also very strong. Fan Dang Long only replied one line, plans are human, outcomes are heaven's will. Ho I Van now also felt she had to thank heaven, thank the nation for sending a carp maid and causing Quan Kin to be unable to let go. Tin Kuang and Quan Kin now ignored the ups and downs of life and peacefully stayed together. Tin Kuang now said she heard today the sister-in-law went to find Han Nian Nian. When leaving she met with accident, she asked if she should visit her sister. Quan Kin only asked her if they met now what would the two say. Tin Kuang didn't know what to do but also couldn't do nothing. He then hugged her saying she should stay at ease caring for her father. The rest she needn't worry about. Also no need to go anywhere. At this time Tin Kuang's phone suddenly had a message. She ran over 
over and saw her sister-in-law send her a message, saying tomorrow Quan Kin's parents would return to the capital, telling them to go to the airport to pick them up. Quan Kin felt tense again because previously Tiu Tin Kuang wasn't favored by his parents and he arranged for them to travel around the world also because of this reason. He told Tin Kuang to quickly tell his sister-in-law that she couldn't leave her father. Tin Kuang texted her sister-in-law but she replied back saying Quan Kin's mother called her, clearly wanting her to go to the airport. He then said it was fine, she didn't need to go, also asking her if she saw her father as more important or mother-in-law more important. After that he came tell her that his parents were very difficult, very picky in choosing a daughter-in-law, reminding her to prepare mentally beforehand. Tin Kuang thought about it and felt although she was often well liked by others, no matter how likable, it wasn't certain she could win his parents over at this time. Because right now the Dai family was like a bomb about to explode. So Tin Kuang clacked away another text to her sister-in-law saying she couldn't go. Who knew the sister-in-law replied saying if she didn't go to the airport to pick them up, his parents would go to the hospital to visit her parents. Faced with these two choices Tin Kuang had no choice but to choose the airport, because she firmly believed her own parents also weren't mentally prepared yet to meet his parents. At this time Quan Kin's parents also called, as soon as he picked up they scolded their son, saying he and his mother wanted to meet his girlfriend yet it was so difficult, acting as if they were hungry tigers and not human, could even eat their daughter-in-law probably. Quan Kin said now he was already 27 years old himself, wanted to find someone to start a family with, afraid Tiu Tin Kuang's little liver would be frightened by his parents into running away. His mother told her son she wouldn't make things difficult for the girl, but Quan Kin still insisted if his mother wanted to meet her she could look at photos or find her photos online. Hearing her son say this, the old couple immediately got angry, scolded him a string of curses then hung up. Quan Kin and Tin Kuang now looked at each other saying in unison tomorrow they should still go. Tisk a bad daughter-in-law would have to meet the in-laws eventually. My wife isn't bad, my wife is very pretty. In the car Tin Kuang's whole body was stiff but in her heart she recalled her mother's words that his mother wouldn't be so fearsome. Quan Kin continuously taught her to remember to greet them, smile more, be a little polite with words and that's good. Tin Kuang now only sighed, still not understanding why her mother knew his mother didn't have the habit of making things difficult for others. Glancing at Quan Kin, she caught him frowning tightly. She felt as if things were about to blow up. Then her huge tumor also felt pressured like a huge mountain. She was extremely nervous. The two of them arrived at the airport and started looking around. Tin Kuang was so nervous she said her close friend wanted to vomit. While Quan Kin immediately ran off saying he needed the restroom. He absolutely had to go? Just normal needs. But his normal needs. In 10 something minutes he went several times. Tin Kuang worried if he would have any issues. She fearfully thought could it be her happiness was ending here. At this time a hand was placed on Tin Kuang's shoulder. With an elderly voice speaking up. Oh young lady we meet again. It was Dai Quan Kin's parents. Previously saved by her now still very much wanted to see her again. Seeing her here they felt it was a fateful coincidence. Tin Kuang was also extremely happy to see them again. After that the three chatted very cheerfully asking about each other's residence and meals. When hearing Tin Kuang say she worked in the capital, the madam was very happy making plans for her to visit if she was free. She would personally cook delicious food for her, even wanted to take Tin Kuang's hand and drag her home right now. Tin Kuang had to make plans for another day because she was busy today. She told them she was waiting waiting for future mother-in-law so was a little nervous now. She'd visit the madam's home another day. Hearing this, the madam asked which parents had such blessings, then encouraged Tin Kuang not to worry because if they had a good daughter-in-law like her they'd be happy beyond words. Tin Kuang now shyly said it seemed the in-laws didn't like her much. Because her boyfriend was so nervous he hid in the restroom and still hadn't come out. Then asked the madam to teach her some common polite phrases to charm elders. The madam seemed confused, said a good girl like Tin Kuang, who wouldn't like her. Tin Kuang explained perhaps due to some objective reasons, the in-laws could ask her and her boyfriend to break up. Tin Kuang now sadly said in case such a situation occurred, she didn't know how to handle it. The madam now put on a grave expression telling Tin Kuang to listen to her. A marriage the elders don't value must be careful. If truly unsuccessful then separate. Dai Quan Kin now walked over. Hearing this hastily asked his mother what she was saying. He stood blocking Tin Kuang, saying if his mother scared her away then don't expect to have grandchildren children. Dai Tian Sin's elderly couple now tensely didn't know what to say, also asking where was his girlfriend, why was she standing here alone, hiding behind Quan Kin's back. 
Tin Kuang now peeked out introducing herself as his girlfriend. She awkwardly smiled saying what a coincidence, but in her heart she shamefully wanted to smash her head into a block of tofu and just die, because she had babbled a bit much earlier. Why Go Keen now was also very worried. The sister stood outside the car, afraid what if the in-laws didn't like Tin Kuang, what to do then? So she decided to run in. If anything happened she could still help her sister-in-law and younger brother. But seeing Tin Kuang very intimate with the in-laws, Go Keen was very concerned asking the in-laws if their travels were fun. The parents said it seemed earlier they ran into reporters so decided to get in the car first then talk. After hearing about the in-laws pirate encounter, why Go Keen was extremely surprised. The madam now grasped Tin Kuang's hand, saying luckily there was the daughter-in-law to assist. Otherwise the consequence would be uncertain. Go Keen breathed a sigh of relief feeling truly fortunate, but upon knowing her sister-in-law could even control sharks she felt it was extremely miraculous. Tuyin Kuang randomly lied that as a child she had saved a baby shark. It was probably the shark king so later all sharks listened to her. Tin Kuang said these were all just coincidences but why Go Keen had believed Tin Kuang was a heaven-sent luck star. The lucky daughter-in-law of the Dai family, previously saved Thoi Din now saved his parents. After that the sister told her mother this time Quan Kin hit the jackpot with Tin Kuang. Way better than if it was Ha Nian Nian by 10,000 times. Hearing this, the madam was also very irritated wondering what was wrong with this Ha Nian Nian. The engagement failed but there was still courtesy. How could she take advantage of privileges in this time to harm their family like this? Go Keen also helplessly said she already tried every possible way to make her concede, but she persisted and wouldn't let go. Elder Tian Sin now frowned asserting his Dai family's turn hadn't come for a wench to intimidate them. Then he turned to pat Tin Kuang's head saying she should be at ease. For a daughter-in-law like her they would definitely keep her. By nightfall, all their siblings returned to the Dai family villa. Even Dai Thoi Din returned. At the dinner table because he was pressed too much, Quan Kin also had to angrily yell for them to be quiet and not mention this anymore. Because he absolutely could not marry Ha Nian Nian. He said if this presidential election failed then wait another four years. But marriage was a lifetime matter. He could not agree. The young masters of the Dai family now jokingly said wasn't it you who advised Duong Chao to marry for the clan before? So how come now it's your turn yet you can't do it? Duong Chao sitting quietly also got hit, silently murmuring for them not to drag her in. Thoi Din now spoke up saying he also hoped for his younger brother's happiness. But there was one matter Quan Kin could understand more than anyone. His sharp gaze asked Quan Kin. Or did you get tired of being director and want to be a prisoner? Quan Kin still resolutely said it was his own matter, if he didn't want to then no one could force him. Even if he had to be jailed for three, six, or nine years it wouldn't be an issue. Thoi Din asked if his brother felt there was no issue then what about the Dai clan? What about the whole corporation? What about the team who worked so hard for this president position? Amidst the tense situation, the old master finally stepped in yelling at the two brothers to each say less. Arguing at home to this extent, waiting for outsiders to see and laugh in their faces huh? Thoi Din now explained he also wanted to go along with Quan Kin, but the matter didn't just involve the presidential election. Importantly Quan Kin would have to face jail time. The old master said they could slowly resolve the jail time issue. Could it be the Dai family would really be held in a little Ha family wench's hand? The madam also told Thoi Din that without Tin Kuang's rescue in the gas station incident, he would have burned to death already, saying his actions were ungrateful. Thoi Din said Tin Kuang did have grace towards him, but in the current circumstances, Quan Kin's choice would only lead to having to go to jail, while their four years of campaign efforts would be wasted. Also asked if his parents hadn't considered what Tin Kuang would do then, he asserted so right now only Quan Kin marrying Ha Nian Nian could resolve this. The old master scolded his son, saying so he didn't want to have this reunion dinner anymore ha, huh? how could he say in this matter he and Quan Kin had the same decision, couldn't let that little Ha family wench take advantage. Oi Din then turned and left, before leaving still apologizing for affecting the meal, but father and Quan Kin had been too emotional, or did everyone think I was cold-blooded, but had anyone understood how much sweat and effort my team and I put into this campaign, now only to fruitlessly waste it all away? The whole room became silent. The two adopted sons, the ones who initially brought up the matter criticizing Dai Quan Kin, also stood up apologizing to their parents for affecting the meal. They said they knew this matter really put Quan Kin in a difficult spot. But weren't marriages of prominent families all to consolidate power? Also said if they chose this path, everyone had to be mentally prepared to disregard everything for the common goal. The old master now angrily scolded them, 
You two brats have grown wings already. Don't want dinner then scram. The brothers really did scram. The madam now had to turn to comfort her daughter-in-law, telling Tin Kuang not to mind them. Hurry and eat. Tin Kuang felt extremely conflicted. She didn't want the two of them to become like this. Although the repentance drug could return to the past and create a turning point, its effects on the people around were not insignificant. So if this time Dai Thoi Din failed the presidential election, then he could really miss this opportunity. Tin Kuang lowered her head sadly. She knew the repentance drug wasn't omnipotent either. Back in the room, she asked Quan Kin how to resolve this matter. If his brother's presidential election could be ensured not to fail, she feared time was running out. If by chance it failed, would Dai Thoi Din resent her? Quan Kin came to embrace Tin Kuang, saying he didn't care about others' feelings, so she needn't pay them any mind. Tin Kuang said but after all he's still the older brother. Quan Kin drank some water to calm down. He feared that even Dai Thoi Din had now forgotten that he was the older brother. Tin Kuang sighed troubled. She opened her phone now and saw information on a live broadcast interview with Dai Thoi Din. Faced with accusations of being behind the gas station explosion, playing dirty against Luke Qian Win to seize the president position, Dai Thoi Din still didn't speak up to defend himself one bit. Seeing this, Tin Kuang immediately jumped up asking why the big brother didn't defend himself. Clearly he was stripped of the right to run for president not because of the exploded gas station, but because Han Nian Nian wanted to force Quan Kin to marry her and he didn't agree. Quan Kin said again to Tin Kuang that he had made her leave him, yet she still cared if he was scolded or not. Tin Kuang still felt each matter had its reason. She even wanted to help the big brother explain because she had quite a lot of Weibo fans. Quan Kin immediately snatched her phone, scolding her for what she was doing. Could it be she wanted netizens to bite and scold him for not caring about sibling bonds? He said even his sibling who grew up with him didn't think for him let alone the netizens. Quan Kin knocked on Tin Kuang's head for her to understand, saying now the big brother was pressuring him with the family. Who knew when it was exposed if he would use public pressure to force him to do it? Tin Kuang felt Quan Kin made sense. She firmly believed Dai Thoi Din's opponents in this presidential race were also gleefully rubbing their hands seeing him scolded. She wondered why Dai T's media outlets also didn't stand up to defend, so it was because of the huge tumor huh? She could only look up at the sky and sigh. Considering this really was a fraternal fight, Quan Kin now still had the spirit to tease Tin Kuang telling her not to sigh anymore. It hadn't reached the point for her to worry yet. He said he forgot to tell her that tomorrow his mother invited her shopping, reminding her to obediently sleep early a bit to prepare. Hearing about the mother-in-law inviting her shopping, Tin Kuang was extremely surprised. The next day Tin Kuang dressed up beautifully. She told herself it was nothing. Just going shopping with mother-in-law that's all. Nothing to be scared of, the mother-in-law's temperament was kind. But unexpectedly as soon as she entered, Tin Kuang caught Ha Nian Nian shopping with Hoai Van. Tin Kuang hurriedly hid behind that tree over there. Han Nian Nian was telling her best friend she heard last night Dai Quan Kin's parents returned. He and his older brother directly argued with each other. Ho Ai Van asked how she knew. Turns out Han Nian Nian had bribed some of his servants. Any slightest thing in his household they would immediately report to her. She now worriedly and resentfully said upon hearing the maid say Dai Tin Kuang rescued Quan Kin's parents from pirates. Now those two accepted that wench as a daughter-in-law, basically not caring about the presidential election. Tin Kuang now understood. No wonder every time something happened she immediately found out, so there were ghosts in the house. Ha Nian Nian now told her friend to hurry back and tell her father to quickly open a trial session so Dai Quan Kin would change his mind. If she let Dai Thoi Din really fail the election, she would be resented by grandma and the Dai family. Ho Ai Van immediately agreed. In her heart she sinisterly hoped Quan Kin would persist. That way Thoi Din wouldn't qualify, increasing her father's chances of winning. Tin Kuang saw rumors circulating online. Inside there were spies reporting to Han Nian Nian anytime. This game was truly difficult. Tin Kuang was still hiding there when the mother-in-law stood behind asking what she was doing. Tin Kuang shyly greeted Auntie, immediately looking for mother-in-law to knock on her head and teach her to greet with mother. The mother and child then cheerfully went shopping. The mother-in-law now introduced herself to the clerk as Bok Lan Go, having placed clothes orders here. Today coming to get them, the clerk then went to fetch them for the mother and child to wait there. Very quickly a pile of dresses were brought over. Total three dresses for Tin Kuang to see. Seeing them, Tin Kuang was extremely eager taking one set telling her mother she would go try it inside. Outside, the clerk was heartily praising Tin Kuang's beauty to Bok Lan Go, 
making the madam very proud. But now she noticed Ha Nian Nian and Ho Ai Van coming over to choose one of the three dresses Bok Lan Go ordered, even saying she could buy it at any price. Ho Ai Van now expressed she had her eyes on this dress and still wanted Bok Lan Go to give it to her, agreeing to pay ten times the price. Bok Lan Go put down her teacup smiling saying her family wasn't lacking money. Ha Nian Nian now turned to the clerk asking if there were any more of this dress design in the shop. But the shop's rule was custom-made designs. There had never been any similarities in designs before. No two sets existed in the same design. But Ha Nian Nian with her arrogant personality said she insisted on wanting this set. Otherwise to give this set to her. The clothes hadn't been given to the customer yet so still belonged to the shop. The clerk was scared stiff but still had to apologize because that would affect the shop's reputation. The designer didn't allow her to do that. That. The wench was even more resentful, then walked towards Dai Quan Kin's mother introducing herself as Han Nian Nian, saying the madam must have seen her on TV before, and this was Vice President Fan Dang Long's daughter. The wench said they didn't intend to rob, just wanted to buy it for a high price. Her faces showed they were forcing her, forcing Bok Lan Go to reconsider if she should give this set to them or not. Bok Lan Go with the madam's elegant bearing still indifferently smiled reading the newspaper until Tin Kuang came out from the changing room in the beautiful beautiful dress, happily saying mother look. Tin Kuang's beauty made Bok Lan Go and the clerk enthralled, while Ha Nian Nian's eyes nearly popped out. Bok Lan Go extremely pleased exclaimed in admiration, so beautiful, mother's daughter is truly beautiful. Ha Nian Nian now pointed a finger at Tin Kuang's face yelling excitedly, how is it you, little Bok Lin? Seeing this, Ho Ai Ven whispered in Ha Nian Nian's ear asking if she was Tin Kuang. Nian Nian ground her teeth confirming it was her. After that the wench even turned smiling mockingly saying no wonder the madam was so shameless. So it was the mother of this little Bok Lin. Indeed it was what kind of people would have what kind of children. Hearing her cursing her mother-in-law, Tin Kuang was about to charge over but was stopped by Bok Lan Go. Bok Lan Go smiled introducing that to be precise she wasn't only Dai Tin Kuang's mother, but also the mother of the one she sabotaged causing him to lose the qualification to participate in the presidential election. Dai Thoi Din, and even more the one she desperately wants to marry. Dai Quan Kin. Han Nian Nian was horrified, nearly fainting. Bok Lan Go still smiled saying she was shameless already, asking Han Nian Nian why the child she gave birth to, she just kept biting and wouldn't let go, not even letting the stammering Han Nian Nian get out a complete word. Bok Lan Go turned saying to the clerk to hurry and pack all the clothes for her, so she and her beloved daughter could go elsewhere to continue shopping, crushing that evil karma in one minute. Tin Kuang felt her mother-in-law was truly amazing. The mother and child happily departed, seeing her daughter-in-law ask if buying so many dresses dresses wasn't too much. The mother-in-law replied the money was spent anyway. Clothes replace people. Also asking didn't Tin Kuang still owe the president's wife a dress? Tin Kuang now thought if Dai Quan Kin still couldn't change the circumstances, then she would use the excuse of gifting the dress to the president's residence, then tell the president she was also the mermaid. Five days later, holding the Supreme Court summons in hand, Tin Kuang felt extremely anxious because at noon today the trial session opened but Dai Quan Kin still had no movements, so she decided to act, taking that dress to gift the president's wife exactly as she had planned in her head. After gifting it, Tin Kuang told the president's wife that in fact she also had a matter so dared to intrude here, then asked if cousin was home. Tin Nam immediately told her Dean Bak was in a meeting, but also told Tin Kuang to wait at ease. After he was done she would arrange for them to meet. Twenty minutes passed and Tin Kuang still saw no movements, becoming very impatient. At this time Dean Bak had opened the door and come in. Knowing he was very busy, Tin Kuang went straight to the point saying she wanted to ask if national treasures had privileges. Hearing this, Dean Bak asked if Tin Kuang still wanted to ask about Han Nian Nian using her privilege to coerce her man right? Tin Kuang now resolutely told Dean Bak to just answer her question, if just being a national treasure allowed arbitrarily choosing her own man or not. Hearing this, Dean Bak asked if Tin Kuang really liked Quan Kin that much? Tin Kuang firmly nodded. Dean Bak asked how much she liked him. Hearing this question, Tin Kuang felt it was one she had never thought of before, but she knew she was willing for his sake to tell everyone her secret. Tin Kuang asked Dean back again, if she was also a national treasure and she was Quan Kin's match. If both were national treasures the same, then would it have to follow the rules of first come first serve? Dean Bak only said her hypothesis basically could not happen, then told Tin Kuang to drink some water to calm down. 
hearing him say that made her extremely agitated, asking who said in this world there was only Ha Nian Nian as the mermaid. Tin Kuang resolutely told cousin that today she came with the mermaid identity, directly asking him to contact the court to revoke the accusations against Dai Quan Kin. Also said if he didn't believe her she would immediately jump into the fountain pool, anywhere for him to clearly see her fishtail to see if she was just spouting nonsense. Dean Back very seriously listened then smiled saying if so then please follow him somewhere. Tin Kuang followed Dean back, now feeling a bit worried because she didn't know if she had to jump into the fountain or pool, or would he directly splash water on her? Dean back now stopped in front of a small room. After inviting Tin Kuang in, he conveniently locked the door. Tin Kuang was extremely surprised, not understanding why he brought her here, and currently at the Supreme Court. Now the trial for Dai Quan Kin rejecting the national treasure officially opened. Today's trial would be broadcasted live on TV and Dai Quan Kin would finally agree to marry the national treasure or accept jail time. The outcome would be today. Now everyone was present in the courtroom. Ha Nian Nian, after all the suffering she caused, still smiled brightly greeting everyone. Of course no one had time to respond. Ha Nian Nian now walked over sitting right next to Ho Ai Van, her best friend equally materialistic and scheming as her. When asked why she only just arrived now, Ha Nian Nian irritably told Ho Ai Van not to mention it again, because before leaving, her older brother still forced her to cancel the marriage application, but this time she absolutely refused to listen. Seeing Dai Quan Kin still seriously sitting there. She didn't expect at this time he still hadn't had a change of heart. In her heart she hoped he'd best obey the court's decision. Otherwise if convicted she wouldn't be able to come down the stage either. Ho Ai Van now said she believed Dai Quan Kin wouldn't be so foolish. He would definitely change his mind and marry Ha Nian Nian at the last minute. Ho Ai Van said if he didn't agree then Duong Tiu was finished. Naim Bok, Duong Chao, Ki Tu, Mac Phi, etc., all the Dai family's adopted children would have to withdraw from the political stage. Also asking didn't Ha Nian Nian think Dai Quan Kin would make such a big play for a little countryside girl from overseas? After making Ha Nian Nian stick to her viewpoint, not withdrawing the marriage registration application, on the surface Ho Ai Van agitated her best friend, but in her heart she hoped Quan Kin would definitely be a man blinded by love. That way her father would benefit. The judge's gavel rang asking for everyone's order. The judge said according to the law, National Treasure Ha Nian Nian had the right to request marriage from any unmarried man. The other party could not refuse. Once refusing they would face severe punishment. Now Dai Quan Kin was invited to stand. To state before the judge his decision after careful consideration. Why Go Qin now immediately stood up calling her brother hoping he could change his decision. Duong Chao agitatedly told Quan Kin to think of brotherly bonds. Could it be for a girl he had just known for a few months he would abandon the siblings who grew up together? The judge now banged the gavel yelling for silence. But Duong Chao still agitatedly could not be silent. Her fate falling into others' hands. Everything she had never done yet had to end her career because Dai Quan Kin rejected marrying the national treasure. How could she be silent? Why Go Qin's eyes brimmed with tears looking at Dai Quan Kin. Her throat choked up. Younger brother, sister begs you. Quan Kin now also looked at his sister-in-law. His gaze still resolute apologizing to his sister. The judge now asked Quan Kin to hurry and state his decision. If he would reject Ha Nian Nian's marriage proposal or not. Ha Nian Nian and Ho Ai Van now both smiled sinisterly. Everyone had their own thoughts and desires. Why Go Qin and the Dai family's people on the other hand had extremely desperate and grieved expressions. Quan Kin closed his eyes and thought. He knew in his heart there was only one mermaid. Then he declared, saying he rejected Ha Nian Nian's marriage proposal. His whole life he would never marry her. The decision was made. All the Dai family's people stood frozen still, while Ha Nian Nian was agitated like going insane. Blaming Dai Quan Kin in the end what was so awful about her that he'd rather abandon his siblings than deign to marry her. Hearing this question, Quan Kin just glanced at her then coldly laughed once. Now was the moment the court would announce the final verdict, asking everyone to stand. The judge said regarding the defendant Dai Quan Kin rejecting the national treasure case. The facts were clear, evidence convincing. Defendant Dai Quan Kin was sentenced to three years imprisonment. All Dai family members' election rights revoked. Now from below came Y Go Kin's grieved cry. Turns out she couldn't withstand the blow and fainted. Her mother hugged the girls looking at Ha Nian Nian with furious eyes. Now was she satisfied? Ha Nian Nian covered her mouth, horrified looking at the reality before her. She didn't expect everything to turn out like this in the end. Quan Kin's hands were cuffed in shackles. If not held back, Ha Nian Nian 
Yuan surely would have leapt towards Quan Kin. Dai Quan Kin, I hate you. She thought because of him now not only did she become the enemy in the Dai family's hearts, even her cousins, aunts and uncles would all be unable to forgive her. Quan Kin only silently turned his head back for a second. Then the door closed shut. The outcome was decided. Now outside Ho Ai Van took the chance to call her father. Reporting on the situation, she said Quan Kin still refused Ha Nian Nian in the end, was sentenced to three years imprisonment, Dai Thoi Din completely disqualified. Han Tan Bak also called Luke Qian Win saying Dai Quan Kin still didn't change his mind on court, still resolute on not marrying Ha Nian Nian. Now the final verdict had been pronounced already, saying the Dai family people were furious to the point of erupting, directly arguing with Dai Quan Kin on court. Everyone wanted to pounce on and hit Ha Nian Nian. Why Go Keen even fainted from anger. Han Tan Bak was still talking when the Dai family people now passed by too. Everyone's faces were murderous, utterly resentful, watching their family members helping each other into cars. After the cars left, Han Tan Bak said this time he truly had to respect Dai Quan Kin, he was a real manly man. At the same time, Tin Kuang had also seen everything on the president's office TV. Her face extremely grieved. She resentfully yelled saying she really was the mermaid. Why didn't they believe her? She pointed at Dai Thoi Din's face saying there was still a chance to salvage the situation originally. All because he didn't believe her. Now his presidential dream had disintegrated into seafoam. Did he know? Dai Thoi Din still smiled handing Tin Kuang a cup of tea. Saying these past days sister-in-law had suffered grievances. Now brother apologizes. Tin Kuang still angrily blew up. Did he know that just because he didn't believe her now the whole Dai family was ruined? Seeing Thoi Din still cheerily saying it surely wasn't that dire. Tin Kuang was even more furious, because now Dai Quan Kin was jailed, while he lost the qualification to run for president. If this wasn't called dire then what was? Tin Kuang was agitated to the point she couldn't sit still. If originally Thoi Din and Dean Bak believed her, everything could still have been salvaged, yet their result was dragging her to watch the live broadcast of the trial. Hearing this, Dean Bak smiled saying this time Tin Kuang was truly angry, today directly calling him by name instead of cousin. Dean Bak then said he wouldn't tease her anymore, telling Thoi Din to go coax his sister-in-law himself. He had something to take care of. Thoi Din now just smiled saying his younger brother really didn't choose the wrong person, then told Tin Kuang to hurry and follow him because they had an important matter to do. Hearing they had to go, Tin Kuang became extremely frightened, because she didn't want to return to the Dai household. She feared if she returned now everyone would chop her into pieces. Thoi Din assured Tin Kuang to be at ease, they wouldn't do anything to her. Although Tin Kuang still couldn't trust him, she had no other choice but to follow. Sitting in the car, Tin Kuang still worriedly asked Thoi Din where he wanted to take her, still suspecting he wanted to take revenge for everyone so secretly disposed of her. Thoi Din said now he had to go to a press conference to find the real culprit behind the gas station explosion, to regain justice for the departed bodyguard brothers. Tin Kuang was also involved then so he had to take her there. Hearing he found the real culprit behind the gas station case, Tin Kuang was extremely surprised, but she dejectedly felt revealing the culprit's name now wouldn't have any meaning anymore. Everything was already over, finding the real culprit then what? He didn't have the qualification to run for president anyway. Thoi Din thought differently than her. He felt sooner or later an explanation had to be given to the departed and the innocent injured citizens. The real culprit had to pay for their actions. Otherwise where was the justice, now? At the press conference, the prosecutor was talking about the explosion's cause. It was due to a smoldering cigarette butt recorded on the gas station's cameras. In Dai Thoi Din's bodyguards there was one who deliberately threw the smoldering cigarette butt. The victim's families now cried resentfully. They furiously demanded Dai Thoi Din pay with his life for their loved ones. Online everyone also turned to condemn him and upon seeing Thoi Din and Tin Kuang arrive, the criticism increased even more, even saying he came to provoke the victim's families. Thoi Din now stood there taking the press's interview. They asked if he viewed lives as worthless grass to gain more support in the presidential election, saying someone like him how could he deserve to be president. He now affirmed using underhanded means for the election, viewing lives as worthless grass, that kind of person truly didn't deserve to be president. They then said he was admitting his guilt and actions himself, saying this was the reason his name was crossed off the presidential candidate list.
Thoi Din now came to the point of leaving the stage, bowing down apologizing that because he didn't strictly manage his subordinates this irreparable consequence occurred, creating wounds that made everyone unable to let go. The grieving mother now became extremely agitated, running up slapping him then demanding he return her son. Her son had only worked at the gas station for a month yet lost his life. The bodyguards now said don't get agitated everyone. The prosecutor also called for everyone to calm down because they hadn't finished speaking. Seeing this, the mother yelled what more was there to say. The culprit was right before them. She asked why they still didn't punish him by law. The prosecutor now said the true mastermind behind this wanted to see the current situation. Also asking didn't they want to become accomplices to the culprit behind the scenes? Hearing these words, everyone became extremely shocked asking couldn't it be the culprit wasn't Dai Thoi Din? Also asking wasn't Thoi Din crossed off the presidential candidate list? Wasn't this saying clearly he was the mastermind? The police chief now requested they quietly and calmly watch a short video. He said to pay attention to. The owner of a car stopped at the gas station. After getting out he immediately ran outside. Moreover he kept pulling his hat down several times. Surely something was fishy. Seeing this, everyone became puzzled wondering about the reason behind his strange behavior. After seeing the fire ignite just seconds after that person left, everyone had the same thought. Could this person be the real arsonist behind the explosion? Reporters still believed even if suspicious of him, the real cause was a cigarette butt. How could there be any other culprit besides Dai Thoi Din's employee? The prosecutor now said, according to their investigation, Dai Thoi Din's bodyguard Trong had asthma. What he inhaled wasn't cigarettes but a handheld inhaler. The shape of this medicine was quite similar to cigarettes. The prosecutor also affirmed they said the explosion's cause was a cigarette butt. It didn't say it was bodyguard Trong who threw that cigarette butt. All the reporters immediately froze. The prosecutor also affirmed this misunderstanding was exactly the result the mastermind behind the scenes wanted. The victim's families now turned asking Dai Thoi Din why earlier did he apologize to them, and say those words words when he wasn't the culprit. Dai Thoi Din still affirmed if not for someone scheming against him like this, then he believed this gas station explosion wouldn't have happened, so he thought no matter how things were, he couldn't shirk responsibility. Now bowing to sincerely apologize to everyone present here once more, then looking straight into the camera, saying with a sharp gaze he knew the schemer was still leisurely sitting at home watching this press conference, not above using underhanded means, very capable. Hearing this, everyone thought there were multiple culprits, also collectively changing their attitudes to sympathize with Dai Thoi Din because although the victim he still apologized. When everyone turned to question why such a responsible person was crossed off the presidential candidate list, the truth was revealed before the public's eyes. The reason was because the national treasure's marriage proposal failed so the entire Dai family's political rights were revoked. Luke Chien Nguyen now also knew public opinion currently wasn't advantageous, directly speculating on Weibo He and Vice President Fan were the pinned suspects. Also saying this time Thoi Din had no way of running for president so wanted to drag both of them down too. As for the real mastermind behind the explosion, Vice President Fan Dang Long was extremely furious. His assistant affirmed the explosion matter was already cleanly handled. It's just online opinion was leaning heavily towards supporting Dai Thoi Din, even demanding his presidential candidacy be reinstated. He didn't expect netizens still didn't know the reason Dai Thoi Din was disqualified. Also unwilling to let Dai Thoi Din climb the political stage again. After the press conference, Dai Thoi Din and Tin Kuang returned. Tin Kuang still felt now even if he cleared his name he still couldn't run for president. She still demanded to immediately jump into the river now to prove she was a mermaid for him to see. Tin Kuang told him to quickly drive near the city outskirts so she could jump into the river and transform into a fish for him to see. Thoi Din smiled saying sister-in-law go home first then jump. Because the city river was very dirty. There was a swimming pool at home. Tin Kuang could only dejectedly gaze out the window because he still didn't believe her. Arriving at the Dai family villa, Tin Kuang was stunned seeing everyone busily working. After seeing the Dai siblings gaze towards her, Tin Kuang was so scared she trembled, feeling like she was about to fall into the wolf's mouth. But sister-in-law Wai Go Keen still gently said Tin Kuang came right on time to help sister look over this press release. Remembering when sister-in-law fainted at the courthouse, she concernedly asked if sister-in-law was better now. Unexpectedly sister-in-law smiled brightly saying she was pretending, then immediately pushed Tin Kuang to work helping her hand 
handle the pile of drafts and press releases. Tin Kuang still wonderingly asked sister why she pretended to faint. Sister-in-law replied of course it was to anger someone. Tin Kuang still worriedly asked what exactly happened. Because she was very impatient wanting to visit Quan Kin. Sister-in-law just smiled saying don't worry. The family would definitely not leave her lonely for three years in the empty room. Now someone told sister-in-law to look at the documents. Why Go Keen had no choice but to bid sister-in-law and go over there. Looking extremely busy, Tin Kuang looked at the bustling surroundings then the documents again. She discovered this was all for the presidential election campaign. She wondered if Big Brother could still participate in the presidential election. After finishing talking to that woman, sister-in-law came over whispering she had something to ask Tin Kuang for help with. Turns out she wanted to ask her to sing a song tomorrow night at the presidential election rally dinner. Also said originally Ha Nian Nian was booked but now she didn't want to see her face. Sister also said Tin Kuang's performance at the presidential President's office's senior dinner received very good feedback. So if she agreed to go on stage there would be many audience members captivated and won over by her. Tin Kuang still hesitated a bit because this was originally Han Nian Nian's performance slot, but she finally reluctantly agreed. Just one thing, she asked if Big Brother could still run for president? Why Go Keen winked mischievously saying Tin Kuang would know tomorrow night. Then she would just need to sing really well and sister would gift her a little brother as a bolster. Then sister-in-law hurriedly bid her goodbye to handle work. Thinking of Dai Quan Kin. Tin Kuang felt her best friend didn't lack bolsters, just worried for him suffering injustice in jail. How could he rest at night? Although she didn't know how Big Brother could still run for president, just seeing everyone so busy like this, Tin Kuang believed everything would surely be fine. 24 hours until presidential election day, seeing Dai Thoi Din's name back on the presidential candidate list again. Fan Dang Long was extremely angry not knowing what was going on. He immediately called high-ranking officials saying they were violating principles by doing this, demanding the immediate cessation of these irrational actions. But they told Vice President Fan there were no irrational activities. Because the president had used his pardon powers, Fan Dang Long didn't expect this, his old face clearly showing anger. Meanwhile, in Luke Qian Wen's office. Now he knew this was the real reason for Dai Quan Kin arrogantly rejecting Han Nian Nian. It was to put on an act of a deeply affectionate man to gain a good reputation, at the same time also helping Dai Thoi Din escape suspicion in the gas station explosion case, to make Dai Thoi Din the person the public looked towards. Luke Qian Wen now felt these brothers were truly deceitful. It was all an act. His assistant now reported Dai Quan Kin's Weibo was currently top one in hot search for Dai Thoi Din, thanking the public for helping prove their innocence. Moreover he also announced in the video tonight at 7.30pm at a northern stadium a ceremony would be held, hoping voters come to the stadium and participate. Luke Qian Win stood frozen there. He knew the outcome of this battle was at hand. The stadium now also completed preparations for tonight's election rally. While Tin Kuang was putting on makeup in the room when she received a call from Han Nian Nian, she said don't think you've won Tin Kuang. Also saying Tin Kuang and that slut were alike. You were just a pawn in Quan Kin's hand. Tin Kuang immediately retorted, saying even if she was a pawn she didn't lose anything, because she and him only knew each other a few months. He wasn't because of her but because of his brother wasn't that very normal? But Tin Kuang knew they still had a lot of time interacting together. One day he could forsake his whole world for her. On the other hand Ha Nian Nian now had to be so angry she called her. Tin Kuang asked if she lost her only reliance? After speaking Tin Kuang hung up, giving the phone to her assistant to hold then stepped onto the stage. Thoi Din now also introduced that next his sister-in-law, the mermaid girl would present everyone with a song. In Tin Kuang's heart, after knowing Dai Quan Kin was because of his brother, this outcome made her very relieved. At least she wouldn't feel guilty anymore. She didn't hope a man she just met a few months, just because of her became hostile with his brother. Betraying his family, that would be illogical and selfish. Tin Kuang now shone brightly under the stage lights. Hello everyone, I'm the mermaid girl. After being jailed for 17 hours, the deputy now drove to the courthouse prison cell to pick him up. Brother Kin really suffered. Please get in the car. He then reminded him not to play so big in the future. Because if the president didn't use his pardon power at the last minute, it would have really been finished. Quan Kin calmly replied he wouldn't fight a battle without preparations. Looking at him, the deputy didn't know where he got his confidence from anymore. Currently the voting scores between Thoi Din and Fan Dang long already had a considerable gap. Quan Kin recalled when at the president's office, he had agreed with the president that if he didn't use his special authority, 
he would move all of Dai Group's companies overseas, at the same time suspending all cooperative projects with the government cutting all benefits, and conversely when the president agreed, Dai Group could devote all its power to contribute to social welfare. The president now just calmly said even if the two brothers didn't threaten him anymore, he would still agree for Tin Kuang Sake. After that handshake that day, Quan Kin had a steady foothold to be ready to play a big game. Now he asked the deputy where Tin Kuang was. After knowing Tin Kuang was currently at the election rally location, he immediately decided to go home and change first before going over. Tin Kuang was still melodiously singing. Quan Kin had also arrived and was listening to her. Standing in a corner listening to her sing, he secretly thought who knew this little mermaid tale dared sing such bold lyrics, confirming you're my destined one I can't escape. Tin Kuang was the most emotional she'd ever been, tears in her eyes about to spill out. The good times between us I can't forget, but I hope more and more we never met, even if you're the only ray of sunlight in my life. Hearing those lyrics, Quan Kin became confused thinking, hope we never met, what does that mean? He thought she was sending this song to him, but didn't understand why she said he was the only ray of sunlight in her life, but hope they never met. After finishing singing, Tin Kuang immediately received thunderous applause and cheers. Then she also rallied for Thoi Din, hoping everyone could vote for him with your only precious ballot. Also saying voting for him would gain more of the mermaid girl's blessing. Just as she was about to step down, a hand grabbed her waist. Tin Kuang was extremely surprised, asking how did he get here, how did he get out. Huan Kin just leaned in next to her ear, expressing his earlier confusion asking why when clearly unforgettable she hoped they never met. He didn't believe her words were just lyrics. He wanted her to quickly tell him her true feelings. Tin Kuang now sorrowfully said because meeting her he was taken by the reaper. If they never met it would have been so much better. That way he wouldn't have died. He hugged her saying Tin Kuang was being silly. Wasn't he still alive and well right here? Huan Kin didn't understand why Tin Kuang kept thinking he had to die. She really had zero positivity. Tin Kuang buried herself in his embrace, still sadly saying it was because of her that Tan Quan Deep died. This name Tan Quan Deep immediately shattered Quan Kin's delusions. He questioned her why this song could be written for Tan Quan Deep. He asked if she was certain those lyrics were meant for him, then angrily shook Tin Kuang, asking if her walnut-sized brain was having memory issues. Tin Kuang pushed him away still insisting it was Tan Quan Deep who said those words to her, also saying how could she mix up the benefactor who saved her life. Now the deputy had invited Brother Kin onto the stage because he was the representative to give a speech rallying votes for Dai Thoi Din. Quan Kin sternly told Tin Kuang to remember clearly. This song couldn't be written for Tan Quan Deep. Even more she couldn't shed tears for him. He warned her if she still dared shed tears for Tan Quan Deep again he would make her hold back her tears until late night. To have her sobbing bitterly for him, Tin Kuang felt Quan Kin was being unreasonable so kicked her leg into his butt. Dai Quan Kin then gave the hot-tempered girl a kiss, also saying if she dared consider his words as fleeting wind he would wring her tears dry tonight, to see how many excess tears she still had to shed for that damn Tan Quan Deep. Tin Kuang knew she couldn't refute him and was extremely frustrated. She even went to tell the deputy he was truly preposterous. His face changed faster than flipping a pancake. After Quan Kin finished his speech, Tin Kuang was also invited on stage to concurrently introduce them as this season's hottest official couple. Tin Kuang then stepped onto the stage. The MC then said he would represent girls who would draw lots in the future and girls who already drew lots to ask her a question. How to draw the one nicknamed Tumor. Huge. Whoever dares accept is digging their own grave. Tin Kuang immediately answered. He's called a tumor so of course he has a loyal temperament. And the MC asked how was Dai Quan Kin caught by the mermaid girl. Quan Kin unexpectedly coldly furrowed his brows. Who said I was caught by her? Tin Kuang immediately turned pale. Feeling this shameless man couldn't be wanting to slap her right on stage. Now the man whose face changed as fast as flipping pancakes hugged her. Saying he himself was the one who caught her. This answer greatly satisfied all the audience members. This witty humor was also very amusing. The MC now said netizens all thought Quan Kin accepted the mermaid girl for the sake of his brother's presidential candidate position. Moreover Quan Kin himself once said it was impossible for feelings to develop from prolonged company. He asked him why he changed his mind now. This cheesy guy then looked at Tin Kuang affectionately and answered perhaps he himself also couldn't escape love's laws. The MC then turned asking Tin Kuang if she was satisfied with this answer. Recalling his earlier harsh dismissing words, Tin Kuang replied she wasn't very satisfied. The MC now asked Quan Kin what should he do now, or do something on sight to satisfy the young lady? Sister-in-law now immediately chimed in urging her little brother to kiss Tin Kuang. 
That shout also rallied all the audience members below. They unanimously cheered kiss. Kiss. Quan Kin also immediately knelt down kissing her hand tenderly. Then he asked Tin Kuang if she was satisfied now. The crowd below was already hoarse from cheering. Quan Kin put his hand into his shirt, saying if she still wasn't satisfied, he took out a jewelry box. Everyone thought he was about to propose, feeling it to be extremely romantic and sweet. Some even cried demanding fireworks be set off as a backdrop for them. From the box Quan Kin took out an extremely exquisite beautiful anklet. Tin Kuang recognized at a glance this was her fish scale she accidentally dropped at the pool before. After putting it on her ankle, Quan Kin even raised Tin Kuang's leg, saying he was truly enamored with her heels. This immediately made the entire stadium dumbfounded, followed by a series of delighted laughter. Tin Kuang immediately recalled that Weibo post saying Quan Kin liked her precious jade feet. She was red-faced with shyness now when the MC asked if she was satisfied. Tin Kuang closed her eyes and held her nose hurriedly replying she was satisfied. Because she was afraid if not yet satisfied he would perform kissing her heels right here. She would die of embarrassment then. Quan Kin now leaned in next to her ear and whispered, asking if she knew the meaning of this anklet. He said it was to bind securely this whole lifetime. Tied tightly the next lifetime, after everything was gloriously successful, the Dai family then invited each other out for hot pot. Tin Kuang heard and became extremely excited but Quan Kin beside her. His complexion seemed to not be very well. He tightly grasped her hand hating that he fell ill at a time like this. Then he told Dai Thoi Din that he felt a bit tired so wouldn't go eat anymore, asking Big Brother to take Tin Kuang out to eat in his stead. Tin Kuang could only listen to him and go with everyone. Now Quan Kin told Captain Kiu Van that after eating his fill to take her back to the production site, Tin Kuang still worriedly looked back. She felt he didn't seem to be very well, so she decided not to get on the car with everyone, but go back asking Kiu Van if he had fallen ill again. Kiu Ven awkwardly said Dai Quan Kin didn't want her to worry, but if there was medicine that was also good, Tin Kuang really wanted to give him the blood pearl, but it had side effects making her hesitate, but suddenly she thought of something calling for Kiu Van to immediately take her back. Quan Kin now had to restrain himself in a difficult situation, self-controlling so the thirst for blood didn't overtake his senses. Seeing Tin Kuang enter, he looked up with bloodshot eyes asking if she wasn't going for hot pot. Tin Kuang brought over the bowl of blood pearl medicine to his side, gently comforting little brother drink this medicine. Later you won't have to feel uncomfortable anymore. Quan Kin still suspicious turned away, also asking Tin Kuang if she was certain he wouldn't feel bad after drinking it. Quan Kin was precisely still clearly remembering that tormented sensation of ice and fire. Tin Kuang embarrassedly asked in a stern tone if he would drink it or not, inwardly cursing why did Dai Quan Kin have to make her spell it out clearly. She already implied it so much. Quan Kin now told Tin Kuang if she was certain then feed it to him. Tin Kuang's face turned red then brought the cup to his mouth to help him drink. Seeing Tin Kuang about to run away, he told her to come back, asking her couldn't she untie him? Like this what was he to do, as soon as the rope was loosened? Quan Kin pounced on Tin Kuang like a beast. This action of his made her a little flustered and panicked. Quan Kin held her entire body, ignoring Tin Kuang's struggles did you think it through already? You know I won't let you off right? Tin Kuang still kicked and shouted for him to let her go. She believed the antidote side effects couldn't have acted so quickly. Quan Kin just sternly asked for Tin Kuang's answer. Her answer was silence and avoiding his gaze. He'll take that as her agreeing. Quan Kin immediately carried her into the room. Under the blood pearl side effect, the flames of love were ignited. Tin Kuang helped Quan Kin satisfy it, officially living up to their husband and wife relationship. Meanwhile at the hot pot restaurant, everyone was anxiously awaiting the upcoming vote starting in half an hour. Dai Thoi Din couldn't get through to his little brother and was extremely worried. His wife seeing this just laughed saying there was still the sister-in-law there. Surely it was nothing. Ki Tu sighed. He knew Brother Kin's old illness had relapsed. No one could help, only little Tin Kuang remained. Why Go Kin didn't expect her little brother's illness truly had no cure. Also not knowing why he contracted such a strange illness. This was also sister's first time hearing because normally the younger bros hid it. Ki Tu explained it wasn't because they wanted to hide it but also didn't know where it came from. Just knew over 10 years ago he went out to sea and was heavily injured. When he returned had to be hospitalized over a month in the ICU. After he recovered he had this illness since. Why Go Kin wondered what Quan Kin went out 
out to sea for at the time. Could it be he encountered pirates so was injured that severely? Ki too told her to ask the deputy. Only the deputy accompanied brother Kin then. The deputy then recounted at the time they were young and fearless. So went to do corporate espionage. Wanting to steal a competitor's trade secret so boarded their ship. Quan Kin was crazy then. Even unwilling to change his looks. In the end he had to wait till he was sound asleep then put makeup on him. Because afraid of drifting out to sea. Specially waterproofed his makeup. Why Go Keen asked how did Quan Kin not notice then? Didn't he look in the mirror? She also asked what the deputy made him look like. The deputy then said he was busy with espionage. Didn't even wash his face. Basically no time to look in the mirror. And what he was made to look like was also forgotten. Anyway it was a normal style. A common face. The deputy said remembering he picked up an ID card on the seashore so based the makeup on that face for Quan Kin. Then stuffed that ID card into his pocket afterwards. Hearing afterwards Quan Kin was captured. Why Go Keen was extremely surprised. Luckily the changed looks made him unrecognizable, just got lost somewhere at sea. The deputy stayed behind to continue the mission while Ki Tu went to fish brother Kin up. Unexpectedly he couldn't find him. Ki Tu scolded the deputy for changing Quan Kin's looks without telling anyone. How were they supposed to recognize him then? Ki Tu had to admit this brat's makeup skills were sublime. By the time they found brother Kin he was already drifting at sea. Forget about the makeup being smeared from drifting couldn't even recognize it was makeup. If not for the deputy saying that was brother Kin they wouldn't have recognized him at all. Afterwards they hauled him onto the boat. Had to use a dedicated heavy duty makeup remover to restore brother Kin's real face. At the time they also didn't dare tell anyone this. Because just knowing foster father and mother would know Dai Quan Kin was pranked by the deputy into briefly meeting the king of hell they would chase the deputy out of Dai House. In fact, forget foster parents not knowing this matter. Even the big brother Dai Thoi Din didn't know the reason his younger brother wasn't found in time was because his looks changed. He firmly believed now perhaps Quan Kin also didn't know his appearance had changed then. 30 minutes had passed now. It was also time to start voting. The next morning, in the Dai family villa, golden sunlight had flooded in. Dai Quan Kin woke up after a night of debauchery. He immediately kissed the forehead of his beloved. The girl still soundly sleeping. Seeing the little mermaid still not awake, he was certain she must have been very tired yesterday. Quan Kin wrapped her in a blanket, then carried Tin Kuang to the mermaid pool. He carefully removed her anklet. Compared to washing, he knew she preferred this more. When Tin Kuang's feet touched the water, the beautiful fish tail immediately grew out. At the same time Quan Kin gave her a sweet kiss, starting a morning full of happiness. Tin Kuang now also opened her eyes awake. Seeing herself submerged in water, she instinctively swam, her face full of joy, until she realized this wasn't a dream. Tin Kuang immediately surfaced, feeling how could she carelessly transform into a mermaid. Quan Kin sitting on the shore waiting for her for a while now. Seeing Tin Kuang finally awake asked, Did you sleep well my mermaid? Tin Kuang immediately splashed water flying everywhere. Quan Kin smiled telling her not to run. Come up and eat, aren't you hungry? Tin Kuang still soaked in the water. Ignoring him, Quan Kin still very gently coaxed her. Come here, let me dry your hair. I'll pull you up. What do you want to eat today? Tin Kuang widened her eyes looking at him, then said didn't he have anything he wanted to ask her? Quan Kin pulled Tin Kuang onto shore, wrapped her in a thin blanket, carried her in his arms, her fishtail turned back into slender legs. He sat down drying her hair, while gently saying didn't he ask earlier what she wanted to eat? Tin Kuang said she wasn't talking about that, so Quan Kin pointed at her legs, asking if she wanted him to ask about her fishtail? Tin Kuang wondered why he didn't have a shred of surprise? His attitude made her feel something was off. Because in this country everyone knew there was only one mermaid, Han Nian Nian. Now there was another mermaid appearing. She wondered why he wasn't puzzled. Quan Kin said he had known for a long time already. Tin Kuang didn't believe him, thinking his older brother must have told him, because she only told Dai Thoi Din about being a mermaid, but she hadn't proven it by jumping into the pool yet, how could he just believe it so easily? Hearing this, Quan Kin interrogated asking why his older brother knew about this. Tin Kuang refuted that wasn't the point, but how did he know she was a mermaid for a long time already? Quan Kin smiled brightly asking her to think carefully. Who was the one who named her? 
Tin Kuang still obliviously answered it was Tan Quan Deep. The smile on his face gradually froze. He asked if besides that name she could remember anyone else in her brain. Even who named her she remembered incorrectly. He then showed her the old photo of himself for her to see. Tin Kuang immediately praised him for being handsome since little. He thus also very confidently asked if she remembered who named her yet. Tin Kuang exasperatedly answered it was Tan Quan Deep, also saying she wasn't an idiot. She remembered that person's face very clearly. She remembered not liking her original name much so Tan Quan Deep gave her a new one. That night, they were at the seaside taking shelter. Looking up was a sky full of stars. Then Tan Quan Deep said her name was Dai Tin Kuang. Quan Kin also helplessly sighed Ha Nian Nian. Just what was in your brain? He grabbed her hand, seriously teaching her. Ha Nian Nian, listen carefully. He then started recounting, 10 years ago, at Moon Crescent Bay Strait, there was an injured teenage boy. The smell of his blood spread attracting a school of sharks. He didn't have the strength to resist anymore. Almost became dinner for the sharks. The young man met a mermaid girl. After the danger temporarily passed, seeing she didn't want to tell him her name, he wanted to give her another name. Name, because she was even more beautiful than the stars so he called her Dai Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang hearing this immediately got angry then, not accepting, even chasing him away. Hearing this, Tin Kuang was extremely shocked. This was the eighth time she drank the regret potion to revisit events from her youth. She didn't expect he would know about this. The dialogue was also not wrong by a single word. Quan Kin then affirmed the teenage boy was him. But Tin Kuang just waved her hand saying this was absolutely impossible. But she also said it was possible. Unless he changed his looks into Tan Quan Deeps. Quan Kin hearing this immediately became became furious. But Tin Kuang insisted she couldn't be wrong about this, because he was her lifesaver. She also coaxed him not to pretend to be Tan Quan Deep out of jealousy. That wouldn't be good. Quan Kin now laughed dryly and helplessly a few times, then angrily left in a huff. Seeing him slam the door right in front of her, he wondered why he kept competing with Tan Quan Deep. Now Tin Kuang received a phone call. It was Thuong Dam calling. As soon as Tin Kuang picked up she pleaded for her help. Tin Kuang had to tell her to slowly say what happened. Don't be impatient, after asking what happened. Dr. Thuong sobbed pleading for Tin Kuang to help arrange a meeting with Ha True Da, and ask him to return her child to her. Hearing Mr. Ha kidnapped her son, Tin Kuang was extremely shocked. Told her to explain clearly, Thuong Dam said she had no other choice so had to bother Tin Kuang. Her child was ill, earlier even called his mom saying he felt very uncomfortable. But Dam couldn't enter Ha house so feared only Tin Kuang could help her call Mr. Ha out to plead for him to return little man. Tin Kuang immediately told her to calm down. She'll call over there now. She promptly hung up, then was about to handle things over here. When the deputy also informed Quan Kin about the hospital catching Ha True Da bringing a child for an examination, saying it was his son. Hearing this Tin Kuang hastily asked which hospital Ha True Da brought little man to. After finding out it was City T Hospital, Tin Kuang immediately took the deputy's car keys to head there. Dai Quan Kin's face still clearly showed his displeasure. With one look the deputy knew someone had provoked him again. Now Quan Kin cast that grim gaze at the deputy giving him some directive. Meanwhile Tin Kuang had driven to arrive at City T. She immediately called Dr. Thuong, asking if she was in the capital now. Hearing Dr. Thuong reply she was. Tin Kuang told her to hurry to City T Hospital to pick up little man. Thuong Dam immediately said she'll rush right over there, and asked Tin Kuang to quickly tell Ha True Da to buy a blood bag from the hospital for little man to drink, because he had the same illness as her father. Only drinking blood could cure it. Tin Kuang was surprised there were so many people with this illness. She agreed then continued speeding over. As soon as Tin Kuang entered the ward, she caught little man violently resisting an injection. She knew the boy was already uncomfortable. Now also having blood drawn for tests. For him this was torture, she immediately rushed over, picked little man up, while shooting the old Mrs. Ha irresolute look. Seeing this, the old woman scolded Tin Kuang, first stealing her daughter's man now also snatching her grandson away. Ignoring her shouting kidnapping accusations, Tin Kuang fled carrying the child. The old woman now yelled at her son to not stand there blankly but chase after them. But Ha Ca affirmed with his mother that Tin Kuang wouldn't harm little man, telling her to wait here. On this side, Tin Kuang had brought little man into the car, also introduced herself to the boy that his mom asked her to come rescue him. Little man then started crying saying he missed his mom, asking Tin Kuang where his mom was. Tin Kuang stroked his head comforting him that his mom will be here soon, also saying she'll bring him to get treated first now. Hearing this, little man immediately muttered saying he won't take medicine, also won't drink blood, 
right then, Ha Tru Da also came out, knocking on the car window, saying Tin Kuang stopped making trouble, little man was sick and needed the doctor's examination, Tin Kuang explained little man's blood craving illness to Ha Tru Da, then told him to quickly go buy a blood bag, she'll wait for him at the villa clinic up ahead, hearing his son had the exact same illness as Dai Quan Kin, he couldn't hide his shock, Tin Kuang just said if he already knew then hurry and go buy it, the child was still young, couldn't drag this out longer. True Da still silently stood there after the car left. He called Dai Quan Kin, interrogating what was little man's illness. Now True Da suddenly recalled Quan Kin once told him he had saved a newborn baby from death before, so the child had the exact same condition as him, and had even nonsensically apologized to him before. True Da asked Quan Kin if that child was little man right? The old hen now could no longer wait and ran out, her mouth still cursing Tin Kuang and even demanding to call the police. Quan Kin coldly said if True Da already knew then hurry up and hang up. Don't bother him, he said as soon as he heard the Ha family's voices he felt annoyed. After hanging up, Quan Kin furiously ordered the deputy to investigate the teenage boy who died 10 years ago named Tan Quan Deep and dig up everything that guy did before he died for him. After the deputy received the order, Quan Kin was also determined to get to the bottom of just what had that Tan Quan Deep done to make the little mermaid remember him so unforgettably. Meanwhile Ha Tru Da was trying to get the old hen to go home, and promised he'll bring little man back. Before leaving, she still tried cursing at the Dai family a bit more, then turned and left. Ha Tru Da fell into guilt and self-blame again, because his son nearly died yet he didn't know anything. After saving little man, Tin Kuang immediately contacted Dr. Thuong, telling her to come immediately to the address she sent. Tin Kuang also said she asked Ha Tru Da to buy a blood bag, adding for them to have an honest talk once at the villa. Thuong Dam was hesitant at first, but she also had to agree. Ultimately they couldn't keep avoiding each other forever, while little man's condition was critical. Finally Ha Tru Da also returned to the villa clinic. Tin Kuang took out a fruit juice box, which was actually blood for little man to drink, but the little guy stubbornly refused. No matter how Tin Kuang coaxed he wouldn't listen. Now Ha Tru Da picked the boy up, asking why he wouldn't take the medicine. Little man pouted saying he was scared that after drinking medicine, the other little friends wouldn't like him anymore. Little Na also wouldn't like him. When Tin Kuang asked who this little Na was, the boy shyly turned his face saying she was his classmate. Tin Kuang laughed, not expecting her little nephew already knew how to make his girlfriend happy from a young age. She then explained to the boy, those who truly like you won't bear to see you sick. If you don't believe it, ask your dad. Hearing this, little man immediately looked up at Ha Tru Da expectantly, then firmly refused to acknowledge him, although he looked like his dad, but he wasn't his dad. He was the wicked one who bullied her and her mom until they cried. Tin Kuang had to pacify him then turned to interrogate her big brother why he made Dr. Thuong cry, and let the child see it. Ha Tru Da immediately complained she hid his child from him and married another man, even pretended not to know him. Tin Kuang said to leave that mushy romantic business for later. Right now they had to get little man to drink his medicine first. The boy was still drowsy now. The child desperately wanted to meet a super cute princess. Not only wouldn't look down on him for drinking medicine but would cheer him on. Speak of the devil. Now a little girl had entered through the door, cheering little big brother to drink his medicine. Seeing Miss Dean Tran Tick, the president's daughter, Tin Kuang was surprised wondering why she was here. While Dean Tran Tick was already happily chatting with her little brother, little man asked if she wasn't grossed out by him drinking medicine. Unexpectedly, Tran Tick took out a little bunny, saying if big brother drank his medicine she'll give him this bunny. Little man still asked if she wasn't scared seeing him drink medicine would be very frightening. Little Miss Tran Tick acted up upset saying if little big brother didn't drink his medicine then she wouldn't play with him anymore, then cheerfully encouraged little man with the bunny, little man with a bit of love immediately took the juice box, closing his eyes and nose to suck vigorously, this scene disgusted Tin Kuang, obviously coaxing him for half a day wasn't as effective as the little loli's few sentences, his dad next to him also told his son to drink slower or he'll choke, right after finishing drinking, the boy demanded to immediately go play with Tran Tick. The two kids discussed playing doctor, with the bunny being the patient, then little man even bragged to his sister that his parents were both doctors, you know. This statement pained Ha Tru Da a bit. Now Tin Kuang pulled him aside asking what happened between him and Dr. Thuong. She said he took little man away. Turns out Ha Tru Da was still angry that Dr. Thuong denied her relationship with him, while the boy was his son. 
had no relation to that heartless doctor. While Tin Kuang scolded her second brother only contributed a sperm. While she had raised the child for five years already, she asked if he ever thought about a mother's feelings. Perhaps Dr. Thuong also had her own pains. But Ha True Da agitatedly said if she had problems then speak directly. Five years of no news then suddenly separating, leaving his son with another man. If she didn't love him then why keep the child? Seeing he was going a bit too far, Tin Kuang had to cover his mouth. The kids were still basically here after all. Watching the boy play happily, Ha True Da smiled. Now that he knew of his son's existence, he certainly couldn't ignore him indifferently. Tin Kuang said she had heard her sister's big tumor say a few things. Surely there were still misunderstandings between them so told them to be clear with each other. Now the ward door was also opened. Wang Dam immediately rushed towards little man as soon as she entered. Little man also turned and called mom. She now tightly embraced her son. The smart boy also consoled his crying mom. Tin Kuang told Dr. Thuong not to worry because little man was fine after drinking his medicine. The older sister thanked Tin Kuang then looked towards Ha True Da again. Both had things they wanted to say to each other. Understanding, Tin Kuang took her little guest outside to give the family some privacy. The scene now only had silence. Restraint from Ha True Da's side. Anger from the mother's, True Da exhaled then raised his hand in surrender. Admitting he was wrong to take the child. Hearing this, Thuong Dam scolded him for a while, then coldly prepared to take her son home. But True Da couldn't let his wife and child leave. He pulled her back asking if she wanted to leave without a word of explanation again. Just like when they broke up before, he asked if she wanted to run away with their child again. Dam agitatedly yelled she wasn't running away. Also didn't have to explain anything to him. It was still little man who stepped in to mediate, saying mom and the wicked one shouldn't fight anymore. His teacher said little friends who fight should hold hands. That way any misunderstandings would be resolved. True Da also opportunistically grabbed Dam's hand. She continuously struggled, silently thinking after five years she thought she could let go. But she didn't want to be forced anymore. True Da now gently softened his tone, saying each should take a step back. He also wouldn't force her to explain anymore, and asked her not to force him to let their mother and child go. He said whether she still loved him now or not. Little man was still his own blood and flesh. Now he had to take responsibility to make up for the boy. Little man turned and asked his mom if True Da was also his dad. No wonder he thought the brat looked like him. True Da immediately picked his son up, saying he was born looking like his dad and in this world only his dad was his dad. That other guy was just a foster father. Little man now also reluctantly accepted this new dad it seemed. Thuong Dam looked at this scene, then awkwardly turned her face away but True Da was certain she would give him a chance. Now Quan Kin also arrived, along with Tin Kuang greeting the president's family. Tran Tik was holding her parents' hands, seeing little big brother she happily beamed. Seeing the two happy kids, Ha True Da coaxed Dam, telling her to see their son also already found a place, even wanting to transfer to the kindergarten of his little girlfriend he liked. Asking wasn't Dam his mother, why couldn't she keep up with her son? Tin Kuang eagerly listened in, very amused, but still bid them farewell to go home with Quan Kin. Seeing her happily grinning like a cat who caught a fish, he puzzledly asked the reason. Tin Kuang happily said she was certain the misunderstanding between Ha Si A and Dr. Dam would be resolved. It was just now she felt sorry for the heartless doctor she helped raise. Quan Kin's face darkened. Clearly their misunderstanding still wasn't resolved yet she only worried about other people's business. He laughed dryly wondering if the Tan Quan Deep issue still wasn't over yet she wanted to add another heartless female doctor? Finally the reconciliation was completed. The family of three left the villa clinic together. Unexpectedly the old hen had come here, flapping her wings saying she missed her grandson. Then immediately snatched little man from his father's arms to dote on him despite the boy's discomfort. True Da had to carefully explain his son just got better again. His frail body was best left in his father's arms. The old hen happily agreed until she saw Dam and asked why this fox spirit was here, scolding him for still being involved with her. She agitatedly told her son back then Dam had extorted their family then dumped him. This time she absolutely didn't want to hand her grandson over to her. No negotiation. Ha True Da was extremely pained seriously requesting she not say such things in front of the child. The old woman still stretched her neck yelling at True Da for being bewitched, even saying she wouldn't let that vixen set foot in their house. 
clearly revealing discriminatory attitude thinking Dam now was a married woman. True Da hugged his wife and child clearly stating his standpoint that if she didn't like it they could move to an apartment downtown. Then ignored the old hen still clucking behind them. He still paid her no heed. Ignoring those curses, yelling at him so much yet he didn't care. And still clung to this vixen. They were like stepping on prejudices and shackles while walking forward. Dam unknowingly was pulled back to the happy memories from before with him. It was the cheerful youthful days together. Carefreely playing in the rain back then he had also bought a house, for them to build a new home together. Now standing before the Ha family garden, Dam was very sentimental. He urged her to stop standing blankly and follow him. Little man asked wicked dad dad, what is this place? True Da pinched his son's cheek, telling him to ask his mom, and corrected him to call him dad dad. No need to add the word wicked. The boy argued if he didn't add the word wicked how could he differentiate from foster dad dad at home. True Da then suggested the boy call him beloved precious old father. The boy gave giggled saying that was too cheesy. The father and son were chatting very happily. He then turned and told Dam to go to the supermarket to buy slippers for little man since there were only their stuff in the house. No children's items yet, by now. Wang Dam could also comfortably enjoy the happiness that belonged to her, comfortably smiling in agreement. This prolonged presidential election was finally nearing its end. Under the effect of yesterday's big move, Dai Thoi Din now had an overwhelming lead over his opponent. He really was the dark horse, just returned to the race yet his votes had exceeded 50% of the total. And tonight the election countdown began its final minutes. If there were no other incidents, the outcome was clear as day. Tin Kuang now sent a congratulatory message to the couple. At the same time she was also invited to the Dai family's intimate kin group chat. Tin Kuang didn't expect the serious Dai family to even name it this, she had to laugh. As soon as Tin Kuang entered, everyone sent welcoming messages. Sister-in-law, to reward everyone's efforts, even happily gave red envelopes. Indeed when all the red envelopes were taken out, Tin Kuang became the lucky one getting 10 fen, while the others only got 0.00 something yuan. Duong Chao immediately complained sister-in-law only gave a few mao, making her get 8 fen. KY2 opportunistically took advantage of Tin Kuang being the lucky one to beg her for a red envelope. Seeing she got 0.1 yuan but still had to be punished, Tin Kuang was very wrong about to send a red envelope but Duong Chao stopped her, saying Tin Kuang's punishment was to answer three questions. KY2 and Duong Chao were now at Coco TV station, sending Tin Kuang the first question, asking who her first kiss was with. Knowing the big tumor was also here, Tin Kuang feared losing face. Thinking this was like the big dare, she chose big dare. But Duong Chao said no way, forcing Tin Kuang to answer quickly. Tin Kuang blushed saying it was a teenage boy. Duong Chao jumped up seeing Tin Kuang's first kiss belonged to someone else, even wanting to take the brothers to deal with that brat. The second question was whether that teenage boy was rich and handsome like brother Kin. Did he have a good family, who took initiative? Seeing the second question had so many parts, Tin Kuang objected. But Duong Chao insisted this was called an introductory question, then encouraged her that brother Kin wasn't online now. He didn't have the habit of browsing his phone, even promising to delete the message history after one minute, so he wouldn't know, knowing this. Tin Kuang answered, the first kiss was Tan Quan Deep, no family background whatsoever, worked at garment factories, convenient repairs, electronics workshops, even a shipper. It was her who took initiative. After sending this, KY2 and Duong Chao immediately looked back greenly at brother Kin. He didn't know when he had taken out his phone, now grinding his teeth furiously. Again Tan Quan Deep, but in his head he clearly remembered that memory. It was him in his youth, telling that little mermaid to hide behind the rock while he went to lead away the bad guys. After hearing him say he would protect her, Tin Kuang immediately took initiative to kiss him. Now remembering it, Quan Kin still blushed. Duong Chao then insisted Quan Deep was very handsome demanding his photo. After it was sent up, they immediately ogled it. Now KY2 suddenly felt this person was familiar. He excitedly slammed the table hard startling Duong Chao who scolded KY2 three more minutes until the election ended yet he was already flipping out. While KY2 was certain this face. Back then the deputy made up spending half a day on it. Little Tin Kuang's first kiss was actually from the Kin family. Now it made sense why Tin Kuang only took one month to catch Quan Kin. Turned out they had known each other for a long time already. But KY2 still wondered why he was so gravely injured back then. Could it be related to Tin Kuang? Now Tin Kuang received a private message from KY2, asking how she met Tan Quan Deep, and what else happened with him. But Tin Kuang didn't want to play anymore, 
turning off her phone saying she wanted to sleep. Now Duong Chao turned to tell KY2 the countdown was about to start. All of Day's family tensely looked up at the screen. Finally Thoi Din officially became the 28th incumbent president. This was the fruit of the entire crew's efforts. Dai Quan Kin also happily smiled for his brother. Then they were busy again, some making feature stories, others notifying the press for media outlets. By 3 a.m., they left the company like zombies. The deputy returned home. Tossing and turning in bed still thinking about the photo Tin Kuang sent in the group chat. It looked familiar, while KY2 set an alarm, reminding himself to ask Tin Kuang tomorrow where Brother Kin's illness came from. Who knows if he managed to set the alarm before immediately passing out. The next morning, Tin Kuang had just opened her eyes to see Quan Kin, dazedly asking why he came home. Your brother won, didn't he? Aren't you busy? Why free to come here? Quan Kin replied he came home to see the unscrupulous her. Tin Kuang argued her conscience was very big. She still remembered today was the 157th that she had to burn paper for her benefactor. Quan Kin immediately pulled Tin Kuang's hand back, pressing her down, still burning paper. That guy was your life-saving benefactor? You keep endlessly burning paper for that guy. Doesn't he feel guilty receiving it? The two stared into each other's eyes. Tin Kuang could hear her heart thumping loudly in her chest, her cheeks also burning hot, finally it had to come out. She lifted her leg to kick Quan Kin away. Hey don't spout that weird yin yang stuff, okay? Then scolded Quan Kin. If you have nothing to do hurry and visit her dad. After all he really misses his son-in-law. Quan Kin unwillingly. Felt out of favor. Could only silently curse that wretched Tan Quan Deep. Then Tin Kuang went out to buy offerings. Telling him to obediently stay home and care for dad. He could only helplessly sigh. While KY2 after waking up immediately rushed to find little Tin Kuang. But arriving only saw sullen brother Kin standing there. KY2 laughingly teased asking who made him angry. Quan Kin still coldly asked asked what his little brother came here for. KY2 said he simply wanted to ask a bit. Ten years ago what happened between little Tin Kuang and him out at sea. Because he saw brother didn't say so he could only ask the other party involved. Then babbled praising brother Kin's righteousness. Clearly he had known Tin Kuang for ten years already. Even stole her first kiss yet didn't let anyone know. KY2 said yesterday little Tin Kuang sent a photo of Tan Kuan deep to the group chat. As soon as he saw that photo he recognized it was brother after changing his looks. Hearing this. Quan Kin was extremely shocked telling KY2 to explain clearly. Now KY2 asked wasn't Quan Kin unaware Tan Quan Deep was him after disguising himself? Seeing he was still stunned, he recounted 10 years ago. Brother had an accident at sea, they searched but couldn't find him. Later contacting the deputy, they found out he had disguised brother as someone else. Seeing the photo last night, it was certainly Quan Kin after changing his looks. Quan Kin now could only click his tongue, clutching his head. KY2 immediately said he would now call the deputy to prove his words were true. And Fence sittingly said don't get mad at him. Now KY2 turned on the speaker to call the deputy. Asking if he remembered the photo little Tin Kuang sent yesterday was the spitting image of brother Kin's face after changing his looks 10 years ago. The deputy who was sleeping heard this and sat up, saying no wonder why the name Tan Kuan Deep sounded so familiar. That photo also felt like he had seen it somewhere before. Turned out that was it. He felt it really was a coincidence. He had disguised Quan Kin's looks into little Tin Kuang's first love. Seeing the deputy react so slowly, Quan Kin silently refuted in his head. What disguising his looks into the little mermaid's first love? The little mermaid's first love was him. Kin now spoke up questioning why he didn't know about this all this time. They could only explain they didn't dare say it afraid of incurring punishment from the foster parents. Afterwards KY2 also asked brother not to blame the deputy. After all he meant well. Afraid he would expose himself and get recognized. As soon as KY2 finished saying this, he got dragged away by the big brother. As a good brother, he still texted the deputy, reminding him to quickly escape or brother Kin would get revenge. Escape to somewhere with both desert and primitive tribes without cell signal so he couldn't find him. Now Tin Kuang had just returned to the villa. Seeing her parents, brother Kin, and KY2 here she was very curious. Mom now replied Dai Quan Kin said to wait for Tin Kuang to come home. He had something he wanted to explain to everyone. Tin Kuang sat down, seeing everyone so serious. She was confused. Now Quan Kin spoke to the parents. It wasn't that he had deliberately stomped on Tin Kuang's offerings before, nor deliberately obstructed her worship, but because the brat who saved Tin Kuang ten years ago didn't die. Hearing this, the two elders were extremely shocked. He cried and laughed saying burning incense for someone still alive really wasn't right so he obstructed it. Bok Lan Go was confused. 
Asking if he wasn't dead then where was Tan Quan deep now? Quan Kin now cleared his throat, saying he was right before everyone. Unexpectedly after saying that, Tin Kuang's parents both looked at KY2. KY2 immediately had to deny, saying auntie and uncle absolutely don't misunderstand, that guy was him. But brother Kin, hearing this, Bok Lan Go looked at Dai Quan Kin in shock. Now KY2 also had to fulfill his responsibility in proving the truth. He concluded very enthusiastically, auntie and uncle also listened very sincerely. Auntie seemed to somewhat believe while uncle demanded evidence. Quan Kin looked at Tin Kuang. He affirmed he could tell every experience he went through with Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang now truly believed, immediately jumping to hug him, scolding him for only appearing now. Did he know how long she had waited for him? Scolding him for only appearing now. Quan Kin kissed his girlfriend's forehead, apologizing because he had also just found out. Tin Kuang's eyes brimmed with tears, still so extremely stunned. Really you? Quan Kin grasped Tin Kuang's hand, affirming it was precisely him. The three light bulbs now also distanced themselves, voiding getting in the way. Dai Quan Kin gazed deeply into his beloved's eyes. From before until now it had always been him, never anyone else, while Tin Kuang felt everything was still like a dream. He raised his hand to wipe Tin Kuang's tears, saying the one who saved her was clearly him yet she only remembered Tan Quan deep. How could he not be angry? then immediately turned villainous demanding compensation from her, and was about to devour those plump lips. When Tin Kuang's phone rang, cutting off his wicked thoughts, the caller was Yen En, Tin Kuang's close friend. Seeing Yen En calling, Tin Kuang felt both happy and surprised. She didn't expect her friend to have her number. She thought last time she went to the island looking for Yen En but didn't see her. Surely Granny gave her number to her. But to Yen En, those things didn't matter. The important thing was my queen. What are you doing? You're in love now? Hearing this Tin Kuang was shocked, asking how she knew. Turned out Tin Kuang's relationship was linked to the entire kingdom. Tin Kuang's mood was synchronized with the entire kingdom. That was because Tin Kuang was the appointed successor. The sacred tree had long acknowledged her as master. It said last night the entire kingdom went through a turbulent emotional roller coaster. The 30-year-old sacred tree that never bloomed suddenly. Bloomed flowers all over. The elders were all dying of anger. Because after all if Tin Kuang fell for someone else then how could she marry the heir of the vampire clan? While Tin Kuang was still stunned not expecting her heart to make the tree bloom. She then asked Yen and why when she loved someone else before. It didn't bloom. Yen and didn't even see Tin Kuang dating. Tin Kuang said that was a year ago. They broke up two months ago. Yen and said during that time they didn't feel her love. Hearing this Tin Kuang breathed a sigh of relief thinking the tree wasn't effective. It couldn't be linked to Tin Kuang's relationships. Yen and was silent, then said that could only prove the previous person wasn't her true love. Tin Kuang was quiet for a bit, then her cheeks flushed red seeing Yen and was right. Yen and said the reason she called Tin Kuang was to warn her because the elders would absolutely not let her love anyone one else besides the vampire clan's heir, and advised Tin Kuang not to get discouraged or the entire kingdom would be affected. Not all moods could be felt, only Tin Kuang's fluctuating moods of love, or extreme joy or sadness, they would feel together. Hearing this, Quan Kin deliberately teased Tin Kuang more. She immediately flusteredly told Yen and she'd call back later. Quan Kin still whined that she had gone to talk on the phone with someone else before compensating him. Tin Kuang raised her hand to pat that whiny puppy's head. Consolingly, Dai Quan Kin took it further crying to make her pay for daring to let him drift outside her heart. He was so pitiful, and asked if she didn't plan to compensate him. Tin Kuang scolded him for changing his looks yet still giving her his last name, then grabbed his collar asking what intentions he had for naming her that. Quan Kin lifted Tin Kuang's chin, smiling, my woman, of course she had to take his last name, you say whether this was proper thoughts or not, then hugged her into his arms causing Tin Kuang to anxiously worry about letting the entire kingdom feel her giddy mood again. But Tin Kuang didn't worry that much. If it happened then let it happen. Now she really wanted to give the marriage bureau a certificate of merit. For her to turn around and immediately get her benefactor. She was determined to excellently contribute to increasing the country's population. After a bout, when Tin Kuang woke up, next to her was empty. She happily smiled then went downstairs. Mom had finished making breakfast, telling Tin Kuang to hurry and eat. Father now asked her to confirm the lifesaver from years ago was Dai Quan Kin right? Tin Kuang very happily said she was fortunate. Her hand even spun her benefactor. The parents were also happy the rock in everyone's heart had been lifted. Now they didn't need to think about the past anymore. This was indeed a fate the country had given. Parents told Tin Kuang to remember to cherish it. 
Tin Kuang recalled her ex, feeling she had to thank him, but now her fish brain just remembered she had blocked him already. So she entered the alumni group chat, tagging T. Doan thanking him for not marrying her. Thinking for a bit she also tagged Luke and Anne to congratulate the two on their wedding bliss. A hundred years of happiness, right after sending. The other members immediately viewed it, unanimously praising Tin Kuang's luck. Now she could become the president's sister-in-law, truly befitting the name Little Mermaid. With that done Tin Kuang decided to leave the group. Tinkering a bit she decided to change Quan Kin's nickname in their chat box. Seeing calling him Big Tumor was still a bit simple. She changed it to Big Tumor that swallows fish bones and all. This little joy of Tin Kuang's made her laugh brightly not noticing her parents also sitting eating breakfast together. Turned out they were talking about how it had been so long yet they didn't see Tin Kuang's in-laws come visit, asking what arrangements they planned. Tin Kuang said her in-laws had long wanted to visit her at the hospital but she declined. She wanted to wait until dad's health stabilized before meeting. Old dad immediately flexed saying he was very healthy now, telling his daughter to quickly discuss with her son-in-law, taking advantage of them still being in the capital to quickly set a wedding date. Tin Kuang felt this was a bit rushed but from her parents' standpoint, she had lived there for so long already. If she didn't want to marry yet then just get engaged first then slowly prepare the wedding later. Tin Kuang could only indulge her parents, saying she'd text Quan Kin about this. Mom even told her for this matter the man should take initiative, otherwise the woman would lose face. In Tin Kuang's heart she actually already wanted to text the big tumor asking what he was doing. It was just she still didn't have a reason, now she could righteously text him. She felt very happy, at the office building. Quan Kin was working when a message notification chime sounded. Quan Kin immediately sent her a voice message, saying to sleep more during the day so she could stay up with him at night. Not expecting this, Tin Kuang turned up the speaker to listen. Her parents could only pretend not to hear anything. But Tin Kuang wasn't any less embarrassed because of it. Feeling so mortified she wanted to just die. Dai Quan Kin also announced everything with his family was resolved so they would probably visit Tin Kuang's parents at the hospital. Seeing Tin Kuang extremely excited hearing this, he guessed she probably knew her parents' intentions. To set a marriage agreement between them which was why she was so agitated. He smiled gently then told Tin Kuang the wedding couldn't be delayed. That was his parents' intentions, after all one should marry upon engagement. Tin Kuang also strongly agreed on this matter. She silently praised her wise in laws, not letting anyone take advantage of this opportunity, especially Han Nian Nian and that hidden vampire heir. Then she reminded Big Tumor to arrange time with his parents, because her parents were still resting at the villa, not going anywhere. Quan Kin immediately set it for tomorrow, but he had a business trip tomorrow. He couldn't go with his parents. Hearing it was a three-day business trip Tin Kuang was very shocked. When she heard him gently ask if she needed any gifts, Tin Kuang recalled the city he was going to had a very delicious sweet and sour radish. She demanded two jars from him as gifts. Hearing this, Quan Kin silently felt this was truly the lowest maintenance mermaid in history. At the villa, Tin Kuang's mother had busily cleaned up the whole morning, very impatiently awaiting the in-laws. She went out to throw the trash and coincidentally heard. Dai Quan Kin's mother and the newly elected president Dai Thoi Din's family were also coming. Seeing Tin Kuang's mother, Quan Kin's mother also looked shocked. In her head she panicked, Lan Go. Turned out to be Bok Lan Go. After finishing throwing the trash Tin Kuang's mother didn't notice the people behind her and turned to go back inside. Now Quan Kin's mother made an excuse, telling her husband Dai Bok Tu she felt the outfit she had on didn't suit her. She wanted to go home and change, telling everyone to go meet the in-laws first. Dai Bok Tu felt confused, about to advise his wife to just go meet the in-laws first but his face immediately stiffened seeing Song True Koi heading out, so he followed his wife back to the car, making up some unbelievable excuses to rush home leaving the newlywed president and his wife standing there not understanding anything. Dai Thoi Din said to his mother their outfits today looked very nice too. Why change? But Bok Lan Go insisted meeting the in-laws couldn't be careless. So she went ahead first, telling her son and daughter-in-law to meet the in-laws in their stead. Dai Bok Tu also mumbled following his wife, insisting on going home immediately. The Dai Thoi Din couple could only look at each other then went inside, sitting before Tin Kuang's parents. After asking about Song Truyan Koi's health, Thoi Din could only explain his parents had something come up so they couldn't come. Chatting for a bit, Tin Kuang's dad immediately asked Thoi Din if his parents planned to come today after taking care of things over there. Thoi Din and Go Keen were silent. They silently looked at each other, 
of course these two also really wanted to know. Now, Quan Kin's mother was anxiously calling her son to ask if Tin Kuang's mother's name was Bok Lan Go. Quan Kin replied not wrong, and asked if his parents had arrived there yet. He wanted them today to smoothly settle the engagement, then he could propose afterwards. But now his mother fell silent, then said they should discuss the engagement again. Quan Kin was shocked by his mother's words. He turned to tell Ki U Van his right eye was twitching a bit. Ki U Van explained to him that a twitching right eye meant impending misfortune. He was even more worried saying to his mother that he was also in a hurry, and asked wasn't she very fond of Tin Kuang, wanting to hold a grandchild or something, she was silent, not answering, her heart very complicated, she did want that but hesitantly wondered how such a coincidence could happen in this world, and she told her son to just hire someone to pretend to be his mother to go meet them, hearing this, Quan Kin of course felt baffled, then he said to explain to Tin Kuang that it wasn't that she disliked her, then made an excuse about expensive phone bills and hung up, Quan Kin was extremely confused so decided to call dad to ask, as soon as he picked up, Dai Bok Tu asked if Tin Kuang's father was named Song Truyan Koi. Wasn't Tin Kuang's last name Dai? Quan Kin was also at a loss for words. After hearing his son say she was adopted, Dai Bok Tu's expression didn't get any more comfortable. Quan Kin then asked Dad to go and discuss the engagement, but old Dad still made up a bunch of excuses not to meet, concluding the engagement should be slowly reconsidered. Quan Kin felt they definitely didn't like Tin Kuang, not wanting him to marry but old Dad strongly denied that. Finally he used his phone battery dying as an excuse to disappear. This attitude from his parents made it very difficult for their son to understand. If it wasn't disliking Tin Kuang then what was the reason? Now the dejected Tin Kuang also called, asking if his parents disliked her. Quan Kin affirmed that was not it. He now felt maybe the in-laws saw her as unworthy of him. Basically Quan Kin felt those also weren't possible. Tin Kuang had saved his brother before. She had also saved his parents. Where was she unworthy of him? Hearing this, Tin Kuang also felt less worried. She wiped her tears, smiling reminding him to buy her the sweet and sour radish. Then asked what he was busy with over there this time. Turned out this time he went to negotiate acquiring myopia treatment medicine. The other party specifically named the chief financial officer of Dai T Group to negotiate. His hand right now was also an introductory brochure for Little Mermaid myopia treatment products, with exclusive rights belonging to Muk A Ku Tu. Hearing it was negotiating only with the CFO, Tin Kuang thought this was big talk. He also coincidentally said the concealment mask this time was Little Mermaid's signature. Then said when he arrived there already, he'd call her back after the meeting ended. Hearing Little Mermaid's signature, she felt it was familiar again. She immediately searched on Weibo. At first glance she wondered why shops were so flashy nowadays. But after seeing this product was Muk A Kuthu's, with her stupid name clearly on it, Tin Kuang panicked. She, when did Muk A Ku Tu take over myopia treatment? Why didn't she know about this? Of course it wasn't difficult for Tin Kuang to guess the mastermind of this. She angrily grabbed her phone. Hello Yenin right? Yenin had just picked up saying she was busy. She'd call back later. Tin Kuang immediately erupted asking why Yenin dared sell her emblem to others. Hearing she was caught, Yenin could only praise Tin Kuang's swiftness. Then she told Tin Kuang she was currently negotiating the contract. She'd call her back when done. Over the phone. Tin Kuang still suspiciously felt like she heard the breathing of her big tumor. She was astounded thinking she had fallen into love's trap so now always thought of him. Then sternly asked Yen and who her partner was. This couldn't be careless. Yen and looked at Quan Kin, women indeed. Then informed Tin Kuang her partner was a handsome guy. Hearing this, Tin Kuang thought that guy was probably like her guy at home, telling Yen and to negotiate this contract well. To not suffer losses, Tin Kuang even told Yen and to take eight portions, leave them just two, then bring it back to split six for herself, four for Yen and, saying don't think you can use my fame to profit without giving me a cent. Yen and hung up then asked Quan Kin how the contract negotiation went, didn't expect Yen and to be greedier than Tin Kuang, demanding nine portions for herself, one for him, no negotiation. Basically Quan Kin couldn't agree, because Yen An's side only provided the medicine formulation. Everything else was done by his side. 64 was his final condition. Yen An said then they had nothing more to discuss and saw Quan Kin out, kicking him right out without even seeing him off. He had just gone out when Lam Han Fong mocked him, even coming to tell him she demanded 73 from him. He'd never seen such a difficult woman before. 
Quan Kin saw that when splitting with him it was 73 to him becoming 91 and felt very confused. Now Han Fong winked at Quan Kin, telling him to use his pretty boy tactics to win over Yen An, but Quan Kin coldly walked straight on. The reason just those three words, buying radish. In the end that CFO stuck to Quan Kin all the way to the market, didn't expect saying buying radish meant actually buying it. Han Fong even thought this was the secret to becoming Dai Ti's president. Seeing he had found the exact radish his little mermaid missed day and night, Quan Kin was very happy. So he immediately bought four jars to bring back for Tin Kuang. Hearing his accent, the friendly shop owner guessed he was from out of town, then immediately gave him a 10% discount. Quan Kin was also very happy saying he was buying it for his wife. She really liked this. Hearing that, the vegetable seller congratulated Quan Kin on becoming a father soon. Because in her experience, many pregnant women especially had people come here to buy sweet and sour radish. Hearing his little fate was pregnant, Lam Han Fong was extremely shocked. After Quan Kin finished buying, he buddy buddied with him, silently praising Quan Kin for keeping it quiet, demanding he treat them to drinks tonight. Quan Kin didn't think much and agreed. That night, besides Lam Han Fong and Quan Kin there was another CFO, Luke Qian Win's younger brother. They all had the same goal of doing business with Yen An. Luke Nhi Thu now was still very confident, feeling this was just a normal acquisition. Nothing to be anxious about but Lam Han Fong was very impatient, because he knew once this medicine was announced, it would make a huge splash. Luke Nhi Thu's competitive spirit was provoked to compete to see who could partner with the other side. He immediately demanded to bet against Quan Kin. Basically he felt their game of competing for president had ended. So next it was his and Quan Kin's turn to compete. Faced with this brash proposal, Quan Kin only replied he wasn't interested. He thought Quan Kin didn't dare. Continuously provoking him, in his heart he still resented the Han Nian Nian matter. The woman he pursued yet Quan Kin chose jail over accepting. Now Quan Kin smiled asking what he wanted to bet. Luke Nhi Thu wanted all the rights to Little Mermaid theme park if he won, saying if Quan Kin got the contract he could ask for anything. Seeing him stay silent, he continued provoking, saying the blessings of Mermaid Miss Dai Rin Kuang couldn't guarantee him any support. Quan Kin finally couldn't stand it when he brought up his Tin Kuang. His condition was, if he won, every time Luke Nhi Thu met his woman, he had to directly kneel and call him dad. Asking in the glory of protagonist Quan Kin, he smugly told Luke Nhi Thu not to forget this bet. Sitting watching this drama, Lam Han Fong felt very amused. He knew Kin Bro was openly protecting his wife. So later wouldn't Luke Han Sam have to call him Mother Kin? So Lam Han Fong stood up to witness. If Yen and collaborated with others then forget it. If not then play like this. Luke Han Sam was very irritated only determined to win this. Hin Kuang was hanging laundry when she got a call from Lam Han Fong. He excitedly congratulated her heaven dictated fate for getting pregnant so quickly. Seeing Tin Kuang dazed, Lam Han Fong still thought she was pretending. He said he had seen Quan Kin buy pickled radishes for her already, saying she was picky, only liking the radishes from that shop. Quan Kin basically only cared about the detail of Big Tumor going to market himself, making her feel happiness filling her heart. Then she asked if his destiny was also at City R. Lam Han Fong said he and brother Kin were competing for the rights to partner on myopia patches there. Hearing this, Tin Kuang immediately asked what company it was exactly. Lam Han Fong replied it was Little Mermaid, and told about the bet between Quan Kin and Lu Han Sam. He said Mr. Kin didn't originally agree, but the result was if he won then every time time Luke Han Sam saw Tin Kuang he had to kneel and call him dad. Lam Han Fong said it was because Luke Thu mentioned her so he reacted that way. This time the bulls were fighting and the patch selling woman would certainly strike it rich. Tin Kuang thanked Lam Han Fong for letting her know. Then said she had something to do and hung up. After getting Tin Kuang's call, Yen An reported earlier two scammers had called. The first claimed to be Luke Group's secretary, saying no matter the price Dai T offered, he would offer 10 times higher. Tin Kuang immediately jumped up saying it was a scam. Don't listen. Tin Kuang told Yen and not to decide anything yet. Wait until she went to City R to find her first. Tin Kuang said she had to go there to support her man. Yen and said there were others beside her, asking if Tin Kuang wasn't afraid of exposing her identity. Tin Kuang was indeed a little scared, so she had thought of a way. On the plane to City R, Tin Kuang relied on the skills of Vice Officer Shen Di Dung. After finishing Tin Kuang's makeover, he praised himself profusely, certain no one would be able to recognize her. Looking at this skill, 
Tin Kuang had to admit it wasn't bad. The vice officer excitedly said with this face meeting Quan Kin, he wouldn't notice either. This gave Tin Kuang an idea, asking the vice officer if at midnight she knocked on his room door. Would he open? The vice officer's smile gradually froze. He knew he had foolishly ignited a prank that could easily damage Tin Kuang's feelings, so he dissuaded her, affirming that no matter how many people wanted to get into Brother Kin's bed, he never paid them any attention. Tin Kuang angrily slammed the table, thinking when he went on business trips, women were often forced on him. To protect his boss, the vice officer challenged Tin Kuang to go test it if she didn't believe it. Tin Kuang sinisterly smiled, then chose a seductive red dress. If testing then test thoroughly, this time the vice officer could only secretly pray Brother Kin would surely pass this test. That night, at the hotel, Quan Kin had just showered when someone knocked on the door. He thought it was Tiu Van finished preparing documents for him so he opened it. Didn't expect Tin Kuang disguised threw herself into his arms. Her expression and attitude very flirtatious. Mister, do you need someone by your side tonight? While he was completely dumbstruck, unable to react in time, the vice officer, after disguising himself, had to go along with it, introducing this young lady as a gift from Lam Han Fong. Quan Kin was confused, in his heart unable to understand why he kept smelling his little mermaid scent on this woman. Tin Kuang spoke resentfully, petulantly saying if she didn't perform well tonight Lam Han Fong would fire her, and leaned into Quan Kin's body demanding he accept her. Her fingers slid over his body, saying she knew her place. Once done she'd leave immediately. Seeing his ancestor go this far, the vice officer was dumbfounded. He still wondered why Quan Kin hadn't thrown her out yet and kept staring. As for Quan Kin, after observing for a while he recognized the hickey he left on Tin Kuang yesterday. Sure enough it was that little mischief. He hugged her tightly, thanking Lam Han Fong, saying he accepted this gift. The door slammed shut in front of the vice officer. The vice officer's mind was in chaos, silently screaming this wasn't right. Done for, completely done for. Just as the vice officer was still in turmoil, he was startled hearing Kiu Van's voice calling. Vice officer, how come you're here already, inside the room? Quan Kin was still carrying that little mischief. Seeing this result, Tin Kuang was extremely angry. Clearly he said he didn't get close with women yet he carried some strange little girl onto his bed. Too upset, she pushed him away, scolding him for being shameless. Quan Kin smiled asking where exactly was he shameless. Didn't she offer herself to him? Tin Kuang cried from anger, saying she regretted it, she wouldn't stay with him anymore. Quan Kin didn't want to tease her anymore and pulled her back, asking if she had deliberately come from the capital just to not sleep tonight. Tin Kuang was stunned asking how he knew it was her. Quan Kin smiled, saying heaven and earth. In the end she worked herself into a bellyful of resentment, that mermaid miss. Seeing Tin Kuang excitedly ask how he still recognized her like this. Quan Kin just pointed to the hickey he left last night. She pretended she wasn't angry at all, saying it was because the vice officer said he wouldn't recognize her so she tested it. Hearing this, Quan Kin asked if the vice officer was here already. Tin Kuang was extremely surprised he didn't notice. When he asked where the vice officer was, she pointed outside saying he was over there. On this side, Kiu Van and the vice officer were chatting, still wondering how Kiu Van recognized him. Looking again at Kiu Van's six-pack abs and slender physique, the vice officer thought incredible, Kiu Van said that wasn't important. The important thing was why the vice officer came to City R. The vice officer had no choice but to tell Kiu Van about his predicament, even demanding Kiu Van use his martial arts to break down the door, to stop Brother Kin from doing anything rash. But Kiu Van didn't just have a good body, he was also smart. He told the vice officer Brother Kin had already recognized the young lady. The vice officer was extremely surprised hearing this. Kiu Van could guarantee with Brother Kin's personality, if he hadn't recognized Tin Kuang then he definitely wouldn't let a strange woman into his room. So tonight the vice officer could rest assured sleeping over in Kiu Van's room. Luke Han Sam now called Quan Kin, saying he had prepared all the contracts for Quan Kin to transfer Little Mermaid theme park to him already. The hotel bar at 3 a.m., he was waiting for Quan Kin's signature. Quan Kin admired how he had gotten the contract and immediately frowned. Luke Han Sam only gave him 10 minutes to get there now. Seeing his expression, Tin Kuang knew he must have run into trouble. Quan Kin stood up saying she should go home, shower, and wash off that unpleasant face, while he went to resolve things. But Tin Kuang refused and clung on insisting on following. No matter how Quan Kin coaxed her, she still clung onto his belt loops, refusing to let go out of options. He had no choice but to bring her along to the bar. Seeing him bring an unfamiliar girl, 
Lam Han Fong was very unhappy. No wonder he lost to Luke Nhi Thu. Turns out he was wasting time on women. Quan Kin didn't care, only asking Tin Kuang what she wanted to drink. Tin Kuang smiled saying she would play on her phone while he did his work. Looking at Yen and sipping her drink while looking at her, Tin Kuang silently scolded Rotten Yen In. To actually block her, Tin Kuang immediately texted Yen In. Questioning didn't they agree Yen In wouldn't partner with anyone before Tin Kuang arrived? Why choose Luke group? Yen and texted back that Lu Khan Sam had offered too good of conditions. This time she'd certainly strike it rich overnight. Tin Kuang asked if she knew how Dai Quan Kin treated her. Tin Kuang furiously typed, he's my man. You not only made things difficult for my man but even helped his rival. Friendship over, block. Reading your texts was shocking enough. Then seeing that blonde glaring at her. Yen and panicked even more. She fawned texting Tin Kuang. Asking if she was little Jew. Tin Kuang used her eyes to intimidate, correcting it was her, seeing it really was her little Jew. Yen An was extremely frightened, didn't expect that girl had disguised herself and appeared here. Tin Kuang also furiously typed forcing Yen An to partner with Dai Ti. From threats of ending their friendship to begging for free signing rights, even demanding Yen An sign a 50-50 contract. After pressuring Yen An, Tin Kuang nestled into Quan Kin's arm signaling her friend to choose this place. Yen An was truly helpless against this damned girl. Now, Lu Khan Sam had coughed a few times already then said today he had invited everyone to announce that he and Yen An had reached a cooperation agreement. He turned to mock Quan Kin, then forced him to sign the transfer contract for Little Mermaid theme park. After saying this, the whole atmosphere became silent. Before Quan Kin could speak, Tin Kuang said Lu Khan Sam's words were a little premature. She sarcastic Drastically smiled, saying he hadn't signed any contract yet. Lu Khan Sam now got angry, telling Quan Kin the woman he brought really didn't understand the rules. Quan Kin hugged Tin Kuang affectionately and twisted his words back at him. Right, how did I not notice she doesn't understand the rules? Now Lam Han Fong also acted tired, urging them to hurry up so he could go home and sleep. Then asked Yen and why she chose Luke Group. Yen and lazily replied now. Who said I chose Luke Group? This immediately made Lam Han Fong jump up. Lam Han Fong laughed happily asking Miss Yen hadn't chosen yet so why was Luke Han Sam so excited? Han Sam now also frowned saying Yen and was joking too much. Yen and said she wasn't joking, then told Dai Quan Kin they could sign the contract now. Luke Han Sam erupted, saying he could give her benefits twice as much as Dai T's, telling her to change her mind while there was still time. Yen and now glanced at Miss Dai Tin Kuang then said she had decided. Dai T hadn't offered her any attractive conditions. She only felt more optimistic towards Dai T group. She said she believed only Dai T could promote this product and benefit society. Then immediately reached out her hand inviting Mr. Dai Quan Kin to sign a 50-50 contract. Quan Kin immediately shook hands agreeing. Hearing 50-50 split, Lam Han Sam jumped up, saying he suspected Quan Kin had used unfair competitive tactics, because no one here couldn't offer a higher price. Now Tin Kuang hugged his arm, saying this was certainly due to the mermaid's blessings. Quan Kin was also very smug saying the country had given him a lucky little star so his life would surely go smoothly. Then called Luke Han Sam's son and thanked him. Thank you son Luke. Hearing these words Lam Han Fong laughed until tears came out. This was basically the funny scene he had wanted to see from the start. He immediately raised his hand saying he was witness that from now on if Han Sam was impolite to the mermaid miss he had to remember to kneel and call him dad. The embarrassed Han Sam immediately ran off. Tin Kuang only regretted that since she was in disguise today she couldn't hear him call her dad. The other two CFOs now stared blankly at each other, not knowing what to say. In the end they could only raise their glasses congratulating Quan Kin. After they had all left, Quan Kin asked Tin Kuang what on earth had happened. Tin Kuang still pretended ignorance, not knowing anything. As for the vice officer, with his clown face, he now happily brought the contract over, seeing Yen An's dejected manner. Before signing he still asked if she had thought it through carefully. Yen An of course couldn't turn back now. She said later her side would provide the formula and raw materials, while his side handled production, sales, promotion. After signing Yen and immediately left, before leaving she turned back to glance at Tin Kuang once. Tin Kuang on the other hand was very happy. Then she texted encouraging Yen An, saying with the 50-50 split she certainly wouldn't lose out. Seeing her text so happily, he affectionately pinched her cheek asking how Tin Kuang knew her. 
Tin Kuang denied it, then hugged him praising how capable he was. So many people competed with higher prices yet he still won. This slightly stupid action of hers was what made Quan Kin freeze up while the vice officer's eyes were wide open in shock. What the heck granny? Finally Tin Kuang successfully removed the disguise makeup. As Quan Kin dried her hair for her, he said his parents had something sudden come up today so they couldn't make it. Tin Kuang said her dad had asked her several times already. Finally if his parents liked her or not. Tin Kuang also thought his parents probably really didn't want to get engaged. This period she hadn't behaved well making the two dissatisfied. Quan Kin immediately playfully rubbed her head with the towel, saying not to talk nonsense, his parents were truly busy with work in the capital today. If so then Tin Kuang decided to wait until next week. And then her parents would also be discharged from the hospital. They would book a table at the restaurant for the parents to eat together. After her parents' discharge they would return to the island so meeting again would also be inconvenient. Convenient. Quan Kin suggested her parents later stay and live in the capital. Because her dad's illness required dialysis every three to five days which was inconvenient out on the island. Moreover, the capital was also convenient for arranging a kidney transplant. So there would be no need for daily dialysis. Now Tin Kuang beamed leaning into Quan Kin's arms saying his family had more resources. Finding a replacement kidney would be better. Otherwise she could only wait for Dr. Bai Nian to successfully research artificial kidneys. Also not knowing how much longer to wait. At this moment, right after she finished speaking, Tin Kuang received a call from Dr. Bai. He asked about her father's health recently. After finding out her father Tin Kuang's health had improved a lot, he announced that if her father agreed, he would help him get an artificial kidney transplant here. Hearing the artificial kidney research was successful, Tin Kuang was extremely happy. They then made an appointment to meet three days later. Tin Kuang still immersed in joy hugged Dai Quan Kin crying. Three days later, after getting Tin Kuang's father Tin Choi and Koi's consent, Dr. Bai decided to start discussing the surgery details. Tin Kuang's family was extremely happy hugging each other congratulating her dad. Now, Dr. Bai gave them a profile of Dr. Li Du. Magician hands. He had called Dr. Bai himself and hoped to be the lead surgeon for Mr. Tin. Tin Kuang felt the name Li Du was familiar. But Dr. Bai affirmed Dr. Li Du's surgery would be safer than his own. For this surgery he would assist Dr. Li Du. He had just said Dr. Li Du would arrive shortly when a young man opened the door and walked in. Walking arrogantly as if lacking sleep. That young man indeed just came in and immediately laid down to sleep. Not paying attention to anyone. Dr. Bai now laughed awkwardly introducing this person was Li Du. Although young, looking like he was always dozing off and nodding, but his hands were recognized as the peak of magical hands in the medical community. Tin Kuang now approached the bedside, asking Dr. Li Du to cure her father's illness but surprisingly the doctor told her he wasn't a doctor, and told her to call him brother. Then Li Du took off his glasses. This face stunned Tin Kuang. Even her parents were shocked crying out little Du together. Dr. Bai asked if they knew each other. Tin Kuang explained he was the son of their neighbor Uncle Li. She grew up with him. Later he had an argument with Uncle Li and left home. Hadn't seen each other for a long time. Tin Kuang stepped forward nosily asking since when he became a doctor. But Li Du basically just wanted to sleep. After telling her not to make noise he turned to continue sleeping. Seeing everyone knew each other. Dr. Bai said he wouldn't bother them anymore. He said for now before the surgery he would arrange a health checkup for Mr. Tin. Confirm his physical condition then schedule the surgery time. Tin Kuang had just seen Dr. Bai off when she happened to run into Quan Kin walking in. She immediately hugged him happily telling him good news that her dad could really get the surgery now. The two played like calves for a bit before Tin Kuang led him to meet a new doctor, saying this person was also acquainted with her. Quan Kin was happy at first but when he saw Li Du's face it immediately darkened. Now Tin Kuang introduced Li Du as her neighbor when she was little and also an incredibly talented doctor. But right after entering he laid down and slept on the sofa like a pig. Quan Kin immediately kicked him once. Quan Kin of course recognized this guy. This was love rival number one who once snatched his little mermaid from his hands. In their past life he had heard they later registered to marry. Seeing this guy, he felt uncertain. Even thinking of eliminating the threat first. Seeing his unpleasant expression Tin Kuang came over asking if he didn't feel well. If there was something wrong with his body? Hearing Quan Kin say he didn't feel well. 
she wanted to take him to rest, but now Li Du had woken up saying if anyone wasn't feeling well he could examine them. Tin Kuang could only awkwardly smile saying this illness he wouldn't be able to diagnose anyway. Best for him to continue sleeping. But next Li Du suddenly blocked their path, then directly grabbed Quan Kin's wrist. Quan Kin swatted his hand away, but Li Du stubbornly insisted on taking his pulse. Seeing them tussling back and forth, Tin Kuang thought they were having a martial arts convention. Finally she hugged Quan Kin, telling him to just let Dr. Du examine him. Since he was a surgeon he would certainly have a way. But Quan Kin insisted he didn't need it. Then irritably told Dr. Du to get lost and dragged Tin Kuang outside. He of course knew that guy could treat illnesses. He still remembered last life Li Du told his family. That as long as he let go of Tin Kuang then Li Du would cure his bloodsucking condition. Tin Kuang was also there and had decided to break up with him. After pulling her out to the hallway. He hastily told Tin Kuang to quickly ask her mom to take out their family register. They would immediately go to the Civil Affairs Bureau and register their marriage. Seeing Tin Kuang hesitate, he asked if she didn't agree. Could it be she still wanted other women wedging in between them? Tin Kuang immediately excitedly said she'd go ask her mom for the family register now. She thought because of the hospital her mom must have brought it with her, telling him to wait for her. But after a while she came back empty-handed because her mom said they had to meet both families first before registering marriage. Tin Kuang had no choice but to tell Quan Kin to wait a little longer. Wait until after both families met and discussed the wedding, then they could go register. This was like a rock slamming down on his head. He was extremely impatient and urged her again to quickly go get the family register. He was very anxious because of the love rival right in front of him. If left for long there would be variables, couldn't let those two be alone together. Then he dragged Tin Kuang away, saying tonight his mother-in-law invited her over for dinner. He had already agreed and said if she wanted to refuse she should call his mom herself. That woman was famously a tiger mom, he didn't dare go against her will. Hearing Tin Kuang refute that his mom's temperament was very kind, he said that was just a show for outsiders. Ever since childhood he had lived under the tiger mom's gaze and grew up. He told her that his bad temper was inherited. Hearing this, Tin Kuang secretly laughed not expecting he knew his own temper was bad. Then she told Quan Kin they should still go to her in-laws for dinner tonight. That night at dinner, the atmosphere was extremely quiet and strange. Tin Kuang now whispered asking Quan Kin didn't he say his mom called telling her to come over for dinner? Quan Kin awkwardly said didn't you call this morning telling me to bring Tin Kuang home for dinner? You forgot mom? Mrs. Bai Go was stunned for a moment, then had no choice but to coordinate with her son saying she was forgetful, then suggested they all go out to eat. As for Mr. Bai Tu, he was glaring at his son, annoyed that his romantic dinner with his wife was ruined. Quan Kin glared back at his dad, silently thinking he was about to lose his wife. Whose fault was that? Now Mrs. Bai Go happily pulled Tin Kuang's hand saying let's go eat. But Tin Kuang still felt something was off with everyone. Now Mrs. Bai Go asked Tin Kuang if her parents were busy and couldn't make it, were they upset? But Tin Kuang said her parents understood. She then asked how her mom had been doing these years, where they lived, how long her dad had been sick. Tin Kuang answered dejectedly, saying her family lived on a small island, and her dad had been sick for over 10 years now. Hearing this, Mrs. Bai Go whispered so wasn't your mom taking care of your dad all those 10 years? In fact, she was the real Mrs. Bai Go, the illegitimate daughter from outside the Bai family who couldn't be publicly recognized, until the real young Miss Bai boy Lone eloped and ran away. She was then brought back to impersonate and marry Mr. Bai Tu, an illegitimate child like her knew nothing, wanting to become a true guilty did miss making a famous name standing steadfast in high society. Looking back now it was truly unbelievable. She felt like she had a halo, a straight path to the finish line, turning danger into success through the pass. No one knew she was a replacement bride. No one knew she wasn't by boy loan. Now sitting at the dinner table, she felt extremely melancholy. That very day she had seen the true gilded young miss. If her husband by two knew he had married the wrong woman, could he angrily divorce her? On the other hand, Tin Kuang now saw her father-in-law come cutting the food into small pieces then transferring it to her mother-in-law's plate and felt extremely touched. Because at one look she knew this habit had formed from years of attentiveness. She was amazed that her in-laws had been married for decades yet still loved each other like this. Of course, her parents were also great. Bai Go was currently very distressed because they had been together half a lifetime already, and had such an outstanding son. When the truth was revealed, she didn't know what to do. In the end, the couple couldn't escape their son 
sons questioning either. Mom and dad, are you free tomorrow? Hearing his dad say he wasn't free tomorrow, he questioned what his dad was busy with tomorrow. His dad made the excuse that previously they had encountered pirates messing up his and his mom's around the world trip plans, so he had planned to continue the around the world trip with her couldn't let the tickets his son booked go to waste. While Dai Quan Kin was still angry not knowing what to say, Bai Go was happy that there was more traveling tomorrow. The two elders played out their act, saying if their son had bought them tickets then they couldn't waste his filial intentions. The two discussed and finally decided to hurry and eat then go home and pack before departing. Now Tin Kuang silently kicked Quan Kin under the table. He also eagerly said to his parents the trip could wait. While Tin Kuang's dad had already been hospitalized in the capital for 10 days, how could they not visit? No day is not the right day to meet, he said let's go over after dinner. Mrs. Bai Go again made excuses that they weren't prepared yet. Going unprepared would be insincere. Quan Kin eagerly said to let him prepare whatever they needed. While Tin Kuang thought her in-laws stalling on meeting her parents could it be they truly were prejudiced against her. Quan Kin's mom now said they needed to pick an auspicious day and she had checked the calendar already. There were no good days recently. Quan Kin felt even a fool could see they just didn't want to go discuss the marriage. Now Mr. Bai Tu said he also agreed with his wife's opinion so this matter couldn't be rushed, and told Tin Kuang her parents surely wouldn't blame them for not visiting again. Following that, he started spewing all sorts of reasons for him and Quan Kin's mom to go on their around-the-world trip. From being busy with work their whole marriage so never taking her on a trip, to not wanting to waste their son's filial intentions, to not knowing how much longer they had left to live. If they didn't go now they may never have another chance. Quan Kin was driven mad, telling his parents to just tell him the truth. Don't spout nonsense you old folks. What exactly do you two want? Seeing his silent parents, Quan Kin stood up, dragged Tin Kuang's hand, Let's go. I'm not your biological child. I was picked up from the trash can. Tin Kuang reluctantly glanced back at her in-laws then had no choice but to run after Quan Kin. Mrs. Bai Go said to her husband they should visit the in-laws home. Otherwise the in-laws would surely have opinions. She felt very guilty towards her daughter-in-law. While Mr. Bai Tu could only silently worry. Now in the bathroom. Quan Kin was splashing water on his face to sober himself up. He wondered where exactly it went wrong. Why did his parents do a 180 degree turn like that? At this moment he suddenly heard heard some people gossiping about how Lam Tram Mac had bumped into Duong Chao, and wondered if Duong Chao was male or female. They said they'd never seen Duong Chao in the men's bathroom before. Maybe he really was female pretending to be male. Some said earlier Lam Tram Mac was mocked by some young masters. Duong Chao suddenly went up to defend him. That demeanor was 80% a female husband. Hearing them gossip too much, Quan Kin stood right behind them with sharp eyes. What are you all saying about Duong Chao? Recognizing him, they could only flee begging him to spare them. Not even daring to look back, Quan Kin clutched his head. He felt extremely vexed because everyone, one after another, only made him more worried. Just like those two said, Duong Chao was now taking action to defend Lam Tram Mac. One kick knocked down several young masters, then stomped on a golden monkey's back, saying what if she was the one bumped into by Lam Tram Mac? It wasn't their turn to gossip behind the back yet. She told them Lam Tram Mac was the one she protected. If they wanted to deal with him they'd have to see if this Duong Chao agreed or not first. Then she turned yelling at stupid Lam Tram Mac. When insulted by them he should have decisively taught them a lesson like her, and asked if he still had a bit of the confidence and arrogance of Little Mermaid's Duong Chao following him. Duong Chao then raised her fist punching the golden monkey's face and chased them away. He still wouldn't leave but pointed at Duong Chao's face telling Lam Tram Mac not to think just because Duong Chao was protecting him that he could suddenly become a swan. Hiding behind someone of unknown gender, Lam Tram Mac leaned down, smiling provocatively telling him if he was jealous then come to the marriage registry tomorrow and get bumped into someone, only not knowing if he'd be as lucky as him. That golden monkey grit his teeth, secretly thinking he wasn't afraid of Duong Chao at all. Just that Dai Thoi had just become president, while Duong Chao was his first assistant, he then turned to leave with his lackeys, not forgetting to say Duong Chao just wait, because he definitely wouldn't let this grudge go so easily. Duong Chao of course retorted she wasn't afraid, then told Lam Tram Mac she would announce it in the group today, that Lam Tram Mac was her person, don't think that just because he fell he could then follow and step all over him, whoever dared touch Duong Chao's people, she would make them regret coming to this world, seeing Lam Tram Mac still smirking, she angrily told him to follow her for a massage, scolding him for being a coward letting those young masters bully and embarrass her, just as she finished speaking, 
Duong Chao's eyes widened seeing Dai Quan Kin here. He said if he wasn't here how would he have known she acted so protective outside. Duong Chao awkwardly explained she wasn't protecting anyone. Just that if he lost face then she lost face too. And if she lost face then President Dai would lose face. She had farsightedly acted to protect the overall situation. And she asked why Kin was looking at her like that. Dai Quan Kin smiled saying he just saw she really lived up to being his family. Duong Chao didn't understand and asked Lam Tram Mac what he meant. Lam Tram Mac said it didn't mean anything. In summary it was probably just, the mouth speaks but the heart differs. Duong Chao didn't agree and shyly turned hitting Lam Tram Mac. The two happily teased each other for a bit while Dai Quan Kin had gone out to the car. He ruffled her hair saying he met Duong Chao's group inside earlier and chatted a bit, that's why it took so long. Hearing little Duong Chao was also here, Tin Kuang was extremely happy asking if she needed to go say hi. As their car was driving away, it was suddenly overtaken at high speed by another car behind, forcing their driver to react in time making Tin Kuang lose balance and fall into Quan Kin's arms, complaining about the reckless driver. It turned out that immoral driver was the golden monkey who had just been beaten by Duong Chao. He still greatly resented her. The angrier he got the more he stepped on the gas, speeding like crazy, with only the thought of getting back at Duong Chao in his mind. Dai Thoi now called his younger brother saying he and Quan Kin's sister-in-law had talked to his parents for half a day, finally managing to get three sentences out of them. Quan Kin eagerly asked what those three sentences were. Thoi sighed saying it's not that they don't like Tin Kuang, not that they want to obstruct the engagement, just that they temporarily don't want to meet the in-laws. He then comforted his brother not to rush, saying after Tin Kuang's dad's successful surgery, they could arrange for the families to meet. They would try to persuade their parents during this time, to find out what they really wanted. Hearing this, Quan Kin felt only he was the real brother. His brother Dai Thoi was also very indulgent towards him, saying if persuasion didn't work, then on the day he assumed the presidential office, he would send an invitation to Tin Kuang's parents inviting them to the dinner banquet. If her parents still didn't nod their heads that night, Quan Kin should directly propose at the banquet that night. With both sets of parents present he believed even if they didn't intend to obstruct, they couldn't improperly behave in that situation. While Quan Kin was happily imagining his future happiness, Tin Kuang ran in sobbing that something had happened to Duong Chao. Tin Kuang said Lam Tram Mac discovered Duong Chao's burnt car at the foot of the mountain. Inside the car there was also a pile of burning white bones. He said he couldn't contact Quan Kin so called her instead. Looking at the photo of the scene, Dai Quan Kin of course couldn't hide his horror. Meanwhile, Lam Tram Mac was grieving at the incident site, crying while calling for help. Duong Chao's image continuously flashed in his mind. The night she had invited them for dinner but when Ki Tu didn't pick up he asked Lam Tram Mac. Lam Tram Mac also couldn't reach her, finally following her phone's location. He arrived here, only to find Duong Chao's car and the burning pile of white bones. Lam Tram Mac cried in anguish under the tree remembering it all. Now Quan Kin also led the Dai brothers rushing over asking where Duong Chao was. Behind them, they froze seeing the police taking out a corpse. Lam Tram Mac frantic rushed over. He couldn't believe it. Duong Chao wasn't skilled but was known as a good driver in the capital. How could this happen? How could a car explosion turn her into a pile of white bones? Quan Kin also couldn't believe it. He tried to stay calm asking them to do a DNA test. Lam Tram Mac took out a cigarette, wanting the smoke to ease his aching heart but Duong Chao's image flashed making him unable to light it. The cigarette fell taking his mood down into the deep abyss. The test results confirmed it was Duong Chao. Quan Kin sat frozen at the basketball court. Tin Kuang could only come comfort him. He tiredly laid his head in her lap. He remembered little Duong Chao liked playing basketball here the most. He wanted Tin Kuang to sit here with him for a bit. Tin Kuang asked if the car had swerved off the mountain and fallen into the valley itself. What time was it? Quan Kin replied he only knew she had left the club at 3.50. Based on her driving speed, it probably happened around 4.20. They still weren't sure if it was an accident or. He hadn't finished speaking when his phone rang. Kiyu Van reported she had investigated the stretch where the accident happened last night was blocked off. Some drivers responded that they had seen the detour signs there before, requiring a detour, but there had been no landslides making the road impassable. Initial suspicion was of premeditated murder. Quan Kin urgently told Kiyu Van to investigate immediately. Tin Kuang lowered her head sadly thinking even if they investigated, Duong Chao was already dead. She recalled the happy memories with Duong Chao. A determination rose in her heart. Now at the Dai house, everyone, the brothers had all gathered. 
Tin Kuang looked left. Dai Quan Kin and Dai Thoi were racking their brains discussing the investigation. Looking right, the Dai cousins couldn't hold back their tears of grief. Tin Kuang tightly grasped her hands then went to call Koi Yulan. She whispered to him that maybe she had a way to save Duong Chao. The reason she whispered was because she knew there were spies from various factions here. Any slight movement outside they could know about. Quan Kin also understood this and ordered all the servants to stop their work and leave. Seeing Lam Tram Mac approach, Tin Kuang asked Quan Kin if he could leave. Lam Tram Mac affirmed to Dai Quan Kin that as Duong Chao's family he had to stay. He added that if Duong Chao could be saved, he would treat Tin Kuang as his life savior. He would definitely remember this favor. Then Lam Tram Mac gave Tin Kuang a special ring. She was about to refuse but Quan Kin took it, put it in Tin Kuang's hand telling her to take it. He said the Lam family's ruthlessness made people terrified just hearing about it. This was an existence like a tiger's might. This from now on everyone would obey Tin Kuang. Tin Kuang looked at the ring, then assured Lam Tram Mac that if she couldn't save Duong Chao she would return it to him. Lam Tram Mac impatiently asked if she could now say how to save little Chao. Tin Kuang asked if they had heard of remorse medicine. Quan Kin felt in his heart that indeed he had guessed right. He knew Tin Kuang too well and would use this method. Tin Kuang said today she had bought remorse medicine from a friend. Just drinking it could return to before Duong Chao's accident to save her. Tin Kuang asked who wanted to drink it. Ki Tu still didn't believe it, thinking Tin Kuang was too heartbroken and hallucinating. The green-haired brother now said he would drink it. Ki Tu said he was crazy because remorse medicine couldn't exist in this world. But he believed he had to try even if there was only a 1 in 10 trillion chance. Tin Kuang took out the box saying she wasn't deceiving them. Holding the medicine box she instructed him to first drink it all then close his eyes and concentrate on returning to that time. It was effective for one hour, one hour before little Chow died. He remembered he was on a plane. Tin Kuang said he wasn't suitable to drink remorse medicine. Going back he wouldn't be able to do anything. Quan Kin now said to give that pill to him. But before he could do anything, the pill was already snatched and swallowed by Lam Tram Mac. He asked Tin Kuang if just closing his eyes and concentrating was enough, right? Tin Kuang nodded then said he only had one hour. With that intense belief, Lam Tram Mac returned to the past. He hazily realized he was in Duong Chao's office. Lam Tram Mac immediately called asking where Duong Chao was. Was. Right now she was driving to eat dinner. Lam Tram Mac sternly told Duong Chao to immediately turn back and go where there were lots of people. He would go pick her up. Duong Chao was still arguing asking why she had to listen to Lam Tram Mac. When she was suddenly splashed by a reckless driver making her unable to help crying out then slamming the brakes. Lam Tram Mac worriedly asked if she was okay but there was no response. He called Quan Kin telling him little Chao had an accident on road 406, telling him to bring a medical team and ambulance there immediately. He himself also went to the rooftop, to the helicopter to urgently head there. Duong Chao's car was now completely wrecked. She herself was sitting there with a bloody head. That golden monkey was extremely smug, mocking her, Duong Chao immediately scolded him as a sneaky, petty, lowly villain. He asked if he was petty then what was Duong Chao. Previously he had always thought she was male. Only when she married Lam Tram Mac did he find out she was female. Duong Chao now shuddered asking what he wanted. The golden monkey lifted her chin, saying his cousin had been away so long. He wanted to see if he'd been eating well lately. Hearing this, Duong Chao immediately headbutted him. The enraged blonde immediately slapped her. He said if he didn't beat her to death today he wouldn't be Lam V. Heen anymore. Just as the metal rod was about to strike down, he was suddenly shot in the hand, painfully falling over. Lam Tram Mac had arrived just in time, using a sniper rifle to shoot him. Seeing he had a gun, Lam V. Heen's lackeys fearfully told each other to flee, but basically they weren't worthy of being spared, each was shot blocking their escape route. After taking care of them, Lam Tram Mac climbed down, tightly embracing Duong Chao. Lam Tram Mac embraced her tightly. He embraced her tightly. Lam V. Heen begged his cousin, saying he only wanted to tease Duong Chao. This excuse was only suitable for his kneecap. Lam Tram Mac gave him a sharp gaze like a blade, saying he also wanted to play with him. A while later Quan Kin arrived with the medical team, seeing the bodies lying on the ground. 
He asked who did this. Lam Tram Max spoke up taking responsibility. Quan Kin immediately rushed over asking about little Chow without hesitation. Lam Tram Mac dejectedly replied she had very serious external injuries. He felt he had come too late. After Duong Chow was carried onto the stretcher, Lam Tram Mac told Dai Quan Kin that he owed his wife a life. The two then immediately boarded the helicopter to return. Duong Chow was now awake at the hospital, frowning in pain from the medicine being applied, her mouth continuously cursing Lam V. Heen for ruining her face, asking Kin if her face wasn't destroyed. The moment Duong Chao took out her phone, Lam Tram Mac tried to stop her but failed, making Duong Chao cry and wail hysterically the moment she saw her face, then immediately fainted. The worried brothers called the doctor in. After examining her, the doctor awkwardly smiled saying she had fainted from her own ugliness. Lam Tram Mac looked at his watch. He knew the one hour was almost up, wondering if this could be considered saving little Chow's life. Indeed in an instant Lam Tram Mac was returned to the present. Everyone shared the same stunned feeling seeing Duong Chow lying in the hospital bed, also unharmed. Ki too wiped his eyes to make sure he wasn't seeing wrong, then burst into tears at his sister being fine. The vice president also looked left and right, confused, weren't they at home preparing the funeral? How were they all at the hospital? Kai's new memories also appeared. Having just gotten off the plane he received Quan Kin's call that Duong Chao was in an accident but not life-threatening. Ki too also had new memories, calling little Chao. Lam Tram Mac picked up saying she was in the hospital. He immediately rushed over without eating, asking where was little Tin Kuang. He wanted to kowtow to her, for her to help his sister cheat death and return to life. Tin Kuang who was standing outside was suddenly pushed against the wall by Quan Kin. He said she had saved so many people around him, such deep love and loyalty. How could he repay her? Tin Kuang smiled saying for him to repay her with his whole life. She wasn't in a hurry nor needed interest. Quan Kin touched her lips teasingly, saying a whole life was too long. He wanted to repay her now. Tin Kuang shyly said actually Quan Kin had also saved her before. Saved her father and little man so they shouldn't speak so clearly about favors. He then shamelessly demanded they repay each other a little now. This good thing was immediately ruined by Ki Tu. He ripped Tin Kuang from Quan Kin's kiss. Demanding to repay Tin Kuang. The price being eating his dark brother's shoe sole. Getting his pig hoof a bit farther away was repayment enough. He too still vigorously pushed Tin Kuang away. Asking Quan Kin if he was lacking just one kiss. Moreover, little Tin Kuang didn't just belong to him but the whole family. Right brothers? Duong Chao's brother even knelt asking his sister-in-law to accept his bow. Making the shy Tin Kuang not dare accept it. She said she had only bought one pill. If she had difficulties in the future, him helping back would be fine. The brother immediately affirmed. In the future with him here, no one would dare bully her. The other brothers also immediately raised their hands. And him too. Tin Kuang now looked over at Lam Tram Mac, telling him to return the jade ring for a bit. Lam Tram Mac gave it to her, saying the mercenary leader's nickname was Fire Meteorite, telling her to give him her number. He would give her that leader's number. After finishing, Tin Kuang bid them farewell and left. Ki Yu Van in the hallway now asked how she had Fire Meteorite's ring. Tin Kuang said Lam Tram Mac gave it to her, asking if Fire Meteorite was very strong. Ki Yu Van offered to help keep it safe for her, because he knew even if she held it, to make Fire Meteorite willingly submit she needed an assistant. Tin Kuang gladly accepted his goodwill. Ki Yu Van said now he would call Fire Meteorite to the capital for her to hear Tin Kuang's arrangement. Tin Kuang left it to Ki Yu Van's discretion then returned to sleep. Ki Yu still stood there leaning against the wall. Lighting a cigarette, his screen already had Fire Meteorite's number dialed. On the day of the kidney transplant, Tin Kuang and her mother worriedly waited outside with Quan Kin. The door now opened. Li Du happily announced the surgery was extremely successful. Mother and daughter immediately happily embraced each other. At night, Tin Kuang held a small party to thank the doctors and everyone. Seeing her drink, Li Du teased saying she should drink less. If she got drunk and became a monster, Big Brother wouldn't like it. Tin Kuang was now tipsy, running over to Li Du making Quan Kin want to die of anger. Li Du asked if she was drunk did she still know whose body she was on, if she still recognized who was who. Tin Kuang hazily opened her eyes saying she wasn't drunk, and pointed at Bak Kin Nu saying he was the one she kept. Hearing this, 
Back Kin Nu froze while Thuong Dam calmly didn't dare look straight. Seeing the fish he raised had crawled into another guy's lap, Quan Kin was burning with anger. He immediately texted asking for opinions. If his girl got drunk and crawled into someone else's lap instead of his, what should he do? All the big brothers advised pampering her more so next time she would crawl into his arms. Only Duong Chao said he had to strictly discipline her. Quan Kin didn't understand his brothers. He felt little Chao's words still sounded the best to him. Of course because the big brothers had promised to protect Tin Kuang already. After the party, Quan Kin saw the backs off then turned around. Tin Kuang was still plastered to that Li guy. Li Du now asked Tin Kuang if she still remembered who Quan Kin was. Tin Kuang went closer then burst out laughing saying he was a handsome guy. Telling Li Du to stop Quan Kin. Quan Kin conveniently asked if she wanted the handsome guy to share her blanket tonight. Tin Kuang shyly replied she wasn't so shameless. But seeing Quan Kin about to leave. Tin Kuang shamelessly begged the handsome guy to stop, saying his ancestral hall was dark, asking him to take all his clothes off for her to exorcise it. Finally obediently in the car, Quan Kin wondered how many harems she had opened behind his back. As their car headed home, Kiu Van discovered someone had scattered nails on the road. There was no signal in the tunnel. He told the team to stay vigilant. Kiu Van thought this was the opponent's premeditated preparation. Quan Kin was furious wanting to see who dared make trouble with him. He immediately put on Tin Kuang's bulletproof vest. Suddenly the car braked sharply. Quan Kin had to hug Tin Kuang tightly, yelling at Kiu Van to be careful. Kiu Van looked at the convoy ahead. The team informed him the SUV contained Black Dragon. They had encountered the professional assassins who worked for money. Kiu Van got out of the car. Unconcerned with danger he lit a cigarette, calling out greeting them as it had been long. Why not come out to chat a bit? There was also a lady boss in the car. Seeing team leader Kiu Van's arrogant attitude made her very aroused. Beside her was also a Scarface. He introduced Kiu Van to her as Dai Quan Kin's first bodyguard, saying if she liked, he could give her three minutes to catch him. After three minutes they would kill everyone. She licked her lips confidently saying no need for three minutes. Just one minute and she could make him willing willingly kneel and lick her. Then she immediately pulled out her gun threatening Kiu Van to think in one minute whether to follow her or die. Kiu Van calmly said he agreed. In this world only one woman could make him willingly devote himself. That was fire meteorite, but that fierce Scarface pulled out his gun. He didn't want to keep someone who wouldn't obey him. The bullet flew at Kiu Van. He calmly tilted his face avoiding it. After it grazed his face, immediately behind was a retaliating gunshot. Scarface panicked barely managing to dodge. Black Dragon's people immediately pointed their guns behind asking who did that. Kiu Van's subordinate also didn't know and asked if it was the reinforcements arriving. Kiu Van just smiled turning behind saying thanks for saving this hero. He could only repay with his body. A beautiful girl walked over, snatching the cigarette from Kiu Van's lips, pressing it arrogantly against his chest, using his body to repay. I'm afraid you still don't qualify. Fire Meteorite's appearance stunned Black Dragon's people. Fire Meteorite snapped her fingers and her mercenaries appeared, giving the opponents one minute to leave. Otherwise she would be happy to send them to their ancestors. Scarface shouted not expecting because of this little white lotus she would treat him this way. Fire Meteorite said Kiu Van didn't have the qualifications to order her around. She looked in the car saying her new master was inside. If the one killed by him was her master, how could she still mix in this circle? Scarface thought her new master must be Dai Quan Kin. But Fire Meteorite just smirked saying what was Dai Quan Kin? How could he be her master? Now seeing a tipsy girl hugging and kissing Quan Kin's cheek, Fire Meteorite was shocked asking Kiu Van if this was Tin Kuang, then laughed saying how interesting. Black Dragon's people knew Fire Meteorite's weapons were much stronger than them. As long as Fire Meteorite's new master wasn't Quan Kin, this job still had a chance. Then they said they were sparing her this time out of respect for Fire Meteorite, and quickly fled together. Kiu Van now also told the Kin family it was resolved satisfactorily, and introduced her as Fire Meteorite, leader of Lam Tram Max Army. Now it could be called the army under young Mrs. Command. Looking inside, Fire Meteorite saw her new master being clingy wanting to play the kissing game with Quan Kin. She could only awkwardly smile. Just then nearby suddenly a gunshot rang out. Kiu Van asked if Fire Meteorite had sent people to chase and kill Black Dragon. But Fire Meteorite didn't know anything. The tunnel was now blazing. The exit was also blocked. 
This wasn't actually done by Black Dragon's people because right now they had also hurried back in panic. Team leader Kiu Van ordered his subordinates to change Dai Quan Kin's tire so the Kin family's car could get out first. They were about to turn and take the other exit but that side also had gasoline. Outside came an announcement, saying if anyone could bring Dai Quan Kin's head out today they would spare that person's life, otherwise they would all have to experience being burned alive by gasoline. Kiu Van was extremely tense. He shouted out saying he would take that dog's life first, but he replied if so then all would have to die. Speaking of which, countless vicious dogs were released charging at them. Fire Meteorite had ordered her subordinates not to shoot to avoid explosions. By then it would be hard to escape. Kiu Van said everyone use cold weapons. Have to be careful. So everyone held a knife being extremely vigilant against the ferocious beasts. Kiu Van went to urge the driver to drive the Kin family out but he said Dai Quan Kin didn't allow it. Kiu Van tensely said he should listen when should listen to the Kin family. And he shouldn't, don't be stupidly loyal. Just then a large dog pounced at Fire Meteorite. Kiu Van immediately pushed Fire Meteorite away. While he was injured because of it. Fire Meteorite knew the situation was hard to handle. While Scarface said to Kiu Van he had said not to be a bodyguard for for rich people, forcing him to sell his life yet questioning his ability. Just now he should have taken Dai Quan Kin's head to exchange for the reward. Team leader Kiu Van now turned to the car telling the Kin family he didn't protect him well, asking him to take young miss and leave. Let the driver drive, but Dai Quan Kin instead, stepped out of the car telling Kiu Van if he couldn't handle it then go rest, take good care of his woman. He stepped forward facing the wolves, the giant creatures howling long terrible cries. Seeing Quan Kin come out, they disregarded the others. Directly surrounding him, his eyes now turned red. He smiled saying after so many years he still had the honor of fighting these wolves. The wolves now grew even more furious, howling mournfully then together jumping at him. All the subordinates tensely reminded him to be careful. Under the protagonist's halo, this punch shattered one's jaw. A kick sent another flying. Everyone was shocked by this strength, but mistakes were unavoidable. Quan Kin was bitten in the shoulder by one. His subordinates fearfully watched. Just then the car door was kicked open. By the furious Tin Kuang because her fresh meat hadn't made it to her mouth yet those wolves dared bite it already. Quan Kin smiled awkwardly, at a loss how to respond. While Fire Meteorite thought her drunk new master didn't need to keep living. The bodyguards immediately tried to stop Tin Kuang's recklessness but to no avail. Couldn't stop her, with the strength to defeat all contenders for the throne. Subdue ocean sharks. Sweep a gang of armed pirates and quell the Ha family's chaos twice. These wolves of course hardly registered. She immediately broke the jaw of the one that bit Quan Kin. Scarface's jaw dropped his mind enlightened. He wondered how this Dai Quan Kin could fight wolves barehanded. Even the delicate woman beside him was so fierce. What was the point of hiring bodyguards? Who could harm him? After finishing, Tin Kuang excitedly rushed over asking about Quan Kin's condition, wanting to check if he had any more injuries. He now only felt creeped out, but the wolves behind were growling. But seeing they didn't attack, Kiu Van wondered if they were all scared of Tin Kuang. Just then the wolves turned tail and left, making Quan Kin suspicious. That they just left like that? He opened the car door, then smiled saying to Scarface, I heard you wanted to kill me. Hearing someone else wanted to compete for her meat, Tin Kuang popped her head out, ready to claw him. Scarface of course panicked, saying he didn't dare, admitting he was blind. Just like that, they escaped disaster and continued on their way back. On the way back Kiu Van was still bothered, clearly able to launch an ambush and wipe them out in one go but only sending a pack of wolves to fight. Also no ambush troops. This was too illogical. He wondered if they were apprehensive about young Miss Tin Kuang, not wanting to harm her. The next morning, the villa resort Tin Kuang woke up, her mind a confused mess, probably not remembering what happened last night. Her mother now brought her daughter some hangover tea. She told her daughter not to drink anymore because last night Quan Kin was injured yet she didn't let the nurse bandage the poor boy. She said her daughter was really out of control. Only Quan Kin's doting allowed her to be so out of control. Hearing Quan Kin was injured, Tin Kuang panicked asking what happened. Her equally surprised mother said last night she and young master encountered assassins. Asking if she didn't remember, the young master was bitten in the back. Saying it was a big wolf, by the time they got to the hospital he started having a high fever. Tin Kuang immediately rushed to the hospital without a word. Outside Dai Quan Kin's room a team of bodyguards immediately bowed calling her big sister. They told each other this was the big sister who beat up the big wolf until it was battered. The big sister who even ate the Kin family's flesh. She now felt extremely embarrassed, thinking to herself she wasn't that kind of person, then went in. From team leader Kiu Van, she learned Quan 
Kwan Kin still had a high fever now. He also told her about yesterday, so many big wolves yet without a trace. The road CCTVs didn't capture anything either. Kin Kwong looked at the calendar, today was the 16th. Yesterday was the full moon, she thought if the big wolves left no trace, could they be the werewolves she knew? If that was really so, then Dai Quan Kin didn't just have a fever but was infected with werewolf venom. Normal treatment basically couldn't cure it. Then she didn't go in to see Quan Kin, instead immediately running off saying she had urgent business to take care of. Inside, Quan Kin was still breathing heavily in the hospital bed. Kiyu Van came in telling him young miss just came but said she suddenly remembered urgent business and left first. Then getting Li Du's message that he was leaving the capital. Having just bought plane tickets, he got up sending someone to follow. His body basically couldn't resist. Seconds later he was dizzy then completely lost consciousness. Memories returned in his mind. He remembered previously telling Tin Kuang the wolf attack was Li Du messing around, asking her why she didn't believe him but Tin Kuang insisted he was delusionally paranoid. Not that Li Du tried to assassinate him for no reason. Even when he gave Tin Kuang evidence, she didn't look saying she only believed Li Du, and that these were just things Quan Kin wanted her to see. A few seconds later he regained consciousness. Extremely weary sitting up, Beside was the wounded little brother coming to see his big brother asking if he was okay. How could he still curse people after fainting from fever? Seeing this, Quan Kin chased Duong Chao away, asking her why she wasn't in bed recuperating but came here instead. Duong Chao said she came over because his phone rang several times, worried it was urgent. As soon as he heard, someone reported Tin Kuang and Li Du were together in City T. Asking why, the subordinate said possibly because Li Du refused to leave. So Tin Kuang went from the capital to there instead. He yelled at them not to spout nonsense without evidence. But the subordinates insisted it was true, saying they saw Li Du chased by Tin Kuang the whole way, finally taking a speedboat into the sea. They were going to assassinate Li Du at sea but because Tin Kuang was also on board didn't take action. Hearing this Quan Kin immediately had a headache telling them to shut up. He ordered them to temporarily cancel the plan, saying anyone who dared touch a hair of Tin Kuang's would pay with their life. Seeing his brother gritting his teeth tightly gripping the phone. Duong Chao worriedly felt his temperature on his forehead, asking if the fever was making him very uncomfortable. He had been on IVs a day yet his head was still hot. Quan Kin now ordered people to immediately prepare a plane. The vice president immediately appeared saying preparations were ready, just that he still had a high fever. Quan Kin arrogantly put on a coat getting off the hospital bed saying fever wouldn't kill him. Tin Kuang was now at her seaside home. She rummaged for a while in the cabinet and finally found what she needed, then immediately ran outside. Neighbor Mrs. Tham seeing her return only to leave again asked her, then passed on her grandfather's words, saying he wanted to ask her forgiveness, hoping she would give him a chance to be old friends again. Mrs. Tham was slightly embarrassed but declined saying no thanks. She didn't need any friends. Tin Kuang was driving back and saw Li Du crouching on the road. She stopped asking why he was here. Tin Kuang said she just came back for some things, and asked if he was kicked out by his dad again. Don't say you'll sleep here okay. Seeing pitiful Li Du, she said he could stay at her house, waiting for Uncle Li's anger to subside and him to return. After Li Du took her house key, he insisted on seeing her off to the sea. Looking up at the sky was a bolt of lightning, with cold air sweeping in. Tin Kuang worried it would rain. Just then Mrs. Tham came over with an umbrella, saying she should hurry back because there was a storm tonight, don't go out to sea, it was dangerous. Seeing the light rain, she worried about the high-fevered Quan Kin at home waiting for her. Mrs. Tham now pulled her inside, afraid she would go out to sea at this hour, her mother finding out would blame her. Now on the plane, the vice president pointed at the map asking Quan Kin if he knew which of these islands was Tin Kuang's house. Because the map didn't have a specific location, going the wrong way in this weather would be troublesome. Quan Kin just glared at the vice president. How could he forget? He had engraved it in his mind already. This time he absolutely couldn't let that happen again. He believed she loved him, standing in front of Tin Kuang's house. The light over there, he knew it was her room. Tin Kuang still couldn't sleep now because she was afraid of the thunder. She felt terribly missing Quan Kin. Shivering in bed, she heard a knock on the door. Tin Kuang immediately ran out asking who was there. Quan Kin appeared dripping wet with knitted brows. Your man, 
he stormed in still simmering with anger. Passing her room, he wondered what if that doctor was inside. Indeed he wasn't disappointed. Li Du came out looking like someone woken mid-sleep by the knocking. Quan Kin immediately gave him a punch to wake him up. Li Du angrily covered his face asking what was wrong with Quan Kin in the middle of the night. Quan Kin now only wanted to strangle him, saying he dared sleep with his woman thinking he wouldn't dare do anything to him. Seeing her violent husband, Tin Kuang yelled at him to stop then rushed over to restrain him. Quan Kin angrily and painfully turned asking if she still wanted to protect him. Li Du now knew Quan Kin had misunderstood him sleeping with Tin Kuang so came from the capital to make a scene. Tin Kuang reached up feeling his forehead, worriedly asking if his fever was very high. While Li Du argued Quan Kin wasn't high and crazy but had violent tendencies. Now Li Du's nose was bleeding from the punch. He was dizzy too. Tin Kuang told him to look carefully. The room Li Du slept in was the guest room, not hers. Then pushed Quan Kin over there to sit and cool off or the fever would make him an idiot. Quan Kin sat on the chair silently, his gaze still full of hostility seeing Tin Kuang bring Li Du a paper towel for his blood. Just then Grandpa and the Vice President also came in. Very noisy. Grandpa even asked if Tin Kuang had hot water. Tin Kuang greeted them then busily went to pour hot water for Grandpa. Then find some of her dad's clothes for the vice president to change into. Then scolded Quan Kin for pretending. The high fever yet still suspecting people. Quan Kin now quietly followed saying Tin Kuang. Embracing her from behind, Tin Kuang still angry asking what he was hugging her for. Wasn't he suspecting she was indecent? Hearing he said Li Du just left and she chased him. Tin Kuang said she urgently hired a car to rush home because of him. She said his high fever was due to the giant wolf's venomous bite. She knew the cure but one ingredient couldn't be bought in the capital so she went home to get it. Now he knew she came back for him, not for Li Du. Tin Kuang truly wondered what was in this man's brain. Seeing she still cared, throwing clothes at him, Quan Kin happily clung to her. She was still pushing him away afraid of catching his fever. Seeing him sneeze pushed him harder, saying she would go make medicine for him. Because his temper was already bad, if the high fever damaged his brain then what? Just then outside came the sound of the sneezing vice president asking to borrow some clothes. Tin Kuang told Quan Kin to be good and let her find clothes for the vice president or they would all get sick. Seeing the Kin family's gaze, the vice president's hair stood on end, thinking that intimate gaze, he must have done something wrong again. Then the vice president made excuses about the wet floor not being wiped yet and ran off hugging the clothes. Looking at the violently boiling medicine, the vice president went down to the kitchen to take a look, and asked if she was making medicine or wanted to add oil to the fire since this was already very nutritious. Blushing, he advised Tin Kuang to restrain herself because now wasn't the time for replenishing the kidney and strengthening the yang. Tin Kuang annoyedly thought men's heads were full of rubbish. Now she received a call from Yen En. Yen En reported it seemed the elders were suspicious of Tin Kuang's identity so warned her to be careful. This was because Tin Kuang kept pressuring Yen En to sign a contract splitting profits with young miss. So the elders felt Yen En had been conned. And those three's personality was to kill when displeased so they sent werewolf warriors to kill Quan Kin. That pack seemed to have recognized Tin Kuang. Just not certain, only suspicious. This was indeed what had worried Tin Kuang. No wonder Quan Kin was bitten by wolves. Yen En now asked if Tin Kuang blamed her for painting Quan Kin's portrait and giving it to that elder. And asked how the two of them were. Tin Kuang angrily said he was poisoned so she was making medicine here. So was this okay? Tin Kuang then ordered Yen En to report all the kingdom's inside information before hanging up. Done. She brought in the medicine, coaxing the high-fevered man in bed to drink it. Every time he was sick, Quan Kin acted spoiled wanting to be fed. Tin Kuang had to indulge him, feeding while scolding him for not being fierce earlier. Before she finished speaking, he used the excuse of bitter medicine to kiss her, immediately pressing her down. The eavesdropping vice president outside was thrilled. Tin Kuang brought in a bowl of nourishing medicine for the Kin family, not knowing if he could withstand it. Although it contained the antidote, Tin Kuang had added a special ingredient. The one who wanted to taste the sweetness in her mouth, after a few sips was fast asleep already. Tin Kuang immediately pushed away that clingy person and climbed into bed to sleep. The next morning, Elder Marshall had gotten up early to practice, and happened to see the woman of his dreams watering flowers. He excitedly jumped over the wall to her frightening her into running away. He kept knocking outside apologizing for his mistakes that year, while Mrs. Tham knocked too coldly told him to get lost. Elder Marshall cried 
tried begging her to explain. His noisy actions woke up Tin Kuang. Li Du was preparing breakfast for everyone, saying the old man was probably seeking joy in his sunset years. Seeing the bruise on Li Du's face more serious, Tin Kuang told him to hurry and get it examined. Before he could reply, that clingy person appeared hugging Tin Kuang. Breakfast became even more chaotic when the aggrieved elder sat down, crying while picking out grains of rice to divine. He loves me, she doesn't love me. Feeling he got off easy being beaten, Li Du asked if Tin Kuang was so forgiving towards those who didn't trust her, sighing over silly Tin Kuang. Indulging Quan Kin would only lead to more chaos. Quan Kin said he was provoking discord, but Li Du said he was just speaking bluntly, and asked how he wanted compensation. Knowing he was provoking him, Quan Kin told himself to stay calm, but the vice president wasn't like that. He scolded Li Du for releasing the wolves to ambush and kill Quan Kin yesterday yet now demanding compensation. Li Du put down his bowl and chopsticks shouting for him to present evidence. He wanted the vice president to be clear or else. Tin Kuang defended Li Du telling the vice president not to talk nonsense but he still insisted it was Li Du who released the wolves to intercept and kill Quan Kin. But when Li Du held out his hand for evidence, the vice president could only only argue empty words. Seeing this, Li Du mockingly asked Tin Kuang if this was the man she wanted to entrust her life with. After all the insults against the Kin family, when the vice president was about to kick up a fuss, he was ordered to back down by our Quan Kin. He told Li Du the vice president had heard wrong. He didn't say that, and asked if 30,000 yuan was enough compensation. If not then 100,000. Li Du smiled then leaned on Tin Kuang's shoulder saying out of respect for her he would subtract 10 leaving 90,000 yuan. Just enter the bank account number and he could transfer it. 